Commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Socinus, translated by G. W. Williard, Section 1, General Prolegomena. Prolegomena, with reference to the Catechism of the Christian Religion, which was prepared for and taught in the schools and churches of the Palatinate. These prolegomena are partly general, such as treat of the entire doctrine of the Church, and partly special, such as have respect merely to the Catechism. The general prolegomena concerning the doctrine of the Church may be included in the following questions. First, what is the doctrine of the Church? Second, what are the parts thereof, and in what do these parts differ from each other? Third, wherein does the doctrine of the Church differ from that of the various sects, and from philosophy, and why these distinctions should be retained? Fourth, what are the evidences of the truth and certainty of this doctrine? Fifth, what are the various methods of teaching and studying this doctrine? First, what is the doctrine of the Church? The doctrine of the Church is the entire and uncorrupted doctrine of the law and gospel concerning the true God, together with his will, works, and worship, divinely revealed and comprehended in the writings of the prophets and apostles, and confirmed by many miracles and divine testimonies, through which the Holy Spirit works effectually in the hearts of the elect and gathers from the whole human race an everlasting church, in which God is glorified both in this and in the life to come. This doctrine is the chief and most expressive mark of the true church, which God designs to be visible in the world, and to be separated from the rest of mankind, according to these declarations of Scripture, Keep yourselves from idols, come out from among them, and be ye separate. If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your houses, neither bid him God speed. Be ye holy, touch no unclean thing, ye that bear the vessels of the Lord. Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. 1 John 5, verse 21, 2 Corinthians 6, verse 17, 2 John 10, Isaiah 52, verse 11, Revelation 18, verse 4. God wills that his church be separate and distinct from the world for the following considerations. First, on account of his own glory, for as he himself will not be joined with idols and devils, so he will not have his truth confounded with falsehood, and his church with her enemies, the children of the devil, but will have them carefully distinguished and separated. It would be reproachful to God to suppose that he would have and acknowledge as his children such as persecute him. Yea, it would be blasphemy to make God the author of false doctrine, and the defender of the wicked, for what concord has Christ with Belial? 2 Corinthians 6 verse 14 Secondly, on account of the consolation and salvation of his people, for it is necessary that the church should be visible in the world, that the elect, scattered abroad among the whole human race, may know with what society they ought to unite themselves, and that, being gathered into the church, they may enjoy this sure comfort, that they are members of that family in which God delights, and which has the promises of everlasting life. For it is the will of God that all those who are to be saved should be gathered into the church in this life. Out of the church there is no salvation. How the church may be known, and what are the marks by which it may be distinguished from the various sects, will be shown when we come to speak regularly upon the subject of the church. We may, however, here say that there are three marks by which the church is known, purity of doctrine, the proper use of the sacraments, and obedience to God according to all the parts of this doctrine, whether of faith or practice. And if it be here objected, that great vices have often made their appearance in the church, we would reply that these are not defended and adhered to by the church, as by the various sects. Yea, the church is the first to censure and condemn them. Hence, if there are faults in the church, these are disapproved of and removed. As long as this state of things lasts, so long the church continues. Second, what are the parts of the doctrine of the church, and in what do they differ from each other? The doctrine of the church consists of two parts, the law and the gospel, in which we have comprehended the sum and substance of the sacred scriptures. The law is called the Decalogue, and the gospel is the doctrine concerning Christ the Mediator and the free remission of sins through faith. This division of the doctrine of the church is established by these plain and forcible arguments. 1. The whole doctrine comprised in the sacred writings is either concerning the nature of God, his will, his works, or sin, which is the proper work of men and devils. 
but all these subjects are fully set forth and taught either in the law or in the gospel or in both therefore the law and gospel are the chief and general divisions of the holy scriptures which comprise the entire doctrine comprehended therein two christ himself makes this division of the doctrine which he will have preached in his name when he says thus it is written and thus it behoved christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name luke twenty four verses forty six to forty seven but this embraces the entire substance of the law and gospel three the writings of the prophets and apostles comprise the old and new testament or covenant between god and man it is therefore necessary that the principal parts of the covenant should be contained and explained in these writings and that they should declare what god promises and grants unto us viz his favour remission of sins righteousness and eternal life and also what he in return requires from us which is faith and obedience these now are the things which are taught in the law and gospel four christ is the substance and ground of the entire scriptures but the doctrine contained in the law and gospel is necessary to lead us to a knowledge of christ and his benefits for the law is our schoolmaster to bring us to christ constraining us to fly to him and showing us what that righteousness is which he has wrought out and now offers unto us but the gospel professedly treats of the person office and benefits of christ therefore we have in the law and gospel the whole of the scriptures comprehending the doctrine revealed from heaven for our salvation the principal differences between these two parts of the doctrine of the church consist in these three things one in the subject or general character of the doctrine peculiar to each the law prescribes and enjoins what is to be done and forbids what ought to be avoided while the gospel announces the free remission of sin through and for the sake of christ two in the manner of revelation peculiar to each the law is known from nature the gospel is divinely revealed three in the promises which they make to man the law promises life upon the condition of perfect obedience the gospel on the condition of faith in christ and the commencement of new obedience hereafter however more will be said upon this subject in the proper place third in what does the doctrine of the church differ from that of other religions and from philosophy and why these distinctions should be retained the doctrine of the church differs from that of all other religions in four respects first the doctrine of the church has god for its author by whom it was delivered through the prophets and apostles whilst the various religious systems of sectarists have been invented by men through the suggestion of the devil secondly the doctrine of the church alone has such divine testimony and confirmation of its truth as is sure and infallible and which is calculated to quiet the conscience and convict all the various sects of error thirdly in the church the law of god is retained entire and uncorrupted whilst in other systems of religion it is narrowed down and basely corrupted for the advocates of these false religions entirely reject the doctrine of the first table concerning the knowledge and worship of the true god either setting forth some other god besides him who has revealed himself to the church by his word and works and seeking a knowledge of god not in his son but out of him or worshipping him otherwise than he has commanded in his word and not only so but they are also equally ignorant of the inward and spiritual obedience of the second table and whatever truth and excellence there is in these systems of religion it is nothing more than a part of the precepts of the second table in relation to the external deportment of the life and the civil duties which men owe to each other fourthly it is only in the church that the gospel of christ is fully taught and rightly understood for the various sects such as the ethnics the philosophers jews and turks are either entirely ignorant of it and thus reject it or else they add to their errors what little they have culled from the doctrine of the apostles the use of which however they do not properly apprehend nor understand as is true of the arians papists anabaptists and all other heretics some of whom hold errors concerning the person and others concerning the office of christ the mediator these great distinctions prove that the doctrine of the church alone should be taught and held fast to whilst the doctrines and religious systems of the sects which oppose the truth should be rejected and shunned as the perversions and wicked devices of the devil according as it is said beware of false prophets and keep yourselves from idols matthew seven verse fifteen one john five verse twenty one it is however different with philosophy 
true philosophy, although it also differs very much from the doctrine of the church, yet it does not array itself against it, nor is it a wicked fabrication and device of Satan, as is true of the false doctrines of the sects, but it contains truth, and is, as it were, a certain ray of the wisdom of God, impressed upon the mind of man in his creation. It is a doctrine that has respect to God and his creatures, and many other things that are good and profitable to mankind, and has been drawn out from the light of nature, and from principles in themselves clear and evident, and reduced to a system by wise and earnest men. It follows, therefore, that it is not only lawful but also profitable for Christians to devote themselves to the study of philosophy, whilst on the other hand it is not proper for them to devote themselves to the study of the various doctrines of the sects, because these are all to be detested and avoided as the wicked devices of the devil. Philosophy and the doctrine of the church differ especially in the following respects. First, in their principles, philosophy is altogether natural and is constructed and based upon principles deduced from nature. And although there are many things in the doctrine of the church which may be known from nature, yet the chief and principal part of it, which is the gospel, is so far beyond and above nature that unless the Son of God had revealed it unto us from the bosom of the Father, no wisdom of men or of angels could have discovered it. Secondly, they differ in their subjects, for whilst the doctrine of the church comprehends the true sense and meaning of the law and gospel, philosophy is entirely ignorant of the gospel, omits the most important parts of the law, and explains very obscurely and imperfectly those parts which it embraces in relation to civil duties and the external deportment of the life, gathered from some few precepts of the Decalogue. And not only so, but philosophy also teaches some of the arts and sciences which are useful and profitable, such as logic, natural philosophy, and mathematics, which we do not find in the doctrine of the church, but which, nevertheless, have an important influence upon the interests of society when taught and understood. Thirdly, they differ in their effects. The doctrine of the church alone traces all the evils and miseries which are incident to man to their true source, which is to be found in the fall and disobedience of our first parents in paradise. It moreover ministers true and solid comfort to the conscience, pointing out the way by which we may escape the miseries of sin and death, and at the same time assures us of everlasting life through our Lord Jesus Christ. But philosophy is ignorant of the true cause of all our evils, and can neither bestow nor direct us to that comfort which can satisfy the desires of the human heart. There are, however, certain comforts which are common both to philosophy and theology, among which we may mention the doctrine of the providence of God, the necessity of obeying the law, a good conscience, the excellency of virtue, the ultimate designs which virtue proposes, the examples of others, the hope of reward, and a comparison of the different events and circumstances of life. But those greater and more precious comforts, by which the soul is sustained and supported, when exposed to the dreadful evils of sin and death, are peculiar to the church, and consist in the free remission of sin, by and for the sake of Christ, the grace and presence of God under these evils, together with final deliverance and eternal life. But, although true philosophy may be insufficient to meet the full demands of our moral nature, and although it may be imperfect as compared with theology, yet it does not oppose and array itself against the doctrine of the church as though it were hostile to it. Hence, whatever erroneous sentiments, such as are in plain opposition to the truth of God's word, are found in the writings of different philosophers, and which are brought forward by heretics for the purpose of controverting and overthrowing the true sense of the scriptures, these are either not philosophical, being nothing more than the subtle devices of human ingenuity, and the very ulcers of true philosophy, as the opinion of Aristotle concerning the creation of the world, and that of Epicurus concerning the immortality of the soul, etc., or they are indeed philosophical, but inappropriately applied to theology. These distinctions between the doctrine of the church and that of other religions and of philosophy also should be observed and maintained for these reasons. First, that all the glory which properly belongs to God may be attributed to Him, which cannot be done unless we acknowledge and confess whatever He will have us to believe concerning Himself and His will, and unless we add nothing to these revelations which He has been pleased to make of Himself, for God cannot be joined with idols, neither can His truth be mingled with the lies and falsehood of Satan without casting the greatest reproach upon His name. 
Secondly, that we may not endanger our salvation, which might occur if we were to be deceived and embrace philosophy or the teaching of some one of the sects, for the true religion. Thirdly, that our faith and comfort may be increased by seeing the superior excellency of the doctrine of the Church to the teachings of all other systems of religion, and how many things are found in the religion of the Bible which are wholly wanting in all others, and why it is that only those who confess and hold to the teachings of the word of God are saved, whilst all the various sects, with their adherents, are condemned and rejected of God. Finally, that we may separate ourselves from the Epicureans and academics, who either despise everything like godliness, or so pervert it, as to suppose that every man who professes some form of religion will be saved, thus interpreting the declaration of the Apostle when he says, The just shall live by his faith, Romans 1, verse 17. Now, as far as it respects these Epicureans, they are not worthy of being refuted, and as for the academics, they evidently wrest the declaration of the Apostle from its proper signification, and may therefore easily be refuted, for the pronoun his never signifies that faith which any man may imagine or frame for himself, but it signifies the true Catholic faith, peculiar to every one who has embraced the gospel of Christ. And thus it opposes the faith of every other man, even though it be true, and also the doctrine of justification by works. Hence the true sense of the passage of Scripture is, the just man is justified not by the works of the law, but only by faith in Christ, and that by his own peculiar faith, and not by the faith of another man. Fourth, what are the evidences by which the truth of the Christian religion or the doctrine of the Church is confirmed? There are a great number of arguments which go to establish the truth and certainty of the teachings of the Church, some of which convince the conscience, as is the case with the first thirteen which we here subjoin, whilst those which follow incline and convert the heart. These arguments we shall present in the following order. 1. The purity and perfection of the law. It is not possible that that religion should be true and divine which either invents and tolerates idols, or approves of the forms of wickedness which are in plain opposition to the law of God and the judgment of sound reason. Now all the different forms of religion except that which has been revealed in the sacred scriptures and which is received and acknowledged by the church evidently do this. For all of them, as has already been said, either entirely abrogate the first table of the Decalogue, which has respect to the one true God and his worship, or they shamefully corrupt it, whilst they at the same time retain only a small part of the second table, relating to external propriety and civil duties. It is only the church that retains both tables of the Decalogue, entire and uncorrupted, according to the Scriptures. Hence it is only the doctrine of the church that is true and divine. 2. The same may be argued from the Gospel, which points out the only way of escape and deliverance from sin and death, for, most assuredly, that doctrine and religion is true and divine, which reveals a method of deliverance from these great evils, without doing any violence to the justice of God, and which administers solid comfort to the conscience in relation to everlasting life. Now, as the doctrine of the Church is the only system of religious truth that has ever discovered and proclaimed a way of deliverance from the evils of sin and death, which alone affords real and substantial comfort to the conscience, it must be true and divine." 3. The great antiquity of this doctrine affords evidence of its truth, for no other system of religious truth, besides that which we have delivered in the Holy Scriptures, can trace its origin to God, and prove its certain and continual descent from the beginning of the world. All the various histories of the world unite their testimony with that of sacred history, in affirming that all other religions took their origin subsequent to this, and are new in comparison with it. Inasmuch, therefore, as the most ancient religion challenges the highest regard, and has the strongest evidence of truth, for men ordinarily receive and regard the first religion as having come immediately from God, it follows that the doctrine of the Church alone is true and divine. 4. The miracles by which God confirmed the truth of this doctrine, from the beginning of the world, bear testimony to its divine character which miracles the devil cannot imitate, even as far as it has respect to their external appearance, such as the raising of the dead, making the sun stand still and go backward, the dividing of the sea and rivers, making the barren fruitful, and others of a similar character, all of which bear the strongest testimony of the truth and divine character of this doctrine, inasmuch as they were wrought by God, 
who could not bear such testimony to what is false, for the confirmation of those things which were spoken by the prophets and apostles. 5. The prophecies and predictions, of which there are very many, both in the Old and New Testament, that have received a most complete and exact fulfilment, establish, in the most satisfactory and conclusive manner, the divine character of the teachings of the Church, inasmuch as no one but God can utter such declarations. 6. The harmony of the different parts of the doctrine of the Church is an evidence of its truth. That doctrine which contradicts itself can neither be true nor from God, since truth is in perfect harmony with itself, and God cannot contradict himself. And as all other religions, except that which is taught in the writings of the prophets and apostles, differ very much from and among each other, even in points which are regarded chief and fundamental, this alone which harmonizes so fully and perfectly in all its various parts, must be true and from God. 7. The acknowledgment of the superior excellency of the Christian religion by its enemies may be urged as an argument in favour of its truth. The devil himself was constrained to confess, Thou art Christ, the Son of God. Luke 4, verse 41. Other enemies have also been repeatedly induced to bear testimony to the superior excellency of the teachings of the Church. Yea, it may be said that whatever goodness and truth may be found in other religions, the same is also contained in the religion of the Bible, only much more clearly and fully, and it may very easily be shown that they have borrowed these things from the teachings of the Church, and that they have commingled them with their own inventions, as the devil himself is accustomed, as an imitator of God, to unite certain truths with his falsehoods, that he may thus the more easily deceive men. Therefore, those things which the various sects have in common with the teachings of the Church are not to be opposed because they have borrowed them from us, but those things which are in opposition to the doctrine of the Church may easily be refuted, since they are nothing more than the inventions of men. 8. The malignity of Satan and his various emissaries against the doctrine of the Church is an evidence of its truth, for most assuredly that religion is true and from God which the devil and wicked men, with one mind and purpose, despise and endeavour to destroy. Truth generally calls forth opposition from the wicked, and the devil, we are told, was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth. Now it is manifestly true that the world and Satan do not hate and impugn any other doctrine so violently as that of the church, which results from this that it reproves them more sharply, calls their errors in question, exposes their fallacies and frauds, and more severely condemns all their idols and vices, than the various sects which connive at these things, and even, in many instances, defend them. The world hateth me, because I testify of it, that the works thereof are evil. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, therefore it hateth you. John 7, verse 7, chapter 15, verse 19. 9. The wonderful protection and preservation of this doctrine, notwithstanding the malice and rage of Satan and other enemies, is a proof of its truth, for since no other religion has been so fiercely and constantly assailed by tyrants and heretics as that of the Church, which God has, notwithstanding, wonderfully protected against the rage of its enemies and the gates of hell, so that it alone remains to the present time, to the astonishment of the world, whilst other religions in the meanwhile have degenerated and disappeared from the earth, with little or no opposition, we may therefore safely conclude that the doctrine of the Church is approved of and cared for on the part of God, or else he would never have extended to it the protection which he has. 10. The punishments and various judgments which God has at different times inflicted upon the enemies of the Church declare the divine character of her teachings. For that religion is doubtless from God, against which no one can array himself with impunity, which may be said to be true, as all history testifies, of that system of religion delivered in the writings of the prophets and apostles, and, although the wicked may often prosper in the world, and the church seem to be trodden under foot, yet this does not come to pass, as the final issue of these events abundantly testifies, and as the scriptures everywhere teach, by mere chance, or because God has greater pleasure in the wicked than in the church, for the church is always preserved, even amidst the greatest persecutions, and at length obtains deliverance from her most violent oppressors, whilst, on the other hand, the short season of prosperity and triumph of cruel tyrants and wicked men is followed by a most awful destruction. 
nor is the force of this argument weakened because all the persecutors of the church are not in this life punished in the same tragical manner as antiochus herod and others for whilst god for the most part avenges himself upon his enemies in this life he declares plainly enough by these judgments what he will have us think of others of a similar character who are not thus severely punished viz that he regards them as his enemies and will cast them into everlasting punishment unless they repent and seek his favour eleven the testimony and constancy of martyrs who testified in the midst of the most excruciating pains that they did truly believe as they taught that they were most firmly persuaded in their hearts of the truth of the doctrine which they professed and that they drew from it that comfort which they had preached unto others that they were indeed the sons of god for the sake of christ and that god had a care for them even in the midst of death may be regarded as an evidence of the truth of the christian religion because god by sustaining and supporting them with the precious consolations of the gospel declared that he approved of the doctrines on account of which they were thus called to suffer twelve the piety and holiness of those who wrote the holy scriptures and professed the doctrine contained therein is a strong confirmation of its truth for that religion which makes men holy and acceptable to god must itself necessarily be holy and divine now as the patriarchs prophets apostles and others who have as well as those who now sincerely embrace and believe this doctrine greatly excel the adherents of other religions in virtue and practical piety as every one may most clearly see who will but make a proper comparison we may reasonably conclude that the teachings of the church have stronger and more satisfactory evidences of truth and certainty than those of any other system of religion that has ever been devised thirteen the candour and honesty which those whom the holy spirit employed in committing this doctrine to writing in speaking of and condemning their own faults as well as those of others may be urged as an argument in favour of the truth of what they wrote lastly we may mention in confirmation of the truth of this doctrine the testimony of the holy ghost by whose inspiration the scriptures were given by this testimony we mean a strong and lively faith and a firm persuasion wrought in the hearts of the faithful by the holy spirit that the scriptures are the word of god and that god will be gracious to us according to what is affirmed in the scriptures which faith is followed by love to god and a calling upon his name with an assured hope of obtaining everything that is necessary for our comfort here and in the world to come everlasting life this assurance and abiding consolation of the godly does not rest upon the testimony of man nor of any other creature but upon that of god and is the proper effect of the holy spirit as such it is experienced by all those who truly believe in whom it is also strengthened and confirmed by that same spirit through the reading hearing and study of the doctrine delivered by the prophets and apostles hence it is chiefly by the testimony of the holy ghost that all those who are converted to christ are confirmed in the truth of this heavenly doctrine and have it sealed upon their hearts this argument being also applicable to the unregenerate does not only convince their consciences of the truth and authority of the holy scriptures but it also moves and inclines their hearts to assent to this doctrine and to receive it as the truth of god this argument therefore is the most important of all those which we have advanced for unless those which precede this be accompanied with the inward testimony of the holy spirit they only convince the conscience and stop the mouths of gainsayers but do not move or incline the heart fifth what are the various methods of teaching and learning the doctrine of the church the method of teaching and studying theology is threefold the first is the system of catechetical instruction or that method which comprises a brief summary and simple exposition of the principal doctrines of the christian religion which is called catechizing this method is of the greatest importance to all because it is equally necessary for all the learned as well as the unlearned to know what constitutes the foundation of true religion the second method is the consideration and discussion of subjects of a general and more difficult character or the commonplaces as they are called which contain a more lengthy explanation of every single point and of difficult questions with their definitions divisions and arguments this method belongs more appropriately to theological schools and is necessary first that those who are educated in these schools and who may afterwards be called to teach in the church may more easily and fully understand the whole system of theology for as it is in other things so it is also in the study of divinity our knowledge of it is obtained slowly and with great difficulty 
yea our knowledge of it must necessarily remain confused and imperfect unless every separate part of this doctrine be taught in some systematic form so as to be perceived and understood by the mind secondly that those who are students of theology may when they are called to act as teachers in the church be able to present clearly and systematically the substance of the entire doctrine of god's word to do this it is necessary that they themselves should first have a complete system or framework as it were of this doctrine in their own mind thirdly it is necessary for the purpose of discovering and determining the true and natural interpretation of the scriptures which requires a clear and full knowledge of every part of the doctrine of the church in order that this interpretation may be in accordance with the analogy of faith so that the scriptures may be made to harmonize throughout lastly it is necessary for the purpose of enabling us to form a proper decision in regard to the controversies of the church which are various difficult and dangerous lest we be drawn from the truth into error and falsehood the third method of the study of theology is the careful and diligent reading of the scriptures or sacred text this is the highest method in the study of the doctrine of the church to attain this the two former methods are to be studied that we may be well prepared for the reading understanding and exposition of the holy scriptures for as the doctrine of the catechism and commonplaces are taken out of the scriptures and are directed by them as their rule so they again lead us as it were by the hand to the scriptures the catechism of which we shall speak in these lectures belongs to the first method of the study of theology section two special prolegomena special prolegomena with reference to the catechism the special prolegomena with reference to catechizing are five first what is catechizing or the system of catechization second has it always been practised in the church or what is its origin third what are the principal parts thereof fourth why is it necessary fifth what is its design first what is catechization the greek word katechesis is derived from katecheo as katechismos is from katechizo both words according to their common signification mean to sound to resound to instruct by word of mouth and to repeat the sayings of another katecheo more properly however signifies to teach the first principles and rudiments of some particular doctrine as applied to the doctrine of the church and as understood when thus used it means to teach the first principles of the christian religion in which sense it occurs in luke one verse four acts eighteen verse twenty five galatians six verse six etc hence catechization in its most general and comprehensive sense means the first brief and elementary instruction which is given by word of mouth in relation to the rudiments of any particular doctrine but as used by the church it signifies a system of instruction relating to the first principles of the christian religion designed for the ignorant and unlearned the system of catechizing therefore includes a short simple and plain exposition and rehearsal of the christian doctrine deduced from the writings of the prophets and apostles and arranged in the form of questions and answers adapted to the capacity and comprehension of the ignorant and unlearned or it is a brief summary of the doctrine of the prophets and apostles communicated orally to such as are unlearned which they again are required to repeat in the primitive church those who learnt the catechism were called catechumens by which it was meant that they were already in the church and were instructed in the first principles of the christian religion there were two classes of these catechumens the first were those of adult age who were converts to christianity from the jews and gentiles but were not as yet baptized persons of this description were first instructed in the catechism after which they were baptized and admitted to the lord's supper such a catechumen was augustine after his conversion to christianity from manichaeism and wrote many books while he was a catechumen and before he was baptized by ambrose ambrose was also a catechumen of this sort when he was chosen bishop the urgent necessity of which arose from the peculiar state and condition of the church of milan upon which the arians were making inroads under other and ordinary circumstances the apostle paul forbids a novice or catechumen to be chosen to the office of a bishop one timothy three verse six the neophytu spoken of by paul were those catechumens who were not yet or very lately had been baptized for the greek word which in our translation is rendered a novice according to its literal significance means a new plant that is a new hearer and a disciple of the church the other class of catechumens included the small children of the church or the children of christian parents 
these children, very soon after their birth, were baptized, being regarded as members of the church, and after they had grown a little older, they were instructed in the catechism, which, having learned, they were confirmed by the laying on of hands, and were dismissed from the class of catechumens, and were then permitted, with those of riper years, to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Those who are desirous of seeing more in regard to these catechumens are referred to the ecclesiastical history of Eusebius, the tenth book, and latter part of the fourth chapter. Those who taught the catechism or instructed these catechumens were called catechists. Second, what is the origin of catechization, and has it always been practised in the church? The same thing may be said of the origin of catechization, which is said of the whole economy or service of the church, that it was instituted by God himself, and has always been practised in the church. For since, from the very beginning of the world, God has been the God not only of those of adult age, but also of those of young and tender years, according to the covenant which he made with Abraham, saying, I will be a God unto thee, and thy seed after thee. Genesis 17, verse 7. He has also ordained that both classes should be instructed in the doctrine of salvation according to their capacity, the adults by the public voice of the ministry, and the children by being catechized in the family and school. As it respects the institution designed for the instruction of adults, the case is clear and admits of no doubt. Touching the catechization of children in the Jewish church, the Old Testament abounds in many explicit commands. In the twelfth and thirteenth chapters of Exodus, God commands the Jews to give particular instruction to their children and families in relation to the institution and benefits of the Passover. In the fourth chapter of the book of Deuteronomy, he enjoins it upon parents to repeat to their children the entire history of the law which he had given them. In the sixth chapter of the same book, he requires that the doctrine of the unity of God and of perfect love to him should be inculcated and impressed upon the minds of their children, and in the eleventh he commands them to explain the Decalogue to their children. Hence, under the Old Testament dispensation, children were taught in the family by their parents, and in the schools by the teachers of religion, the principal things contained in the prophets, viz. such as respects God, the law, the promise of the gospel, the use of the sacraments and sacrifices, which were types of the Messiah that was to come, and of the benefits which he was to purchase. For there can be no doubt but that the schools of the prophets, Elijah, Elisha, etc., were established for this very purpose. It was also with this design that God delivered his law in the short and condensed form in which it is, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, etc., and thy neighbour as thyself. So also, as it respects the gospel, it was briefly comprehended in the promises, The seed of the woman shall bruise the serpent's head, and in thy seed shall all the nations be blessed. They had likewise sacrifices, prayers, and other things which God required Abraham and his posterity to teach their children and families. Hence it is that this doctrine is presented in such a plain and simple form as to meet the capacity of children, and such as are unlearned. In the New Testament we are told that Christ laid his hands upon little children, and blessed them, and commanded them that they should be brought unto him. Hence he says in Mark 10 verse 14, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. That the catechization of children was diligently attended to in the times of the apostles is evident from the example of Timothy, of whom it is said that he knew the Holy Scriptures from a little child, and from what is said in the epistle to the Hebrews, where mention is made of some of the principal heads included in the catechization of the apostles, such as repentance from dead works, and of faith towards God, of the doctrine of baptism, and of laying on of hands, and of resurrection from the dead, and of eternal judgment, which the apostle terms milk for babes. These and similar points of doctrine were required from the catechumens of adult age at the time of their baptism, and of children at the time of their confirmation, by the laying on of hands. Hence the apostle calls them the doctrine of baptism and laying on of hands. So likewise the fathers wrote short summaries of doctrine, some fragments of which may still be seen in the papal church. Eusebius writes of Origen that he restored the custom of catechizing in Alexandria, which had been suffered to grow out of use during the times of persecution. Socrates writes thus in relation to the system of catechizing in the primitive church. Quote, Our form of catechizing, says he, is in accordance with the mode which we have received from the bishops who have preceded us, and according as we were taught when we laid the foundation of faith and were baptized, and according as we have learnt from the scriptures, etc. End quote. Pope Gregory caused images and idols to be placed in the churches that they might serve as books for the laity and children. 
after this period the doctrine of the church through the negligence of the bishops and the subtlety of the romish priests became gradually more and more corrupt and the custom of catechizing grew more and more into disuse until at length it was changed into the ridiculous ceremony which to this day they call confirmation so much concerning the origin and practice of catechization in the church third what are the parts or principal heads of the doctrine of the catechism the chief and most important parts of the first principles of the doctrine of the church as appears from the passage just quoted from the epistle to the hebrews are repentance and faith in christ which we may regard as synonymous with the law and gospel hence the catechism in its primary and most general sense may be divided as the doctrine of the church into the law and gospel it does not differ from the doctrine of the church as it respects the subject and matter of which it treats but only in the form and manner in which these things are presented just as strong meat designed for adults to which the doctrine of the church may be compared does not differ in essence from the milk and meat prepared for children to which the catechism is compared by paul in the passage already referred to these two parts are termed by the great mass of men the decalogue and the apostles creed because the decalogue comprehends the substance of the law and the apostles creed that of the gospel another distinction made by this same class of persons is that of the doctrine of faith and works or the doctrine of those things which are to be believed and those which are to be done there are others who divide the catechism into these three parts considering in the first place the doctrine respecting god then the doctrine respecting his will and lastly that respecting his works which they distinguish as the works of creation preservation and redemption but all these different parts are treated of either in the law or the gospel or in both so that this division may easily be reduced to the former there are others again who make the catechism consist of five different parts the decalogue the apostles creed baptism the lord's supper and prayer of which the decalogue was delivered immediately by god himself whilst the other parts were delivered immediately either through the manifestation of the son of god in the flesh as is true of the lord's prayer baptism and the eucharist or through the ministry of the apostles as is true of the apostles creed but all these different parts may also be reduced to the two general heads noticed in the first division the decalogue contains the substance of the law the apostles creed that of the gospel the sacraments are parts of the gospel and may therefore be embraced in it as far as they are seals of the grace which it promises but as far as they are testimonies of our obedience to god they have the nature of sacrifices and pertain to the law whilst prayer in like manner may be referred to the law being a part of the worship of god the catechism of which we shall speak in these lectures consists of three parts the first treats of the misery of man the second of his deliverance from this misery and the third of gratitude which division does not in reality differ from the above because all the parts which are there specified are embraced in these three general heads the decalogue belongs to the first part in as far as it is the mirror through which we are brought to see ourselves and thus led to a knowledge of our sins and misery and to the third part in as far as it is the rule of true thankfulness and of a christian life the apostles creed is embraced in the second part inasmuch as it unfolds the way of deliverance from sins the sacraments belonging to the doctrine of faith and being the seals that are attached thereto belong in like manner to this second part of the catechism which treats of deliverance from the misery of man and prayer being the chief part of spiritual worship and of thankfulness may with great propriety be referred to the third general part fourth why is it necessary to introduce and teach the catechism in the church this necessity may be urged one because it is the command of god you shall teach them to your children etc deuteronomy eleven verse nineteen two because of the divine glory which demands that god be not only rightly known and worshipped by those of adult age but also by children according as it is said out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength psalm eight verse two three on account of our comfort and salvation for without a true knowledge of god and his son jesus christ no one that has attained to years of discretion and understanding can be saved or have any sure comfort that he is accepted in the sight of god hence it is said this is life eternal that they might know thee the only true god and jesus christ whom thou hast sent and again without faith it is impossible to please god john seventeen verse three hebrews eleven verse six 
and not only so, but no one believes on him of whom he knows nothing, or has not heard, for how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, verses 14 and 17. It is necessary, therefore, for all those who will be saved to lay hold of and embrace the doctrine of Christ, which is the chief and fundamental doctrine of the gospel. But in order that this may be done, there must be instructions imparted to this effect, and, of necessity, some brief and simple form of doctrine suited and adapted to the young, and such as are unlearned. For, for the preservation of society and the church, all past history proves that religion and the worship of God, the exercise and practice of piety, honesty, justice, and truth, are of the greatest importance to the well-being and perpetuation of the church and of the commonwealth. But it is in vain that we look for these things among barbarous nations, since they have never been known to produce the fruits of piety and virtue. Hence there is a necessity that we should be trained to the practice of these things from our earliest years, because the heart of man is depraved and evil from his youth. Yea, such is the corruption of our nature, that unless we early commence the work of reformation and moral training, we too late apply a remedy, when, through long delay, the evil principles and inclinations of the heart have become so strengthened and confirmed as to bid defiance to the restraints we may then wish to impose upon them. If we are not correctly instructed in our childhood out of the sacred scriptures concerning God and His will, and do not then commence the practice of piety, it is with great difficulty, if ever, we are drawn away from these errors which are, as it were, born in us, or which we have imbibed from our youth, and that we are led to abandon the vices in which we have been brought up, and to which we have been accustomed. If, therefore, the church and state are to be preserved from degeneracy and final destruction, it is of the utmost importance that this depravity of our nature should in due time be met with proper restraints, and be subdued. 5. There is a necessity that all persons should be made acquainted with the rule and standard according to which we are to judge and decide in relation to the various opinions and dogmas of men, that we may not be led into error and be seduced thereby, according to the commandment which is given in relation to this subject, beware of false prophets, prove all things, try the spirits, whether they are of God, Matthew 7, verse 15, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21, 1 John 4, verse 1. But the law and the apostles' creed, which are the chief parts of the catechism, constitute the rule and standard according to which we are to judge of the opinions of men, from which we may see the great importance of a familiar acquaintance with them. 6. Those who have properly studied and learnt the catechism are generally better prepared to understand and appreciate the sermons which they hear from time to time, inasmuch as they can easily refer and reduce those things which they hear out of the word of God to the different heads of the catechism to which they appropriately belong, whilst, on the other hand, those who have not enjoyed this preparatory training hear sermons, for the most part, with but little profit to themselves. 7. The importance of catechization may be urged in view of its peculiar adaptedness to those learners who are of weak and uncultivated minds, who require instruction in a short, plain, and perspicuous manner, as we have it in the catechism, and would not, on account of their youth and weakness of capacity, be able to understand it, if presented in a lengthy and more difficult form. 8. It is also necessary for the purpose of distinguishing and separating the youths and such as are unlearned, from schismatics and profane heathen, which can most effectually be done by a judicious course of catechetical instruction. Lastly, a knowledge of the catechism is especially important for those who are to act as teachers, because they ought to have a more intimate acquaintance with the doctrine of the church than others, as well on account of their calling, that they may one day be able to instruct others, as on account of the many facilities which they have for obtaining a knowledge of this doctrine, which it becomes them diligently to improve, that they may, like Timothy, become well acquainted with the Holy Scriptures, and be good ministers of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of a good doctrine, whereunto they have attained. 1 Timothy 4, verse 6. To these considerations, which clearly show the importance of catechization, we may add many others of great weight, especially with the great mass of mankind, such as the arguments which may be drawn from the end of our creation, and from the prolongation and preservation of our lives from childhood to youth, and from youth to manhood, etc. We might also speak of the excellency of the object of the doctrine of the Catechism, which is the highest good, even God himself, 
and might show the effect of such a course of instruction, which is a knowledge of this highest good, and a participation therein, which is something vastly more important and desirable than all the treasures of this world. This is that pearl of great price hidden in the field of the church, concerning which Christ speaks in Matthew 13, verse 44, and on account of which Christians in former times suffered martyrdom with their little children. We may here refer to the example of Origen, of which we have an account in the sixth book and third chapter of the Ecclesiastical History of Eusebius. So the fourth book and sixteenth chapter of the History of Theodoret may be read to the same purpose. But if we are ignorant of the doctrine and glory of Christ, who from among us would be willing to suffer on their account? And how can it be otherwise, but that we will be ignorant of these things, unless we are taught and instructed in them from our childhood? A neglect of the catechism is, therefore, one of the chief causes why there are so many at the present day tossed about by every wind of doctrine, and why so many fall from Christ to Antichrist. Fifth, what is the design of the catechism and of the doctrine of the church? The design of the doctrine of the catechism is our comfort and salvation. Our salvation consists in the enjoyment of the highest good. Our comfort comprises the assurance and confident expectation of the full and perfect enjoyment of this highest good in the life to come, with a beginning and foretaste of it already in this life. This highest good is that which makes all those truly blessed who are in the enjoyment of it, whilst those who have it not are miserable and wretched. What this only comfort is, to which it is the design of the Catechism to lead us, will be explained in the first question, to which we now proceed without making any further introductory remarks. Section 3 of True Christian Comfort First Lord's Day, Question 1, What is thy only comfort in life and death? Answer, that I, with body and soul, both in life and death, am not my own, but belong unto my faithful Saviour Jesus Christ, who, with his precious blood, hath fully satisfied for all my sins, and delivered me from all the power of the devil, and so preserves me that, without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head, yea, that all things must be subservient to my salvation, and therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life, and makes me sincerely willing and ready henceforth to live unto him. Exposition the question of comfort is placed and treated first because it embodies the design and substance of the catechism. The design is that we may be led to the attainment of sure and solid comfort, both in life and death. On this account all divine truth has been revealed by God, and is especially to be studied by us. The substance of this comfort consists in this, that we are ingrafted into Christ by faith, that through him we are reconciled to and beloved of God, that thus he may care for and save us eternally. Concerning this comfort we must inquire first what is it, second in how many parts does it consist, third why is it alone solid and sure, fourth why is it necessary, fifth how many things are necessary for its attainment. First what is comfort? Comfort is that which results from a certain process of reasoning in which we oppose something good to something evil, that by a proper consideration of this good we may mitigate our grief and patiently endure the evil. The good, therefore, which we oppose to the evil must necessarily be great and certain in proportion to the magnitude of the evil with which it is contrasted. And as consolation is here to be sought against the greatest evil, which is sin and eternal death, it is not possible that anything short of the highest good can be a sufficient remedy for it. Without the word of God, however, to direct and reveal the truth, there are almost as many opinions entertained as to what this highest good is, as there are men. The Epicureans place it in sensual pleasure, the Stoics in a proper regulation and moderation of the affections, or in the habit of virtue, the Platonists in ideas, the Peripatetics in exercise of virtue, whilst the ordinary class of men place it in honours, riches, and pleasure. But all these things are transitory, and are either lost already in life, or they are at best interrupted and left behind in the hour of death. But the highest good after which we seek never fades away, no, not in death. It is true indeed that the honour of virtue is immortal, and as the poet says, survives men's funerals, but it is rather with others than with ourselves. And it has been well said by a certain one that virtues cannot be considered the highest good, since we have them witnesses of our calamities. 
hypocrites both within and without the church as jews pharisees and mohammedans seek a remedy against death in their own merits in outward forms and ceremonies the papists do the same thing but mere external rites can neither cleanse nor quiet the consciences of men nor will god be mocked with such offerings therefore although philosophy and all the various sects inquire after and promise such a good as that which affords solid comfort to man both in life and death yet they neither have nor can bestow that which is necessary to meet the demands of our moral nature it is only the doctrine of the church that presents such a good and that imparts a comfort that quiets and satisfies the conscience for it alone uncovers the fountain of all the miseries to which the human race is subject and reveals the only way of escape through christ this therefore is that christian comfort spoken of in this question of the catechism which is an only and solid comfort both in life and death a comfort consisting in the assurance of the free remission of sin and of reconciliation with god by and on account of christ and a certain expectation of eternal life impressed upon the heart by the holy spirit through the gospel so that we have no doubt but that we are the property of christ and are beloved of god for his sake and saved for ever according to the declaration of the apostle paul who shall separate us from the love of christ shall tribulation or distress etc romans eight verse thirty five second of how many parts does this comfort consist this comfort consists of six parts one our reconciliation with god through christ so that we are no longer the enemies but the sons of god neither are we our own but we belong to christ one corinthians seven verse twenty three two the manner of our reconciliation with god through the blood of christ that is through his passion death and satisfaction for our sins one peter one verse eighteen one john one verse seven three deliverance from the miseries of sin and death christ does not only reconcile us to god but he also delivers us from the power of the devil so that sin death and satan have no power over us hebrews two verse fourteen one john three verse eight four the constant preservation of our reconciliation deliverance and whatever other benefits christ has once purchased for us we are his property therefore he watches over us as his own so that not so much as a hair can fall from our heads without the will of our heavenly father our safety does not lie in our own hands or strength for if it did we should lose it a thousand times every moment five the turning of all our evils into good the righteous are indeed afflicted in this life yea they are put to death and are as sheep for the slaughter yet these things do not injure them but rather contribute to their salvation because god turns all things to their advantage as it is said all things work together for good to them that love god romans eight verse twenty seven six our full persuasion and assurance of all these great benefits and of eternal life this assurance is obtained in the first place from the testimony of the holy spirit working in us true faith and conversion bearing witness with our spirits that we are the sons of god and that these blessings truly pertain to us because he is the earnest of our inheritance and secondly from the effects of true faith which we perceive to be in us such as true penitence and a firm persuasion to believe god and obey all his commandments for we are assured of having true faith when we have an earnest desire of obeying god and by faith we are persuaded of the love of god and eternal salvation this is the foundation of all the other parts of this consolation which we have specified and without which every other comfort is transient and unsatisfying amid the temptations of life the substance of our comfort therefore is briefly this that we are christ's and through him reconciled to the father that we may be beloved of him and saved the holy ghost and eternal life being given unto us third why is this comfort alone solid that this comfort alone is solid is evident first because it alone never fails no not in death for whether we live or die we are the lord's and who shall separate us from the love of christ romans fourteen verse eight chapter eight verse thirty five and secondly because it alone remains unshaken and sustains us under all the temptations of satan who often thus assails the christian one thou art a sinner to this comfort replies christ has satisfied for my sins and redeemed me with his own precious blood so that i am no longer my own but belong to him two but thou art a child of wrath and an enemy of god answer i am indeed such by nature and before my reconciliation but i have been reconciled to god and received into his favour through christ three but thou shalt surely die 
answer christ has redeemed me from the power of death and i know that through him i shall come forth from death unto eternal life four but many evils in the meantime befall the righteous answer but our lord defends and preserves us unto them and makes them work together for our good five but what if thou fall from the grace of christ for thou mayest sin and faint for it is a long and difficult road to heaven answer christ has not only merited and conferred his benefits upon me but he also continually preserves me in them and grants me perseverance that i may neither faint nor fall from his grace six but what if his grace does not extend to thee and thou art not of the number of those who are the lord's answer but i know that grace does extend to me and that i am christ's because the holy spirit bears witness with my spirit that i am a child of god and because i have true faith for the promise is general extending to all them that believe seven but what if thou hast not true faith answer i know that i have true faith from the effects thereof because i have a conscience at peace with god and an earnest desire and will to believe and obey the lord eight but thy faith is weak and thy conversion imperfect answer yet it is nevertheless true and unfeigned that i have the blessed assurance that to him that hath shall be given lord i believe help thou mine unbelief luke nineteen verse twenty six mark nine verse twenty four in this most severe and dangerous conflict which all the children of god experience christian consolation remains immovable and at length concludes therefore christ with all his benefits pertains even to me fourth why is this comfort necessary from what has been said it is clearly manifest that this comfort is necessary for us first on account of our salvation that we may neither faint nor despair under our temptations and the conflict in which we are all called to engage as christians and secondly it is necessary on account of praising and worshipping god for if we would glorify god in this and in a future life for which we were created we must be delivered from sin and death and not rush into desperation but be sustained even to the end with sure consolation fifth how many things are necessary for the attainment of this comfort this proposition is considered in the following question of the catechism to which we refer the reader question two how many things are necessary for thee to know that thou enjoying this comfort mayest live and die happy answer three the first how great my sins and miseries are the second how i may be delivered from all my sins and miseries the third how i shall express my gratitude to god for such deliverance exposition this question contains the statement and division of the whole catechism and at the same time accords with the division of the scriptures into the law and gospel and with the differences of these parts as they have already been explained first a knowledge of our misery is necessary for our comfort not that it of itself administers any consolation or is any part of it for of itself it rather alarms than comforts but it is necessary first because it excites in us the desire of deliverance just as a knowledge of disease awakens a desire of medicine on the part of the sick where there is no knowledge of our misery there is no deliverance sought just as the man who is ignorant of his disease never inquires after the physician now if we do not desire deliverance we do not seek it and if we do not seek it we will never obtain it because god gives it only to those who seek and knock as it is said to him that knocketh it shall be opened ask and it shall be given unto you blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness come unto me all ye that labour and are heavy laden i dwell with him that is of a contrite and humble spirit matthew seven verse six chapter five verse six chapter eleven verse twenty eight isaiah fifty seven verse fifteen that now which is necessary for the purpose of exciting in us a desire of deliverance is also necessary for our comfort but a knowledge of our misery is necessary for the purpose of creating in us the desire of deliverance therefore it is necessary for our consolation not indeed as being in its own nature the cause but as a motive without which we would not seek it for in itself it terrifies yet this terror is advantageous when it leads to the exercise of faith secondly that we may be thankful to god for our deliverance we should be ungrateful if we did not know the greatness of the evil from which we have been delivered because in this case we could not correctly estimate the magnitude of the blessing and so would not obtain deliverance since this is granted only to such as are thankful thirdly because without the knowledge of our sinfulness and misery we cannot hear the gospel with profit 
for unless by the preaching of the law as touching sin and the wrath of god a preparation be made for the proclamation of grace a carnal security follows and our comfort becomes unstable sure consolation cannot stand in connection with carnal security hence it is manifest that we must commence with the preaching of the law after the example of the prophets and apostles that men may thus be cast down from the conceit of their own righteousness and may obtain a knowledge of themselves and be led to true repentance unless this be done men will become through the preaching of grace more careless and obstinate and pearls will be cast before swine to be trodden under foot second a knowledge of our deliverance is necessary for our comfort first that we may not despair a knowledge of our misery would lead us to despair did not a way of deliverance present itself to us secondly that we may desire this deliverance an unknown good is not desired because what we have no knowledge of we cannot desire if we be ignorant therefore of the benefit of our deliverance we will not long after it and of course we will not obtain it yea if it were even offered to us or we were to fall upon it we would not embrace it thirdly that it may comfort us a good that is not known cannot impart any comfort fourthly that we may not devise another method of deliverance or embrace one invented by others and thereby cast a reproach upon the name of god and endanger our salvation fifthly that we may receive it by faith but faith cannot be without knowledge deliverance is also obtained by faith alone lastly that we may be thankful to god for as we do not desire an unknown good so we neither appreciate nor feel thankful for it but the benefit of deliverance is not given to the ungrateful god is pleased to confer it only upon those in whom it produces its proper effect which is gratitude for these reasons a knowledge of our deliverance what it is in what manner and by whom it is effected and bestowed etc is necessarily required that we may enjoy true and solid comfort this knowledge is obtained from the gospel as heard read and apprehended by faith because it alone promises deliverance to those that believe in christ third a knowledge of gratitude is necessary to our comfort first because god is pleased to grant deliverance only to the thankful it is only in such that his purpose is realized which is his glory and gratitude on our part gratitude is therefore the principal end and design of our deliverance for this purpose the son of god was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil he hath adopted us to the praise of the glory of his grace one john three verse eight ephesians one verse four secondly that we may return such gratitude as is acceptable to god who will not have us to be grateful under any other form than that which he has prescribed in his word true gratitude is therefore not to be rendered according to our own notion but is to be learnt from the word of god thirdly that we may know that whatever duties we perform towards god and our neighbour are not meritorious but are a declaration of our thankfulness for that which we do from gratitude we acknowledge we have not deserved lastly that our faith and comfort may be increased or that by this gratitude we may assure ourselves of our deliverance as we are made acquainted with the causes of things from their effects those who are grateful acknowledge and profess that they are certain of the good which they have received we may learn what true gratitude is in general from the gospel because it requires faith and repentance in order that we may be saved as it is said repent and believe the gospel for the kingdom of heaven is at hand mark one verse fifteen in the law however it is taught particularly because it distinctly declares what works and what manner of obedience is pleasing to god we must therefore necessarily treat of thankfulness in the catechism objection it is not necessary to teach that which follows of its own accord gratitude naturally follows a knowledge of our misery and deliverance therefore there is no necessity that it should be taught answer there is here an incorrect course of reasoning in supposing that to be true generally which is so only in part for it is not a just inference that because gratitude follows a knowledge of our deliverance from misery that the manner of it must also necessarily follow we are therefore to learn from the holy scriptures the nature of true gratitude and the manner in which it should be expressed so as to be pleasing and acceptable to god again the major proposition is not universally true for that also which follows of its own accord may be taught for the purpose of increasing our knowledge and confirming us therein and it is in this way that is through the revelation and knowledge of his word that god awakens increases and confirms in us true gratitude section four of the misery of man 
Whence knowest thou my misery? Second Lord's Day, the first general division of the Catechism concerning the misery of man. Question 3. Whence knowest thou thy misery? Answer, out of the law of God. Exposition. In this division of the Catechism, which treats of the misery of man, we are to consider principally the subject of sin, together with the effects or punishment of sin. Other subjects of a subordinate nature are connected with this, such as the creation of man, the image of God in man, the fall and first sin of man, original sin, the liberty of the will, and afflictions. In regard to our misery, we must consider in general what it is, whence, and how it may be known. The term misery is more comprehensive in its signification than that of sin, for it embraces the evil both of guilt and punishment. The evil of guilt is all sin. The evil of punishment is all affliction, torment, and destruction of our rational nature, as well as all subsequent sins also, by which those are punished that go before, as the numbering of the children of Israel, for instance, by David, was a sin, and at the same time the punishment of a preceding sin, viz. that of adultery and murder, with which he was chargeable, so that it included the evil both of guilt and punishment. The misery of man, therefore, is his wretched condition since the fall, consisting of these two great evils, first, that human nature is depraved, sinful, and alienated from God, and secondly, that on account of this depravity mankind are exposed to eternal condemnation, and deserve to be rejected of God. The knowledge of this, our misery, is derived out of the law of God, for through the law is the knowledge of sin, Romans 3, verse 20. The language of the law is cursed, be he that confirmeth not all the words of the law to do them, Deuteronomy 27, verse 26. The two following questions of the Catechism teach us how the law makes us acquainted with our misery. Question 4. What doth the law of God require of us? Answer. Christ teacheth us that briefly, Matthew 22, verses 37 and 40, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first and the great command, and the second is like to this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commands hang the whole law and the prophets. Exposition. Christ rehearses the substance of the law in Matthew 22, verse 37, and in Luke 10, verse 27, from Deuteronomy 6, verse 5, and Leviticus 19, verse 8. He explains what is meant by that declaration, Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them, that is, he who does not love God with all his heart, with all his soul, and with all his mind, and with all his strength, and his neighbor as himself. These several parts must be explained more fully. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. To love God with the whole heart is, upon a due acknowledgment of his infinite goodness, reverently to regard and esteem him as our highest good, to love him supremely, to rejoice and trust in him alone, and to prefer his glory to all other things, so that there may not be in us the least thought, inclination, or desire for anything that might be displeasing to him, yea, rather to be willing to suffer the loss of all things that may be dear to us, or to endure the heaviest calamity, than that we should be separated from communion with him, or offend him in the smallest manner, and lastly to direct all this to the end that he alone may be glorified by us. The Lord thy God. As if he would say, Thou shalt love that God, who is thy Lord and thy God, who has revealed himself unto thee, who confers his benefits upon thee, and to whose service thou art bound. There is here an opposition of the true God to false gods. With all thy heart. By the heart we are to understand the affections, desires, and inclinations. When God therefore requires our whole heart, he desires that he alone should be loved above everything else, that our whole heart should be stayed on him, and not that a part should be given to him and a part to another. In short, he wills that we make nothing equal to him, much less that we should prefer anything to him, or that we should be willing to share only a part of his love. To love God thus is what the Scripture calls walking before God with a perfect heart, the opposite of which is not to walk before God with a perfect heart, which is to halt, and not to surrender the whole person to him. Objection. God alone is to be loved, therefore our neighbors, parents, and kindred are not to be loved. Answer. This argument is false, because it proceeds from a denial of the manner to that of the thing itself. God alone is to be loved supremely and above everything else, that is, in such a manner that there may be nothing at all which we either prefer or put on an equality with him, and which we are not heartily willing to part with for his sake. 
but we ought to love our neighbours, parents, and others, not supremely, nor above everything else, nor in such a manner that we would rather offend God than our parents, but in subordination to and on account of God, and not above him, with all thy soul, the soul signifies that part of our being which wills, together with the exercise of the will, as if he would say, Thou shalt love with thy whole will and purpose, with all thy mind. The mind signifies the understanding, or that which perceives, as if he would say, As much as thou knowest of God, so much shalt thou love him. Thou shalt bend all thy thoughts, that thou mayest know God truly and perfectly, and so shalt thou also love him. We can love God only as far as we know Him. We now love Him imperfectly because we know Him only in part, but in the life to come we shall know Him perfectly, and shall therefore love Him perfectly, for that which is in part shall be done away. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 10 With all thy strength, this embraces all actions and exercises at the same time, both external and internal, that they may be in accordance with the law of God. This is the first and greatest commandment. The love of God is called the first commandment because all the others proceed from this as their source. It is the impelling, the efficient and final cause of obedience to all the other commandments of God. For we love our neighbor because we love God, and that we may manifest our love to God in the love which we cherish towards our neighbor. It is called the greatest commandment, one, because the object upon which it is immediately directed is the greatest, even God himself, Two, because it is the end to which all the other commandments look, for our entire obedience is designed to show forth our love to God and to honor his name. Three, because it is the principal worship of God which the ceremonial law subserved and to which it gave place. The Pharisees extolled the ceremonial law and worship above the moral, whilst Christ, on the other hand, calls love the greatest commandment and gives precedence to the moral law and worship because whatever was instituted under the ceremonial system was on account of love, and was designed to give place to it. Objection. The love of God is the greatest commandment, therefore it is greater than faith, and hence justifies, rather than faith. Answer. Love is here to be understood as including the entire obedience which we owe to God, in which faith is included, which justifies not of itself as a virtue, but correlatively, as it apprehends and appropriates the merits of Christ. But the love which is opposed to faith, and which in particular is so called, does not justify, because the application of the righteousness of Christ is not made by love, but by faith alone. Yea, love springs from faith, for faith is the cause of all the other virtues. The second is like to this, Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. To love thy neighbour as thyself is in view of thy love to God, or because thou lovest God, do well unto thy neighbour according to all the commandments of the Lord, or will and do to thy neighbour those things which thou wilt that he should do to thee. Now every man is our neighbour. It is called the second commandment, one, because it embodies the substance of the second table, or those duties which are performed directly towards our neighbour. If thou love thy neighbour as thyself, Thou wilt neither murder nor injure him. 2. Because the love which we cherish towards our neighbour must arise out of the love of God. It is therefore naturally subsequent to it. It is said to be like unto the first in three respects. 1. In the kind of worship which it requires, which is moral or spiritual. This is no less required and sanctioned in the second table than in the first, for it everywhere opposes itself to a mere formal worship. 2 in the kind of punishment which it threatens against the transgressor, which is an eternal punishment, for God inflicts this as well for the violation of one table as for that of the other. 3. In the connection which holds between the two tables, for neither one can be maintained without the other. It is also unlike the first, one in the object which it immediately respects, which in the first is God, in the second our neighbour. 2. In the order of cause and effect, the love which we cherish towards our neighbour originates in the love which we have to God, but not the contrary. 3. In the degree of love, we must love God supremely, but the love which we have for our neighbour must not be above everything else, nor stronger than that which we have for God, but only as we love ourselves. From what has now been said, it is easy to return an answer to the objection sometimes made, the second commandment is like unto the first, therefore the first is not the greatest, 
or therefore our neighbour is to be regarded as equal with God, and is to be worshipped in like manner. To this we reply that the second is like unto the first, not absolutely and in every point of view, but only in certain respects, and unlike it in the particulars already specified. On these two commandments hang the whole law and the prophets, that is, the entire doctrine of the law and the prophets is reduced to these two heads, and all obedience to the law inculcated by Moses and the prophets arises from love to God and love to our neighbour. Objection, but there are also many promises of the gospel in the prophets, therefore it would seem that the doctrine of the prophets is not properly restricted to these two commandments. Answer, Christ speaks of the doctrine of the law and not of the promises of the gospel, which is evident from the question of the Pharisee, who asked him which was the greatest commandment, and not which was the principal promise in the law. Question 5. Canst thou keep all these things perfectly? Answer, in no wise, for I am prone by nature to hate God and my neighbour. Exposition. This question, in connecting with the preceding, teaches us that our misery, of which there are two parts, may be known out of the law in two ways, first by a comparison of ourselves with the law, and second by an application of the curse of the law to ourselves. The comparing of ourselves with the law, or of the law with ourselves, is a consideration of that purity which the law requires, and whether it be in us. This comparison clearly proves that we are not what the law requires, for it demands perfect love to God, whilst there is nothing in us but aversion and hatred to Him. The law, again, demands perfect love toward our neighbour, but in us there is enmity to our neighbour. It is in this manner, therefore, that we obtain a knowledge of the first part of our misery, which includes our depravity, of which the Scriptures in many places convict us, Romans 8, verse 7, Ephesians 2, verse 3, Titus 3, verse 3, etc., the application of the curse of the law to ourselves is made by a practical syllogism, of which the major proposition is the voice of the law. Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Conscience supplies and affirms in us the minor proposition, I have not continued in all things written, etc. The conclusion is the approbation of the sentence of the law, I am condemned. Conscience dictates to every man such a syllogism as this, Yea, it is nothing else than such a practical syllogism formed in the mind, whose major proposition is the law of God. The minor is the knowledge of what we have done contrary to the law, and the conclusion is the approbation of the sentence of the law, condemning us on account of sin, which approbation will be followed by grief and despair, unless the consolation of the gospel is brought nigh unto us, and we obtain the remission of sins for the sake of the Son of God, our Mediator. It is in this way that we obtain a knowledge of our sinful state and exposure to eternal condemnation, which is the second part of our misery, for by this argument all are convinced of sin. The law binds all to obedience, and, if this is not performed, to eternal punishment and condemnation, but no one renders this obedience, therefore the law binds all men to eternal condemnation. Section 5 Of the Creation of Man The Third Lord's Day Question 6. Did God then create man so wicked and perverse? Answer. By no means, but God created man good, and after his own image, in righteousness and true holiness, that he might rightly know God, his Creator, heartily love him and live with him in eternal happiness, to glorify him and praise him. Exposition. Having established the proposition that human nature is depraved or sinful, we must now inquire, did God create man thus, and if not, with what nature did he create him, and whence does this depravity of human nature proceed? The subject of the creation of man, therefore, and of the image of God in man, belongs properly to this place. It is also proper that we should here contrast the misery of man with his original excellence. First, that the cause and origin of our misery being known, we may not impute it unto God, and secondly, that the greatness of our misery may be the more clearly seen. In proportion as this is done, will the original excellency of man become apparent, just as the benefit of deliverance becomes the more precious, in the same proportion in which we are brought to apprehend the magnitude of the evil from which we have been rescued. Of the creation of man The questions to be discussed in connection with the creation of man are the following. First, what was the state or condition in which God originally created man? Second, for what end did he create him? First, what was the state in which God originally created man? 
This question is proposed almost for the same reasons for which the whole subject itself is considered, viz., that it may be manifest in the first place that God created man without sin, and is therefore not the author of sin, or of our corruption and misery. 2. That we may see from what a height of dignity, to what a depth of misery we have fallen by sin, that we may thus acknowledge the mercy of God, who has deigned to extricate and deliver us from this wretchedness. 3. That we may acknowledge the greatness of the benefits which we have received, and our unworthiness of being made the recipients of such favours. 4. That we may the more earnestly desire and seek in Christ the recovery of that dignity and happiness which we have lost. 5. That we may be thankful to God for this restoration. As touching the state and condition in which God originally created man, we are here taught, in the answer to this sixth question, that God created man good, and in his own image, etc., which it is necessary for us to expound somewhat more largely. Man was created by God on the sixth day of the creation of the world. His body was made of the dust of the ground, immortal if he continued in righteousness, but mortal if he fell, for mortality followed sin as a punishment. His soul was made out of nothing. It was immediately breathed into him by the Almighty. It was, therefore, rational, spiritual, and immortal. And God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Genesis 2.27 He created and united the soul and the body, so as to constitute by this union one person, performing such internal and external functions and actions as are peculiar to human nature, and which are just, holy, and pleasing to God. Man was also created in the image of God, by which we mean that he was created perfectly good, wise, just, holy, happy, and lord of all other creatures. Concerning this image of God in which man was at first created, more will be said a little further on. Second, for what end did God create man? To this the Catechism answers, that he might rightly know God his Creator, heartily love him and live with him in eternal happiness to glorify and praise him. The glory of God is, therefore, the chief and ultimate end for which man was created. It was for this purpose that God created rational and intelligent beings, such as angels and men, that, knowing Him, they might praise Him forever. Hence, man was created principally for the glory of God, that is, for professing and calling upon His holy name, for praise and thanksgiving, for love and obedience, which consists in a proper discharge of the duties which we owe to God and our fellow men, for the glory of God comprehends all these things. Objection. But the heavens and earth and other creatures are also said to glorify God. Therefore, this was not the end for which man was created. Answer. When creatures destitute of reason are said to praise and glorify God, it is not that they acknowledge or celebrate his praise, but because they furnish the matter and occasion of glorifying God, which belongs properly to intelligent creatures. Angels and men, by the contemplation of these works of God, discern his wisdom, goodness, and power, and are thus stirred up to magnify and praise his name. To glorify God, therefore, is the work of creatures possessed of reason and understanding, and if there were not beings of this description to discern the order and arrangement which is manifest in nature, unintelligent creation could no more be said to praise God than if it had no existence. Hence we are to regard those declarations in the book of the Psalms, in which the heavens, sea, earth, etc., are said to praise God, as figurative expressions, in which the inspired writer attributes to things, void of reason, that which belongs properly to intelligent creatures. 2. There are other reasons for which man was created, subordinate to the glory of God. His knowledge, for instance, contributes to his glory, inasmuch as he cannot be glorified if he is not known. It is, moreover, the proper work of man to know and glorify God, for eternal life consists in this, as it is said, This is eternal life, that they might know thee, the only true God. John 17.3 3. 3. The happiness and blessedness of man, which consists in the enjoyment of God and heavenly blessings, is subordinate or next in order to the knowledge of God, for his goodness, mercy, and power are manifest from these. Objection but the felicity and happiness of man, his knowledge and glorifying of God, are properties or conditions with and in which he was created, that is, they are a part of the image of God and of the proper form of man. Therefore they are not the ends for which man was created, and belong more properly to the first question, which we have already considered, than to this second which treats of the end of our creation. 
Answer, they are a part of the proper form and end of man, but in a different respect, for God made man such a being, that, being blessed and happy, he might rightly know and glorify him, and he created him for this end, that he might henceforth and forever be known and praised by him, and that he might continually communicate himself to man. Man was therefore created happy, knowing God aright and glorifying him, which was the form he received in his creation, and at the same time he was created for this end, that he might forever remain such. It is therefore correct to include both these things in speaking upon this subject, because man was created such a being and for such an end. The first refers to the question what in respect to the beginning, the other to the question for what in respect to his continuance and perseverance therein. So, in Ephesians 4, verse 24, righteousness and true holiness, which constitute the form and very being of the new man, are said to be the end of the same. Nor is it absurd that the same thing should be declared the form and end in a different respect, for that which is the form in respect to the creature is declared the end in respect to the purpose of the Creator. The fourth end for which man was created is the manifestation or declaration of the mercy of God in the salvation of the elect, and of his justice in the punishment of the reprobate. This is subordinate. Section 6 Of the image of God in man Concerning this we are chiefly to inquire, first, what is it and what are the parts thereof, second, to what extent is it lost and what remains in man, third, how may it be restored. First, what is it, and what are the parts thereof? The image of God in man is a mind rightly knowing the nature, will, and works of God, a will freely obeying God, and a correspondence of all the inclinations, desires, and actions with the divine will. In a word, it is the spiritual and immortal nature of the soul, and the purity and integrity of the whole man, a perfect blessedness and joy, together with the dignity and majesty of man, in which he excels and rules over all other creatures. The image of God therefore comprehends, one, the spiritual and immortal substance of the soul, together with the power of knowing and willing, two, all our natural notions and conceptions of God and of his will and works, three, just and holy actions, inclinations, and volitions, which is the same as perfect righteousness and holiness in the will, heart, and external actions. 4. Felicity, happiness, and glory, with the greatest delight in God, connected at the same time with an abundance of all good things, without any misery and corruption. 5. The dominion of man over all creatures, fish, fowls, and other living things. In all these respects our rational nature resembles in some degree the Creator, just as the image resembles the archetype. Yet we can never be equal with God. Paul calls the image of God righteousness and true holiness, Ephesians 4 verse 24, because these constitute the principal parts of it. Yet he does not exclude wisdom and knowledge, but rather presupposes them, for no one can worship God if he does not know him. Neither does the Apostle, in this passage, exclude happiness and glory, for this, according to the order of divine justice, follows righteousness and true holiness. And wherever righteousness and true holiness are found, there is an absence of all evil, whether of guilt or punishment. This righteousness and true holiness, in which, according to the Apostle, the image of God consists, may also be taken for the same thing, or they may be so distinguished that righteousness may be considered as referring to such outward and inward actions and motions as are in harmony with the law of God, and a mind judging correctly, whilst holiness may be understood as referring to the qualities of these actions, etc. Objection. Perfect wisdom and righteousness are peculiar to God alone, nor is there any creature in whom they are found, for the wisdom of all creatures, even of the holy angels, may and does increase. How then could the image of God in man embrace perfect righteousness and wisdom? Answer. That which is here called perfect wisdom does not mean such a wisdom as is ignorant of nothing, but such as is perfect according to the being in whom it is found, or which is such as the Creator designed should be in the creature, and which is sufficient for the happiness of the creature. As, for instance, the wisdom and felicity of the angels is perfect, because it is such as God designed and willed, and yet something may be continually added unto it, or else it would be infinite. So man was perfectly righteous, because he was conformable to God in all things which were required of him. And yet he was not equal with God, nor was his righteousness perfect in that degree in which God is righteous, but because there was nothing wanting to that perfection in which God created him, which he desired should be in him, and which was sufficient for the happiness of the creature. 
There is, therefore, an ambiguity in the word perfection, and it is in the sense just explained that man is said in the Scriptures to be the image of God, or that he was made after his likeness. When Christ, however, is called the image of God, it is a far different sense, which is evident, one, in respect to his divine nature, in which he is the image of the Eternal Father, being co-eternal, consubstantial, and equal with the Father in essential properties and works, and as being that person through whom the Father reveals himself in creating and preserving all things, but especially in the salvation of those whom he has chosen unto everlasting life. And he is called the image, not of himself, nor of the Holy Ghost, but of the Father, because he is eternally begotten, not of himself, nor of the Holy Ghost, but of the Father. 2. In respect to his human nature, in which he is the image of God, created indeed, yet transcending infinitely angels and men, both in the degree and number of gifts, such as wisdom, justice, power, and glory, and at the same time resembling in a peculiar manner the Father, in doctrine, virtues, and actions, as he himself said to one of his disciples, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father, John 14, 9. But angels and men are said to be the image of God, as well in respect to the Son and Holy Ghost, as in respect to the Father, where it is said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, Genesis 1, verse 26. This is not to be understood, however, of any likeness or equality of essence, but merely of certain properties which have a resemblance to the Godhead, not in degree or essence, but in kind and imitation, for there are some things in angels and men which bear a certain analogy and correspondence with what we find in God, who comprehends in himself all that is truly good. Those things, on the other hand, concerning the image of God in man, which were formerly discussed and denied by the anthropomorphites and recently by Osiander, may be found in Ursini, volume 1, pages 154 and 155. Second to what extent is it lost, and what remains in man? Such now is the image of God in which man was originally created, and which was apparent in him before the fall. But after the fall, man lost this glorious image of God on account of sin, and became transformed into the hateful image of Satan. There were, however, some remains and sparks of the image of God still left in man after his fall, and which even yet continue in those who are unregenerated, of which we may mention the following— one, the incorporeal, rational, and immortal substance of the soul, together with its powers, of which we would merely make mention of the liberty of the will, so that whatever man wills, he wills freely. Two, there are, in the understanding, many notions and conceptions of God, of nature, and of the distinction which exists between things proper and improper, which constitute the principles of the arts and sciences. Three, there are some traces and remains of moral virtues, and some ability of regulating the external deportment of the life. 4. The enjoyment of many temporal blessings. 5. A certain dominion over other creatures. Man did not wholly lose his dominion over the various creatures which were put in subjection to him, for many of them still remain subject to him, so that he has the power of governing and using them for his own benefit. These vestiges and remains of the image of God in man, although they are greatly obscured and marred by sin, are nevertheless still preserved in us to a certain extent, and that for these ends. 1. That they may be a testimony of the mercy and goodness of God towards us, unworthy as we are. 2. That God may make use of them in restoring his image in us. 3. That the wicked may be without excuse. But those things which we have lost of the image of God are by far the greatest and most important benefits, of which we may mention the following. 1. The true, perfect, and saving knowledge of God, and of the divine will. 2. Correct views of the works of God, together with light and knowledge in the understanding, in the place of which we now have ignorance, blindness, and darkness. 3. The regulation and government of all the inclinations, desires, and actions, and a conformity to the law of God in the will, heart, and external parts, instead of which there is now a dreadful disorder and depravity of the inclinations and motions of the heart and will, from which all actual sin proceeds. 4. True and perfect dominion over the various creatures of God, for those beasts which at first feared man now oppose, injure, and lie in wait for him, whilst the ground which was cursed for his sake brings forth thorns and briars. 5. The right of using those things which God granted, not to his enemies, but to his children. 6. The happiness of this and of a future life, in the place of which, 
we now have temporal and eternal death with every conceivable calamity. Objection. The heathen were distinguished for many virtues and performed works of great renown. Therefore, it would seem that the image of God was not destroyed in them. Answer. The excellent virtues and deeds of renown, which are found among heathen nations, belong indeed to the vestiges or remains of the image of God, still preserved in the nature of man. But there is so much wanting to constitute that true and perfect image of God, which was at first apparent in man, that these virtues are only certain shadows of external propriety, without the obedience of the heart to God, whom they neither know nor worship. Therefore, these works do not please God, since they do not proceed from a proper knowledge of Him, and are not done with the intention of glorifying Him. Third, how the image of God may be restored in us. The restoration of this image of God in man is effected by Him alone who first conferred it upon man, for He who gives life and restores it when lost is the same being. God the Father restores this image through the Son, because He has made Him unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30. The Son, through the Holy Spirit, changes us into the same image, from glory unto glory, as by the Spirit of the Lord. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18. And the Holy Ghost carries forward and completes what is begun by the Word and the use of the sacraments. The Gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Romans 1 verse 16. This restoration, however, of the image of God in man is effected in such a manner that it is only begun in this life, in such as believe, and is confirmed and carried forward in them even to the end of life, as it concerns the soul, but as it concerns the whole man it will be consummated in the resurrection of the body. We are therefore to consider who is the author, and what is the order and manner in which this restoration is effected. Section 7 of the fall and first sin of man. Question 7. Whence then proceeds this depravity of human nature? Answer. From the fall and disobedience of our first parents, Adam and Eve, in paradise. Hence our nature is become so corrupt that we are all conceived and born in sin. Exposition. Here we are to take into consideration in the first place the fall and first sin of man from which the depravity of human nature proceeds, and secondly we are to consider the subject of sin in general, and especially original sin, of the fall and first sin of man. In relation to this we must inquire first what was the sin of our first parents, second what were the causes of it, third what were the effects of it, fourth why God permitted it. First, what was the sin of our first parents? The fall or first sin of man was the disobedience of our first parents, Adam and Eve, in paradise, or the eating of the forbidden fruit. Of every tree in the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Genesis 2 verses 16 and 17 Man, by the instigation of the devil, violated this command of God, and from this has proceeded our depravity and misery. But is the plucking of an apple such a great and heinous offence? It is indeed a most aggravated offence, because there are many horrid sins connected with it, such as 1. Pride, ambition, and an admiration of self. Man, not satisfied with his own dignity and with the condition in which he was placed, desired to be equal with God. This God charged upon him when he said, Behold, the man is become as one of us, to know good and evil. Genesis 3.22 2. Unbelief, for he charged a lie upon God, who had said, Thou shalt surely die. The devil denied this by saying, Ye shall not surely die, and accused God of envy, saying, But God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Genesis 3.5 Adam believed the devil rather than God, and ate of the forbidden fruit. Nor did he believe that any punishment would overtake him. But not to believe God and to believe the devil is to regard God as though he were no God. Yea, it is to substitute the devil in the place of God. This was a sin that was horrible beyond measure. 3. Contempt and disobedience to God, which appears in the fact that he ate of the fruit contrary to the command of God. 4. Ingratitude for benefits received. He was created in the image of God, and for the enjoyment of eternal life, for which benefit he made this return that he hearkened to the devil more than to God. 5. Unnaturalness and the want of love to posterity. Miserable man that he was, he did not think that, as he had received these gifts for himself and his posterity, 
so he would also by sinning lose them for himself and his posterity. 6. Apostasy, or a manifest falling away from God to the devil, whom he believed and obeyed rather than God, and whom he set up in the place of God, separating himself from God. He did not ask of God those things which he was to receive, but by the advice of the devil he wished to obtain equality with God. The fall of man, therefore, was no trifling nor single offence, but it was a sin manifold and horrible in its nature, on account of which God justly rejected him with all of his posterity. Hence we may easily return an answer to the objection, No just judge inflicts a great punishment on account of a small offence. God is a just judge, therefore he ought not to have punished so severely in our first parents the eating of an apple. Answer. It was not, however, a small offence, as we have already shown, but a most aggravated sin, comprehending pride, ingratitude, apostasy, etc. Hence God justly inflicted a severe punishment on account of this act of disobedience. And if it be still further objected that God ought to have spared the posterity of Adam, inasmuch as he himself has declared, The Son shall not bear the iniquity of the Father, Ezekiel 18, verse 20, we would reply that this is true only where the Son is not a partaker of the wickedness of the Father, but we are all partakers of the sin of Adam. Second, what were the causes of the first sin? The first sin of man had its origin not in God, but was brought about by the instigation of the devil and the free will of man. The devil tempted man to fall away from God, and man, yielding to this temptation, willingly separated himself from God. And although God left man to himself in this temptation, yet he is not the cause of the fall, the sin, or the destruction of man, because in this desertion he neither designed nor accomplished any of these things. He merely put man upon trial to show that he is entirely unable to do or to retain aught that is good if he is not preserved and controlled by the Holy Spirit. And with this his trial, God in his just judgment permitted the sin of man to occur. The wisdom of man reasons and concludes differently, as is evident from the objection which we often hear. He who withdraws in the time of temptation that grace without which it is not possible to prevent a fall is the cause of the fall. But God withdrew from man his grace in the trial through which he was called to pass, so that man could not but fall. Therefore God was the cause of the fall of man. Answer. The major proposition is true only of him who withholds grace when he is obligated not to withdraw it, who takes it from him who is desirous of it and does not willfully reject it, and who withholds it out of malice. But it is not true of him who is not bound to preserve the grace which he at first gave, and who does not withdraw it from him who desires it, but only from him who is willing for him so to do, and who, of his own account, rejects the grace that is proffered him, and who does not therefore withhold it because he envies the sinner righteousness and eternal life, but that he may make a trial of him to whom he has imparted his grace. He who thus forsakes any one is not the cause of sin, even though it necessarily follows this desertion and withdrawal of grace. And inasmuch as God withheld his grace from man in the time of his temptation, not in the first, but in the last manner just described, he is not the cause of his sin and destruction, but man alone is guilty for willfully rejecting the grace of God. It is again objected, by men of carnal minds, he who wills to tempt any one, when he certainly knows that he will fall if he be tempted, wills the sin of him who falls. God willed that man should be tempted by the devil, when he knew that he would certainly fall, for if he had not willed it, man could not have been tempted, therefore God is the cause of the fall. Answer. We deny the major if it be understood in its naked and simple form, for he is not the cause of sin who wills that he who may fall should be tempted for the purpose of being put on trial and for the manifestation of the weakness of the creature which was the sense in which god tempted man but the devil tempting man with the design that he might sin and separate himself from god and man of his own free will yielding to this temptation in opposition to the command of god they are both the cause of sin of which we shall speak more hereafter third what are the effects of the first sin the effects of the first sin are one exposure to death and the privation and destruction of the image of god in our first parents two original sin in their posterity which includes exposures to eternal death and a depravity and aversion of our whole nature to god three all actual sins which proceed from original sin for that which is the cause of a cause is also the cause of the effect the first sin is the cause of original sin and this of actual sins four all the various evils which are inflicted upon men as punishments for sin, 
The first sin, therefore, is the cause of all other sins, and of the punishments which are inflicted upon the children of men. But whether it is in accordance with the justice of God to punish posterity for the sins of their parents will be hereafter explained when we come to treat the subject of original sin. Fourth, why did God permit sin? God had the power of preserving man from falling if he had willed so to do, but he permitted him to fall, that is, he did not grant him the grace of resisting the temptation of the devil for these two reasons. First, that he might furnish an exhibition of the weakness of the creature when left to himself and not preserved in original righteousness by his Creator. And secondly, that by this occasion God might display his goodness, mercy, and grace in saving through Christ all them that believe and manifest his justice and power in punishing the wicked and reprobate for their sins, as it is said, God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all, and that every mouth might be stopped. What if God, willing to show his wrath, and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory? Romans 11, verse 32 Chapter 9, verse 22. Section 8 of Sin in General. The questions which are usually discussed in relation to sin in general are chiefly the following. First, from what does it appear that sin is in the world and also in us? Second, what is sin? Third, how many kinds of sin are there? Fourth, what is the origin of sin or the causes of it? Fifth, what are the effects of sin? First, from what does it appear that sin is in the world, and that it is also in us? That sin is in the world, and also in us, may be proven by a variety of arguments. First, God declares that we are all guilty of sin, which declaration ought especially to be believed, inasmuch as God is the searcher of the heart, and an eye-witness to all our actions. Genesis 6, verse 5, chapter 18, verse 21, Jeremiah 17, verse 9, Romans 1, verse 21, chapter 3, verse 10, chapter 7, verse 18, Psalms 14 and 53, Isaiah 59. Secondly, the law of God recognizes sin, as we have already shown in our exposition of the third and fifth questions of the Catechism, where these declarations of the law were referred to. By the law is the knowledge of sin. The law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. The law entered that the offense might abound. I had not known sin, but by the law... Romans 3, verse 20, chapter 4, verse 15, chapter 5, verse 20, chapter 7, verse 7. Thirdly, conscience convinces and convicts us of sin, for God, even apart from his written law, has preserved in us certain general principles of the natural law, sufficient to accuse and condemn us, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these not having the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness, and their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing, or else excusing, one another. Romans 1 verse 19, chapter 2 verses 13 to 14. Fourthly, punishments and death, to which all men are subject, yea, our cemeteries, graveyards, and places of execution, are all so many sermons upon the evil of sin, because God, being just, never inflicts punishment upon any of his creatures, unless it be for sin, according to what the scriptures say, death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. The wages of sin is death. Cursed is every one that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them. Romans 5, verse 12, Romans 6, verse 23, Deuteronomy 27, verse 26. The benefit of this question is, one, that we may have matter for constant humiliation and penitence, two, that we may turn away from and not be ensnared by the errors and corruptions of the Anabaptists and Libertines, who deny that they have any sin, in contradiction to the express declaration of the word of God, which affirms that if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, 1 John 1 verse 8, and also in contradiction to all experience, for they themselves frequently do many things which God in his law declares to be sins, but which they affirm, although most falsely, to be the workings of the Holy Spirit. They also live in misery, being subject to disease and death, no less than others, which, if they were not sinners, would certainly be in opposition to the rule and law, where there is no sin, there death is not. Does any one ask whether we may not also obtain a knowledge of sin from the gospel, since the gospel, in exhorting us to seek for righteousness not in ourselves, but out of ourselves in Christ, declares us sinners? 
we reply that the gospel does indeed pronounce us sinners, but not in particular as the law does. Neither does it avowedly teach what and how manifold sin is, what it deserves, etc., which is the proper work of the law. But it does this in general by presupposing what the law affirms, just as an inferior science assumes certain principles which are taken from another that is higher and superior to it. After the law has convinced us that we are sinners, the gospel takes this principle as established, and concludes that inasmuch as we are sinners in ourselves, we must therefore seek righteousness out of ourselves, in Christ, if we would be saved. We may therefore conclude from these five considerations that we are all sinners in the sight of God. From the testimony of God himself, from the law of God in particular, from the gospel in general, from the sense of conscience, and from the various punishments which God, being just, would not inflict upon us if we had not sinned. Second, what is sin? Sin is the transgression of the law, or whatever is in opposition thereto, whether it be the want of righteousness, defectus, or an inclination or action contrary to the divine law, and so offending God and subjecting the creature to his eternal wrath, unless forgiveness be obtained for the sake of the Son of God, our Mediator. Its general nature is a want of righteousness, or an inclination, or action, not in accordance with the law of God. To speak more properly, however, it may be said that the want of righteousness is this general nature of sin, whilst inclinations and actions are rather the matter of sin. The difference or formal character of sin is opposition to the law, which the Apostle John calls the transgression of the law. The property which necessarily attaches itself to sin is the sinner's guiltiness, which is a desert of punishment, temporal and eternal, according to the order of divine justice. Sin has, therefore, what is usually termed a double form, or a twofold nature, which may be said to consist in opposition to the law and guilt, or it may be regarded as including two sides, the former of which is opposition to the law, and the latter desert of punishment. The accidental condition of sin is thus expressed, unless forgiveness be obtained, etc., for it is not according to the nature of sin, but by an accident, that those who believe in Christ are not punished with eternal death, because sin is not imputed to them, but graciously remitted for Christ's sake. This want of righteousness which is comprehended in sin includes, as it respects the mind, ignorance and doubt with regard to God and his will, and as it respects the heart, it includes a want of love to God and our neighbour, a want of delight in God, and an ardent desire to purpose to obey all his commands, together with an omission of such actions as the law of God requires from us. Disordered inclinations consist in a stubbornness of the heart, and an unwillingness to comply with the law of God and the judgment of the mind, as it respects actions which are proper and improper, together with a depravity and propensity of nature to do those things which God forbids, which evil is called concupiscence. That this want of righteousness and these disordered inclinations are sins and condemned of God, may be proven, first, from the law of God, which expressly condemns all these things, when it declares, Cursed be him that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them, and thou shalt not covet. Deuteronomy 27, verse 26, Exodus 20, verse 17. The law also requires of men the opposite gifts and exercises, such as perfect knowledge and love to God and our neighbour, saying, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, etc. This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, etc. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Deuteronomy 6, verse 5, John 17, verse 3, Exodus 20, verse 3. Secondly, the same thing is proven by the many testimonies of Scripture, which condemn and speak of these evils as sins, as when it is said, Every imagination of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually. The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. I had not known lust, that is, I had not known it to be sin, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Genesis 6 verse 8, Genesis 6 verse 8, Jeremiah 17 verse 9, Romans 7 verse 7. See also John 3 verse 5, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 14, chapter 15 verse 28. Thirdly, by the punishment and death of infants, who, although they neither do good nor evil, and sin not after the similitude of Adam's transgression, nevertheless have sin, on account of which death reigns in them. This is that ignorance of and aversion to God of which we have already spoken. Objection 1. That which we do not will, as well as that which we cannot avoid, is no sin. But we do not will this want of righteousness, neither can we prevent disordered inclinations from arising within us, therefore they are no sins. 
answer the major proposition is true in a civil court but not in the judgment of god before whom whatever is in opposition to his law whether it can be avoided or not is sin and as such deserves punishment the scriptures clearly teach these two things that the wisdom of the flesh cannot be subject to the law of god and that all those who are not subject thereto stand exposed to the curse of the law objection two nature is good our inclinations and desires are natural therefore they are good answer nature is indeed good if we look upon it as it came from the hands of god and before it became corrupted by sin for all things which god made he declared to be very good genesis one verse thirty one and even now nature is good as to its substance and as it was made of god but not as to its qualities and as it has become corrupted objection three punishments are no sins disordered inclinations and a want of righteousness are punishments of the first sin of man therefore they are no sins answer the major proposition is true in a civil court but not in the judgment of god who often punishes sin with sin as the apostle paul most clearly shows in romans one verse twenty seven two thessalonians two verses four to eleven god has power also to deprive his creatures of his spirit which power none of his creatures possess third how many kinds of sin are there there are five principal divisions of sin the first is that of original and actual sin this distinction is taught in romans five verse fourteen chapter seven verse twenty chapter nine verse eleven original sin original sin is the guilt of the whole human race on account of the fall of our first parents it consists in a want of the knowledge of god and of his will in the mind and of an inclination to obey god with the heart and will in the place of which there is an inclination to those things which the law of god forbids and an aversion to those things which it commands resulting from the fall of our first parents adam and eve and from them made to pass over into all their posterity thus corrupting our whole nature so that all on account of this depravity are subject to the eternal wrath of god nor can we do anything pleasing to him unless forgiveness be obtained for the sake of the son of god our mediator and the holy ghost renew our nature of this kind of sin it is said death reigned even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of adam's transgression in sin did my mother conceive me romans five verse fourteen psalm fifty one verse seven original sin comprehends therefore these two things exposure to eternal condemnation on account of the fall of our first parents and a depravity of our entire nature since the fall paul includes both when he says by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin and so death passed upon all for that all have sinned romans five verse twelve the same thing is expressed although somewhat more obscurely in the common definition of original sin which is generally attributed to anselm quote, original sin is a want of original righteousness which ought to be in us end quote original righteousness was not only a conformity of our nature with the law of god but it also included divine acceptance and approbation in the place of this conformity with the divine law we now have depravity and in the place of this approbation we have the displeasure of god which has followed in consequence of the fall the same thing is true of that definition of hugo quote, original sin is that which we inherit from our birth through ignorance in the understanding and concupiscence in the flesh end quote in opposition to this doctrine of original sin the pelagians formerly believed and taught as the anabaptists do at this day that there is no original sin that posterity are not guilty on account of the fall of our first parents and that sin is not derived from them by propagation but that every one sins and contracts guilt only by imitating the bad examples of others augustine refuted these pelagians in many books there are others who admit that we are all guilty on account of the fall of our first parents but deny that we are born with such depravity as that which deserves condemnation for the want of righteousness and the propensity to evil which we all have by nature they contend cannot be regarded as sins we must hold and maintain in opposition to all these heretics these four propositions one that the whole human race is subject to the eternal wrath of god on account of the disobedience of our first parents adam and eve two that we are also even from the moment of our birth destitute of righteousness and have inclinations contrary to the law of god three that this want of righteousness and these inclinations with which we are born are sins and deserve the eternal wrath of god 
for that these evils are derived and contracted not only by imitation but by the propagation of the corrupt nature which we have all christ excepted derived from our first parents the first second and third propositions have been already sufficiently demonstrated the fourth is proven first by the testimony of scripture we are all by nature the children of wrath even as others by the offence of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation by one man's disobedience many were made sinners who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean i was born in iniquity except a man be born of water and of the spirit he cannot enter into the kingdom of god ephesians two verse three romans five verse six and nineteen job fourteen verse four psalm fifty one verse seven john three verse five secondly infants die and are to be baptized therefore they must have sin but they cannot have sin by imitation it remains therefore that it must be born in them according as it is said thou wast called a transgressor from the womb the heart of man is evil from his youth isaiah forty eight verse eight genesis eight verse twenty one ambrose says quote, who is just before god when an infant but a day old cannot be free from sin End quote. thirdly everything that is born has the nature of that from which it has proceeded as it respects the substance and accidents of the species to which it belongs but we are all born of corrupt and sinful parents therefore we all by our birth inherit or become partakers of their corruption and guilt fourthly by the death of christ who is the second adam we obtain a twofold grace we mean justification and regeneration it follows therefore that we must all have derived from the first adam the twofold evil of guilt and corruption of nature otherwise there had been no necessity for a twofold grace and remedy objection one if original sin be transmitted from parents to their offspring it must be either through the body or through the soul but it cannot be through the body because it is destitute of reason nor can it be through the soul because this is not produced by transmission or derived from the soul of the parent because it is a substance which is spiritual and indivisible nor is it created corrupt since god is not the author of sin therefore original sin is certainly not transmitted by nature answer we deny the minor proposition because the soul although created pure and holy by god may nevertheless contract corruption from the body into which it is infused even though it be destitute of reason nor is it absurd to say that the corrupt constitution of the body with its propensity to evil is an unfit instrument for the good actions of the soul and that the soul not established in righteousness may become polluted and so fall from its own integrity so soon as it becomes united with the body we also deny the consequence of the above syllogism for the reason that the parts which are enumerated in the first proposition are not properly expressed original sin is neither transmitted through the body nor through the soul but through the transgression of our first parents on account of which god even whilst he creates the soul at the same time deprives it of original righteousness and such other gifts as he conferred upon our first parents upon the condition that they should transmit them to or lose them for their posterity according as they themselves should retain or lose them nor is god by this act unjust or the cause of sin for this want of righteousness in respect to god who inflicts it on account of the disobedience of our first parents is no sin but a most just punishment although in respect to our first parents who drew it upon themselves and their posterity it is a sin the fallacy of the above argument will now be apparent if we state more fully the major proposition original sin is transmitted to posterity either through the body or through the soul or through the transgression of our first parents and the desert of this want of righteousness for just as original sin came to exist in our first parents on account of their transgression so it is transmitted to posterity on account of the same this is not that small chink or unimportant subject about which the schoolmen disputed so warmly whether the soul be transmitted from our parents by generation and whether it becomes polluted by its connection with the body but it is that wide gate through which original sin flows violently and infects our nature as paul testifies when he says by one man's disobedience many were made sinners romans five verse nineteen to this it is objected the want of original righteousness is sin god has inflicted this by creating in us a soul destitute of those gifts which he would have conferred upon adam had he not sinned therefore he is the author of sin answer there is in the minor proposition a fallacy of accident 
this want of righteousness is sin in respect to adam and us since by his and our fault we have drawn it upon ourselves and now eagerly receive it that the creature should be destitute of righteousness and of conformity to god is repugnant to the law and is sin but in respect to god it is a most just punishment of disobedience which punishment is in harmony with the nature and law of god it is further objected god ought not to punish the transgression of adam with such a punishment as that which he knew would result in the destruction of the whole nature of man answer god's justice must be satisfied even if the whole world should perish it moreover behooved him to avenge in this manner the obstinacy of man from regard to his extreme justice and truth an offence committed against the highest good deserves the most extreme punishment which consists in the eternal destruction of the creature for god has said thou shalt surely die it is therefore of his mercy that he should rescue any from this general ruin and save them through christ objection two it is natural that we should desire objects therefore these desires are no sins answer such desires as are directed upon proper objects and which god has excited and ordained are no sins but such as are inordinate and contrary to the law are sins for to desire is not of itself sinful inasmuch as it of itself is good because it is natural but to desire contrary to the law is sin objection three original sin is removed as far as it respects the saints therefore they cannot transmit it to their offspring answer the godly are indeed delivered from original sin as it respects the guilt thereof which is remitted unto them through christ but in as far as it respects its formal character and essence that is as an evil opposing itself to the law of god it remains and although those to whom sin is remitted are at the same time regenerated by the holy ghost yet this renewal of their nature is not perfect in this life therefore they transmit their corrupt nature which they themselves have to their posterity to this it is objected that which the parents do not possess they cannot transmit to their posterity the guilt of original sin is taken away from all those parents who have been regenerated therefore at least guilt cannot be transmitted answer the major is to be distinguished parents do not transmit to their children that which they have not by nature for they are freed from the guilt of sin not by nature but by the grace of christ it is for this reason that they do not transmit to their posterity by nature the righteousness which is imputed unto them by grace but they transmit the corruption and condemnation to which they are by nature subject and the reason why they transmit their guilt and not their righteousness is this their children are born not according to grace but according to nature nor are we to conceive of grace and justification as restricted and transmitted by carnal propagation but by the most free election of god jacob and esau are examples of this etc augustine illustrates this by two forcible comparisons the one is that of the grains of wheat which although they are sown after having been separated from their stalk chaff beard and ear by threshing still spring out of the earth again with all these this comes to pass because the threshing and cleaning are not natural to the grain but are the work of human industry the other is that of a circumcised father who although he himself has no foreskin yet begets a son with one and this also happens because circumcision was not upon the father by nature but by the covenant objection four if the root or tree be holy the branches are also holy therefore the children of those that are holy are also holy and free from original sin romans eleven verse sixteen answer there is here an incorrectness in the use of terms that are ambiguous in their signification for holiness as it is here used does not signify freedom from sin or purity of heart but that dignity and privilege peculiar to the posterity of abraham because god on account of the covenant which he made with abraham promised that he would at all times dispose some of his seed to do his will and would grant unto them true inward holiness and also because they obtained a right and title to his church objection five but the children of believers are holy according to the declaration of st paul one corinthians seven verse fourteen therefore they have no original sin answer this is an incorrect conclusion drawn from a perversion of the figure of speech that is here employed for when it is said they are holy it does not mean that all the children of the faithful are regenerated or that they obtain holiness by carnal propagation for it is said in romans nine verse eleven and thirteen of jacob and esau that the one was loved and the other was hated before they were born or had done good or evil 
but it means that the children of the godly are holy as it respects the external fellowship of the church that they are considered citizens and members thereof and as being included in the number of those who are called and sanctified unless when they come to years of maturity they bear testimony against themselves by their impiety and unbelief and so declare that they have forfeited all their rights and privileges objection six if sin be transmitted to posterity by natural generation then those who will live at the latest period of the history of the human race will have to bear the sins of all the previous generations whilst those who lived before them will have borne the sins of only a portion of their ancestry consequently those who will live last upon the earth will be the most miserable which is absurd and inconsistent with the justice of god answer it would not be absurd even if god were to desert and punish more heavily the last of our race for the greater the number of sins that are committed and treasured up by the human race the more fiercely does his anger burn and the more aggravated are the punishments which he inflicts upon men according to what is written the iniquity of the amorites is not yet full that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of the righteous abel unto the blood of zacharias etc genesis fifteen verse sixteen matthew twenty two verse thirty five we may also reply that although god in his justice permits original sin or the corruption and guilt of our nature to pass upon all the posterity of adam yet he at the same time of his mercy sets bounds to this sin that posterity may not always suffer punishment for the actual transgression of their ancestors nor imitate them and that the children of wicked parents may not be evil or worse and more miserable than their parents Objection 7. But it is said, Ezekiel 18, verse 20, that the son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. Therefore it is unjust that posterity should endure punishment for the sin of Adam. Answer. The son shall not indeed bear the iniquity of the father, nor make satisfaction for his transgression, if he does not approve of it, nor imitate it, but condemns and avoids it. But we justly suffer on account of the sin of Adam, one, because all of us approve of and follow his transgression, two because the offence of adam is also ours for we were all in adam when he sinned as the apostle testifies we have all sinned in him romans five verse twelve three because the entire nature of adam became guilty and as we have proceeded from his very substance being as it were a part of him we must also necessarily be guilty ourselves four because adam had received the gifts of god upon the condition that he would also impart them unto us if he retained them or lose them for us also if he lost them Hence it is that when Adam lost these gifts, he did not merely lose them for himself, but also for all his posterity. Objection 8. All sin implies an exercise of the will, but infants are not capable of such an exercise of the will as is necessary in order to the commission of sin. Therefore they cannot be said to commit sin. Answer. The whole argument is conceded as far as it has respect to actual sin, but not as it relates to original sin which consists in the depravity of our nature. Again, we deny what is affirmed in the minor proposition, because infants are not destitute of the power of willing. For although they may not be able to will sin as something that is actually done, yet they do will it in inclination. Objection 9. The corruption and evils of our nature rather deserve pity than censure and punishment. Aristotle himself declares, quote, that no man censures the defects which attach themselves unto our nature, end quote original sin is a defect and corruption of our nature therefore it does not deserve punishment answer the major proposition is true of such evils as are brought upon us not by our negligence or wickedness as if any one should be born blind or become so by disease or by a stroke from another such an one would indeed deserve to be pitied rather than upbraided but evils which we have all wickedly brought upon ourselves as is the case with original sin are justly deserving of censure as aristotle also testifies when he adds quote, but every one finds fault with such an one as becomes blind by excess of wine or any other wicked action End quote. so much concerning original sin of actual sin and the remaining distinctions of sin with its causes and effects Actual sin includes all those actions which are opposed to the law of God, whether they be such as have respect to the understanding, will, and heart, or to the external deportment of our lives, as to think, to will, to follow, and to do that which is evil, and an omission of those things which the law of God commands, as to be ignorant of, not to will, to shun, and omit that which is good. 
The division of sin into sins of commission and omission is properly in place here. The second division of sin. This distinction has respect to sin as reigning and not reigning. By reigning sin we understand that form of sin to which the sinner makes no resistance through the grace of the Holy Spirit. He is therefore exposed to everlasting death unless he repent and obtain forgiveness through Christ. Or it includes every sin which is not deplored and to which the grace of the Holy Spirit makes no resistance and on account of which he in whom it reigns is exposed to everlasting punishment not according to the order of divine justice but also according to the nature of the thing itself. The following passages of Scripture refer to this distinction of sin. Let not sin reign in your mortal bodies. He that committeth sin, that is, he who sins habitually, willfully, and with delight, is of the devil. Romans 6, verse 12, 1 John 3, verse 8. It is called reigning sin because it gratifies and enslaves those who are the subjects of it, and also because it holds dominion over the man in whom it reigns, and exposes him to eternal condemnation. All the sins of men in their unregenerate state are of this character. There are also some sins of this description in those who have been regenerated, such as errors in the groundwork of faith, and such offences as are against the conscience, which, unless they are repented of, are inconsistent with an assurance of the forgiveness of sins and true Christian comfort. That those who are regenerate may be guilty of sin under this form, the lamentable fall of such holy men as Aaron and David abundantly testifies. Those objections which are commonly brought against what is here advanced may be found in Ursini, volume 1, page 207. Sin which does not thus reign is that which the sinner resists by the grace of the Holy Spirit. It does not therefore expose him to eternal death because he has repented and found favour through Christ. Such sins are disordered inclinations and unholy desires, a want of righteousness and many sins of ignorance, of omission and of infirmity, which remain in the godly as long as they continue in this life, but which they nevertheless acknowledge, deplore, hate, resist, and earnestly pray may be forgiven them for the sake of Christ, the Mediator, saying, Forgive us our debts. Hence the godly retain their faith and consolation, notwithstanding they are not free from these sins. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. There is no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk after the Spirit. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. 1 John 1 verse 8, Romans 7 verse 18, chapter 8 verse 1, 1 John 1 verse 8, Romans 7 verse 18, chapter 8 verse 1, Psalm 19 verse 13. The common distinction of sin into mortal and venial may be referred to this division. For although every sin in its own nature is mortal, by which we mean that it deserves eternal death, yet reigning sin may be properly so called, inasmuch as he who perseveres in it will at length be overtaken by destruction. But it becomes venial sin, that is, it does not call for eternal death, when it does not reign in the regenerate who resisted by the grace of God, and this takes place not because its merits pardon in itself, or does not deserve punishment, but because it is freely forgiven those that believe on account of the satisfaction of Christ, and is not imputed to them unto condemnation, as it is said, there is no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8 verse 1. When thus understood, the distinction of mortal and venial sin may be retained, but not when it is understood in the sense in which the Romish priests use it, as if that were mortal sin which deserves eternal death on account of its greatness, and that venial which does not deserve eternal death on account of its smallness, but merely some temporal punishment. Hence we prefer in the place of mortal and venial sin the distinction which we have made of sin into reigning and not reigning, and that for the following reasons. 1. Because the terms mortal and venial are ambiguous and obscure. All sins are mortal in their own nature. The Apostle John also calls the sin against the Holy Ghost mortal or unto death. 2. Because the Scriptures do not use these terms, especially venial sin. 3. Because of the errors of the Papists, who call those sins venial, which are small and do not deserve eternal death, while the Scriptures declare, Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them. Whosoever shall offend in one point is guilty of all. The wages of sin is death. Whoso shall break one of these commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of God. Deuteronomy 27 verse 26, 
James 2 verse 10, Romans 6 verse 23, Matthew 5 verse 19. In a word, every sin in its own nature is mortal and deserves eternal death, but it becomes venial, that is, it does not work eternal death in the regenerate because their sins have been freely pardoned for the sake of Christ. The third division of sin, there is sin which is against the conscience and sin which is not against the conscience. Sin against the conscience is when any one, knowing the will of God, does with design and purpose that which is contrary thereto, or it is that sin which is committed by those who sin knowingly and willingly, as did David when he committed the sin of adultery and murder. Sin not against the conscience is when any one does anything contrary to the law of God, ignorantly or unwillingly, or it is that which is indeed known to be sin and deplored by the sinner, but which he cannot perfectly avoid in this life, as original sin and many sins of ignorance, of omission and infirmity. For we omit many things that are good and do many that are evil, being suddenly overcome by infirmity as Peter was, when by the force of temptation he denied Christ, knowingly indeed, but not willingly. Hence he wept so bitterly, and did not lose his faith entirely, according to the promise of Christ, I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. Luke 22, verse 32. This was not reigning sin, much less the sin against the Holy Ghost, because Peter loved Christ no less when he denied him than when he wept over his sin, although his love did not at the time show itself on account of his fear, excited by the dangerous circumstances in which he was placed. Such was also the sin which Paul acknowledged and lamented when he said, The good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Romans 7 verse 19. His blasphemy and persecution of the church were likewise sins of ignorance, for, says he, I did it ignorantly in unbelief, and therefore obtained mercy. 1 Timothy 1 verse 13. The fourth division of sin, there is sin which is unpardonable, sin against the Holy Ghost and unto death, and there is also pardonable sin, sin which is not against the Holy Ghost, nor unto death. The Scriptures speak of this distinction of sin in Matthew 12, verse 31, Mark 3, verse 29, 1 John 5, verse 16. By unpardonable sin, or the sin against the Holy Ghost, and unto death, is meant a denial of, and a willful opposition to, the acknowledged truth of God, in connection with His will and works, concerning which the mind has been fully enlightened, and convinced by the testimony of the Holy Ghost, all of which proceeds not from fear or infirmity, but from a determined hatred to the truth, and from a heart filled with bitter malice. This sin God punishes with perpetual blindness, so that those who are guilty of it never repent, and consequently obtain no pardon. It is called unpardonable, not because its greatness exceeds the value of Christ's merit, but because he who commits it is punished with total blindness, and does not receive the gift of repentance. It is a sin of a peculiarly aggravated nature, and is therefore followed by a punishment in accordance with its character, which punishment is final blindness and impenitency. And where there is no repentance, there is no forgiveness obtained. Whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. Matthew 12, verse 32, Mark 3, verse 29. It is called the sin against the Holy Ghost, not that any one may commit an offence against the Holy Ghost, which is not at the same time an offence against the Father and the Son, but by a significant form of speech, inasmuch as it is in an especial manner committed against the Holy Ghost, that is, against his peculiar and immediate office and work, which consists in the enlightening of the mind. It is called by the Apostle John a sin unto death, not because it alone is a mortal sin and deserves death, but, as has just been remarked, because it especially merits death, and because those who are guilty of it will most assuredly die, seeing that they never repent or obtain forgiveness. The Apostle John, therefore, does not desire that we should pray for it, because it is in vain that we ask God to grant the pardon of it. The Scriptures also speak of this sin in other places, as in Hebrews 6, verses 4 to 8, chapter 10, verses 26 to 29, Titus 3, verses 10 and 11. Certain rules to be observed in relation to the sin against the Holy Ghost. 1. The sin against the Holy Ghost is not found in every wicked person, but only in those who have been enlightened by the Holy Ghost, and who have been fully convinced of the truth, as Saul, Judas, etc. 
2. Every sin which is against the Holy Ghost is reigning sin and a sin against conscience, but not the reverse. For it may occur that someone may, either ignorantly or even knowingly and willingly, hold certain errors or violate some of the commandments of God, from weakness or torture, or from fear of danger, and yet not purposely and maliciously impugn the truth, or totally fall from holiness, and continue in sensuality and a contempt of all that is sacred. But he may return unto God and repent of his sin. These forms of sin differ, therefore, as genus and species. 3. The sin against the Holy Ghost is not committed by the elect, or those who are truly converted. They can never perish, for Christ safely preserves and saves them. They shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hands. John 10, verse 28. Also, 2 Timothy 2, verse 19, 1 Peter 1, verse 5, 1 John 5, verse 15. Hence, those who sin against the Holy Ghost were never truly converted and called. They went out from us because they were not of us. 4. No one should decide hastily or rashly concerning the sin against the Holy Ghost. Yea, judgment should in no case be passed upon any one, unless it be a posteriori, for the reason that we do not know what is in the heart of man. Many things which are controverted in relation to this subject may be found in Ursini, volume 1, page 213, etc. Sin that is pardonable or not against the Holy Ghost is any sin of which men may repent and obtain forgiveness. The fifth division of sin. There is that which is sin per se, and that which becomes sin by accident. Those things which are sins of themselves and in their own nature are those inclinations, desires, and actions which are contrary to and forbidden by the law of God. Yet they are not sins in so far as they are mere activities, or in respect to God, who moves all things. For motions, in as far as they are such, are good in themselves and from God, in whom we live, move, and have our being. But in respect to us they are sins, in as far as they are committed by us contrary to the law of God, in which sense they are all in, and according to their own nature, sins. Those things which are sins by accident are the actions of hypocrites, and such as have not been regenerated, which, although they have been prescribed and commanded by God, are nevertheless displeasing to him, inasmuch as they do not proceed from faith and a desire to glorify God. The same thing may be said of indifferent actions which are performed and attended with shame. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. Without faith it is impossible to please God. Romans 14 verse 23, Titus 1 verse 15, Hebrews 11 verse 6. All the virtues, therefore, of the unregenerate, such as the chastity of Scipio, the bravery of Julius Caesar, the fidelity of Romulus, the justice of Aristides, etc., although they are in themselves good and commanded by God, yet they are nevertheless sins by accident and hateful to God, both because the persons by whom they are done do not please him, not being in a state of reconciliation, and also because they are not done in the manner nor with the design which God requires, that is, they do not proceed from faith, and are not done for the glory of God. These conditions are so necessary in every good work, that without them our best actions are sinful, as the prayers, the alms, the sacrifices, etc., of hypocrites, and the wicked are sins, because they do not spring from faith, and are not done out of regard to the glory of God. Hypocrites give their alms in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward." He that killeth an ox is as if he slew a man, etc. Matthew 6, verse 2, Isaiah 66, verse 3. There is, therefore, a great difference between the virtues of the regenerate and the unregenerate. For, one, the good works of the regenerate proceed from faith and are pleasing to God, but it is different with the works of the unregenerate. Two, the regenerate do all things to the glory of God. The unregenerate and hypocrites act with reference to their own glory. 3. The actions of the regenerate are connected with a sincere desire to obey God. The unregenerate and hypocrites exhibit only an outward profession without inward obedience. Their virtues are, therefore, not such in reality. They are nothing more than shadows and faint resemblances of that which is truly good. 4. The imperfection of the works of the regenerate is covered by the satisfaction of Christ, and the corruption which is still inherent in them is not imputed unto them nor is it objected to them that they defile the gifts of God by their sins, but the virtues of the unregenerate, which are good in themselves, are and remain sins by accident, and are defiled by many other crimes. 5. 
the good works of the unregenerate are honoured merely with temporal rewards and that not because they are pleasing to god but that he may thus invite and encourage them and others to such honesty and external deportment as is necessary for the well-being of the human race but god accepts the works of the righteous for the sake of christ and graciously crowns them with temporal and eternal rewards as it is said godliness is profitable unto all things having the promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come one timothy four verse eight finally the unregenerate by performing works commanded by god obtain a mitigation of punishment that they may not with other wicked persons suffer more grievously in this life but the righteous do these things not only that their sufferings may be alleviated but also that they may be entirely freed therefrom objection those things which are sins ought not to be done the works of the unregenerate although they are good in the estimation of men and the civil law are nevertheless sins therefore they ought not to be done answer there is here a fallacy of accident the major proposition is true of those things which are sins in themselves the minor of those which are sins by accident those things now which are sins in themselves ought to be strictly avoided but those which are sins by accident ought not to be omitted but amended and performed in the manner and for the end for which god has commanded but this external discipline and conformity to the law is necessary even on the part of those who have not been regenerated one on account of the command of god two that they may escape the punishment which follows the violation of outward propriety three that the peace and well-being of society at large may be preserved lastly that the way to repentance may not be shut up by perseverance in a course of open transgression there is likewise a great difference between the sins of the regenerate and the unregenerate for as we have already shown especially under the second division of this subject there are many remains of sin still found in those who have been renewed by the holy spirit such as original sin and many actual sins of ignorance of omission and infirmity which they nevertheless acknowledge lament and strive against so that they do not lose a good conscience nor a sense of the divine forgiveness there are also some who fall into errors which oppose the very foundation of their faith or who sin against conscience on account of which they lose the consciousness of their acceptance with god and the gifts of the holy spirit who were they to continue therein to the end of their days would be condemned and rejected of god but they do not perish for the reason that they are led to see the error of their ways and thus brought to repentance there is however a threefold distinction between the righteous and the wicked when they sin one god has an eternal purpose to save all those whom he calls into his service two when the righteous sin they are brought to repentance at some time or other before the end of life three when those who have been regenerated fall into sin the seed of their regeneration always remains which is sometimes so strong and vigorous as to resist sin to such an extent that they neither fall into errors that subvert the foundation of their hope nor into reigning sin at other times it is less vigorous and active so that it may for a time be suppressed by temptations yet it will at length authenticate its divine character so that none of those who have been truly converted to god will finally fall away and perish as we may see in the case of david of peter etc but when the unregenerate sin the case is wholly different for none of these things have respect to them fourth what are the causes of sin that god is not the cause of sin is proven one from the testimony of scripture god saw everything that he had made and behold it was very good thou art not a god that hath pleasure in wickedness genesis 1 verse 31 psalm 5 verse 4 2. God himself is supremely and perfectly good and holy, and cannot therefore be the author of sin. 3. God forbids all manner of sin in his law. 4. God punished most severely all sin, which he could not consistently do if it had its origin in him. 5. God would not destroy his own image in man. From these considerations it is evident that the origin of sin is not to be attributed to God but the proper and in itself efficient cause of sin is the will of devils and men by which they freely fell from god and deprived themselves of his image through envy the devil brought death into the world wisdom two verse twenty four but death is the punishment of sin ye are of your father the devil and the lusts of your father ye will do he was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him when he speaketh a lie he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of it he that committeth sin is of the devil for the devil sinneth from the beginning 
For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. By one man sin entered into the world. John 8, verse 44, 1 John 3, verse 8, Romans 5, verse 12. The cause, therefore, of the first sin, or of the fall of our first parents in paradise, was the devil tempting and urging man to sin, and the will of man freely separating itself from God, and falling in with the suggestions of the tempter. This fall of Adam is the efficient cause of original sin both in himself and in his posterity. By one man's disobedience many were made sinners. The preceding cause of all actual sins in posterity is original sin. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. When lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. Romans 7, verse 17, James 1, verse 14. Those objects which entice men to sin may be regarded as accidental or causal motives. Sin, taking occasion by the commandments, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. Romans 7, verse 8. The devil and wicked men are the cause of sin in and of themselves. Preceding actual sins are the causes of those which follow, for the scriptures teach that God punishes sin with sin, and that sins which follow are the punishments of those that precede. God gave them up to uncleanness, through the lusts of their own hearts, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. Therefore God shall send them strong delusion, that they may believe a lie. Romans 1, verse 24 and 27, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 11. But as man in his wisdom, so great is his insolence, is accustomed to frame various arguments for the purpose of throwing the cause of sin from himself upon God, and so free himself from blame, we must speak more fully of the causes of sin, and refute the vain pretenses by which men are wont to justify themselves. There are some who pretend to find the origin of sin in their destiny, as revealed by the stars, saying, We have sinned because we were born under an unlucky planet. Others, when rebuked for their sins, reply, Not we, but the devil is the cause of the wicked deeds we have committed. Others, throwing aside all excuses, cast the blame directly upon God, saying, God willed it thus, for if he had not willed it, I had not sinned. Others again say, in extenuation of their sins, God was able to prevent me from doing that which was wrong, and as he did not restrain me, therefore he himself is the author of my sin. With these and similar pretenses men have often, for it is no new thing, sharpened their blasphemous tongues against God. Our first parents, when they sinned, and God charged their crimes upon them, endeavoured to throw the blame of their wicked deed from themselves upon others, nor did they honestly confess the truth. Adam threw it, not so much upon his wife as upon God himself. The woman, said he, whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat as if he would say, I had not sinned, except thou hadst joined her to me. Genesis 3, verse 12. The woman charged the evil deed wholly to the devil, saying, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Genesis 3, verse 13. These are the false, impious, and detestable conclusions of wicked men in regard to the origin of sin, by which great reproach is cast upon the majesty, truth, and justice of God. Nor is the nature of man the cause of sin, because God created it good, according as it is said god saw all things which he had made and behold it was very good genesis 1 verse 31 sin is an adventitious or accidental quality which attaches itself to man in consequence of the fall and not a substantial property although it became natural after the fall and is called so correctly by augustine because we are now all born in sin and are the children of wrath even as others but these things must be more largely considered 1. Those who would make destiny an excuse for their sins define destiny to mean an order or chain linked together through eternity, and a certain perpetual necessity of purposes and works according to the counsel of God or the evil stars themselves. Now, if you ask, Who made these stars? they reply, God. Therefore these men charge their sins upon God. But such a destiny as this, all the wiser, not to speak of Christian, philosophers unite in rejecting Augustine, in opposing two epistles of the Pelagians to Boniface, says, quote, Those who affirm destiny to be the cause of sin contend that not only actions and events, but also our wills themselves depend upon the position of the stars at the time of everyone's conception or birth, which they call constellations. But the grace of God does not only rise above all the stars and all the heavens, but also above all the angels. End quote. 
we may conclude our remarks in reference to this vain pretense by adducing the word of the lord as uttered by the prophet jeremiah chapter ten verse two thus saith the lord learn not the way of the heathen and be not dismayed at the signs of the heavens for the heathen are dismayed at them that the heathen astrologers should therefore call the planet saturn unmerciful rigid and cruel and venus benignant favourable and mild is the vanity of vanities for the stars have no power of doing good or evil and hence the crimes of wicked men ought never to be attributed to them two that the devil is not the sole author of sin who when we are guilty of transgression should alone bear the blame and we be free from censure is evident from this one consideration that he can only suggest and entice men to do that which is evil but cannot compel them to commit it god so restrains the devil by his power that he cannot do what he desires but only what and as much as god permits yea he has not so much as control over filthy swine much less over the most noble souls of men he has indeed subtlety and great power of persuasion but god is more powerful than satan and never ceases to suggest good thoughts to man nor does he permit the devil to go farther than is for our good this we may see in the case of job that most holy man and also in paul and in those words of his god is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able one corinthians ten verse thirteen they reason falsely therefore who attempt to throw the blame of their sins upon the shoulders of satan three it remains to be demonstrated that god is not the author of sin there are some who argue god willed it thus and if he had not willed it we had not sinned who can resist his power again when god had the power to prevent us from sinning and did not he is the author of our sins these are the cavils the foul slanders and sophisms of the wicked god might indeed by his absolute power prevent evil but he will not wrong and despoil his own creature man whom he created righteous and holy he acts with man in a manner that corresponds with the nature with which he has endowed him hence he proposes laws to which he attaches rewards and punishments he commands us to embrace the good and shun the evil and that we may do this he both grants his grace without which we can do nothing and also encourages our diligence and labour but if a man come short of doing what he ought his sin and negligence are chargeable upon himself and not upon god although god had the power to prevent it and yet did not nor is it proper that god should prohibit in any direct manner the evil deeds of the wicked lest by so doing he should disturb the order which he has established and so destroy his own work hence god is not the author of sin or of evil we shall now give the testimony of the scriptures in reference to this subject refute certain objections and investigate the origin of sin the scriptures in many places teach that god is not the author of sin we can merely refer to a few passages bearing upon this point god made not death nor hath he pleasure in the destruction of the living i desire not the death of the wicked but that the wicked turn from his way and live thou art not a god that hath pleasure in wickedness neither shall evil dwell with thee the foolish shall not stand in thy sight god hath made man upright but they have sought out many inventions our unrighteousness commends the righteousness of god by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin i know that in me dwelleth no good thing wisdom one verse thirteen ezekiel eighteen verse twenty three psalm five verses four and five ecclesiastes seven verse twenty nine romans three verse five five verse twelve seven verse eighteen from these expressed declarations of scripture we may safely conclude that god is not the author of sin but that its origin must be traced to man the devil being the instigator yet in such a manner that we may say the devil who became corrupt from the beginning deprived man of his original holiness which however he could not have done had not man of his own free will consented to the evil here it is necessary for us to revert to the fall of our father adam whom god created in his own image by which we mean that he created him good perfect holy just and immortal and furnished him with the most excellent gifts so that nothing was wanting to his full and perfect enjoyment his understanding was fully enlightened his will was most free and holy he had the power of doing good or evil and had the law which directed him what to do and what to avoid for the lord said thou shalt not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil genesis two verse seventeen 
God demanded a simple obedience and faith, that Adam might depend wholly upon him, and that, not constrainedly, as if he were compelled thereto by some necessity, but freely and cheerfully. God made man from the beginning, and left him in the hand of his counsel, saying, If thou wilt, thou shalt keep the commandment, and perform acceptable faithfulness. Ecclesiasticus 15 verse 14 when the serpent therefore tempted man and persuaded him to taste of the forbidden tree, he was not ignorant that the counsel and device of the serpent was contrary to the command of God. For the Lord had said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Genesis 3 verse 3. It was therefore in the hand of his counsel to eat or not to eat. God declared his law, expressly enjoining upon him not to eat, and endeavoured to restrain him from eating by foretelling the penalty, lest ye die nor did Satan use any compulsive measures, which it was not possible for him to do, but probably advised and urged man on, until he at length overcame him by his entreaties. For when the will of the woman inclined to the word of the devil, her mind receded from the word of God, and in rejecting his law she committed an evil deed. Afterwards she inclined her husband, and drew him along with her, who, by consenting, became a partaker of her sin. The Scriptures teach this, where it is said, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Genesis 3 verse 6 Here we have the beginning of evil, the devil, and that which moved the will of man, viz. the false praise and condemnation of the devil, and therefore a manifest lie, and the pleasant and attractive appearance of the tree. Hence Adam and Eve did, of their own choice and free will, what they did, being deceived by the hope of obtaining greater and more excellent wisdom, which the seducer had falsely and deceptuously promised. We conclude, therefore, that sin had its origin, not in God, who forbids what is evil, but in the devil, and the free choice of man, which was corrupted through the falsehood of Satan. Hence the devil, and the perverted will of man following him, are to be regarded as the true cause of sin. This evil now flows over from our first parents into all their posterity, so that sin does not take its rise from any other source than from ourselves, from our perverted judgment and depraved will, together with the suggestion of the devil. For an evil root or principle, such as the fall of our first parents, brings forth of itself a corrupt and rotten branch, corresponding with its own nature, which Satan, now also by his fraud and lies, cultivates just as plants. But... It is all in vain that he should so labour, if we do not offer ourselves to him to be moulded according to his will. That is called original sin, which flows from the original fountain, viz. from our first parents, into all their posterity, by propagation or generation. We bring this sin with us in our nature out of our mother's womb, when we are born into the world. I was born in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Psalm 51 verse 7 and Christ thus speaks of the devil, he was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it. John 8 verse 44. Objection 1. Satan was created by God, therefore his malice must also be from him. Answer. We deny the antecedent. The devil was made Satan, or an adversary, not by God, for he created him a good angel, but by voluntary apostasy. Hence it is said that he abode not in the truth, from which we may infer that he must have stood in the truth prior to his fall. Objection 2. God created Adam, and therefore the sin of Adam. Answer. There is here a fallacy of accident in attributing to God the creation of an accidental and accessory evil in the place of that which is good. Sin is not natural, but it is a corruption of the nature of man, which God created good. For God made man good but man, by the instigation of the devil, deprived himself of the gifts which he had received from God, and corrupted himself. Objection 3. But the will and power which Adam possessed was from God. Therefore sin, which is committed by this will, must also be from God. Answer. There is here again a fallacy of accident, for the will of Adam was not the cause of sin, in as far as it was from God, but in as far as it of its own accord inclined to the word of the devil. God did not give to man the will and power of doing evil, for he strictly forbade and denounced it in his law. 
but Adam abused and perverted the will and power which he had received from God, inasmuch as he did not devote them to the purposes for which they were given. The prodigal son received money from his father, not that he should waste it in riotous living, but that he might have as much as would be sufficient for his necessity. Wherefore, when he wickedly squandered that which he had received from his father, and was reduced to starvation, it was not the fault of the father from whom he had received it, but it resulted from the abuse of what he had received. Objection 4. God created man fallible, nor did he establish him in the goodness in which he created him. Therefore it was according to his will that man sinned. Answer. The scriptures rebuke and put to silence this frowardness of men, wickedly curious, saying, Who art thou that repliest against God? Woe unto him that striveth with his Maker. Romans 9, verse 20, Isaiah 45, verse 9. Unless man had been created fallible, there would have been no praise attaching itself to his work or virtue, for he would have been good from necessity. And what if it had been proper that man should have been thus created? The very nature of God required it to be thus. God does not give his glory to any creature. Adam was a man and not God, and as God is good, so is he also just. He does good to men, but he wills that they be obedient and grateful to him. He bestowed innumerable benefits upon man, and therefore it behoved him to be thankful, obedient, and subject to God, who has declared in his law what would be pleasing to him and what would not, saying, Of the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat, lest thou die. Genesis 2, verse 17. As if he would say, Thou shalt have respect to me, adhere to me, serve and obey me, thou shalt not ask and seek rules of good and evil from any one else than from me, thou shalt thus show thyself obedient to me. To this it is objected, God foreknew the fall of man, which he might have prevented if he had not willed it, but he did not prevent it, therefore Adam sinned by the will and fault of God. Answer. An answer has already been returned to this objection, yet we may remark, in addition to what we have said, that it does not necessarily follow from the foreknowledge of God that man was compelled to fall. A certain wise father did, from some particular signs, foresee that his degenerate son at some subsequent time would be thrust through with a sword, nor does his foreknowledge deceive him, for he is slain for fornication. But no one believes that he is thus slain because the father foresaw that he would come to a miserable end, but because he is a fornicator. Ambrose thus speaks of the murder of Cain. Quote, God suddenly foreknew to what his rage would lead him when excited and exasperated, yet he was not on this account urged to the deed which he perpetrated by the exercise of his own will, as by a necessity, to sin, because in his foreknowledge God cannot be deceived. End quote. And Augustine says, quote, God is a just revenger of those things of which he is not the wicked perpetrator. End quote. Fifth, what are the effects of sin? Having defined and considered what sin is and whence it proceeds, we are now prepared to investigate the effects which necessarily follow the transgression of the divine law, a knowledge of which is of great importance to a proper understanding of the magnitude of the evil of sin. These effects are temporal and eternal punishments, and because God often punishes sins with sins, subsequent transgressions may be said to be the effects of preceding sins. Romans 1 verse 24, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 11, Matthew 13 verse 12. That this may be the better understood, the following explanations are especially necessary. 1. Original sin, or the depravity of the entire nature of man, or the destruction of the image of God in man, in the sense in which we have explained it, is the effect of the fall of our first parents in paradise. Romans 5 verse 19. 2. All actual sins are the effects of original sin. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Romans 7 verse 17. 3. All subsequent actual sins are the effects of preceding ones, and an increase of them, since, according to the just judgment of God, men often run from one sin into another, as Paul teaches concerning the Gentiles in the first chapter of his epistle to the Romans. 4. The sins of other men are also frequently the effects of actual sins, inasmuch as many persons are made worse through the reproach and bad examples of others, and are thus enticed and urged on to sin. As it is said, evil communications corrupt good manners. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 33. 5. An evil conscience and a fear of the judgment of God invariably and constantly follow the commission of sin. Romans 2 verse 15, 
Isaiah 57 verse 21. 6. All the various calamities of this life, together with temporal death itself, are the effects of sin, because it is on account of sin that God has inflicted all these things upon the human race, according to the declaration, In the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Genesis 2 verse 17. 7. Eternal death is the last and most extreme consequence of sin in all those who have not been delivered therefrom by the death and merit of Christ. Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake to shame and everlasting contempt. Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire. Deuteronomy 27 verse 26, Daniel 12 verse 1, Matthew 25 verse 41. All sins, therefore, whatever may be their character, deserve in their own nature eternal death, which is most plainly affirmed in these and similar passages of God's word. Cursed be he that confirmeth, etc. Whosoever shall offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Thou shalt by no means come out thence, till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. Deuteronomy 27 verse 26, James 2 verse 10, Matthew 5 verse 26. Yet all sins are not equal, they differ according to certain degrees, even in the judgment of God, as it is said, All sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness. He that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. Mark 3, verses 28 and 29, John 19, verse 11. So there will also be degrees in the punishments of hell, for the punishments of the lost will be in proportion to the sins which they have committed, although, as it respects the duration of these punishments, all will be eternal. That servant which knew his Lord's will and did not according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. It shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. Luke 12, verse 47, Matthew 11, verse 22. Section 9. The Freedom of the Will. Question 8. Are we then so corrupt that we are wholly incapable of doing any good, and inclined to all wickedness? Answer, indeed we are, except we are regenerated by the Spirit of God. Exposition. The question of the freedom of the will, or the power of the human will to obey God, and to do that which is good, is intimately connected with the subject of the misery of man, and claims our attention next in order. It is also necessary to know what ability man possessed before the fall, and what he has since, that, having a correct knowledge of the effects of the first sin, we may be the more excited to humility, and to an earnest desire for divine grace and guidance, and also to true gratitude to God. For this doctrine of the liberty of the will brings us to a consideration not of the ability and excellence of man, but of his weakness and misery. Of free will the principal question and object in this discussion is whether man can now, in the same way in which he separated himself from God, also return to him by his own strength, accept of the grace that is offered him by God, and recover for himself the position which has been lost by sin, and also whether the will of man be the chief cause why some are converted, whilst others continue in sin, and why, both among the converted and the unconverted, some are better than others. In a word, whether the will of man be the cause why men do good or evil, whether in this or in that manner. The Pelagians and others of a similar character reply to this question, that so much grace is given by God and left by nature to all men, that they can of themselves return to God and obey Him. Neither are we to seek for any other cause than the will of man as the reason why some receive and retain, whilst others reject and disregard divine aid in forsaking sin, and do, after this or that manner, resolve upon and execute their own counsels and deeds. The Holy Scriptures, however, teach a wholly different doctrine, which, as we understand it, is that no work acceptable and pleasing to God can be undertaken and performed by any one without regeneration and the special grace of the Holy Spirit. Neither can there be any more or less good in the counsels and actions of any man than God of his own free grace chooses to produce in them nor can the will of any creature be inclined in any other direction than that which seems good to the eternal and gracious counsel of God. And yet all the actions of the created will, both good and bad, are performed freely. That this may be the better understood, let us inquire, first, what is freedom of will or free power of choice? 
Second, what is the distinction which exists between the liberty which is in God and that which is in his rational creatures, angels and men? Third, is there any freedom of the human will? Fourth, what kind of freedom of will is there in man, or how many degrees of free will are there in man, according to his fourfold state? First, what is the freedom of the will, or free power of choice? The term freedom or liberty sometimes signifies a relation, power or right, be it the ordering or disposing of a person or thing made by the will of a certain person, or by nature for the purpose of acting with one's own choice, or from fear according to just laws, or the order which is in harmony with the nature of man, for the purpose of enjoying those benefits which are fit and proper to us, without any prohibition and restraint and for the purpose of being relieved from enduring the wants and burdens which are not peculiar to our nature. This may be termed a freedom from bondage and misery, and is opposed to slavery. So God is most free because he is bound to no one, so the Jews and Romans were free, not being bound by foreign governments and burdens, so a state or city is free from tyranny and servitude, whilst in the enjoyments of civil liberty so we, being justified by faith, are through Christ freed from the wrath of God, the curse of the law, and the ceremonies instituted by Moses. But this signification of liberty does not properly belong to this discussion of the freedom of the will, because it is evident and admitted by all that we are the servants of God, and that the law binds us either to obedience or punishment. There are also many things which our will chooses freely, which it nevertheless has not the power or ability to perform. Secondly, freedom is opposed to constraint, and is a quality of the will, or a natural power of an intelligent creature, concurring with the will, that is, it is the power of choosing or refusing of its own accord, and without any constraint, an object presented by the understanding, the nature of the will remaining the same, and being free to choose this or that, or to defer any action it may see fit, just as a man may be willing to walk or not to walk. This is to act upon mature deliberation, which is the method of acting peculiar to the will. This freedom of will belongs to God, angels, and men, and when considered in relation to them is called free power of choice. For that is said to be free which is endowed with this power or liberty of willing or not willing, whilst the power of choice is the will itself, as it follows or rejects the judgment of the mind in the choice which it makes, for it comprehends both faculties of the mind, viz. the judgment and the will. Free power of choice is therefore the faculty or power of willing or not willing, of choosing or rejecting an object presented by the understanding of its own accord and without any constraint. This faculty is called the power of choice in respect to the mind, which presents objects to the will to be chosen or rejected, and it is called free in respect to the will, following voluntarily and of its own accord, without any constraint, the judgment of the mind. That is called free which is voluntary, and which is opposed to what is involuntary and constrained, but not to that which is necessary, for that which is voluntary may agree and harmonize with what is necessary, but not with what is involuntary, as God and the holy angels are necessarily good, but not involuntarily or constrainedly but most freely, because they have the beginning and cause of their goodness, which is free will in themselves. That is said to be constrained, which has only an external beginning and cause of its own activity, and not at the same time one that is also internal, by which it may move itself to act in this or in that manner. There is therefore such a difference between what is necessary and constrained, as that which exists between what is general and particular. Whatever is constrained is necessary, but not everything that is necessary is constrained. Hence there is what is called a double necessity, a necessity of immutability and of constraint. The former may exist with what is voluntary, but the latter cannot. The same distinction also exists between what is free and contingent. Everything that is free is contingent, but not the opposite. Therefore that which is free is a species of what is contingent, as is also that which is fortuitous and casual. Second, what is the distinction which exists between the liberty which is in God and his creatures, angels and men? There are two things common to God and rational creatures as it respects the liberty of the will. The one is that God and intelligent creatures act upon deliberation and counsel, 
that is, they choose or reject objects by the exercise of the understanding and will. The other is that they choose or reject objects by their own proper and inward activity, without any constraint, which is the same thing as to say that the will, being in its own nature capacitated to will the opposite of that which it does will, or to defer acting, inclines of its own accord to that course which it prefers. Psalm 104 verse 24, Psalm 115 verse 3, Genesis 3 verse 6, Isaiah 1 verses 19 and 20, Matthew 23 verse 37. There are three differences between the liberty which belongs to God and that which belongs to his creatures. The first relates to the understanding. God sees and understands of himself all things in the most perfect manner from all eternity without the least ignorance or error of judgment. Creatures, on the other hand, know nothing of themselves, neither do they know all things nor the same things at all times, but only so much of God, together with his works and will, as he is pleased, at particular times, to reveal unto them. Hence they are ignorant of many things, and often err. The following passages of Scripture confirm this distinction which we have made in regard to the understanding. Of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. He giveth wisdom unto the wise, and knowledge to them that know understanding. Who hath directed the Spirit of the Lord? Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. He lighteneth every man that cometh into the world. Matthew 24, verse 36, Daniel 2, verse 21, Isaiah 40, verse 13, Hebrews 4, verse 13, John 1, verse 9. The second distinction holds in the will. The will of God is neither governed by nor dependent upon anything beyond or out of itself. The wills of angels and men are indeed the causes of their own actions, yet they are, notwithstanding, influenced and controlled by the secret counsel and providence of God in the choice or rejection of objects, whether immediately by God or through certain instrumentalities, be they good or evil, which God sees fit to employ. It is consequently impossible for them to do anything contrary to the eternal and immutable counsel of God. Hence the term aftexusion, which means to be absolutely his own, at his own will and in his own power, by which the Greek theologians express free power of choice, belongs more properly to God, who is perfectly and absolutely at his own control, not being bound to any one, whilst the term ekousion, which means voluntary or free, is more correctly used in relation to creatures, and is thus applied in the following passages of Scripture. Philemon, verse 14, Hebrews 10, verse 26, 1 Peter 5, verse 2. The various arguments and testimonies from the Word of God, by which this distinction is established, will be presented at large when we come to the consideration of the doctrine of the providence of God. That God, however, is indeed the first cause of His counsels, these and similar declarations of His Word plainly affirm. He hath done whatsoever He hath pleased, who doeth according to His will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. Psalm 115, verse 3, Daniel 4, verse 35 that the will and counsels of creatures depend upon the permission and will of God, may be proven by the following and similar passages of Holy Writ. The Lord shall send his angel before thee, etc. Go and gather the children of Israel together, etc. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. But God hath fulfilled those things, etc. Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together, for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. I know, O Lord, that the way of man is not in himself, it is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Genesis 24, verse 7, Exodus 3, verse 16, Acts 2, verse 23, chapter 3, verse 17, chapter 4, verse 27, Jeremiah 10, verse 23, Proverbs 21, verse 1. The will, therefore, of angels and men and all other second causes are in like manner governed by God, as they are from Him, as their first and chief cause. But the will of God is ruled by none of His creatures, because, as He has no efficient cause out of Himself, so He has no moving or inclining cause. Otherwise He would not be God, the first and great cause of all His works, and creatures would be substituted in the place of God. God does not constrain and force, but moves and directs the will of his creatures. In other words, he effectually inclines the will by presenting objects to the mind, to choose that which the understanding at the time judges to be good, and to reject what it conceives to be evil.
The third distinction holds in the understanding and will at the same time. God, as he knows all things unchangeably, so he has also decreed them from everlasting, and wills unchangeably all things which are done, in as far as they are good, and permits them in as far as they are sins. But as the notions and judgment which creatures form of things are changeable, so their wills are also changeable. They will that which before they would not, and refuse to choose that which they formerly delighted in. And still further, as all the counsels of God are most good, just, and wise, he never disapproves of them, neither does he correct or change them, as men often do, when they perceive that they have unwisely decided upon anything. These declarations of Scripture are here in point. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. I am the Lord, I change not. What if God, willing to show his wrath, and to make his power known, endured with much, etc.? Numbers 23, verse 19, Malachi 3, verse 6, Romans 9, verse 22. Objection 1. He who cannot change his counsel has no free will. God cannot change his counsel, therefore his will is not free. Answer. We reply to the first proposition of this syllogism by making a distinction. It is not he who cannot change his purpose that has no liberty of will, but he who cannot change his counsel, being hindered by some external cause, although he might wish to change it. But God does not change his counsel, neither can he change it. Not, however, on account of any hindrance arising from some external cause, nor on account of any imperfection of nature or ability, but because he does not will, neither can he will a change of his counsel, on account of the immutable rectitude of his will, in which no error nor any cause of change can possibly exist. Objection to that which is governed and ruled by the unchangeable will of God does not act freely. The will of angels and men acts freely, therefore it is not ruled nor bound in the choice which it makes by the unchangeable will of God. Answer. It is necessary here again, in answering the above objection, to make the following distinction with reference to the major proposition. He who is so ruled and controlled by the will of God, as to act without any deliberation or choice of his own, does not act freely, but it is not in this way that God influences the will of angels and men. He presents objects to the understanding, and through these effectually moves and inclines the will, so that although they choose that which God wills, they nevertheless do it from their own deliberation and choice, and therefore act freely. Hence creatures may be said to act freely, not when they disregard every form of government and restraint, but when they act with deliberation, and when the will chooses or rejects objects by its own free exercise, even though it may be excited and controlled by someone else. Objection 3. If the will, when God changes it, and directed it upon other objects, cannot resist, it is wholly passive. But this involves us in error, therefore the will cannot be thus influenced and controlled. Answer. The conclusion he had drawn is incorrect, inasmuch as there is not a sufficiently full and distinct enumeration in the major proposition of those exercises and actions of which the will is capable of. For it may not only resist the influence which God brings to bear upon it, but it has the ability also, by its own proper determination, to obey God, and to assent to the suggestions and influences of his Spirit. In doing this, however, it is not only passive, but also active, and performs its own actions, although the power of assenting and obeying is not from itself, but from the grace of the Holy Spirit. Objection 4. That which resists the will of God is not governed by it. The will of man opposes and resists God in many things, therefore it is not governed by him. Answer. There are here four terms. The major proposition is true, if it be understood, as including both the secret and revealed will of God. The minor, however, merely expresses the will of God as expressed or revealed, for the secret decrees of God's will are always ratified and performed in all, even in those who most violently resist the commands of God. Objection 5. If all the determinations, including even those of the wicked, are excited and ruled by the will of God, and if many of these are sinful, then God seems to be the author of sin. Answer. There is here a fallacy of accident in the minor proposition, for the determinations of the wicked are sins, not in as far as they are ordained and proceed from the will of God, for so far they are good and agree with the divine law, but in as far as they are from devils and men, who in acting either do not know the will of God, or do not perform it with the design that they may thus obey and glorify God. Third. Is there any freedom of the human will? 
that there is in man a certain freedom of will is proven one from the fact that man was created in the image of god of which free will constituted a part let us make man in our image after our likeness god made man in the beginning and left him in the hand of his counsel genesis one verse twenty six ecclesiasticus fifteen verse fourteen two from the definition of the freedom which belongs to man for man acts upon deliberation freely knowing and desiring or rejecting this or that object if this definition now correspond with the nature of man the thing which is expressed and defined by it must also belong to him objection if man be in the possession of freedom of will the doctrine of original sin is overthrown for it is a contradiction to say that man is not able to obey god and to affirm at the same time that he has liberty of will answer there is no real opposition in what is here affirmed because since the fall man has liberty of will only in part and not such as he had before the fall nor to the same degree objection to he who has not a will to choose in like manner the good and the evil does not possess free will but man since the fall has not a will to choose equally the good and the evil therefore he does not possess freedom of will answer we reject the major proposition because it contains an incorrect definition of liberty for according to it god himself does not possess any liberty of will objection three that which is dependent upon another is not free our will is dependent upon another therefore it is not free answer we reply to the major proposition by making the following distinction that which is dependent upon and ruled by another and not by itself also is not free the will of man however is ruled not only by another but also by itself for god influences men in such a manner that they are not constrained and carried along involuntarily but most freely so that it may be said that they move themselves the being or will which is moved only by itself belongs to god alone of whom infinite liberty may more correctly be predicated than of creatures in the meanwhile however it may be sufficient as far as it respects the liberty which belongs to man to affirm that whatever he wills he wills freely and by his own proper determination objection four that which is enslaved is not free our power of choice is enslaved since the fall therefore it is not free answer the whole argument is conceded if by free we understand that which has the power of choosing that which is good and pleasing to god for thus far the will is held in bondage and can only will and choose that which is evil i am carnal sold under sin etc romans seven verse fourteen but if by free we understand voluntary or deliberative then the major proposition is false for it is not the subjection but the constraint of the will that takes away its liberty fourth what kind of liberty of will has man or how many degrees of free will are there according to man's fourfold state it is still further to be inquired in the discussion of this subject and this is also necessary in order that we may arrive at a proper knowledge of ourselves what and how great was the liberty of will which man possessed before the fall whether there be any or none at all since the fall and if any what is it whether it be restored in us in what manner and how far wherefore it is evident that the degrees of free will may be considered and distinguished most correctly according to the fourfold state of man viz as not yet fallen into sin as fallen as regenerated and as glorified that is what kind and how great was the freedom of the human will before the fall what is this freedom since the fall and before regeneration what is it in those who are regenerated and what will it be in the life to come in a state of glorification the first degree of liberty is that which belonged to man before the fall this consisted in a mind enlightened with the perfect knowledge of god and a will yielding entire obedience to god by its own voluntary act and inclination and yet not so confirmed in this knowledge and obedience but that it might fall by its own free exercise if the appearance of any good were presented for the purpose of deceiving and effecting a fall that is the will of man was free to choose good and evil or it might freely choose the good but in such a manner that it might also choose the evil it might continue to stand in the good being preserved by god and it might also incline and fall over to the evil if forsaken of god the former is confirmed by a consideration of the perfection of the image of god in which man was created the latter is evident from the event itself and from the following testimonies of scripture god made man upright but they have sought out many inventions 
God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 29, Romans 11 verse 32. In the last passage just quoted, Paul testifies that God, with profound wisdom, did not place the first man beyond the reach of a fool, nor did he give him such a measure of grace that he might not be seduced by the temptation of the devil and be persuaded to sin, but he permitted him to be seduced and to fall into sin and death, that all those who would be saved from this general ruin might be saved by his mercy alone. It is also proven by this plain argument that if nothing can be done without the eternal and most wise counsel of God, then surely the fall of our first parents, least of all, could be excluded therefrom, inasmuch as God had fully determined from the very beginning what he would have done as regards the human race, the most important part of the work of creation. Those things which the wisdom of man is accustomed to bring forward against what has here been advanced may be found in Orsini, volume 1, page 242, etc. The second degree of free power of choice is that which belongs to man as a fallen being, born of corrupt parents and unregenerated. In this state, the will does indeed act freely, but it is disposed and inclined only to that which is evil and can do nothing but sin. And the reason is because the fall was followed by a privation of the knowledge of God and of all inclinations to obedience, and because this has been succeeded by an ignorance of and an aversion to God, from which man cannot be delivered unless he be regenerated by the Holy Spirit. In short, there is in man, since the fall, in his unregenerate state, a proneness to choose only that which is evil. In view of this ignorance and corruption of human nature since the fall, it is said, every thought of man's heart is evil continually. Can the Ethiopian change his skin, and the leopard his spots, etc.? Every man from his youth is given to evil, and their stony hearts cannot become flesh. We were dead in trespasses and sins, and were by nature the children of wrath. A corrupt tree cannot bring forth good fruit. We are not sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves. Genesis 6 verse 5, Jeremiah 13 verse 23, Sirach 17 verse 13, Ephesians 2 verses 1 and 3, Matthew 7 verse 18, 2 Corinthians 3 verse 6. With these explicit testimonies gathered from the word of God, every man's experience fully harmonizes, as may also be said to be true of the sense of conscience, which declares that we have no liberty and inclination of will to do that which is good, but in the place of this a great proneness to do that which is evil, so long as we are not regenerated. As it is said, Turn thou me, and I shall be turned. Jeremiah 31 verse 18. It is, therefore, clearly evident that the love of God is in no one by nature, and hence no one in this state has a propensity or inclination to serve God. Objection 1. There is nothing easier, said Erasmus to Luther, than to restrain the hand from theft. And still further, Socrates, Aristides, and many others performed many excellent things, and were adorned with many virtues. Therefore there was in them, before regeneration, a power of choice that was free to do that which was good. Answer. This is an imperfect definition of free power of choice, and of what constitutes a good work, or of liberty to do that which is good, which is the power of rendering such obedience as is acceptable to God. This the unregenerate have not, and although they may refrain from theft as far as the external act is concerned, yet they are guilty of it as it respects the desires and tendencies of the heart, and not only so, but this external propriety itself, of which so much account is made, is to be attributed to God, who by his providence controls the hearts even of the wicked, and restrains them from those outbreaks of sin to which they are naturally inclined. Yet it would be wrong to conclude from this that it is easy for them to commence that true internal obedience which is pleasing to God. Such obedience can only be rendered by those who have been regenerated by the Holy Spirit. Objection 2. The works which are prescribed and enjoined by the law are good, the heathen perform many of these works, therefore their works are good, although they have not been regenerated, and, as a matter of consequence, they must possess liberty to choose the good. Answer. We reply to this objection by making the following distinction. The works prescribed and enjoined by the law are good, considered in themselves, but they become evil by an accident, when they are done by those who are not regenerated, because they are not done in the manner nor with the design which God requires. Objection 3. What God desires us to do, we have the power of doing. God desires us to do that which contributes to our well-being. 
therefore we have the ability of ourselves to do that which is good and consequently do not need the grace and influence of the holy spirit answer there is in this syllogism an incorrect chain of reasoning arising from the ambiguity of the word desire in the major it is used in its ordinary and proper sense but in the minor it is used improperly for god is here said to desire through a figure of speech by which he is represented as being affected after the manner of men hence there is a different kind of affirmation in the major from what there is in the minor god desires in two respects first in respect to his commandments and invitations secondly in respect to the love which he cherishes towards his creatures and the torments of those that perish but not in respect to the execution of his justice reply he who invites others to do that which is good and rejoice in their well-doing declares that it is in their power to do this and not in the power of him who invites but god invites us to do that which is good and approves of our conduct when we thus act therefore it is in our power to do the good answer we deny the minor proposition because it is not sufficient for god to invite it is also necessary that our wills consent to do the good which they will not do unless god incline them objection four if we can do nothing but sin before our regeneration god seems to punish us unjustly answer he who sins of necessity is punished unjustly unless he has brought this necessity of sinning upon himself we are therefore justly punished because we have brought this necessity of sinning upon ourselves in our first parents and follow their example by doing the same things other objections which are ordinarily brought forward by the advocates of free will may be seen in Ursini, volume one page two four five the third degree of free power of choice is that which belongs to a man as regenerated but not as yet perfected and glorified in this state the will uses its liberty not only for doing that which is evil as is true of man before his regeneration but here the will does both the good and the evil in part it does that which is good because the holy spirit by his special grace has renovated the nature of man through the word of god has kindled new light and knowledge in his understanding and has awakened in the heart and will such new desires and inclinations as are in harmony with the divine law and because the holy spirit effectually inclines the will to do those things which are in accordance with this knowledge and with these desires and inclinations it is in this way that the will recovers both the power of willing that which is acceptable to god and the use of this power so that it commences to obey god according to these declarations of his word the lord thy god will circumcise thy heart a new heart also will i give you and a new spirit will i put within you and i will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and i will give you a heart of flesh where the spirit of the lord is there is liberty whoever is born of god doth not commit sin deuteronomy thirty verse six exodus thirty six verse twenty six two corinthians three verse seventeen one john three verse nine the reasons on account of which the will in this third degree chooses and does in part both the good and the evil are the following one because the mind and will of those who are regenerated are not fully and perfectly renewed in this life there are many remains of depravity which cleave to the best of men as long as they continue in the flesh so that the works which they perform are imperfect and defiled with sin i know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing romans seven verse eighteen two because those who are regenerated are not always governed by the holy spirit but are sometimes forsaken of god for a season that he may thus either try or humble them yet although they are thus left to themselves for a time they do not finally perish for god in his own time and way calls them to repentance take not thy holy spirit from me o lord why hast thou made us to err from thy ways and hardened our heart from thy fear return for thy servant's sake psalm fifty one verse thirteen isaiah sixty three verse seventeen in short after regeneration is begun in man there is a proneness to choose partly the good and partly the evil there is a proneness to the good because the mind and will being illuminated and changed begin in some measure to be turned to the good and to commence new obedience there is a proneness to the evil because the saints are only imperfectly renewed in this life retain many infirmities and evil desires on account of original sin which still cleaves to them hence the good works which they perform are not perfectly good 
those things which the anabaptists and others of a similar character are accustomed to bring forward against what is here said of the imperfection of the holiness and good works of the righteous may be seen on the two hundred and fifty sixth page of the same volume of osinus to which we have before referred and also in the exposition of the hundred and fourteenth question of the catechism the fourth degree of free power of choice is that which belongs to man after this life in a state of glorification or as perfectly regenerated in this state the will of man will be free to choose only the good and not the evil this will be the highest degree or the perfect liberty of the human will when we shall obey god fully and for ever in this state we shall not only not sin but we will abhor it above everything else yea we shall then no longer be able to sin in proof of this we may adduce the following reasons first the perfect knowledge of god will then shine in the mind whilst there will be the strongest and most ardent desire of the will and heart to obey god so that there will be no room left for ignorance or doubt or the least contempt of god secondly in the life to come the saints will never be forsaken but will be constantly and for ever ruled by the holy spirit so that it will not be possible for them to deviate in the smallest respect from that which is right hence it is said they are as the angels of god in heaven we shall be like him matthew twenty two verse thirty one john three verse three the good angels are inclined only to that which is good because they are good just as the bad angels on the other hand are inclined only to that which is evil because they are evil but we shall be like the good angels our condition will therefore be one of far greater excellence than that of adam before the fall adam was indeed perfectly conformed to god but he had the power to will both the good and the evil and therefore with all his gifts he had a certain infirmity viz the possibility to fall from god and lose his gifts he was changeably good but we shall not be able to will anything but the good just as the wicked are inclined and led to do evil only because they are wicked so we shall be inclined to that which is good and love and choose it alone because we shall be unchangeably good we shall then be so fully established in righteousness and conformity to god that it will not be possible for us to fall from him yea it will then be impossible for us to will anything that is evil because we shall be preserved by divine grace in that state of perfect liberty in which the will will choose the good only from these things which we have now said in relation to human freedom it is manifestly a foul slander to say that we take away the liberty of the will and although those who are renewed and glorified will not be able to choose anything but the good after their glorification yet their power of choice will then be free to a much greater extent than it now is for god also cannot will anything but the good and yet he possesses perfect freedom of will so on the other hand we do not take away the power of choice from the ungodly or such as are unregenerated when we affirm that they are not able to will anything but that which is evil for they will and choose the evil freely yea most freely their will is inclined and carried with the greatest impetuosity to evil only because they continually retain in their hearts hatred to god hence all the works which they perform of an external moral character are evil in the sight of god as we have already shown in our remarks upon the doctrine of sin so much concerning the free power of choice which belongs to man fourth lord's day question nine doth not god then do injustice to man by requiring from him in his law that which he cannot perform answer not at all for god made man capable of performing it but man by the instigation of the devil and his own wilful disobedience deprived himself and all his posterity of those divine gifts exposition there is here in this portion of the catechism an objection on the part of human reason against what is said in the preceding question if man is so corrupt that he cannot do anything that is good before his regeneration then god seems unjustly and in vain to require from him in his law perfect obedience the objection may be more fully stated thus he who requires or commands that which is impossible is unjust god requires of man in his law perfect obedience which it is impossible for him to perform therefore god seems to be unjust to this objection we reply as follows he who requires what is impossible is unjust unless he first gave the ability to perform what he requires secondly unless man covered and has of his own accord brought this inability upon himself and lastly unless the requirement which it is not possible for man to comply with be of such a nature as is calculated to lead him to acknowledge and deplore his inability 
but God, by creating man in his own image, gave him the ability to render that obedience which he justly requires from him in his law. Wherefore, if man, by his own fault and free will, cast away this ability with which he was endowed, and brought himself into a state in which he can no longer render full obedience to the divine law, God has not, for this reason, lost his right to exact the obedience which man is in duty bound to render him. God, therefore, justly punishes us, because we have cast away this good by transgressing his commandments, and because he threatened punishment in case his law were violated. Objection 1. But we did not bring this sin upon ourselves. Answer. Our first parents, when they fell, lost this ability both for themselves and all their posterity, just as they also received it for themselves and their posterity. If a prince were to give a nobleman a fee, and he were to rebel against him, he would lose it, not only for himself, but for his posterity also, and the prince would do no injustice to his children by not restoring to them that which was lost by the rebellion of their father. And if he does restore it, it is because of his goodness and mercy. Objection 2. He that commands impossibilities commands in vain. God commands that which is impossible for man to perform since the fall, therefore he commands in vain. Answer. 1. God does not command in vain, even though we do not perform what he enjoins upon us, because his commandments have other ends in view, both as it respects the righteous and the wicked. The righteous are required to obey the commands of God. 1. That they may acknowledge their own weakness and inability. By the law is the knowledge of sin. 2. That they may know what they were before the fall. 3. That they may know what they ought most especially to ask of God, viz. the renewal of their nature. 4. That they may understand what Christ has done in our behalf, that he has made satisfaction for us and regenerates us. 5. That we may commence new obedience to God, because the law teaches us how we ought to act towards God, in view of the benefits of redemption, and what God in return requires of us. Obedience is required from the wicked. 1. That the justice of God may be manifest in their condemnation, because if they know what they ought to do, and yet do it not, they are justly condemned. That servant which knew his Lord's will, and did not according to it, shall be beaten with many stripes. Luke 12, verse 47. 2. That external propriety and discipline may be preserved. 3. That those whom God designs to save may be converted. We reply in the second place to the major proposition of this syllogism by making the following distinction. He who commands impossibilities does indeed command in vain unless he at the same time gives the ability but God, in commanding the elect, gives them the power also to obey, and commences obedience in them by the gospel, and ultimately perfects it. Augustine says, Lord, give what thou dost command, and command what thou wilt, and thou shalt not command in vain. De dono persivantine, caput ten. This impossible demand is, therefore, the greatest benefit, because it leads us to the attainment of the power through which we may comply with what is required of us. Question 10. Will God suffer such disobedience and rebellion to go unpunished? Answer. By no means. Bart is terribly displeased with our original as well as actual sins, and will punish them in his just judgment, temporally and eternally. As he has declared, cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Exposition. In the exposition of this question we must consider the evil of punishment, which is the other part of the misery of man. In relation to this we are taught that God punishes sin most severally, justly, and certainly. He punishes it most severally, that is, with present and eternal punishment, on account of its enormity and greatness, because it is an offence against the infinite good. Most justly, because every sin, even the smallest transgression, is a violation of the law of God, and therefore, according to the order of divine justice, deserves eternal punishment and banishment from God most certainly because God is true and does not change the sentence which the law denounces. Cursed is he that continueth not in all things written in the book of the law to do them. Galatians 3 verse 6. Objection 1. But the wicked often prosper in this life and do many things with impunity. Therefore all sins are not punished. Answer. They will at length be punished. Yea, they are even in this life punished. 1. In the conscience by whose stings the wicked are tortured. 2. Also in those things which they use with the greatest eagerness and delight, and the less they know and acknowledge themselves to be punished, so much the heavier it is. 
three they are also often afflicted with other grievous punishments and yet their punishment will be still more dreadful in the life to come where it will be everlasting death objection two god did not create evil and death therefore he will not punish sin so severely answer he did not indeed create them in the beginning yet when sin was committed he inflicted death in his just judgment upon sinners according to the threatening thou shalt surely die genesis two verse seventeen wherefore it is likewise said shalt there be evil in a city and the lord hath not done it amos three verse six objection three if god punish sin with present and everlasting judgment he punishes the same offence twice and is unjust but he is not unjust neither does he punish the same offence twice therefore he will not punish with present and everlasting punishment answer we deny the major proposition for the punishment which god inflicts upon the wicked in this and in the life to come is but one punishment although it consists of several parts present punishment is but the beginning of everlasting punishment neither is it separate or complete in itself because it is not sufficient to satisfy the justice of god objection four sins which are different in their character are not punished with an equal punishment therefore all sins are not punished with eternal punishment answer there is more in the conclusion than in the premises this is all that legitimately follows therefore all sins are not punished with equal punishment which is true but all sins even the smallest deserve eternal punishment because all offend the infinite and eternal good hence all sins are punished equally as to duration but not as to the degrees of punishment great sins will be punished eternally with severe punishment whilst smaller ones will be punished eternally with lighter punishment objection five but if god punish sin with eternal punishment then all of us must either perish or else the justice of god is not satisfied answer it is true indeed that if god were to punish sin in us we would all necessarily perish for ever but he does not punish sin in us with eternal punishment and yet his justice does not suffer on this account because he has made a satisfaction for our sins in christ by inflicting upon him a punishment equivalent to that which is eternal it is in this way that the gospel satisfies the demands of the law objection six but if god has punished our sins in christ he ought not if he is just to inflict further punishment upon us so that the afflictions of the righteous in this life are unjust answer the afflictions of the righteous are not to be regarded as a punishment or satisfaction for sin but they are merely the chastisement of a father sent for the purpose of humbling them hence it becomes necessary for us after we shall have given an exposition of the following question of the catechism to speak of afflictions question eleven but is not god also merciful answer god is indeed merciful but also just therefore his justice requires that sin which is committed against the most high majesty of god be also punished with extreme that is with everlasting punishment both of body and soul exposition there is here an objection to what is taught in the preceding question which affirms that god punishes every sin with eternal punishment the objection is this it belongs to him who is in the highest degree merciful not to be too rigorous in the demands of his justice god is in the highest degree merciful therefore he will not exact all that his extreme justice demands and so will not punish sin with eternal punishment to the major proposition we thus reply it does indeed belong to him who is merciful to be lenient in his demands but not so as to wrong his justice if he be at the same time extremely just but god is exceedingly merciful in such a way that he is also exceedingly just hence he will exercise his mercy in such a manner as not to do any violence to his justice now the justice of god demands that sin which is committed against his most high majesty be punished with extreme that is with everlasting punishment both of body and soul that there may be a proportion between the offence and its punishment every crime is great and deserving of punishment in proportion to the majesty of him against whom it is committed the following objection demands a passing notice objection he who rigorously exacts his right shuts out every expectation of clemency god rigorously exacts his right therefore with him there is no clemency or the objection may be thus stated he who does not yield anything in relation to his rights is not merciful but only just god does not yield anything as it respects his rights because he punishes every sin with a punishment that corresponds with its just desert answer we deny the minor proposition because god although he punishes sin with eternal punishment 
does nevertheless yield much as it respects his right. He exhibits great clemency, for instance, towards the reprobate, for he defers the punishment which they deserve, and invites them to repentance by strong and powerful motives. And as to the punishment which he will inflict upon them in the world to come, it will be lighter than they deserved. So he also exercises great mercy towards the faithful, for he has, from his mercy alone, without being bound by any law or merit on our part, given his son, and subjected him to punishment for our sake. We also deny the major proposition, if applied either to him who is endowed with such wisdom that he can discover a method of exercising mercy without violating his justice, or when applied to him, who, whilst he executes his justice, does not rejoice in the destruction of man, but would rather that he be saved. As a judge, when he passes the sentence upon a robber, that he deserves to be put to the torture, and yet does not take pleasure in his punishment, exhibits great equity and clemency, even though he seems to exact the most rigorous demand of the law, so God is far more equitable and clement, although in his just judgment he punishes sin, for he does not delight in the destruction of the wicked, Ezekiel 18, verse 23, and chapter 33, verse 11, and has also shown his mercy and compassion towards us by laying the punishment which we deserved upon his own Son. Section 10 Concerning Afflictions there are three questions which particularly claim our attention in regard to afflictions. First, how many kinds of afflictions are there? Second, what are the causes of them? Third, what comforts may be opposed to them? First, how many kinds of afflictions are there? There are two kinds of afflictions, such as are temporal and such as are eternal. Eternal are those everlasting torments of body and soul, which constitute the final portion of devils, and of the wicked who in this life are not converted to God. They are called in the scriptures, hell, torments, unquenchable fire, a worm that dieth not, and everlasting death, because they are torments which will be everlasting, and such as are experienced by the dying, who, although they are always dying, will never be dead. This now will be the character of eternal death, always to die and never to be dead, or it will be a continuation of death with an infinite increase of hellish agonies and torments. The following are some of the declarations of Scripture which refer to everlasting punishment. Their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. If the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Isaiah 66, verse 24, Mark 9, verse 43 and 44, Matthew 25, verse 41, 1 Peter 4, verse 18. The reason which makes this form of punishment necessary is evident from this, that sin which is committed against God, who is infinitely good, demands an infinite punishment and satisfaction, which could not be rendered by the afflictions which are incident merely to this life. This would not satisfy the infinite and eternal justice of God. That eternal punishment includes both the soul and body is clearly affirmed by Christ himself when he says, Fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Matthew 10 verse 28. The soul is the fountain of sin, whilst the body, as a thing destitute of reason, executes what the soul directs. As the soul and body are, therefore, both involved in the commission of sin, the one being the author, and the other the instrument, they will both be included in the punishment thereof. Objection. He who is most merciful cannot behold the eternal torments of his creatures, much less inflict them. God's mercy is infinitely great, and exceeds our sins, Therefore he can neither inflict nor behold eternal torments in his creatures. Answer. This objection is true if it refers merely to a being who is infinitely merciful, without being at the same time infinitely just. But as both of these attributes meet in the character of God, the objection loses its force when applied to him, as we have already shown in our remarks upon the eleventh question of the Catechism. Temporal afflictions, such as sickness, poverty, reproach, calumny, oppression, banishment, wars, and the other miseries of this life, together with temporal death itself, are common both to the righteous and the wicked. These afflictions are either punishments or the cross. The punishments, which are a part of the afflictions of this life, consist in the destruction and sufferings which are inflicted upon those who are guilty of sin. These are peculiar to the reprobate, 
because they are inflicted upon them for the purpose of making satisfaction to the justice of God. For the law binds all men either to obedience or punishment. Objection. But the evils which are inflicted upon the wicked in this life are not sufficient to satisfy the justice of God. Answer. They do not constitute the whole punishment of the wicked. They are only a part of it, and a beginning of that full satisfaction which will be exacted from them through all eternity. Just as every part of the air is called air, so every part of punishment is called punishment. There are, however, degrees of punishment. The first degree is that which pertains to this life, for here already, when conscience chides and reproves, there is a commencement of the gnawings of the worm which shall never die. The second degree of punishment is that which is experienced in temporal death, when the wicked begin to feel the wrath of God, as the soul is separated from the body and plunged into the place of hopeless torment. The third degree of punishment is that which will be inflicted in the last judgment, when the soul and body will be cast into hell, and everlasting agonies will rush in from every side, as if in torrents upon the wicked. The cross comprises those afflictions which are peculiar to the godly, which are not properly punishments because they are not afflicted for the purpose of making satisfaction to the justice of God. There are four kinds of afflictions included in the cross, and distinguished from each other by their ends. The first comprises those chastisements which God inflicts upon the righteous for their sins, but which are inflicted according to his mercy, as a father corrects his son with much gentleness and toleration. They are therefore not properly punishments, but fatherly chastisements, by which the godly are admonished of their impurity, and of their peculiar sins and backslidings, are stirred up to repentance, and so brought back to the path of duty and holiness. Thus David was driven from his kingdom and banished on account of his fall, for peculiar sins are followed by peculiar and severe chastisements, even in the saints. These chastisements, however, are not to be regarded as a recompense for sin, but they are the effects of divine justice, through which God designs that we and others should be made acquainted with the rectitude of his character, that he is greatly displeased with sin and will punish it with death, not only in this but also in the life to come, unless we repent and return to him. The second form or species of the cross includes the proofs or trials which are made of the faith, hope, patience, etc. of the saints, in order that these virtues may be strengthened and confirmed in them, and also that their infirmity may be made manifest to themselves and others. Such was the nature of Job's affliction. The third form of the cross is martyrdom, which includes the testimony and witness of the saints concerning the doctrine of the gospel, when they confirm and seal with their blood the doctrine which they professed, by which they declare that it is true that they themselves experience in death the comfort which they promised to others in their teachings, and that there remains another life and another judgment after this life. The cross, in the last place, includes ransom, or the obedience of Christ, which is a satisfaction for our sins, and includes the entire humiliation of Christ, from the very moment of his conception to his last agony upon the cross. A TABLE OF THE AFFLICTIONS OF MAN Afflictions are, one, temporal, some of which belong to the wicked, and are properly punishments for sins, or the godly, as the cross which includes chastisements, trials, martyrdom, or ransom. Afflictions are, two, eternal, which include the everlasting torments of the damned. Second, what are the causes of afflictions? The causes of the punishments of the wicked are, one, sin, which is the impelling cause, they are made to suffer, that satisfaction may thus be made by a just punishment for their sins. 2. The justice of God, which is the chief efficient cause which inflicts punishment for sin. 3. The instrumental causes are various. They are such as angels and men, both good and bad, and other creatures, all of whom are armed against the sinner and fight under God's banner. The causes of the cross, which is peculiar to the godly, are 1. Sin which, however, is to be viewed differently in the godly from what it is in the wicked. The godly are afflicted on account of sin, not for the purpose of making satisfaction to the justice of God, but that sin may be acknowledged by them and removed through the cross. They are paternally chastised, that they may be led to a knowledge of their faults. These chastisements are to them sermons and call to repentance. 
when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. It is good for me that I have been afflicted. God, however, gives loose reins to the wicked, that they may rush into destruction. He confers upon them the blessings of this life, with a short season of repose and rejoicing, because they are his creatures, that their ingratitude may become apparent, and that he may render them inexcusable. But he corrects and improves the character of the godly through the cross. 2. That we may learn to hate sin, the devil, and the world. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Love not the world. John 15, verse 19, Ephesians 6, verse 12, 1 John 2, verse 15. 3. That we may be exercised and tried, that thus our faith, hope, patience, prayer, and obedience may be strengthened and confirmed, or that we may have matter and occasion for exercising and proving ourselves, and that our faith, hope, and patience may be made manifest both to ourselves and others. When all things go well, it is an easy thing for us to glory in regard to our faith, but in adversity the grace or beauty of virtue becomes apparent. He that has not been tempted, what knoweth he? Experience worketh hope. Romans 5 verse 4. 4. The peculiar faults and slidings of the saints. Manasseh had his peculiar faults, Jehoshaphat had his, and other saints have other failings and sins peculiar to themselves. Hence the chastisements, by which God shows that he is also displeased with the sins of the saints, and will avenge them more severely, unless they repent, are various and different. That servant which knew his Lord's will, and did not according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. Luke 12 verse 47 5. The exhibition and manifestation of the glory of God in the deliverance of the church and of the godly. God often brings his church and people into extreme danger, that the deliverance which he effects may be the more glorious, as was the case with the oppression of the children of Israel in Egypt, and their captivity in Babylon, etc. In these instances the deliverance which God wrought was truly glorious, and gave evidence of his wisdom in discovering a way of escape where no creature could hope for it. The Lord bringeth down to the grave, and bringeth up. 1 Samuel 2, verse 6. 6. The conformity of the members to Christ, their head in affliction and glory. If we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. Whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. The servant is not greater than his Lord, nor the disciple above his master. 2 Timothy 2, verse 12, Romans 8, verse 29, Matthew 10, verse 24. 7. That the saints by their sufferings and death may bear witness to the truth of the doctrine of the gospel, for when the faithful endure every form of suffering, and even death itself for the sake of their profession of Christianity, they give the most satisfactory testimony that they themselves are fully persuaded of its truth, and that they cannot from any consideration be induced to renounce it, and also that it affords them real and solid consolation even in death itself, and must therefore necessarily be true. It was foretold to Peter by what death he should glorify God. John 21, verse 19. 8. The afflictions of the godly are evidences of a judgment to come and of eternal life. The truth and justice of God both require that it should at length go well with the righteous and ill with the wicked. This, however, is not fully the case in this life. Therefore there must be another life after this, in which God will render to every one according to his just deserts which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer. 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 5 Having made these remarks in relation to the afflictions of the godly, we may easily reply to the objection which the men of the world are wont to bring against the providence of God. The church, say they, is oppressed throughout the whole world, and trodden under foot by all men. Therefore it is not the true church, and is not cared for on the part of God. But this, instead of proving anything against the church, is rather an argument in its favour, for if the church were of the world, then this opposition and persecution would cease, for the world loves its own. The reasons of the afflictions of the church are therefore manifest, and the end of things will convict and condemn the world. Third, what are the comforts which we may oppose to our affliction? There are some comforts under afflictions which are peculiar to the church, 
whilst there are others that are common both to the church and philosophy the first in connection with the ninth and tenth which we shall now present are peculiar to the church whilst the rest are common both to it and philosophy and yet whilst it may be said that they are common it is only as it respects the outward appearance and not as it regards the matter or substance of the things spoken of these comforts we shall present in the following order one remission of sin this is the first in order and lies at the bottom of all the rest because if we have no assurance of the forgiveness of sin and reconciliation with god all the other comforts are of no account for we should then always be in doubt whether the promise of grace belongs to us or not but if this comfort be well grounded and fixed all the others will naturally follow for if god be our father we may rest assured that he will not only not send us anything that will be an injury to us but he will also defend us against all the evils of this life if god be for us who can be against us romans eight verse thirty one the reason of all this is that where the cause is taken away the effect is also removed therefore where sin is taken away punishments and death are also done away with two the will and providence of god or the necessity of obeying god both in adversity and prosperity because he wills and directs all things the reason of this consequence of obedience is not only because we are not able to resist him but more especially one because he is our father two because he is deserving of this obedience from us to such an extent that we ought to be willing to endure the greatest evils for his sake three because the evils which he sends are fatherly chastisements this comfort quiets the mind inasmuch as it assures us that it is our heavenly father's will that we should suffer these things though he slay me yet will i trust in him the lord gave and the lord hath taken away blessed be the name of the lord job thirteen verse fifteen chapter one verse twenty one philosophers tell us that we ought to endure patiently what we cannot alter and avoid they establish a fatal necessity and then count it foolish to resist it but in their calamities they do not submit themselves to god nor acknowledge his displeasure nor endure adversity with the design of obeying god but because they cannot avoid these things this is miserable comfort three the excellency of virtue or obedience to god which is true virtue on account of which the mind should not be cast down under the cross the temporal blessings which god confers upon us are great benefits but obedience faith hope etc are far greater therefore it becomes us not to prefer less benefits to those which are greater nor to cast away the greater for the sake of redeeming the loss of those which are less he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me whosoever will save his life shall lose it matthew ten verse thirty seven chapter sixteen verse twenty five philosophers make much account of the dignity of virtue but it is with poor grace inasmuch as they themselves are destitute of true virtue for a good conscience which exists only in the godly who know that god is at peace with them by and for the sake of christ the mediator now if god be favourable to us we cannot but enjoy tranquillity of mind philosophers however do not comfort their followers in this manner for when they are afflicted they ask why doth not good fortune or prosperity follow a good conscience and hence they complain and murmur as cato and others have done five the final causes or ends which are one the glory of god which is apparent in our deliverance two our salvation we are chastened of the lord that we should not be condemned with the world three the conversion of others together with the enlargement of the church the apostles rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for the name of jesus that thus others might be converted and confirmed in the faith philosophers tell us it is a good end when any one suffers for the purpose of saving his country and obtaining everlasting glory and renown but in the meantime miserable men they are led to ask what will these things profit us when we die six a comparison of events it is better to be chastened of the lord for a short season than to live in the greatest abundance and at last be driven from god and be cast into everlasting destruction philosophers comparing evils with each other find but little good arising from this comparison whilst they are ignorant of the chief good to obtain which we ought to be willing to suffer all the varied ills of life seven the hope of recompense or of reward in this and in another life great is your reward in heaven matthew five verse twelve we know that there are other blessings in reversion for us 
with which the afflictions of this life are not to be compared, and even in this life the godly enjoy greater blessings than other men, for they have peace with God and all other spiritual gifts. Temporal blessings, even though they are small as far as it respects the righteous, yet they are profitable to them. There is no man that hath left house, or brethren, or sisters, etc., but he shall receive an hundredfold now in this time, and in the world to come, eternal life. A little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. We glory in tribulations. Mark 10, verses 29 and 23. Psalm 37, verse 16. Romans 5, verse 3. The hope of reward may administer some little comfort to philosophers in light afflictions, but not in those which are grievous, because they think it better to be without this reward than to endure great sufferings for the sake of obtaining it, and also because they regard it as uncertain, small, and transient. 8. The example of Christ and of his saints. The servant is not above his Lord. Matthew 10, verse 24. God also desires that we should be conformed to the image of his Son. We then follow Christ in reproach and glory. Gratitude requires this, because Christ died for our salvation. Holy martyrs have suffered, nor did they perish under their afflictions. We ought not to ask for ourselves a better lot than theirs, since we are not better than they, but much worse. They have suffered, and have been delivered by God. Let us therefore look for a similar event, because the love of God towards his people is unchangeable. So persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Matthew 5, verse 12, 1 Peter 5, verse 9. 9. The presence and help of God in our afflictions. God is present with us by His Spirit, strengthening and comforting us under the cross. He does not permit us to be tempted above that which we are able to bear, and also with every temptation opens a way of escape, and always proportions our afflictions to our strength, that we may not be overcome. We have the first fruits of the Spirit. I will be with Him in trouble. He shall give you another comforter, that He may abide with you for ever. If a man love me, my father will love him, and will come unto him, and make our abode with him. I will not leave you comfortless. Can a woman forget her sucking child, that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee. Romans 8, verse 23, Psalm 91, verse 15, John chapter 14, verses 16 and 18, Isaiah 49, verse 15. 10. Complete and final deliverance is the crowning point of all the rest. The first is the chief comfort and foundation of all the others. This is the perfection and consummation of all. For as there are degrees of punishment, so there are also degrees of deliverance. The first degree is in this life, where we have the beginning of eternal life. The second is in temporal death, when the soul is carried into Abraham's bosom. The third will be in the resurrection of the dead and their glorification, when we shall be perfectly happy both in body and soul. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Revelation 21, verse 4. Section 11. The Deliverance of Man. Fifth Lord's Day, the Second General Division of the Catechism of the Deliverance of Man. Question 12. Since then, by the righteous judgment of God, we deserve temporal and eternal punishment. Is there no way by which we may escape that punishment, and be again received into favour? Answer. God will have his justice satisfied, and therefore we must make this satisfaction either by ourselves or by another. Exposition. Having shown in the first part of the Catechism that all men are in a state of eternal condemnation on account of not having rendered the obedience which the law of God requires, we are next led to inquire whether there is or may be any way of escape or deliverance from this state of misery and death. To this question the Catechism answers that deliverance may be granted, if satisfaction be made to the law and justice of God, by a punishment sufficient for the sin that has been committed. The law binds all either to obedience, or if this is not rendered to punishment, and the performance or payment of either is perfect righteousness, which God approves of in whomsoever it is found. There are two ways of making satisfaction by punishment. The one is by ourselves. This is the one which the law teaches and the justice of God requires. Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the law to do them. Galatians 3 verse 10. This is legal. 
The other way of making satisfaction is by another. This is the method which the gospel reveals and the mercy of God allows. What the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son, etc. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, etc. Romans 8, verse 3, John 3, verse 16. This is evangelical. It is not indeed taught in the law, but it is nowhere condemned or excluded. Neither is it repugnant to the justice of God, for if only satisfaction be made on the part of man by a sufficient punishment for his disobedience, the law is satisfied, and the justice of God permits the party offending to be set at liberty and received into favour. This is the sum and substance. Furthermore, there are two things taught in this question, the possibility of this deliverance and how it is effected. That these things may be better understood, we shall now consider, first, what the deliverance of man is, second, whether such a deliverance be possible, third, whether it be necessary and certain, fourth, whether a perfect deliverance may be expected, fifth, how it is accomplished. First, what the deliverance of man is. The word deliverance is relative, for every deliverance is from something to something, as from captivity to liberty. As now all men, by nature, are the slaves of sin, Satan, and death, we cannot better and more correctly understand what the deliverance of man is than by a consideration of what his misery consists in. The misery of man consists first in the loss of righteousness, and in inbred corruption or sin, and secondly in the punishment of sin. His deliverance, therefore, from this misery requires first the pardon and abolishing of sin, and a restoration of the righteousness lost, and secondly a release from all punishment and misery. As, therefore, the misery of man consists of two parts, sin and death, so his deliverance consists in two parts, a deliverance from sin and death. Deliverance from sin includes the pardon of sin, that it may not be imputed unto us, and an abolishing of sin by the renewing of our nature, that it may not reign in us. Deliverance from death is a deliverance from despair, and a sense of the wrath of God, from the calamities and miseries of this life, and also from death, both temporal and spiritual. From these things it is easy to perceive what we are to understand by the deliverance of man. It consists in a perfect deliverance from all the miseries of sin and death, which the fall has entailed upon man, and a full restoration of righteousness, holiness, life, and eternal felicity, through Christ, which is begun in all the faithful in this life, and will be fully perfected in the life to come. Second, whether such a deliverance be possible. That this deliverance of man from the ruins of the fall was possible may be inferred from a consideration, one, of the immense goodness and mercy of God, which would not suffer the whole human race to perish for ever. Two, the infinite wisdom of God would naturally lead us to expect that he would be able to devise a way by which he might exhibit his mercy towards the human race, and yet not violate his justice. Three, a consideration of the power of God might lead us to the conclusion that he who could create man out of nothing after his own image could also raise him up from the ruins of the fall and deliver him from sin and death. To deny the possibility of the deliverance of man is, therefore, to deny the goodness, wisdom, and power of God. But in God there is neither wisdom nor goodness nor power wanting, for the Lord bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. Unto God the Lord belong the issues from death. The Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save. 1 Samuel 2, verse 6, Psalm 68, verse 20, Isaiah 59, verse 1. But we must inquire particularly, whence do we know this deliverance to be possible? Whether human reason without the word of God can arrive at this knowledge, and whether Adam, after his fall, could know or hope for it? That our deliverance was possible, we now know from the event itself, and from the gospel, or from the revelation which God has been pleased to make. Human reason, however, if left to itself, could know nothing of this deliverance, or of the manner in which it could be effected, although it might probably have conjectured that it was not impossible, which, by the way, is very doubtful, inasmuch as it was not presumable that so glorious a creature as man would be created for eternal misery, or that God would give a law that could not be fulfilled. These two arguments are in themselves forcible, but human reason, on account of its corruption, does not subscribe to them. As, therefore, those who are without the church and ignorant of the gospel can have no knowledge or hope of deliverance, so Adam, after the fall, without a special promise and revelation, could neither know nor hope for it by the mere exercise of his reason. When sin was once committed, 
the mind of man could think of nothing but the severe justice of God, which does not permit sin to pass with impunity, and the unchangeable truth of God, which had declared, In the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Genesis 3, verse 17. Adam knew full well that it was necessary to make satisfaction to this justice and truth of God by the everlasting destruction of the sinner, and hence he could not hope for any deliverance in his case. He might, indeed, probably have supposed that deliverance could be effected if satisfaction could be made in any way to the justice and truth of God, but he could neither hope for it nor conceive how or by whom it could be accomplished. Yea, the angels themselves could never have devised this method of deliverance, had not God, out of his infinite wisdom and goodness, conceived it and made it known through the gospel. But some object to what is here said as follows. If deliverance seemed impossible to Adam on account of the justice and truth of God, then it must now also seem to be impossible, for a violation of the justice and truth of God cannot take place now any more than formerly. But the escape of the sinner from punishment would be a violation of these attributes of God. To this we reply that if the sinner would escape punishment without a sufficient satisfaction being made for sin, it would, indeed, be a violation of the justice and truth of God. Had Adam seen a satisfactory solution of this problem, he would have had reason to hope for deliverance, especially if he had considered at the same time the nature of God, his infinite goodness, wisdom, and power, and the end for which he created man, and that it would not be consistent with the character of God, who is most wise, good, and powerful, to create a being of such noble powers as man, to endure everlasting misery, or that he would give such a law to man as could never be perfectly obeyed. Yet he could not entertain any certain hope, for, as we have already remarked, before the gospel was published, neither he nor any other creature was able to see or contrive a way of escape from punishment that would be in harmony with the justice of God, nor could any way of escape ever have been contrived had not God revealed it through his Son. This now is the substance of what has been said. Man, being fallen, could hope for no deliverance from sin and death, before he heard the joyful promise that the seed of the woman should bruise the head of the serpent, but yet he ought not, neither could he simply despair, as though it were wholly impossible. For although he could not conceive any necessary reason, from which he might conclude upon his future deliverance, nor understand the way in which satisfaction could be made, Yet it does not follow that if a creature could not discover this, therefore God could not discover it. He ought therefore to have looked away from himself to the wisdom, goodness, and power of God, and not have despaired, although everything seemed to drive him to desperation. Yet, if the sound of the gospel had not reached his ear, nothing could have sufficiently comforted him under the temptations to which he was exposed. But after the promise was once made known, and he was brought to understand the method of redemption through Christ, then he could not only hope for deliverance with certainty, but could also resolve all doubts and objections which might arise, among which we may mention the following. Objection 1. The justice of God does not permit those who are deserving of eternal condemnation to go unpunished. We have all deserved eternal condemnation, therefore our deliverance is impossible on account of the justice of God. Answer. Adam saw how the first proposition of this syllogism could be answered, viz. that the justice of God does not absolve and acquit those who are deserving of everlasting condemnation, unless satisfaction be made by a punishment corresponding with the offence. Objection 2. The justice and truth of God are both violated, when that is not done which the former requires and the latter threatens. But if everlasting punishment and death be not inflicted upon man, that is not executed which the justice of God requires, and his truth threatens. Therefore both are violated, if man be not punished, which is impossible. Answer. Here again Adam saw that the minor proposition was true only in case no punishment at all were inflicted, neither upon the sinner himself, nor upon someone else who might offer himself as a substitute in the sinner's room and stead. But the promise which God had been pleased to reveal to him made him acquainted with the fact that Christ, the seed of the woman, would, as man's substitute, bruise the serpent's head. Objection 3 that which the unchangeable truth and justice of God demand is necessary and unchangeable, but the unchangeable truth and justice of God demand that the sinner be cast into everlasting punishment. Therefore the rejection of the sinner is necessary and unchangeable. Answer. He also saw an answer to the principal proposition of this objection, viz. that that is unchangeable which the justice of God demands absolutely, and not that which it requires conditionally. 
demanding either the everlasting punishment of the transgressor or satisfaction through Christ. Objection 4. That is impossible, which we have not the power of escaping. We have not the power of escaping sin and death, therefore it is impossible for us to escape these evils. Answer. But here again Adam saw that an escape from these evils was impossible only in case God neither knew nor would reveal the way of deliverance, which was unknown to human reason and to all created things, and which they never could have discovered. These and similar objections, Adam was enabled, through the promise of the seed of the woman bruising the serpent's head, to repel and overcome. We, however, who live at the present day, can see and understand much more clearly the solution of these difficulties than Adam could, inasmuch as we know certainly that the gospel and the event itself, as well as from our own consciousness, that the deliverance of man was not only possible and would take place at some future time, as Adam himself saw, but that it is also already accomplished by Christ. Hence the deliverance of man is, and always was, possible with God. Third, whether deliverance be necessary and certain. Although God was not under the least obligation to deliver man from the misery of sin, but was free to leave all men in death, and save none, for who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again, Romans 11, verse 35. Yet it may correctly be said that man's deliverance was and is necessary, understanding by this term not an absolute but a conditional necessity, as it is called. This is proven, one, because God has most freely and unchangeably decreed and provided it, and it is impossible that he should lie or be deceived. As I live, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that, etc. Ezekiel 18, verse 23. Two, because God desires to be praised and glorified forever by man, he hath made us to the praise of the glory of his grace. Wherefore hast thou made all men in vain? Ephesians 1, verse 6. Psalm 89, verse 47. Three, because God did not in vain send his Son into the world, neither did Christ die in vain. I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me, and this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, etc. I came to call sinners to repentance, who was delivered for our offences, and was raised again for our justification. If righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. John 6, verses 38 and 39, Matthew 9, verse 13, Romans 4, verse 25, Galatians 2, verse 21. 4. Because God is more inclined to mercy than to wrath, but in the punishment of the wicked his wrath is manifested, much more, therefore, will he manifest his mercy in the salvation of the righteous. 4. Whether a perfect deliverance may be expected. This deliverance of man is perfect in this life, as it respects the commencement of it, but in the life to come it will be perfect also, as it respects the consummation of it. Now it is perfect in all its parts, being a deliverance from the evil, both of guilt and of punishment. Then it will be perfect also in the degrees of it, when all tears shall be wiped away from our eyes, when the perfect image of God will be restored in us, and God shall be all and in all. This is proven, one, because God does not deliver us only in part, but saves and loves perfectly all those whom he saves. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin, 1 John 1 verse 7. 2. Because God will punish the wicked most severely, that they may, by these punishments, fully satisfy his justice. He will, therefore, also perfectly deliver the godly, since he is more inclined to mercy than wrath. Neither is the benefit of Christ more imperfect or of less force than the sin of Adam. This would be the case if he did not deliver us perfectly, because we have lost all righteousness and salvation in Adam. A perfect deliverance is therefore to be expected, but by degrees, as it has been shown. In this life it is perfect, in the resurrection it will be more perfect, and in glorification it will be most perfect. Fifth, how this deliverance is accomplished. The deliverance, of which we have now spoken, is accomplished, one, by a full and sufficient satisfaction for sin. There is such a satisfaction when the punishment which is inflicted on account of sin is equivalent to that which is eternal. Two, by abolishing sin and renewing our nature, which is done by restoring in us the righteousness and image of God which we have lost, or by the perfect regeneration of our nature. Both of these are necessary to our deliverance. Satisfaction is necessary because the mercy of God, as has been shown, does not violate his justice, which demands satisfaction. 
the law binds either to obedience or punishment but satisfaction cannot be made through obedience because our past obedience is already impaired and that which follows cannot make satisfaction for past offences we are bound to render exact obedience every moment to the law as a present debt hence obedience being once impaired there is no other way of making satisfaction except by punishment according to the threatening in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die genesis 2 verse 17 if a sufficient punishment be endured to satisfy the law god is reconciled and deliverance becomes possible so in like manner the abolishing of sin and the renewing of our nature are necessary because it is only upon the condition that we cease to offend god by our sins and are thankful to him for our reconciliation that he is willing to accept of this satisfaction to be willing that god should receive us into his favour and yet not be willing to abandon sin is to mock god but it is not possible for us to leave off and forsake sin unless our nature be renewed it is in this way therefore that the deliverance of man is made possible question thirteen can we ourselves then make this satisfaction answer by no means but on the contrary we daily increase our debt exposition having given an explanation of the manner in which our deliverance is accomplished we must now inquire by whom this satisfaction and abolishing of sin can be effected whether by ourselves or by someone else and if by someone else whether it be by a mere creature and if not by a mere creature by whom therefore and by what kind of a mediator the first of these questions is answered in this thirteenth question of the catechism the other two are answered in the fourteenth and fifteenth questions of the catechism we cannot make this satisfaction by and of ourselves neither by obedience nor by punishment we cannot make it by obedience because whatever good we perform we owe to god by present obligation hence it is impossible for us to satisfy for our past offences by any present obedience that we may render to the law of god for we cannot deserve anything at the hands of god for the present much less for the time to come neither can a double merit that is to say a merit for the present and the future proceed from one satisfaction a more common and popular reason is assigned in the catechism because we daily increase our debt we sin continually and in sinning we increase our guilt and the displeasure of god towards us now he who never ceases to offend can never appease the party offended just as a debtor who continually adds new accounts to former claims can never release himself from debt neither can we make satisfaction to god for our sins by punishment because our guilt being infinite deserves an infinite punishment one that is eternal or that is equivalent to everlasting punishment sin being an offence against the highest good deserves eternal condemnation or at least such a temporal punishment as is equivalent to that which is eternal but we cannot make satisfaction by a punishment that is eternal because then we should never be freed from it we would always be making satisfaction to the justice of god and yet it would never be satisfied our satisfaction would never be perfect it would never be a complete victory over sin and death but would continue imperfect to all eternity as the satisfaction of devils and wicked spirits nor can we make satisfaction by enduring such a temporal punishment as will be equivalent to that which is eternal which is necessary in order that death may be overcome such a punishment as this cannot be endured by any mere creature on account of many imperfections as we shall presently show as we cannot therefore make a satisfaction by ourselves there is a necessity that this satisfaction should be made by another if we would obtain deliverance from our misery from this we may readily return an answer to the following objection which is sometimes made we can never satisfy the law neither by punishment nor obedience therefore the method of deliverance through satisfaction is of no account answer it is not of small account because although we are not able to make satisfaction through obedience we are nevertheless able to make it through the endurance of a sufficient punishment not in ourselves but in christ who has satisfied the law both by obedience and punishment against this the following objections have been urged objection one the law requires our own obedience or punishment because it is written he that doeth these things shall live by them cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words etc answer the law does indeed require our obedience or punishment but not exclusively for it never excludes or condemns the satisfaction of another in our behalf although it does not teach it and is ignorant of it but the gospel reveals and shows this unto us in christ 
Objection 2. It is unjust to punish another in the place of the guilty, therefore Christ could not be punished in our room and stead. Answer. It is not inconsistent with the justice of God that another should be punished in the place of those who are guilty, if these conditions be present. 1. If he who is punished be innocent. 2. If he be of the same nature with those for whom he makes satisfaction. 3. If he of his own accord offer himself as a satisfaction. 4. If he himself be able to endure and come forth from this punishment. This is the reason why men cannot punish one person in the place of another, because they cannot bring it to pass that the one who suffers should not perish under the punishment. 5. If he look to and obtain the end which Christ had in view, viz. the glory of God and the salvation of man. Question 14. Can there be found anywhere one who is a mere creature able to satisfy for us? Answer. None. For first, God will not punish another creature for the sin which man hath committed, and further, no mere creature can sustain the burden of God's eternal wrath against sin, so as to deliver others from it. Exposition. The exclusive particle mere is added in this question, that the negative answer may be true. For it was necessary that a creature should make satisfaction for the creature's sin, but not such an one as was merely or only a creature, because such an one could not make the satisfaction which was required, as will appear in the remarks which we shall now make. We must, therefore, since satisfaction must be made through another, inquire whether this other person may be any creature besides man, and whether he may be a mere creature. We deny both propositions. Our reason for denying the first is, because God will not punish the sin which man has committed in any other creature. This is in accordance with the order of his justice, which does not permit one to sin and another to bear the punishment. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Ezekiel 18, verse 20. This reason proves that no creature except man could satisfy for man. Yea, God could not be satisfied for the sin of man by the eternal destruction of heaven and earth, and of the angels themselves, and all other creatures. Our reasons for denying the second proposition are these. 1. Because no creature possesses such power as to be able to sustain a finite punishment, equivalent to that which is infinite, for the purpose of making satisfaction for the infinite guilt of man. A mere creature would be consumed and reduced to nothing before satisfaction could be made to God in this way, for God is a consuming fire. If thou shouldst mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, etc. Deuteronomy 4, verse 24, Psalm 130, verse 3, Romans 8, verse 3. This reason proves that no creature in the whole universe was able to make satisfaction to God for man's sin by punishment, so as to come forth from the same, which escape was necessary in order to our deliverance. They could therefore in this way, on account of the weakness of the creature, be no just proportion between sin and its punishment. 2. Because the punishment of a mere creature could not be a price of sufficient dignity and value for our redemption. 3. Because a mere creature could not have renewed and sanctified our nature, nor could such an one have brought it to pass that we should no longer sin, all of which it was necessary for our deliverer to accomplish. Question 15. What sort of a mediator and deliverer, then, must we seek for? Answer. For one who is very man and perfectly righteous, and yet more powerful than all creatures, that is, one who is also very God. Exposition. Since then we are not able of ourselves to make satisfaction to God for our sins, but must have some other satisfier or mediator in our place, we must inquire further what sort of a mediator must he be. To this we may reply that he must of necessity be merely a creature, or merely God, or both. A mere creature, however, he cannot be, for the reasons already assigned. Merely God he could not be, because man, and not God, had sinned, and also because it behooved the Mediator to suffer and die for the sins of man. But God in himself can neither suffer nor die. It follows, therefore, that such a Mediator is required, who is both God and man. The reasons for this will be assigned in the questions immediately following. Sixth Lord's Day. Question 16. Why must he be very man, and also perfectly righteous? Answer. Because the justice of God requires that the same human nature which hath sinned should likewise make satisfaction for sin, and one who is himself a sinner cannot satisfy for others. 
exposition. It behooved our mediator to be man, and indeed very man, and perfectly righteous. First it behooved him to be man, one, because it was man that sinned. It was necessary, therefore, that man should make satisfaction for sin, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, etc. Since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. Romans 5, verse 12, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 21. 2. That he might be able to die. It was necessary that he should make satisfaction for us by his death, and by the shedding of his blood, because it had been declared, Thou shalt surely die. Without the shedding of blood there is no remission. Genesis 2, verse 17, Hebrews 9, verse 22. Secondly, it behooved him to be very man, descending from the same human nature which had sinned, and not created out of nothing, or let down from heaven, but subject to all our infirmities, sin excepted. One, because the justice of God required that the same human nature which had sinned should likewise make satisfaction for sin. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. And in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Ezekiel 18, verse 20, Genesis 2, verse 17. It was necessary, therefore, that he who would make satisfaction for man should himself be very man, having sprung from the posterity of Adam, which had sinned. The following passages of Scripture are here in point. Since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He took on him the seed of Abraham, wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, etc. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 21, 1 Timothy 2, verse 5, Hebrews 2, verses 16 and 17. So the Apostle says also that we are buried with Christ in baptism, crucified with him, raised with him, etc., Romans 6, verse 4, Colossians 2, verse 12. And Augustine, in his book on true religion, says, quote, The very same nature was to be assumed, which was to be delivered. End quote. 2. Because the truth of God required it. The prophets who spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost often described our mediator as one that is poor, weak, despised, etc. The 53rd chapter of the prophecy of Isaiah furnishes us with a striking instance. 3. On account of our comfort, for if we did not know him to have sprung from Adam, we could not receive him as the promised Messiah and as our brother, since the promise is, The seed of the woman shall bruise the serpent's head. In thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Genesis 3, verse 15, chapter 22, verse 18. The Apostle Paul also says in relation to this, He that sanctifieth, and they who are sanctified, are all of one, that is, of the same human nature, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Hebrews 2, verse 11. It was necessary, therefore, that he should spring from Adam, in order that he might be our brother. For as much then, as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, etc. Hebrews 2, verse 14. 4. That he might be a faithful high priest, able to succour them that are tempted. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered, being tempted, he is able to succour them that are tempted. Hebrews 2, verses 17 and 18. Thirdly, it behooved him to be a perfectly righteous man, one that was wholly free from the least stain of original and actual sin, that he might deservedly be our Saviour, and that his sacrifice might avail not for himself, but for us. For if he himself had been a sinner, he would have had to satisfy for his own sins. My righteous servant shall justify many. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Christ also hath once suffered for sin, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Isaiah 53, verse 11, 1 Peter 2, verse 22, chapter 3, verse 18. But he who is himself a sinner. If the mediator himself had been a sinner, he could not have escaped the wrath of God, much less could he have procured for others the favour of God, and exemption from punishment. Neither could the passion and death of him, who did not suffer as an innocent man, be a ransom for the sin of others. Therefore God hath made him to be sin for us, that is, a sacrifice for sin, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily, as those high priests, to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins, and then for the people's. 
2 Corinthians 5, verse 26, Hebrews 7, verses 26 and 27. The man Christ was perfectly righteous, or has fulfilled the law in four respects. 1. By his own righteousness. Christ alone performed perfect obedience, such as the law requires. 2. By enduring punishment sufficient for our sins. There was a necessity that this double fulfilment of the law should be in Christ, for unless his righteousness had been full and perfect, he could not have satisfied for the sins of others, and unless he had endured such punishment as has been described, he could not thereby have delivered us from everlasting punishment. The former is called the fulfilling of the law by obedience, by which he himself was conformable thereunto. The latter is the fulfilling of the law by punishment, which he suffered for us, that we might not remain subject to eternal condemnation. 3. Christ fulfills the law in us by his Spirit, when he, by the same Spirit, regenerates us, and by the law leads us to that obedience which is required from us, which is both external and internal, which we commence in this life, and which we shall perfectly and fully perform in the life to come. 4. Christ fulfills the law by teaching it, and freeing it from errors and interpolations, and by restoring its true sense, as he himself said, I am not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Matthew 5, verse 17. Question 17. Why must he in one person be also very God? Answer, that he might, by the power of his Godhead, sustain in his human nature the burden of God's wrath, and might obtain for and restore to us righteousness and life. Exposition. It was necessary that our Mediator should not only be a man, and one that was truly such and perfectly righteous, but that he should also be God, the true and mighty God, and not an imaginary deity, or one that was adorned with excellent gifts, above angels and men, as heretics suppose. The reasons for this are the following. 1. That he might, by the power of his Godhead, sustain in his human nature the infinite wrath of God against sin, and endure a punishment which, although it were temporal, as it respects its duration, was nevertheless infinite in greatness, dignity, and value. If our Mediator had been only a man, and had taken upon himself the burden of God's wrath, he would have been crushed under its weight. It was necessary, therefore, that he should be possessed of infinite strength, and for this reason be God, that he might endure an infinite punishment without sinking into despair or being crushed under it. There was a necessity that the punishment of the Mediator should be of infinite value and equivalent to that which is eternal, that there might be a proportion between sin and the punishment thereof. For there is not one sin, amongst all the sins committed from the beginning to the end of the world, so small that it does not deserve eternal death. Every sin is so exceedingly sinful that it cannot be expiated by the eternal destruction of any creature. It was proper, however, that this punishment should be finite in respect to time, because it was not necessary that the Mediator should forever remain under death, but it became him to come forth from death, that he might accomplish the benefit of our redemption, that is, that he might perfectly merit, and having merited, might apply and bestow upon us the salvation which he purchased in our behalf. It was also required of our Mediator, both to merit and bestow righteousness, that he might be a perfect saviour in merit and efficacy. But these things could not have been accomplished by a mere man, who, and of whatever strength he might have been possessed, if he nevertheless had not the power to come forth from death. It was necessary, therefore, that he who was to save others from death should overcome death by his own power, and first throw it off from himself. But this he could not have done had he not been God. 2. It was necessary that the ransom which the Redeemer paid should be of infinite value, that it might possess a dignity and merit sufficient for the redemption of our souls, and that it might avail in the judgment of God for the purpose of expiating our sins and restoring in us that righteousness and life which we had lost. Hence it became the person who would make this satisfaction for us to be possessed of infinite dignity, that is, to be God, for the dignity of this satisfaction, on account of which it might be acceptable to God and of infinite worth, although temporal, consists in two things, in the dignity of the person and in the greatness of the punishment. The dignity of the person who suffered appears in this, that it was God, the Creator Himself, who died for the sins of the world, which is infinitely more than the destruction of all creatures, and avails more than the holiness of all the angels and men. Hence it is that the apostles, when they speak of the sufferings of Christ, almost always make mention of his divinity. God hath purchased the church with his blood, 
The blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Yea, God himself in paradise joined together these two. The seed of the woman shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Acts 20, verse 28, 1 John 1, verse 7, John 1, verse 29, Genesis 3, verse 15. The greatness of the punishment which Christ endured appears in this, that he sustained the dreadful torments of hell and the wrath of God against the sins of the whole world. The pains of hell got hold upon me. God is a consuming fire. The Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Psalm 116, verse 3, Deuteronomy 4, verse 24, Isaiah 53, verse 10. From this we may perceive why it was that Christ manifested such signs of distress in the prospect of death, whilst many of the martyrs met death with the greatest courage and composure. Objection. The perfect fulfilment of the law by obedience might have been a satisfaction for our sins, but a mere man, had he only been perfectly righteous, might have fulfilled the law by obedience. Therefore a mere man, being perfectly righteous, might have satisfied for our sins, and hence it was not necessary that our mediator should be God. Answer. 1. We deny the major proposition because it has already been shown that when obedience was once impaired it was not possible that the justice of God could be satisfied for sin unless by a sufficient punishment on account of the divine threatening. In the day thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Genesis 2 verse 17. 2. Although we may grant the minor proposition that a mere man by his obedience might fulfill the law perfectly, yet his obedience could not be a satisfaction for the sins of another, because every one is bound to obey the law. It was necessary, therefore, that the Mediator should endure a sufficient punishment for us, and for this reason be armed with divine power, for the devils themselves are not able to sustain the burden of God's wrath against sin, much less could man. If it be objected that the devils and the wicked do sustain and are compelled to sustain the eternal wrath of God, we answer that they do indeed sustain the wrath of God, but not so as ever to satisfy his justice and come out of their punishment, for their punishment will endure for ever but it behooved the Mediator to endure the burden of God's wrath, that, having made satisfaction, he might remove it from himself, and also from us. 3. It was necessary that the Mediator should be God, that he might reveal the secret will of God concerning the redemption of mankind, which he could not have done had he been merely a man. No creature could ever have known or discovered the will of God concerning our redemption, had not the Son of God revealed it. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. John 1 verse 18. 4. It behooved the Mediator to be God, that he might be able to give the Holy Ghost, gather a church, be present with it, and bestow and preserve the benefits purchased by his death. It did not only become him to be made a sacrifice, to throw off death from himself and intercede for us with God, but it became him also to give assurance that we would no more offend God by our sins. This, however, on account of our corruption, no one could promise in our behalf, who had not the power of giving the Holy Spirit, and through him the power of conforming us to the image of God. But to give the Holy Spirit, and through him to regenerate the heart, is peculiar to God alone, whose Spirit he is. Whom I will send unto you from the Father. John 15, verse 26. Only he who is the Lord of nature can reform it. 5. Finally, it was necessary that the Messiah should be the Lord our righteousness. Jeremiah 23, verse 6. Objection. The party offended cannot be mediator. Christ is the mediator, therefore he cannot be the party offended, that is God. Answer. The major proposition is true only when the party offended is such as admits of no personal distinctions, which, however, is not the case as regards the Godhead. V. De Ursini, Volume 1, page 120. Question 18. Who then is that mediator who is in one person both very God and a real righteous man? Answer. Our Lord Jesus Christ, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Exposition. We have now shown what kind of a mediator it is necessary for us to have. The next question which claims our attention is, who is this mediator? That this mediator is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, manifested in the flesh, is proven by these considerations. 1. It became the mediator to be very God, as has been shown. God the Father, however, could not be the mediator, because he does not work through himself, but through the Son and the Holy Spirit. Neither is the Father a messenger, because he is sent by no one, but himself sends the mediator. Nor could the Holy Ghost be the mediator, because he was to be sent by the mediator into the hearts of the elect. 
therefore the sun alone is this mediator. Two, it was necessary that the mediator should have that which it became him to confer upon us. It became him now to confer upon us the right and title of the sons of God which we had forfeited. That is, it became him to bring it to pass that God might, for his son's sake, adopt us as his children. This, however, Christ alone was able to effect, because he alone had the right thereof. The Holy Ghost had not this right, because he is not the Son. Neither did it belong to the Father, for the same reason, and also because it became him to adopt us among his children, through the Son. Therefore the Word, who is the natural Son of God, is alone our Mediator, in whom, as in the first begotten, we are adopted as the sons of God, as it is said, If the Son shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. As many as received him, to them he gave the power to be called the sons of God, unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ. He hath made us to be accepted in the Beloved. John 8, verse 36, chapter 1, verse 12, Ephesians 1, verses 5 and 6. 3. The Son alone is the Word, the ambassador of the Father, and that person who was sent to the human race to reveal the will of God, through whom the Father operates and gives the Holy Spirit, and through whom also the second creation is accomplished, for it is through the Son that we are made new creatures. The Scriptures for this reason everywhere join the first and second creation, because the second was to be effected by the same person through whom the first was made. All things were made by the Son. John 1 verse 3, the Mediator was also to be a messenger and peacemaker between God and us, and to regenerate us by the Holy Spirit. Therefore the Son alone is this Mediator. 4. It belongs to the Mediator to send immediately the Holy Spirit, but it is the Son alone who thus sends the Holy Spirit. The Father does indeed send the Holy Spirit, but it is through the Son. The Son sends the Spirit immediately from the Father, as He Himself declares, whom I will send unto you from the Father. John 15, verse 26. 5. It became the Mediator to suffer and die, but it was not possible for any of the persons of the Godhead to suffer and die except the Son, who assumed our nature. God was manifested in the flesh. Christ was put to death in the flesh. 1 Timothy 3, verse 16, 1 Peter 3, verse 18. Therefore the Son is the Mediator. 6. That the Son is the Mediator may be proved by a comparison of the prophecies of the Old Testament with their fulfillment in the New Testament. 7. The works and miracles of Christ establish His claims to the office of Mediator. The works that I do bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. Believe the works. When Christ will come, He will do more miracles than these. Go and show John those things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, etc. John 5, verse 36, chapter 10, verse 38, chapter 7, verse 31, Matthew 11, verses 4 and 5. 8. By these clear testimonies of Scripture, there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Christ is made unto us of God wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. That is, he is made unto us a teacher of wisdom, a justifier, a sanctifier, and a redeemer, which is the same as to say he is a mediator and saviour, both by his merit and efficacy. For in this declaration of the Apostle, the abstract is put for the concrete. 1 Timothy 2 verse 5, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30. It is here worthy of notice that the Mediator is said to be made unto us of God, which means that he was appointed and given. The Mediator ought to have been given by us, and to have proceeded from us, because we had sinned. But we were not able to give a Mediator, inasmuch as we were all the children of wrath. Therefore it was necessary that he should be given unto us of God, it is also worthy of notice that righteousness and holiness were one and the same thing in us before the fall, viz. an inherent conformity with God and the divine law, as they are now the same thing in the holy angels. Since the fall, however, they are not the same thing in us, for now Christ is our righteousness and our justification consists in the imputation of his righteousness by which we are accounted just before God. Holiness is the beginning of our conformity with God, whilst sanctification is the carrying forward of this conformity with God, which in this life is imperfect, but which will be fully perfected in the life to come. When righteousness and holiness will again be the same thing in us as they are now in the holy angels, the sum and substance of the whole doctrine of the Mediator is contained in what now follows. Section 12. The Doctrine of the Mediator the doctrine of the Mediator, which is intimately connected with the glory of God and our comfort, must be carefully considered for the following reasons. 
one that we may acknowledge and magnify the mercy of god in that he has given his son to be our mediator and to be made a sacrifice for our sins two that we may know god to be just inasmuch as he would not out of his clemency pardon sin but was so greatly displeased therewith that he would not remit it except satisfaction were made by the death of his son three that we may be assured of eternal life in having a mediator who is both willing and able to grant it unto us four because the doctrine of the mediator is the foundation and substance of the doctrine of the church five on account of heretics who at all times oppose with great bitterness this doctrine and that having a proper knowledge of it we may be able to defend it against all their assaults the doctrine of the mediator seems to belong to the article of justification because there also the office of the mediator is explained but it is one thing to teach what and what kind of a benefit justification is and how it is received which is done when the doctrine of justification is treated of and it is another thing to show whose benefit it is and by whom it is bestowed upon us which properly belongs here the principal things to be considered in relation to the mediator are the following first what a mediator is second whether we need a mediator third what his office is fourth what kind of a mediator he ought to be fifth who he is sixth whether there can be more than one mediator first what a mediator is a mediator in general signifies one who reconciles two parties that are at variance by interposing himself and pacifying the offended party by entreaty by satisfaction and giving security that the like offence will not again be committed a mediator in the german is ein schiedmann to reconcile includes one to intercede for the offender with the offended two to make satisfaction for the injury done three to promise and bring it to pass that the offending party shall not repeat the offence four to bring the parties at variance together if any of these conditions are wanting there can be no true reconciliation but in special as here applied to christ a mediator is a person reconciling god who is angry with sin and the human race exposed to eternal death on account of sin by making satisfaction to divine justice by his death interceding for the guilty and applying at the same time his merits through faith to them that believe regenerating them by his holy spirit thus bringing it to pass that they cease from sinning and finally hearing the groans and prayers of those that call upon him or as a mediator is a peacemaker between god and men appeasing the anger of god and restoring men to his favour by interceding and making satisfaction for their sins bring it to pass that god loves men and men love god so that a constant and eternal peace or agreement is effected between them a middle person and mediator are different the former is the name of the person the latter the name of the office christ is both he is a middle person because in him is the nature of each party he has the nature of god and of man he is a mediator because he reconciles us to god although he is to a certain extent a middle person in the same respect in which he is a mediator because in him the two extremes god and man are joined together addenda it is sometimes asked whether adam had need of a mediator before the fall to this answer may be returned according to the signification which we attach to the term mediator if we mean by it one through whose mediation or by whom god bestows his benefits and communicates himself to us then adam even before his fall had need of a mediator because christ ever has been the person through whom the father creates and quickens all things for in him was life both natural and spiritual and the life was the light of men john one verse four but if we understand by a mediator one who performs these and all the other duties which belong to the office then we reply that adam did not need a mediator before the fall we must observe however that the scriptures do not speak of christ as being mediator before the fall of man second whether we need a mediator with god that we need a mediator is evident one because the justice of god does not admit of any reconciliation without a return to his favour an advocate is therefore necessary neither can we be reconciled to god except intercession be made in our behalf an intercessor is therefore needed so satisfaction is demanded hence there must be one to satisfy then there must be an application of the benefit for there is a necessity that it should be received hence there must be some one to apply the benefit of redemption and finally without a removal of sin and the restoration of the image of god in us we will not cease to sin against god hence we need some one to deliver us from sin and renew our nature 
part of ourselves we are not able to accomplish these things, we cannot appease God who is angry, we cannot make ourselves acceptable in his sight, etc. We need, therefore, another person to act as mediator for us, who may perform these things in our behalf. 2. God demanded a mediator from the party which had committed the offence. As a divine being, he could not receive satisfaction from himself. His justice made it necessary that the offending party should make satisfaction, or obtain favour through such a mediator, as would be able to satisfy perfectly, and also be most acceptable to God, so as not to be driven from his presence, and who might, by his influence with God, be able easily to reconcile us to him, by making satisfaction, entreaty, and intercession in our behalf. Such a mediator, however, we were entirely unable to find from among ourselves, because we were all the children of wrath. There was, therefore, a necessity for some third person to come in as a mediator, who should be given of God, and who would be very man, and at the same time most acceptable to God. 3. It is necessary that those who would obtain deliverance should make satisfaction to the justice of God, either by themselves or by another. Those who cannot make this satisfaction of themselves have need of a mediator. It is required of us now, if we would obtain deliverance from sin, to satisfy the justice of God, either by ourselves or by another but we are unable to effect this by ourselves. Hence we have need of a mediator. Objection. Where there is but one way of making satisfaction, no other is to be sought or proposed. The law acknowledges but one way, which is by ourselves. Therefore we must not propose any other, nor must we say either by ourselves or by another. Answer. The whole is conceded as it respects the law, for the law prescribes but one way of making satisfaction, and it is in vain that we look for another. But yet, whilst this is true as touching the law, it nevertheless does not reject every other way. It does indeed say that satisfaction must be made through ourselves, but it never says only through ourselves. It does not therefore exclude the method of making satisfaction through another. And although God did not express this other method in the law, yet it was comprehended in his secret counsel, and afterwards revealed in the gospel. The law does not therefore explain this method, but leaves it to be unfolded by the gospel. Nor is there in this any conflict or want of agreement between the law and the gospel, inasmuch as the law, as has just been remarked, nowhere adds the exclusive particle, saying that satisfaction can only be made by ourselves. 4. That we have need of a mediator with God may be shown by many other considerations, of which we may mention the following. 1. The chidings and compunctions of conscience. 2. The punishments of the wicked. 3. The sacrifices instituted by God, which referred to and shadowed forth the perfect sacrifice of Christ. 4. The sacrifices of the heathen and papists, with which they desired to please God, which had their origin in the feeling or consciousness of the need of some satisfaction being made in order to our acceptance with God. 3. What the office of the mediator is. It becomes a mediator to treat with both parties, the offended and the offending. It was in this way that Christ performed the office of mediator, treating with each party. With God, the offended party, he does these things. 1. He intercedes with the Father for us, and prays that our sin may not be laid to our charge. 2. He offers himself as a satisfaction in our behalf. 3. He makes this satisfaction by dying for us, and enduring a punishment sufficient to meet our case, finite indeed as to time, but infinite in dignity and value. 4. He becomes our surety that we shall no more offend God by our sins. Without this surety-ship intercession finds no place, not even with men, much less with God. 5. He at length effects this promise in us by giving us his Holy Spirit and everlasting life. With us, as the offending party, he does these things. 1. He presents himself to us as the messenger of the Father, revealing this his will, that he should present himself as our mediator, and that the Father accepts of his sacrifice. 2. He makes this satisfaction, and grants and applies it unto us. 3. He works faith in us by giving us the Holy Spirit, that we may embrace and not reject this benefit which is offered unto us, because there can be no reconciliation unless each party consents. He works in us, both to will and to do, Philippians 2, verse 13. 4. He brings it to pass by the same Spirit that we leave off sinning and commence a new life. 5. He preserves us in this state of reconciliation by faith and new obedience, and defends us against the devil and all enemies, even against ourselves, lest we fall. 6. Finally, he will raise us up from the dead and glorify us, 
that is, he will perfect the salvation begun, and the gifts which we lost in Adam, as well as those which he has merited for us. All these things Christ does, obtains, and perfects, not only by his merits, but also by his efficacy. He is therefore said to be a mediator both in merit and efficacy, because he does not only by his sacrifice merit for us, but he also, by virtue of his Spirit, effectually confers upon us his benefits, which consist in righteousness and eternal life, according to what is said, I lay down my life for the sheep, I give unto them eternal life, as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given unto the Son to have life in himself. As the Father raiseth up the dead, and quickeneth them, so the Son quickeneth whom he will. John 10, verse 15 and 28, chapter 5, verses 21 and 46. There are many benefits comprehended in the office of the Mediator, for God has instituted it for the purpose of bestowing blessings upon the Church. Paul comprehends these blessings very briefly in four general terms when he says, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30. He is made unto us wisdom, one, because he is the matter and subject of the wisdom which we possess. I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. We preach Christ crucified, to the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Greeks foolishness, but to them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 2, chapter 1 verse 24. 2. Because he is the cause of our wisdom, and that in three ways because he brought it from the bosom of the Father, instituted and preserves the ministry of the Word, through which he instructs us concerning the will of the Father and his office as mediator. And finally, because he works effectually in the hearts of the elect, so that they ascend to the doctrine and are renewed in the image of God. In a word, Christ is our wisdom, because he is the subject, the author and the medium. He is our righteousness, that is, our justifier. Our righteousness is in him, as in the subject, and he himself gives this unto us by his merit and efficacy. He is our sanctification, that is, sanctifier, because he regenerates us and sanctifies us through the Holy Spirit. He is our redemption, that is, redeemer, because he finally delivers us, for the word that is here translated redemption does not only signify the price, but also the effect and consummation of our redemption. Fourth, what kind of a mediator he ought to be. This question is most wisely connected with the foregoing, for since it is manifest that satisfaction must be made, that it must be made through another, and that it must be with the satisfaction of the mediator which has already been described, we must now inquire, what kind of a mediator is he? In answer to this question we would reply that our mediator must be man, very man, deriving his nature from our race and retaining it forever, a perfectly righteous man, and very God. In a word, he must be a person that is theanthropic, having both natures, the divine and human, in the unity of his person, that he may truly be a middle person and mediator between God and men. The proofs concerning the person of the mediator are drawn from his office, for it was necessary that he should be and possess all that was included in his office. These proofs have been already presented and explained in the exposition of the fifteenth, sixteenth, and seventeenth questions of the Catechism, to which we refer the reader. Fifth, who this mediator is, who in one person is both God and man. The mediator has thus far been spoken of as the Son of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, as we have shown in the eighteenth question of the Catechism. The sum and substance of what we are to believe in relation to this subject is this, that the Scriptures attribute at the same time these three things to Christ and to Him alone. First, that He is God. The Word was God. All things were made by Him the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood, who was declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. John 1 verse 1, Acts 20 verse 28, Romans 1 verse 4, 1 John 5 verse 7. To these declarations of Scripture we may add those which attribute to Christ divine worship, invocation, hearing of prayer, and such works as are peculiar to God alone. Those passages which attribute to Christ the name of Jehovah are also in point. Jeremiah 23, verse 6, Zechariah 2, verse 10, Malachi 3, verse 1. The same thing may in like manner be said of those declarations of Scripture which refer to Christ, the things spoken of Jehovah in the Old Testament, Isaiah 9, verse 6, John 12, verse 40, etc. 2. That he is very man. 
the humanity of Christ is proven by those declarations of Scripture which affirm that he was man, the son of man, the son of David, the son of Abraham, etc. 1 Timothy 2, verse 5, Matthew 1, verse 1, chapter 9, verse 6, chapter 16, verse 13. Also, those which declare that he was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, that he had a body of flesh and came in the flesh, Romans 1, verse 3, Colossians 1, verse 22, 1 John 4, verse 2. The same thing is also proven by those passages which attribute to Christ things peculiar to man, as to grow, to eat, to drink, to be ignorant, to be fatigued, to rest, to be circumcised, to be baptized, to weep, to rejoice, etc. 3. That these two natures in Christ constitute one person, those declarations of Scripture are here in point which attribute, through the communication of properties, to the person of Christ, those things which are peculiar to the divine or human nature. The word was made flesh, he partook of flesh and blood. Before Abraham was, I am. I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. God hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, by whom also he made the world. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, who is over all, God blessed for ever. Had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. John 1 verse 14, Hebrews 2 verse 14, John 8 verse 38, Matthew 28 verse 20. Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2, 1 John 4, verse 3, Romans 9, verse 6, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 8. Sixth, whether there can be more than one mediator. There is but one mediator between God and man. The reason of this is because no one but the Son of God can perform the office of mediator, and as there is only one natural Son of God, there cannot be more than one mediator. Objection 1. But the saints also make intercession for us. Therefore, they are also mediators. Answer. There is a great difference between the intercession of Christ and that of the saints who live in the world, and make intercession both for themselves and others, even their persecutors and enemies, for the saints depend upon the merits of Christ in order that their intercessions may avail, whilst Christ depends upon his own merits. And still more, Christ alone offered himself a surety and satisfier, sanctifying himself for us, that is, presenting himself in our stead before the judgment seat of God, which cannot be said of the saints. Objection 2. Where there are many means, there must be more than one mediator. But there are many means of our salvation, therefore there are more mediators than one. Answer. We deny the major proposition, for the means and mediator of salvation are not one and the same thing. Section 13. THE COVENANT OF GOD It has been shown that a mediator is one who reconciles parties that are at variance, as God and men. This reconciliation is called in the Scriptures a covenant, which has particular reference to the mediator, inasmuch as every mediator is a mediator of some covenant, and the reconciler of two opposing parties. Hence the doctrine of the covenant which God made with man is closely connected with the doctrine of the mediator. The principal questions which claim our attention in the consideration of this subject are the following. First, what is this covenant? Second, was it possible without a mediator? Third, is it one or more than one? Fourth, in what do the old and new covenants agree, and in what do they differ? First, what is this covenant? A covenant, in general, is a mutual contract or agreement between two parties, in which the one party binds itself to the other to accomplish something upon certain conditions, giving or receiving something, which is accompanied with certain outward signs and symbols, for the purpose of ratifying in the most solemn manner the contract entered into, and for the sake of confirming it, that the engagement may be kept inviolate. From this general definition of a covenant, it is easy to perceive what we are to understand by the covenant here spoken of, which we may define as a mutual promise and agreement between God and men, in which God gives assurance to men that he will be merciful to them, remit their sins, grant unto them a new righteousness, the Holy Spirit and eternal life, by and for the sake of his Son, our Mediator. And on the other side, men bind themselves to God in this covenant, that they will exercise repentance and faith, or that they will receive with a true faith this great benefit which God offers, and renders such obedience as will be acceptable to him. This mutual engagement between God and man is confirmed by those outward signs which we call sacraments, which are holy signs, declaring and sealing unto us God's good will and our thankfulness and obedience. A testament is the last will of a testator, in which he, at his death, declares what disposition he wishes to be made of his goods or possessions. 
In the scriptures, the terms covenant and testament are used in the same sense, for the purpose of explaining more fully and clearly the idea of this covenant of God, for both of them refer to and express our reconciliation with God, or the mutual agreement between God and men. This agreement or reconciliation is called a covenant because God promises to us certain blessings and demands from us in return our obedience, employing also certain solemn ceremonies for the confirmation thereof. It is called a testament because this reconciliation was made by the interposition of the death of Christ, the testator, that it might be ratified, or because Christ has obtained this reconciliation by his death, and left it unto us as parents at their decease leave their possessions to their children. This reason is adduced by the Apostle Paul in his epistle to the Hebrews, where he says, For this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength at all whilst the testator liveth. Hebrews 9, verses 15, 16, and 17. Whilst the testator lives, he has the right to change, to take from, or to add anything which he chooses to his will. The Hebrew word berit signifies only a covenant and not a testament, whilst the Greek word theatheke, which is used in the epistle to the Hebrews, signifies both a covenant and a testament, from which it is inferred, as some suppose, that this epistle was written not in the Hebrew, but in the Greek language. Objection. A testament is made by the death of the testator, but God cannot die, therefore his testament is not ratified, or this reconciliation cannot be called a testament. Answer. We deny the minor proposition, because God is said to have redeemed the church with his own blood. Hence he must have died, but it was in his human nature, according to the testimony of the Apostle Peter, who says of Christ the testator, who was both God and man, that he was put to death in the flesh, 1 Peter 3, verse 18. Second, how could this covenant between God and man be made? This covenant could only be made by a mediator, as may be inferred from the fact that we, as one of the parties, were not able to satisfy God for our sins, so as to be restored to his favour. Yea, such was our miserable condition, that we would not have accepted of the benefit of redemption had it been purchased by another. Then God, as the other party, could not, on account of his justice, admit us into his favour without a sufficient satisfaction. We were the enemies of God, and hence there could be no way of access to him, unless by the intercession of Christ the Mediator, as has been fully shown in the remarks which we have made upon the question, why was a Mediator necessary. We may conclude, therefore, that this reconciliation was possible only by the satisfaction and death of Christ the Mediator. Third, is this covenant one or more? This covenant is one in substance, but twofold in circumstances, or it is one as it respects the general conditions upon which God enters into an engagement with us and we with him, and it is two as it respects the conditions which are less general, or as some say, as it respects the mode of its administration. The covenant is one in substance, one because there is but one God, one mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ, one way of reconciliation, one faith, and one way of salvation for all, who are and have been saved from the beginning. It is a great question, and one that has been much debated, whether the ancient fathers were saved in a different way from that in which we are saved, which, unless it be correctly explained, throws much obscurity and darkness around the gospel. The following passages of Scripture teach us what we are to believe in relation to this subject. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever and God gave him to be head over all things to the church, from whom the whole body fitly joined together, etc. No man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. There is none other name under heaven given, whereby we must be saved. No one knoweth the Father but the Son, and he to whom, etc. No one cometh to the Father but by me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He means I am the way by which even Adam obtained salvation, Many kings and prophets desired to see the things which ye see, etc. Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Hebrews 13, verse 8, Ephesians 1, verse 22, chapter 4, verse 16, John 1, verse 18, Acts 4, verse 12, Matthew 11, verse 27, John 14, verse 6, Luke 10, verse 24, John 8, verse 56. 
All those, therefore, who have been saved, those under the law as well as those under the gospel, had respect to Christ, who is the only mediator through whom alone they were reconciled to God and saved. Hence there is but one covenant. 2. There is but one covenant, because the principal conditions, which are called the substance of the covenant, are the same before and since the incarnation of Christ. For in each testament God promises to those that repent and believe the remission of sin, whilst men bind themselves, on the other hand, to exercise faith in God and to repent of their sins. But there are said to be two covenants, the old and the new, as it respects the circumstances and conditions which are less general, which constitute the form or the mode of administration, contributing to the principal conditions, in order that the faithful, by their help, may obtain those which are general. Fourth, in what do the old and the new covenant agree, and in what do they differ? Since there is but one covenant, and the scriptures speak of it, as though there were two, we must consider in what particulars the old and the new covenants agree, and in what they differ. They agree, one, in having God as their author, and Christ as the mediator. But Moses, some say, was the mediator of the old covenant. To this we reply that he was a mediator only as a type of Christ, who was even then already mediator, but is now the only mediator without any type. For Christ, having come in the flesh, is no longer covered with types. Two, in the promise of grace concerning the remission of sins, and eternal life granted freely to such as believe, by and for the sake of Christ, which promise was common to those who lived under the old covenant as well as to us, although it is now delivered more clearly, for God promises the same grace to all that believe in the mediator. The seed of the woman shall bruise the serpent's head. I will be a God unto thee and thy seed. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved, even as they. Genesis 3, verse 15, chapter 17, verse 7, John 3, verse 36, Acts 15, verse 11. We here speak of the promise of grace in general, and not of the circumstances of grace particularly. 3. In the condition in respect to ourselves. In each covenant, God requires from men faith and obedience. Walk before me, and be thou perfect. Repent, and believe the gospel. Genesis 17, verse 1, Mark 1, verse 15. The new covenant, therefore, agrees with the old, in that which relates to the principal conditions, both on the part of God and on the part of man. The two covenants differ, one, in the promises of temporal blessings. The old covenant had many special promises in relation to blessings of a temporal character, such as the promise of the land of Canaan, which was to be given to the church, the form of the ceremonial worship and of the mosaic polity, which were to be preserved in the land, even to the time of the Messiah, the birth of the Messiah from that people, etc. But the new covenant has no such special promises of temporal blessings, but only such as are general, because God will preserve his church even to the end, and will always provide for it a certain resting place, Two, in the circumstance of the promise of grace. In the old covenant, the faithful were received into the favor of God on account of the Messiah that was to come, and the sacrifice which he would offer. In the new, the same blessing is obtained for the sake of the Messiah, who has already come, and for the sacrifice which he has already offered in our behalf. 3. In the rites or signs which are added to the promise of grace. In the old covenant, the sacraments were various and painful, such as circumcision, the Passover, oblations, and sacrifices. In the new, there are only two sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper, both of which are simple and significant. 4. In clearness, the old had types and shadows of good things to come. All was typical, as the priests, sacrifices, etc. Hence everything was more obscure and unintelligible. In the new, we have a fulfilment of all these types, so that everything is clearer and better understood, both in regard to the sacraments and the doctrine which is revealed. 5. In the gifts which they confer. In the old, the effusion of the Holy Spirit was small and limited. In the new, it is large and full. I will make a new covenant. If the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more, etc. I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Jeremiah 31, verse 31, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 5, Joel 2, verse 28. 6. In duration. The old was to continue only until the coming of the Messiah, but the new will continue forever. I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Jeremiah 32, verse 40. 7. In their obligation. The old bound the people to the whole law, the moral, ceremonial, and judicial, 
the new binds us only to the moral and to the use of the sacraments of Christ. 8. In their extent. In the old covenant, the church was confined to the Jewish nation, to which it became all those who would be saved to unite themselves. In the new, the church is established among all nations, and is open to all that believe of every nation, rank, condition, or language. Remark. The Old Testament, or covenant, is often used in Scripture by a figure of speech called synecdoche, in which a part is taken for the whole, for the law, with respect to that part which is especially treated of. For in the Old Covenant the law was enforced more strenuously, and there were many parts of it. The gospel was also more obscure. The New Testament, or covenant, on the other hand, is for the most part taken for the gospel, because in the New a great part of the law is abrogated, and the gospel is here more clearly revealed. Section 14 of the Gospel Question 19. Whence knowest thou this? Answer from the Holy Gospel, which God himself revealed first in Paradise, and afterwards published by the patriarchs and prophets, and was pleased to represent it by the shadows of sacrifices and the other ceremonies of the law, and lastly has accomplished it by his only begotten Son. Exposition. This question corresponds with the third question of the Catechism, where it is asked, Whence knowest thou thy misery? Out of the law of God. So it is here asked, Whence knowest thou thy deliverance out of the gospel? Having therefore spoken of the mediator, we must now speak of the doctrine which reveals, describes, and offers him unto us, which doctrine is the gospel. After having spoken of the gospel, we must in the next place speak of the way in which we are made partakers of the mediator and his benefits, which is by faith. First then we must speak of the gospel, which is, with great propriety, made to follow the doctrine of the mediator and the covenant, one, because the mediator is the subject of the gospel, which teaches who and what kind of a mediator he is. Two, because he is the author of the gospel. It is a part of the office of the mediator to reveal the gospel, as it is said, the only begotten which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. John 1 verse 18. Three, because the gospel is a part of the covenant, and is often taken for the new covenant. The principal questions to be discussed in relation to the gospel are the following. First, what is the gospel? Second, is it a new doctrine? Third, in what does it differ from the law? Fourth, what are its effects? Fifth, from what does it appear that the gospel is true? First, what is the gospel? The term gospel signifies, one, a joyful message or good news, two, the sacrifice which is offered to God for this good news, three, the reward which is given to him who announces these joyful tidings. Here it signifies the doctrine or joyful news of Christ manifested in the flesh, as, Behold, I bring unto you good tidings of great joy, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, which is Christ the Lord. Luke 2, verses 10 and 11. The words Epangelia and Evangelia are of a somewhat different signification. The former denotes the promise of a mediator that was to come. The latter is the announcement of a mediator already come. This distinction, however, is not always observed, and is rather in the words than in the thing itself, for both denote the same benefits of the Messiah, so that the distinction is only in the circumstance of time, and in the manner of his appearance, as is evident from the following declarations of Scripture. Abraham saw my day, and was glad. No man cometh to the Father but by me. I am the door, by me if any, etc. God hath appointed him head over all things to the church. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. John 8, verse 56, chapter 14, verse 6, chapter 10, verse 7, Ephesians 1, verse 22, Hebrews 13, verse 8. The gospel is, therefore, the doctrine which the Son of God, our Mediator, revealed from heaven in paradise immediately after the fall, and which he brought from the bosom of the Eternal Father, which promises and announces, in view of the free grace and mercy of God, to all those that repent and believe, deliverance from sin, death, condemnation, and the wrath of God, which is the same thing as to say that it promises and proclaims the remission of sin, salvation, and eternal life, by and for the sake of the Son of God, the Mediator and is that through which the Holy Spirit works effectually in the hearts of the faithful, kindling and exciting in them faith, repentance, and the beginning of eternal life. Or we may, in accordance with the eighteenth, nineteenth, and twentieth questions of the Catechism, 
define the gospel to be the doctrine which God revealed first in paradise, and afterwards published by the patriarchs and prophets, which he was pleased to represent by the shadows of sacrifices and the other ceremonies of the law, and which he has accomplished by his only begotten Son, teaching that the Son of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, which is to say that he is a perfect mediator, satisfying for the sins of the human race, restoring righteousness and eternal life to all those who, by a true faith, are engrafted into him and embrace his benefits. The following passages of Scripture confirm this definition which we have given of the gospel. This is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. And that repentance and remission of sin may be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. John 6, verse 41, Luke 24, verse 47, John 1, verse 17. Second, has the gospel always been known in the church, or is it a new doctrine? The gospel sometimes signifies the doctrine concerning the promise of grace and the remission of sins to be granted freely on account of the sacrifice of the Messiah, who had not as yet come in the flesh, and then again it signifies the doctrine of the Messiah as already come. In the latter sense it has not always been, but commenced with the New Testament. In the former sense, however, it has always been in the church, for immediately after the fall it was revealed in paradise to our first parents. Afterwards it was published by the patriarchs and prophets, and was at length fully accomplished and revealed by Christ himself. The proofs of this are the following. 1. The testimony of the apostles. Peter says, To him gave all the prophets witness, that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently. Acts 10, verse 43, 1 Peter 1, verse 10. Paul says of the gospel, which he had promised afore by his prophets, Romans 1, verse 2, Christ himself says, Had ye believed Moses, he would have believed me, for he wrote of me, John 5, verse 46. 2. The promises and prophecies which relate to the Messiah establish the same thing. This must therefore be carefully noticed, because God will have us know that there was, and is from the beginning to the end of the world, only one doctrine and way of salvation through Christ, according to what is said, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and for ever. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father, but by me. Moses wrote of me. Hebrews 13, verse 8, John 14, verse 6, chapter 5, verse 46. Does anyone ask how Moses wrote of Christ? We answer, 1. By enumerating the promises which had respect to the Messiah. In thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. God shall raise up a prophet, etc. A star shall rise out of Jacob. The scepter shall not depart from Judah until Shiloh come. Genesis 12, verse 3. Deuteronomy 10, verse 15. Numbers 24, verse 17. Genesis 49, verse 10. 2. He restricted these promises to a certain family from which the Messiah was to be born, and to which the promise was afterwards more frequently referred and spoken of. 3. The whole Levitical priesthood and ceremonial worship, as sacrifices, oblations, the altar, the temple, and other things which Moses described, all looked forward to Christ. The kings and kingdom of the Jewish nation were types of Christ and of his kingdom. Hence Moses wrote many things of Christ. Objection 1. Paul declares the gospel was promised through the prophets, and Peter says that the prophets prophesied of the grace that should come unto us, therefore the gospel has not always been. Answer. We grant the gospel has not always been, if we understand by it, the doctrine of the promise of grace, as fulfilled through the manifestation of Christ in the flesh, and as it respects the clearness and evidence of this doctrine, for in ancient times the gospel was not, but was only promised by the prophets, 1. As concerning the fulfilment of those things which in the Old Testament were predicted of the Messiah. 2. In respect to the clearer knowledge of the promise of grace. 3. In respect to the more copious outpourings of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That is, the gospel then was not the announcement of Christ already come, dead, risen again, and seated at the right hand of the Father, as it now is, but it was a preaching of Christ, who would at some future time come and accomplish all these things. Nevertheless, there was a gospel, that is, there was a joyful announcement of the benefits of the Messiah that was to come, sufficient for the salvation of the ancient fathers. As it is said, Abraham saw my day and rejoiced. 
to him gave all the prophets witness christ is the end of the law john eight verse fifty six acts ten verse forty three romans ten verse four objection two the apostle paul says the gospel was the mystery that was kept secret since the world began and that in other ages it was not made known to the sons of men romans sixteen verse twenty five ephesians three verse five answer this objection contains an incorrect division inasmuch as it disjoins things which ought not to be separated for the apostle adds in connection with the above as it is now which ought not to be omitted because it shows that in former times the gospel was also known although less clearly and to fewer persons than it now is the objection is also weak in affirming that to be strictly so which was only declared such in a certain respect for it does not follow that it was then altogether unknown because it is now more clearly perceived and that by many more persons it was known to the fathers although not so clearly as to us hence the importance of the distinction between the words evangelia and evangelion as expressed above objection three the law came by moses grace and truth by jesus christ therefore the gospel has not always been known answer grace and truth did indeed come through christ viz in respect to the fulfilment of types and the full exhibition and copious application of those things which were formerly promised in the old testament but it does not follow from this that the ancient fathers were entirely destitute of this grace for unto them also the same grace was applied by and on account of christ who would subsequently appear in the flesh although it was given in smaller measures to them than to us for whatever grace and true knowledge of god has ever come to men has come through christ as it is said the only begotten son which is in the bosom of the father he hath declared him no man cometh to the father but by me without me ye can do nothing john one verse eighteen chapter fourteen verse six chapter fifteen verse five but it is said the law was by moses therefore the gospel was not by him answer this is so declared because it was the principal part of his office to publish the law yet he also taught the gospel because he wrote and spoke of christ although more obscurely as has been shown but it was the peculiar office of christ to publish the gospel although he at the same time taught the law but not principally as did moses for he took away from the moral law the corruptions and glosses of false teachers he fulfilled the ceremonial law and abrogated it together with the judicial law third in what does the gospel differ from the law the gospel and the law agree in this that they are both from god and that there is something revealed in each concerning the nature will and works of god there is however a very great difference between them one in the revelations which they contain or as it respects the manner in which the revelation peculiar to each is made known the law was engraven upon the heart of man in his creation and is therefore known to all naturally although no other revelation were given the gentiles have the work of the law written in their hearts romans two verse fifteen the gospel is not known naturally but is divinely revealed to the church alone through christ the mediator for no creature could have seen or hoped for that mitigation of the law concerning satisfaction for our sins through another if the son of god had not revealed it no man knoweth the father but the son and he to whom the son will reveal him flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee the son who is in the bosom of the father he hath declared him matthew eleven verse twenty seven chapter sixteen verse seventeen two in the kind of doctrine or subject peculiar to each the law teaches us what we ought to be and what god requires of us but it does not give us the ability to perform it nor does it point out the way by which we may avoid what is forbidden but the gospel teaches us in what manner we may be made such as the law requires for it offers unto us the promise of grace by having the righteousness of christ imputed to us through faith and that in such a way as if it were properly ours teaching us that we are just before god through the imputation of christ's righteousness the law says pay what thou owest do this and live matthew eighteen verse twenty eight luke ten verse twenty eight the gospel says only believe mark five verse thirty six three in the promises the law promises life to those who are righteous in themselves or on the condition of righteousness and perfect obedience he that doeth them shall live in them if thou wilt enter into life keep the commandments leviticus eighteen verse five matthew nineteen verse seventeen 
the gospel, on the other hand, promises life to those who are justified by faith in Christ, or on the condition of the righteousness of Christ applied unto us by faith. The law and the gospel are, however, not opposed to each other in these respects, for, although the law requires us to keep the commandments if we would enter into life, yet it does not exclude us from life if another perform these things for us. It does indeed propose a way of satisfaction which is through ourselves, but it does not forbid the other, as has been shown. 4. They differ in their effects. The law, without the gospel, is the letter which killeth, and is the ministration of death. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law worketh wrath, and the letter killeth. Romans 3, verse 20, chapter 4, verse 15, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 6. The outward preaching and simple knowledge of what ought to be done is known through the letter, for it declares our duty, and that righteousness which God requires, and whilst it neither gives us the ability to perform it, nor points out the way through which it may be attained, it finds fault with and condemns our righteousness. But the gospel is the ministration of life and of the spirit, that is, it has the operations of the spirit united with it, and quickens those that are dead in sin, because it is through the gospel that the Holy Spirit works faith and life in the elect. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation, etc. Romans 1, verse 16. Objection. There is no precept or commandment belonging to the gospel, but to the law. The preaching of repentance is a precept, therefore the preaching of repentance does not belong to the gospel, but to the law. Answer, we deny the major if it is taken generally, for this precept is peculiar to the gospel, which commands us to believe, to embrace the benefits of Christ, and to commence new obedience, or that righteousness which the law requires. If it be objected that the law also commands us to believe in God, we reply that it does this only in general, by requiring us to give credit to all the divine promises, precepts, and denunciations, and that with a threatening of punishment, unless we do it. But the gospel commands us expressly and particularly to embrace by faith the promise of grace, and also exhorts us by the Holy Spirit and by the word to walk worthy of our heavenly calling. This, however, it does only in general, not specifying any duty in particular, saying, Thou shalt do this or that. But it leaves this to the law, as on the contrary it does not say in general, Believe all the promises of God, leaving this to the law, but it says in particular, Believe this promise, Fly to Christ, and thy sins shall be forgiven thee. Fourth, what are the proper effects of the gospel? The proper effects of the gospel are, one, faith, because faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. The gospel is the ministration of the Spirit, the power of God unto salvation, Romans 10, verse 17, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 8, Romans 1, verse 16. Two, through faith our entire conversion to God, justification, regeneration, and salvation, for through faith we receive Christ with all his benefits. Fifth, from what does the truth of the gospel appear? The truth of the gospel appears, one, from the testimony of the Holy Ghost, two, from the prophecies which were uttered by the prophets, three, from the fulfillment of these prophecies which took place under the New Testament dispensation, four, from the miracles by which the doctrine of the gospel was confirmed. 5. By the testimony of the gospel itself, because it alone shows the way of escape from sin, and ministers solid comfort to the wounded conscience. Section 15. The Subject of Faith Question 21. What is true faith? Answer. True faith is not only a certain knowledge, whereby I hold for truth all that God has revealed to us in his word, but also an assured confidence, which the Holy Ghost works by the gospel in my heart, that, not only to others, but to me also, remission of sin, everlasting righteousness, and salvation are freely given by God, merely of grace, only for the sake of Christ's merits. Exposition, the subject of faith is introduced next in order, one, because it is the means by which we are made partakers of the Mediator, two, because the preaching of the gospel profits nothing without faith, in speaking of faith, we must inquire, first, what is faith? Second, of how many kinds of faith do the Scriptures speak? Third, in what does faith differ from hope? Fourth, what are the efficient causes of justifying faith? Fifth, what are the effects of faith? Sixth, to whom is it given? First, what is faith? The word faith, according to Cicero, is derived from fiendo, which signifies doing, because that which is declared is performed. 
It is, according to him, the assurance and truth of contracts, and of whatever may be spoken, and is the foundation of justice. According to the common definition, faith is a certain knowledge of facts or conclusions, to which we assent on the testimony of faithful witnesses, whom we may not disbelieve, whether it be God, or angels, or men, or experience. But since, according to the most general distinction, there is one kind of faith in divine, and another in human affairs, we must here inquire what is faith in divine things, or what is theological faith. The definition of faith, therefore, taken generally, must be given somewhat more exactly, and yet it must be such as to comprise in it all the different forms of faith spoken of in the Scriptures. Faith in general, of whatever kind mention is made in the Holy Scriptures, is an assent to, or a certain knowledge of what is revealed concerning God, His will, works, and grace, in which we confide upon divine testimony or it is to yield assent to every word of God, delivered to the church in the law and gospel, on account of the declaration of God himself. Faith is also often taken for the doctrine of the church, or for those things of which the word of God informs us, and which are necessary to faith, as when it is called the Christian faith, the apostolic faith. It is likewise often used for the fulfilment of ancient promises, or for the things themselves which are believed, as before faith came we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Galatians 3 verse 23. Second, of how many kinds of faith do the Scriptures speak? There are four kinds of faith enumerated in the Holy Scriptures, viz. historical, temporary, the faith of working miracles, and justifying or saving faith. The difference which exists between the different kinds of faith here specified will appear by giving a proper definition of each. Historical faith is to know and believe that every word of God is true, which is divinely delivered and revealed, whether by the voice, or by oracles, or by visions, or by any other method of revelation by which the divine will is made known unto us upon the authority and declaration of God himself. It is called historical, because it is merely a knowledge of those things which God is said to have done, or now does, or will hereafter do. The scriptures speak of this faith in these places. If I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, which may also be understood of all the different kinds of faith except justifying. The devils believe and tremble. Simon also believed, viz., that the doctrine of Peter was true, yet he had no justifying faith. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 2, James 2, verse 19, Acts 8, verse 13. Temporary faith is an assent to the doctrines of the church, accompanied with profession and joy, but not with a true and abiding joy, such as arises from a consciousness that we are the objects of the divine favour, but from some other cause, whatever it may be, so that it endures only for a time, and in seasons of affliction dies away. Or it is to assent to the doctrine delivered by the prophets and apostles, to profess it, to glory in it, and to rejoice for a time in the knowledge of it, but not on account of an application of the promise to itself, or on account of a sense of the grace of God in the heart, but for other causes. This definition is drawn from what Christ says in the explanation of the parable of the sower. He that received the seed into the stony places, the same is he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. Yet hath he not root in himself, but endureth for a while, for when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. Matthew 13, verses 20 and 21. The causes of this joy are in a manner infinite, and different in different individuals. Yet they are all temporary, and when they fade, the faith that is built upon them vanishes away. Hypocrites rejoice in hearing the gospel, either because it is new to them, or because it seems to calm their minds whilst it delivers them from the burdens which men, by their traditions, have imposed upon them, as does the doctrine of Christian liberty, justification, etc., or because they seek under its profession a cloak for their sins and hope to reap rewards and advantages, both public and private, such as riches, honours, glory, etc., which shows itself when they are called to bear the cross, for then, because they have no root in themselves, they fall away. But hypocrites do not rejoice as true believers from a sense of the grace of God and from an application to themselves of the benefits offered in the divine word, which may be regarded as the cause of true and substantial joy in the faithful, the removal of which single cause is sufficient to make their faith temporary. This temporary faith differs from historical only in the joy which accompanies it. Historical faith includes nothing more than mere knowledge, 
whilst this has joy connected with this knowledge, for these time-serving men receive the word with joy. The devils believe historically and tremble, but they do not rejoice in the knowledge which they have, but rather wish it were extinguished. Yea, they do not even profess themselves to be followers of this doctrine, although they know it to be true, but hate and oppose it most bitterly. In men, however, historical faith is sometimes joined with profession, and sometimes not, for men often, whatever may be the causes, profess that truth and religion which they hate. Many also, who know the doctrine to be true, still oppose it. Sie wollten, dass die Bibel im Rhein schwimme. These sin against the Holy Ghost. Objection. But the devil has often professed Christ, therefore he cannot be said to hate this doctrine. Answer. He did not, however, profess Christ from any desire of advancing and promoting his doctrine, but that he might mingle with it his own falsehoods, and thus cause it to be suspected. It is for this reason that Christ commands him to keep silent, as Paul also does in Acts 16, verse 18. The faith of miracles is a special gift of effecting some extraordinary work, or of foretelling some particular event by divine revelation. Or it is a firm persuasion produced by some divine revelation, or peculiar promise in regard to some future miraculous working, which the person desires to accomplish, and which he foretells. This faith cannot be drawn simply out of the general word of God, unless some special promise or revelation be connected with it. The Apostle speaks of this kind of faith when he says, If I had all faith, that I could remove mountains, etc. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 2. This declaration may, however, be understood of all the different kinds of faith except justifying, yet it is spoken with special reference to the faith of miracles. That this is a distinct kind of faith is proven, one, from the declaration of Christ. If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, etc. Matthew 17, verse 20. Many holy men also have had strong faith as Abraham, David, etc., and yet they did not remove mountains. Therefore this species of faith is distinct from justifying faith which all true Christians possess. 2. Exorcists, as the sons of Sceva, Acts 19, verse 14, have endeavoured to cast out devils when they had not the gift or power of accomplishing it, who were afterwards severely punished when the evil spirit fell upon them and overcame and wounded them. 3. Simon Magus is said to have believed, and yet he was not able to work miracles. He therefore desired to purchase this gift. 4. The devil has a knowledge of what is historical, and yet he cannot work miracles, because no one except the Creator is able to change the nature of things. 5. Judas taught and wrought miracles, as did the other apostles, therefore he had a historical faith, perhaps also temporary, and the faith of miracles, and yet he had not that faith which justifies, for Christ said of him, He is a devil. John 6, verse 70. 6. Many shall say unto Christ, Lord, Lord, have we not in thy name cast out devils? To whom he will nevertheless reply, I never knew you. Matthew 7, verse 22. 7. Lastly, the other kinds of faith extend to all things which the word of God reveals and requires us to believe. The faith of miracles, however, refers merely to certain works and extraordinary events. It is therefore a distinct kind of faith. Justifying faith is properly that which is defined in the Catechism, according to which definition the general nature of saving faith consists in knowledge and an assured confidence, for there can be no faith in a doctrine that is wholly unknown. It is proper for us, therefore, to obtain a knowledge of that in which we are to believe before we exercise faith, from which we may see the absurdity of the implicit faith of the Papists. The difference or formal character of saving faith is the confidence and application which every one makes to himself of the free remission of sins by and for the sake of Christ. The property or peculiar character of this faith is trust and delight in God on account of this great benefit. The efficient cause of justifying faith is the Holy Ghost. The instrumental cause is the Gospel, in which the use of the sacraments is also comprehended. The subject of this faith is the will and heart of man. Justifying or saving faith differs therefore from the other kinds of faith, because it alone is that assured confidence by which we apply unto ourselves the merit of Christ, which is done when we firmly believe that the righteousness of Christ is granted and imputed unto us, so that we are accounted just in the sight of God. Confidence is an exercise or motion of the will and heart, following something good, resting and rejoicing in it. The German has it, Vertrauen sich ganz und gar darauf verlassen. 
pistis and pistevin, the former of which means belief and the latter to believe, are from pepisme, which means strongly persuaded, whence pistevin, even among profane writers, signifies to wax confident or to rest upon anything. As we read in Phocylides, believe not the people, for the multitude is deceitful, and in Demosthenes, thou art confident in thyself, etc. Justifying faith differs from historical, because it always includes that which is historical. Historical faith is not sufficient for our justification. The same thing may also be said of the other two kinds of faith. Justifying faith, again, differs from all other kinds of faith in this, that it is by it alone that we obtain righteousness and a title to the inheritance of the saints. For if, as the Apostle says, we are justified by faith, and faith is imputed for righteousness, and by faith is the inheritance, then this faith must be one of the four kinds of which we have spoken. But it is not historical faith, for then the devils would also be accounted just, and be heirs of the promise. Neither is it temporary faith, for Christ rejects this. Nor is this the faith of miracles, for in that case Judas would also be an heir. Hence it is by justifying faith alone that we obtain righteousness and an inheritance among the saints, which the scriptures properly and simply call faith, and which is also peculiar to the elect. No man, however, truly knows what justifying faith is, except he who believes or possesses it, as he who never saw or tasted honey knows nothing of its quality or taste, although you may tell him many things of the sweetness of honey. But the man who truly believes experiences these things in himself, and is able also to explain them to others. 1. He believes that everything which the Scriptures contain is true and from God. 2. He feels himself constrained firmly to believe and embrace these things, for... If we confess that they are true and from God, it is proper that we should ascend to them. 3. He sees, embraces, and applies particularly to himself the promise of grace or the free remission of sins, righteousness, and eternal life, by and for the sake of Christ, as it is said, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. John 3, verse 36. 4. Having this confidence, he trusts and rejoices in the present grace of God, and from this he thus concludes in reference to future good, since God now loves me and grants unto me such great blessings, he will also preserve me unto eternal life, because he is unchangeable, and his gifts are without repentance. 5. Joy arises in the heart in view of such benefits, which joy is accompanied with a peace of conscience that passes all understanding. 6. Then he has a will and an earnest desire to obey all the commands of God, without a single exception, and is willing to endure patiently whatever God may send upon him. The man, therefore, who possesses a justifying faith, does that which is required of him, regardless of the opposition of the world and the devil. He who truly believes experiences all these things in himself, and he who experiences these things in himself truly believes. Third, in what does faith differ from hope? We must not confound justifying faith with hope, although both have respect to the same blessing. Faith lays hold of present good, whilst hope has respect to that which is future objection, but we believe in everlasting life, which is nevertheless something that is future. Therefore faith also has respect to future good. Answer, eternal life is a future good, as to its consummation, and in this respect we do not simply believe in it, but hope for it. For we are saved by hope. Now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. Romans 8 verse 24, 1 John 3 verse 2. But life everlasting is also a present good, in respect to the will of God who grants it unto us, and in respect to the beginning of it, even in this life, in which respect it is not hoped for, but believed, as it is said, He that believeth on the Son of God hath everlasting life, and is passed from death unto life. This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, etc. John 5, verse 24, chapter 17, verse 3. By faith, therefore, we are persuaded that those benefits are ours, which we have not as yet, on account of the promise of God, and by hope we confidently look for the full consummation of these things. It is in this sense that Paul speaks of faith when he says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Hebrews 11 verse 1. That is, it is that which makes those things hoped for, present and real, and it is the evidence of those things which do not appear as it respects their consummation. There are some who make the following distinction between faith and hope. Faith embraces the promises contained in the creed concerning things to come, whilst hope comprehends the things themselves which are future. This distinction, however, is less popular and not as easily understood as the former. Fourth, 
what are the causes of faith the first and chief efficient cause of historical and temporary faith as well as the faith of miracles is the holy spirit who produces these different kinds of faith by his general influence and operation it is different however as it respects justifying faith which the holy ghost produces by his special working by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of god ephesians two verse eight objection the devil has historical faith therefore it is wrought in him by the holy ghost answer the faith which is in devils is indeed produced by the holy ghost but it is by his general working as we have remarked and not by his special influence by which he works saving faith in the elect and in them alone for whatever knowledge devils and hypocrites possess god produces in them by his spirit but not in such a manner as that he regenerates or justifies them as in the case of the elect nor in such a manner that they may acknowledge and praise him as the author of this gift the instrumental cause of faith in general is the word of god comprehended in the books of the old and the new testament in which beside the word there are also many divine works and miracles contained the chief and peculiar instrument of justifying faith is the preaching of the gospel the gospel is the power of god unto salvation to every one that believeth faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of god romans 1 verse 16 chapter 10 verse 17 justifying faith is therefore not ordinarily produced in adults without the preaching of the gospel the cause of that faith which works miracles is not simply the word of god but it requires a special promise or revelation the formal cause of justifying faith is that which is peculiar to saving faith which is a certain knowledge of all that god has revealed and an assured confidence wrought in the heart the object of saving faith is christ and the promise of grace the subject or part of man in which it exists is the understanding the will and the heart the end or final cause is first the glory of god or the manifestation of his righteousness glory and mercy and secondly our salvation fifth what are the effects of faith the effects of justifying faith are one our justification before god two joy and delight in god with peace of conscience being justified by faith we have peace with god romans five verse one three conversion regeneration and universal obedience purifying their hearts by faith acts fifteen verse nine four the consequences which belong to the effects of faith such as an increase of temporal and spiritual gifts and the reception of these gifts by faith the first effect therefore of justifying faith is our justification after this has once taken place all the other benefits which follow faith are made over unto us which benefits we believe are given unto us by faith inasmuch as faith is the cause of them for that which is the cause of a cause is also the cause of an effect if faith be therefore the last cause of our justification it is likewise the cause of those things which follow our justification thy faith hath made thee whole luke eight verse forty eight in a word the effects of faith are justification and regeneration which is begun in this life and will be perfected in the life to come Romans 3 verse 28, chapter 10 verse 10, Acts 13 verse 39. Sixth, to whom is faith given? Justifying faith is peculiar to all the elect and to them alone, for it is given to all the elect and only to them, including even infants, as it respects an inclination to faith. No man can come to me except the Father draw him. It is given unto you to know the mystery of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given as many as were ordained unto eternal life believed whom he did predestinate them he also called justified and glorified faith is the gift of god but they have not all obeyed the gospel for isaiah saith lord who hath believed etc for all men have not faith john six verse forty four matthew thirteen verse eleven acts three verse forty eight romans eight verse thirty chapter ten verse sixteen Ephesians 2 verse 8, 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 2. Temporary faith, as well as the faith of miracles, is given to those who are members of the visible church only, that is, to hypocrites. Have we not in thy name done many wonderful works, cast out devils, etc.? Matthew 7 verse 22. The faith of miracles, however, which was possessed by many in the primitive church, has now disappeared from the church inasmuch as the doctrine of the gospel has been sufficiently confirmed by miracles historical faith may be possessed even by those who are out of the church and also by devils objection one historical faith is a good work the devils possess this faith therefore they have good works 
we reply to the major proposition thus, historical faith is a good work if it be connected with an application of those things which are known, and if confidence be at the same time joined with it, and if it be said by way of objection that this faith is the effect of the Spirit of God, and so of itself a good work, we reply that it is indeed a good work in itself, but it becomes evil by accident, seeing that the reprobate do not receive and apply to themselves the things which they know to be true. Hence the devils are said to tremble because they do not apply to themselves what they know of God, that is, they do not believe that God is to them what they know him to be from his word, merciful, gracious, etc., Objection to many infants are included in the number of the elect, and yet they have no faith. Therefore all the elect do not possess faith. Answer, infants do not indeed possess actual faith as adults, yet they nevertheless have a power or inclination to faith, which the Holy Ghost works in them according to their capacity or condition, for since the Holy Ghost is promised to infants also, it cannot be inactive in them. Therefore that which we have said, that saving faith is granted to all the elect, remains true. We add still further that faith is necessary for all the elect, and not only faith, but also a profession of faith in those who have arrived to years of understanding, and that one, on account of the command of God, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, therefore thou shalt reverence and profess it. He that confesseth me before men, him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. Exodus 20, verse 7, Matthew 10, verse 32. 2. On account of the glory of God. Let your light so shine before men, etc. Matthew 5, verse 16. 3. Because faith is not inactive, but like a fruitful tree, it manifests itself by profession. 4. On account of our safety, by the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans 10, verse 10. 5. That we may bring others to Christ. When thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Luke 22, verse 32. We may know that we have faith, one, from the testimony of the Holy Ghost, and by the true and unfeigned desire which we have to embrace and receive the benefits which Christ offers unto us. He that believes is conscious of the existence of his faith. As Paul says, I know whom I have believed. We have the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. 2 Timothy 1 verse 12, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 13, 1 John 5 verse 10. 2. We may know that we have faith by the doubts and conflicts which we experience, if we are of the number of the faithful. 3. From the effect of faith, which is a sincere purpose and desire to obey all the commands of God. Objection 3. Those who may fall and lose the grace of God before the end of life cannot be certain of eternal life, because to be certain of our salvation and yet not be raised above the possibility of losing the grace of God, involves a contradiction. Therefore we cannot be certain of our salvation, so that what has been said of justifying faith, that it is an assured confidence of righteousness and eternal life, is false. Answer. The antecedent is true of those who finally fall away, for to be able thus to fall is inconsistent with the certainty of salvation, but those in whom God once produces true faith do not finally fall away. Reply 1. All those who are weak may finally fall away. We are all weak, therefore we may all come short of the grace of God. Answer. If the righteous were sustained by their own strength, they might indeed fall and lose the grace of God, but they are continually supported by divine grace. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. Psalm 37 verse 24. Reply 2. God has nowhere declared that he will preserve us in our favour to the end. Answer, yea, he has declared it in the passage just quoted, and in many other places, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man, etc. I am persuaded that neither life nor death, nor angels, nor principalities, etc., shall be able to separate me from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. John 10, verses 28 and 29, Romans 8, verse 38. Reply 3, But it is said, Let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed, lest he fall. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12, Therefore God does not promise perseverance, but makes our salvation dependent upon ourselves, which is to make it doubtful. Answer, There is here a fallacy in regarding that a cause which is none, for God, by this exhortation, wishes to nourish, to preserve, and perfect the salvation of believers, by urging them to their duty, and not to commit their perseverance to their own strength and will. 
Wherefore, if we now truly believe, we ought certainly to rest assured that God will also preserve us in time to come, for if he desires that we should be assured of his present grace, he will also have us certain of that which is still future, for he is unchangeable. Reply 4. But it is also said in Ecclesiastes 9 verse 1, No man knoweth either love or hatred by all that is before them. Therefore we cannot be certain of the present grace of God, and consequently we cannot determine anything in reference to that which is still future. We reply to the antecedent, 1. No man can indeed know or judge with certainty from second causes or from events whether good or evil, for the external condition of men furnishes no safe criterion either of the favour or disapprobation of God. 2. He may not know it of himself, and yet, if God is pleased to reveal it unto him, he may not be ignorant of it. We may therefore be ignorant of our salvation as far as it is dependent upon second causes, but we may know it in as far as God is pleased to reveal it unto us by his word and spirit. Reply 5. But who hath known the mind of the Lord? Romans 11, verse 34. Answer. No man indeed knows the mind of the Lord before it is revealed, but after God has revealed it, we may know as much as is necessary for our salvation. We all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image, from glory unto glory. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18 Objection 5. Paul exhorts the Corinthians not to receive the grace of God in vain, and Christ exhorts us to watch and pray. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 1, Matthew 26 verse 41 Answer. This, however, is said to prohibit carnal security, and to excite the faithful to watchfulness and prayerfulness, in order that the certainty of their salvation might be preserved. Objection 6. Saul fell away finally. He was one of the godly, therefore the righteous may finally fall. Answer. Saul was not a truly pious man, but a hypocrite. Hence we deny the minor proposition. And if it is said by way of objection that he had the gifts of the Holy Spirit, we reply that he had only such gifts as are common both to the godly and ungodly, but he had not the gift of regeneration and adoption which is peculiar to the godly. Objection 7. The doctrine of perseverance and of the certainty of our salvation produces security. Answer. It produces by itself a spiritual security in the elect and a carnal security in the reprobate by accident. Section 16. The Apostles' Creed. Question 23. What are these articles? Answer. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Exposition. The term symbol or creed, symbolum, signifies in general a sign or mark by which one person or thing is distinguished from another, as a military symbol is a sign which distinguishes allies from enemies. The German has it, ein Feldzeichen oder Losung. Or, it, symbola, signifies a collation or bringing together as to a feast, zusammenschießen. In the sense of the church, it signifies a brief and summary form of Christian faith which distinguishes the church and her members from all the various sects. There are those who suppose that this summary of our Christian faith, as just recited, is called a symbol or creed, because it was collated or formed by the apostles, each one furnishing a certain portion of it. This, however, cannot be proven. It is more probable that it was so called because these articles constitute a certain form or rule with which the faith of all orthodox Christians should agree and conform. It is called apostolic because it contains the substance of the doctrine of the apostles which the catechumens were required to believe and profess, or because the apostles delivered this sum of Christian doctrine to their disciples and the church afterwards received it from them. It is called Catholic because it is the one faith of all Christians. We must here inquire why were other creeds, as the Nicene, the Athanasian, the Ephesian, and Chalcedonian, formed and received in the Church after the Apostles' Creed. To this we would reply that these are not properly other creeds differing in substance from the Apostles' Creed, but are merely a repetition and clearer enunciation of its meaning, in which some words are added by way of explanation 
on account of heretics who took advantage of its brevity and corrupted it. There is, therefore, no change as it respects the matter or substance of the Apostles' Creed in those of a later date, but merely a difference in the form in which the doctrines are expressed. There are other weighty reasons which may have led and compelled the bishops and teachers of the ancient church to form and construct these brief formulas of confession, especially when churches were multiplying and heresies were springing up in different places. Among these reasons we may mention the following. 1. That all the young, as well as those of riper years, might be able to remember the chief points of Christian doctrine, as thus briefly summed up and expressed. 2. That all might constantly have before their eyes the confession and comfort of their faith, knowing what the doctrine was on account of which they were called to suffer persecution. It was in this way that God formerly had the substance of the law and promises expressed and comprehended in a brief form, so that all might have a certain rule of life and ground of comfort continually in view. 3. That the faithful might have a certain badge or mark by which they might then, and in all future ages, be distinguished from unbelievers and heretics who cunningly corrupt the writings of the prophets and apostles. This was also a reason on account of which these confessions were called creeds or symbols. 4. That there might be extant some perpetual rule, short, simple, and easily understood by all, according to which every doctrine and interpretation of Scripture might be tried, that they might be embraced and believed when agreeing therewith, and rejected when differing from it. And although other confessions were formed, the Apostles' Creed greatly surpasses all others in importance and authority, and that for the following reasons. 1. Because almost the whole of it is expressed in the very language of the Scriptures. 2. Because it is of the greatest antiquity, it was first delivered to the Church by apostolic men, either by the Apostles themselves, or by their disciples and hearers, and has been regularly transmitted down to the present time. 3. Because it is the basis and type of all the other creeds which have been formed by the consent of the whole Church, and approved of by general synods, for the purpose of preventing and refuting the perversions and corruptions of heretics, by explaining more fully the meaning of the Apostles' Creed. The truth of the other creeds, however, does not consist in the authority or in the decrees of men or of councils, but in their perpetual agreement with the Holy Scriptures and with the teachings of the whole Church from the time of the Apostles, retaining and holding fast to the doctrine which they delivered, and at the same time giving testimony to posterity that they have received this doctrine from the Apostles and those that heard them, which agreement is obvious to all those who will but give the subject a careful consideration, the power to give new laws concerning the worship of God, or to give new articles of faith binding the conscience, belongs to no assembly of men or of angels but to God alone. We are not to believe God on account of the testimony of the Church, but the Church upon the testimony of God. These things, in reference to the causes and authority of creeds, are taken from Admonit Noestat de Concordia Bergensia, written by Osinus in the year of our Lord, 1581, where theological students may obtain a knowledge of the things concerning the truth and authority of ecclesiastical writers learnedly discussed, from page 117 to 142. A short table is here subjoined. The writings concerning the doctrine of the Church are either divine, such as have been written by the prophets and apostles who were immediately inspired by God. Under this head we may include the canonical books of the Old and New Testaments, these alone are simply and divinely inspired as to their words and thoughts, and are alone worthy of credit. They are, therefore, the rule of all other writings. Or, divided into ecclesiastical, such as have been written by the doctors of the Church, these are either public, such as were written in the name of the whole Church, these are again divided into Catholic, including the creeds and confessions which were written in the name and with the consent of the whole Orthodox Church, and which were received and approved of by the Church, such as the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Constantinopolitan Creed, the Chalcedonian Creed, the Athanasian Creed, or particular, including the confessions of certain churches and councils as catechisms, the Augustian Confession, etc., or private, such as were written in the name and by the private advice of some one or more persons as commonplaces, commentaries, etc. Section 17. Concerning the one true God. Question 25. Since there is but one divine essence, why speakest thou of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? Answer. Because God hath so revealed himself in his word, 
that these three distinct persons are the only true and eternal God. Exposition. In this question we have contained the doctrine of the Church in reference to the one true God and the three persons of the Godhead. The principal questions which claim our attention in connection with this subject are the following. First, from what does it appear that there is a God? Second, what is the character of that God whom the Church acknowledges and worships, and in what does he differ from heathen idols? Third, is he but one, and in what sense do the Scriptures call creatures gods? Fourth, what do the terms essence, person, and trinity signify, and in what do they differ? Fifth, is it proper to retain these names in the Church? Sixth, how many persons of the Godhead are there? Seventh, how are these persons distinguished from each other? Eighth, why is it necessary for the Church to hold fast to the doctrine of the Trinity? First, from what does it appear that there is a God? That there is a God is proven by many arguments, common both to philosophy and theology. These arguments we shall present in the following order. 1. The order and harmony which we observe everywhere in nature gives evidence of the existence of God. There is as every one must perceive a wise arrangement of every part of nature, and a constant succession of changes and operations, according to certain laws, which could not exist and be preserved, unless by some intelligent and almighty being. The scriptures refer to this argument at considerable length in the following places. Psalms 8, 19, 104, 135, 136, 147, and 148. Romans 1, Acts 14, and 17. 2. A rational nature, having some cause, cannot exist except it proceed from some intelligent being, for the reason that a cause is not of a more inferior character than the effect which it produces. The human mind is endowed with reason, and has some cause, therefore it has proceeded from some intelligent being which is God. There is a spirit in man, etc. Yet they say the Lord shall not see, etc. We also are his offspring. Job 32 verse 8 Psalm 94, verse 7, Acts 17, verse 28. 3. The conceptions or notions of general principles, which are natural to us, as the difference between things proper and improper, etc., cannot be the result of mere chance or proceed from an irrational nature, but must necessarily be naturally engraven upon our hearts by some intelligent cause, which is God. The Gentiles show the work of the law written in their hearts, etc. Romans 2, verse 15. 4. From the knowledge or sense which we all have that there is a God, there is no nation, however barbarous or uncivilized, but has some notion or system of religion which presupposes a belief in some God. That which may be known of God is manifest in them, that is, in the minds of men, for God hath showed it unto them. Romans 1 verse 19. 5. The reproofs of conscience which follow the commission of sin and harass the minds of the ungodly, cannot be inflicted by any one except by an intelligent being, one who can distinguish between that which is proper and improper, who knows the thoughts and hearts of men, and who can cause such fears and forebodings to arise in the minds of the wicked. Their worm dieth not, there is no peace to the wicked, God is a consuming fire, they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their consciences either accusing or excusing them. Isaiah 57 verse 21, Deuteronomy 4 verse 24, Romans 2 verse 15. Addenda, these reproofs of conscience, which are common to all men, may be regarded as a sufficient answer to the objection that has sometimes been brought against the existence of God, that it is a mere subtle device, invented and published by philosophers and legislators, for the purpose of restraining men from the commission of crime. For, if it be true that it is a mere device, why is it, we might ask, that these men who seem to have detected this fraud are most harassed by their consciences on account of this their blasphemy, as well as for their other crimes. How, too, we might ask, could the mere assertion of a few individuals be sufficient to persuade all mankind into this belief, and cause it to be maintained in all succeeding ages? And if, to weaken the force of this argument, it be asserted that there are those who neither believe in God, nor are troubled by their consciences, we reply that this, which they imagine is most false, for there are none of the wicked who are free from these compunctions of conscience, for however much they may despise God and every form of religion, and endeavour to repress their fears, so much the more are they tormented, and made to tremble at every mention and approach of God. Hence we often see those whose lives are for the most part profane and secure, die in despair when they are oppressed with the judgments of God. 6. 
the rewards of the righteous and punishments of the wicked, as the deluge, the destruction of Sodom by fire, the overthrow of Pharaoh in the Red Sea, the downfall of flourishing kingdoms, etc., are evidences of the existence of a God, for these judgments which are inflicted upon wicked men and nations testify that there must be some universal and omnipotent judge of the whole world. God is known by the judgments which he executeth. Verily, he is a God that judgeth in the earth. Psalm 9, verse 16, Psalm 58, verse 11. Addenda. And although the wicked often flourish for a time, whilst the godly are oppressed, yet examples which are few in number do not weaken the general rule with which most events agree. And if it were even so that the wicked do not as often suffer punishment as the righteous, yet these very examples, although few in number, testify that there is a God, and that he is also displeased with the offences of others who seem not to be so severely punished. But it is not true of any of the wicked that they are not punished in this life, for all those who are unconverted are sooner or later overtaken by punishment. Yea, they most generally die in despair, which punishment is more grievous than all others, and is the beginning and testimony of everlasting punishment. And although the punishment of the wicked in this life is not as great as their sins deserve, yet it nevertheless has some correspondence with the most tragical crimes of the ungodly, so that we are taught by the doctrine of the Church that the lenity which God here uses towards the wicked, and the severity which he seems to show to the righteous, do not at all weaken his providence and justice, but rather declare his goodness, in that he invites the wicked to repentance, whilst he delays their punishment and perfects the salvation of the righteous by exercising them with crosses and chastisements. 7. A civil compact or commonwealth, governed wisely by just and wholesome laws, could not possibly be exhibited to men except by some intelligent being approving of this order. And as devils and wicked men generally hate and oppose this order, it must of necessity be God who has hitherto preserved it. By me kings reign and princes decree justice. Proverbs 8, verse 15. 8. Heroic enthusiasm, or that wisdom and excellent virtue in understanding and accomplishing works surpassing the ordinary powers of man, as the dexterity and delight of skilful artificers, and of governors in discovering and furthering the arts, in devising various counsels, also such greatness of mind in performing deeds of renown, and in managing affairs, as there was in Achilles, Alexander, Archimedes, Plato, etc., all give evidence that there must be some superior and omnipotent cause that excites and urges men on to these things. Of Joshua it is said, The Lord himself will go before thee, he will be with thee. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, the spirit of the Lord came upon him. Deuteronomy 31 verse 8, Ezra 1 verse 1, Judges 14 verse 19. 9. The prediction of future events, which could have been foreknown neither by human sagacity, nor by natural causes or signs, as the prophecies which had respect to the deluge, to the posterity of Abraham, the coming of the Messiah, etc., are of necessity known only by being revealed by him who has both men and the nature of things so completely in his power, that without his will nothing can be done. He is truly God who can thus foretell what is to come to pass, show the things that are to come hereafter, that we may know that ye are gods. Isaiah 41 verse 23 10. The end and use of things generally are not by mere chance, nor from a being destitute of reason, but proceed from a cause that is wise and omnipotent, which is God. All things now are wisely adapted and ordained to their own peculiar and certain ends. 11. The order of cause and effect is finite, nor can it come to pass that the chain or cause of efficient causes can be of infinite extent. There must therefore be some first cause which either mediately or immediately produces and moves the rest, and on which all other causes depend. For in every order that is finite there is something that is first and before everything else. Second, who and what is God? God cannot be defined for the reason that he is immense and because we are ignorant of his essence. We may, however, describe him to a certain extent from the revelation which he has been pleased to make of himself, yet in giving a description of God we must be careful to include in it those attributes, representations, and peculiar works which distinguish him from all false deities. God is philosophically described as an eternal mind or intelligence, sufficient in himself to all felicity, the best of beings, and the cause of good in nature. A theological and more complete description of God the one which the church receives is the following. 
God is a spiritual essence, intelligent, eternal, different from all creatures, incomprehensible, most perfect in himself, immutable, of immense power, wisdom, and goodness, just, true, pure, merciful, bountiful, most free, hating sin, which is the Eternal Father, who from eternity begat the Son in his own image, the Son, who is the co-eternal image of the Father, and the Holy Ghost, proceeding from the Father and the Son, as has been divinely revealed by the sure word, delivered by the prophets and apostles, and divine testimonies, that the Eternal Father, with the Son and Holy Ghost, did create heaven and earth and all creatures, is present with all creatures, that he may preserve and rule them by his providence, and produce all good things in them, and that from the human race, made after his own image, he hath chosen and gathers unto himself an everlasting church, by and for the sake of his Son, that by the church this one and true deity may, according to the word revealed from heaven, be here known and praised and glorified in the life to come and that he is the judge of the righteous and the wicked. This theological description of God which the Church gives differs from the philosophical description, one, in perfection, because it contains certain things unknown to men by nature, such as the distinction which exists between the persons of the Godhead, election, and the gathering of the Church through the Son. It also explains more fully those things which are known from nature. Two, in its effect, inasmuch as men cannot, by the mere light of nature, arrive at a true knowledge of God, nor be excited thereby to holiness, or to the love and fear of God. This same description teaches that the true God, whom the Church worships, may be distinguished from false gods in three ways, by his attributes, personal distinctions, and works. God has declared by his works that he is such an one by nature, as his attributes import, he also shows that there are three persons in one divine essence, since according to his works, which are works either of creation or of redemption or sanctification, God has different titles attributed to him, and to each person of the Godhead there is a peculiar name applied. God therefore differs from idols. First by his attributes. Out of the church no attribute of God can be rightly and fully known. Even his mercy is not properly known by those who are out of the church, because the Son is not known or the doctrine concerning him is corrupted. Nor do they know his justice, because the wicked do not believe that God is so greatly offended at sin that any satisfaction was needed, or that redemption could be effected only by the death of his Son. Nor can the wisdom of God be known without the church, because the principal part of it is found in his word which the Gentiles had not. The same thing may be said of the truth of God, because we do not gain a knowledge of his promises from nature, and so of all the divine attributes the church, however, attributes to God in the highest degree righteousness, truth, goodness, mercy, loving-kindness, which attributes of God the various sects are either entirely ignorant of, or, if they have any knowledge of them, they misrepresent them. Secondly, by the personal distinctions of the Godhead. The heathen philosophers and sectarists neither know nor acknowledge that there are three persons in one divine essence. The church, therefore, acknowledges and calls upon the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, one God, consisting in three persons, as he has revealed himself in his word. Thirdly, by his works. Those who are without the church have no proper knowledge of the creation and government of all things, much less have they a correct knowledge of the work of redemption and sanctification through the Son and Holy Spirit. The true God is, in these respects, distinguished from idols. The knowledge of God which his word reveals to the church is also different from that which the heathen have obtained from the light of nature. A short explanation of the description of God as given by the Church. God is an essence, that is, a thing which neither springs from nor depends upon anything else, but exists of and by itself alone, and is the cause of existence to everything else. God is for this reason called Jehovah, as if to say that he exists from himself and causes all other things to exist. Spiritual, that is, incorporeal, invisible, and imperceptible by the senses, also living or existing from himself and quickening all things else. Objection 1. But God has often appeared to men, therefore his nature cannot be spiritual in the sense just explained. Answer. God in these appearances merely assumed a bodily form for the time, without exhibiting his proper substance, which no man hath or can see. Objection 2. But he was seen face to face. Answer. This, however, does not mean that God was perceptible to the natural eye, but that there was a clear perception of him by the mind. Objection 3. But the scriptures very frequently attribute to God the various parts and members of the human body. 
Answer, these representations of God are to be understood figuratively as spoken after the manner of men. Objection 4. But it is said that man was made in the image of God, therefore God cannot be spiritual, as explained above. Answer, the image of God, in which man was created, consisted not in the shape or form of the body, but in the essence of the soul, in its powers and integrity. Intelligent. The human mind, with the notions or general conceptions which it has, which are from God, proves that he is endowed with this attribute. He that planted the ear, shall he not hear? Psalm 94, verse 9. Eternal, that is, having an existence without beginning or end. From everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Psalm 90, verse 2. Different from all creatures and things. God is not nature itself, nor matter, nor form, nor any part of nature, but the efficient cause of all things. Neither is his essence mixed or blended with other things. It is different from and unlike everything else. Objection 1. All things are from God, therefore they cannot be different from him. Answer. All things are indeed from God, but only by having been created by him out of nothing. Objection 2. We are the offspring of God. Answer. But only in respect to a resemblance of properties and by creation. Objection 3. The saints are born of God. Answer. This is, however, by regeneration by the Holy Spirit. Objection 4. We are made partakers of the divine nature according to the Apostle Peter. 2 Peter 1 verse 4. Answer. This means nothing more than that God dwells in us, and that we have a conformity with him. Objection 5. Christ is God, and has a divine body. Answer. But this is by virtue of the hypostatical union and glorification. Incomprehensible. God is incomprehensible, one, as it respects our thoughts or knowledge of him, two, in the immensity of his essence, three, in the communication of his essence, in number one and the same most perfect in himself. 1. Because he alone has all things necessary to perfect felicity, so that nothing can be added unto him to increase his glory or happiness. 2. Because he has all these things in and from himself. 3. Because he is also sufficient for the happiness of all other creatures. Objection 1. But God is said to have made all things for himself. Answer. God created all things not for the purpose of benefiting himself, but for the purpose of communicating himself to his creatures. Objection 2. But God employs his creatures in effecting his designs. Answer. This he does not from any want or necessity in the case, but that he may honour his creatures by making them dispensers of his bounty and co-workers with himself. Objection 3. We are bound to worship God. Answer. This we owe to God and results in our good. Objection 4. To whom that is given which is his due, to him something is added. Answer. This, however, is not true in regard to that which is due according to the order of justice, and which contributes to the happiness of the giver. Objection 5. God delights in our obedience. Answer. This he does, in as far as our obedience is an object, and not in us as far as it is an efficient cause of joy. Immutable. God is immutable, one, in his essence, two, in his will, three, as it respects place, because he is immense. Objection one, but God is said to have repented of those things which he did. Answer, this is spoken figuratively. Objection two, God has often promised and threatened things which he did not perform. Answer, these promises and threatenings were always conditional. Objection three, but God changes his precepts, observances, and works. Answer, he changes them according to his eternal decree. Omnipotent. 1. God can do all things which he wills to do. 2. He does them by his will alone without any difficulty. 3. He does them, having all things in his own power. Objection. But there are many things which God cannot do, as to sin, to lie, to contradict himself, etc. Answer. But these things are indicative of weakness and imperfection. Of immense wisdom. This shows itself, one, in seeing and understanding himself and all things out of himself, with one view or glance, perfectly and at all times. Two, in being the cause of all knowledge in angels and men. Of immense goodness. One, the nature of God is such as has been revealed in the law and the gospel. Two, he is the cause and pattern of all goodness in his creatures. Three, he is the supreme good. Four, he is essentially good. Just. God is just, one, in respect to his general justice, willing and doing unchangeably those things which he has prescribed in his law. 
two in respect to his particular justice according to which he distributes unchangeably suitable rewards and punishments three in that he is the rule and pattern of righteousness in his creatures objection one god sends evil upon the righteous and good upon the wicked answer this however will not always be the case eventually it shall be well with the righteous and ill with the wicked objection two god does not immediately punish the wicked answer he defers punishment in their case for various reasons objection three it ought never to go ill with the good answer not with those who are perfectly good which is not the case with any one in this life objection four god does certain things contrary to the law answer he takes away certain things from his general will by his special which he has a right to do as he is bound by no one objection five god bestows unequal rewards upon men who are placed in similar circumstances answer he does not however give to any one his just desert true one god has a true and certain knowledge of all things two he does not will or speak things contradictory three he does not dissemble or deceive four he never changes his mind five whatever he says he brings to pass six he enjoins truth and veracity upon all objection one but god has foretold things which he did not intend to bring to pass answer these things were spoken conditionally objection two god deceived the prophets answer he in his just judgment delivered them over to the devil that they should be deceived pure one his nature is most pure two he loves and commands that which is pure three he greatly detests and severely punishes all manner of uncleanness whether it be internal or external three he distinguishes himself by this notable mark from devils and wicked spirits this is the will of god even your sanctification that ye abstain from fornication that every one of you possess his vessel in sanctification and honour defile not yourselves in any of these things for in all these the nations are defiled one thessalonians four verses three and four leviticus eighteen verse twenty four merciful god's mercy appears in this one that he wills the salvation of all men two that he defers punishment and invites all to repentance three that he accommodates himself to our infirmity four that he redeems those who are called into his service five that he gave and delivered up to death his only begotten son six that he promises and does all these things most freely out of his mercy seven that he confers benefits upon his enemies and such as are unworthy of his regard objection one but god seems to take pleasure in avenging himself upon the ungodly answer only in as far as it is the execution of his justice objection two he refuses mercy to the ungodly answer only to such as do not repent objection three he does not save all when he has the power answer god acts thus that he may exhibit his justice with his mercy objection four he does not exercise his mercy without a sufficient satisfaction answer yet he has most freely given his son that he might make satisfaction by his death bountiful god is said to be bountiful one because he creates and preserves all things two because he confers benefits upon all even upon the wicked three because of the free and boundless love which he exercises towards his creatures especially to man four because of the love which he cherished towards the church and in giving eternal life and glory to his people objection one but the scriptures speak of god as cherishing anger answer he is angry with sin and depravity but not with his creatures objection two god often inflicts punishment upon his creatures answer only upon such as are impenitent most free god is most free one from all guilt misery obligation servitude and constraint two he wills and does most freely and righteously all things and wills and does them when and in what manner he pleases objection one second causes work necessarily and yet they do not work without god answer the necessity here spoken of is a necessity of consequence depending upon the first cause objection two but god is unchangeably good answer god is unchangeably good by a necessity of immutability and not of constraint objection three but what god has once decreed he wills necessarily answer he wills them immutably but not constrainedly objection four god does not always do what he wills as how often would i and ye would not luke thirteen verse thirty three answer these and similar declarations show what god delights in 
but not what he has fully purposed to do. Hating sin, that is, God is terribly displeased with sin and will punish it temporally and eternally. Third, from what does the unity of God appear? The unity of God is proven in the first place by the express testimony of Scripture. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. See now that I, even I, am He, and there is no God with me. I am the first and the last, and beside me there is no God. We know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. There is one God, and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, chapter 32, verse 39, Isaiah 44, verse 6, 1 Corinthians 8, verse 4, 1 Timothy 2, verse 5, see also Deuteronomy 4, verse 35, Psalm 18, verse 31, Isaiah 37, verse 16, chapter 45, verse 21, Hosea 13, verse 4, Malachi 2, verse 10, Mark 12, verse 32, Romans 3, verse 20, Galatians 3, verse 20, etc. Secondly, the unity of God may be proven by many solid arguments, such as the following. 1. There is only one God, the God whom the Church worships, that has been revealed by such undoubted and sure testimonies as miracles, prophecies, and such other works as can be accomplished only by a being that is all-powerful. And who, as I, shall call and shall declare it, and set it in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people? Among the gods there is none like unto thee, O Lord, neither are there any works like unto thy works. Isaiah 44, verse 7, Psalm 86, verse 8. 2. He who alone reigns over all and governs all things in the same way, and so possesses supreme power and majesty, cannot be more than one. But there is no one beside God who is so supreme and great that no greater can either exist or be conceived of. Therefore he is God alone, and beside him there can be no other God. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another. Now unto the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, etc., Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honour and power, for Thou hast created all things. Isaiah 42, verse 8, 1 Timothy 1, verse 17, Revelation 4, verse 11. 3. He who is perfect in the highest degree can be only one, for he who alone has the whole and every part is absolutely perfect. God now is thus perfect because He is the cause of all that is good in nature. Therefore nothing is more absurd than to suppose anyone to be God, who is not supreme and perfect in the highest degree. O Lord, who is like unto thee? Psalm 89, verse 8. 4. There cannot be more than one being that is omnipotent, for if there were many, they would mutually hinder and oppose each other, and so would not be omnipotent. It is by this argument that the monarchy of the world is ascribed to one God in the prophecy of Daniel, where it is said, No one can stay his hand or resist his will. Daniel 4, verse 35. 5. If we suppose many gods to exist, no one of them would be able singly and alone to rule all the rest, and so all would be imperfect and not gods, or else the rest would be at ease and superfluous. But it is absurd to suppose that God is such an one as has not sufficient power to govern all things, or who is at ease and superfluous. Therefore there is necessarily but one God who alone is sufficient for all things. 6. There cannot be more than one being who is infinite or immense, for if there were more than one, no one would be everywhere, hence there cannot be many gods, but only one God, who alone is infinite. 7. There can be but one first cause of all things. God is that first cause, therefore He is one God, excluding all others. 8. The highest good can be only one, for if there were besides this also another highest good, it would either be greater or less, or equal to the first. But if it were greater, the first would not be the highest, and yet it would be God, which would be reproachful to the deity. If it were less, then this would not be the highest good, and so would not be God. And if it were equal, then neither would be the highest good, nor God. The use or benefit of this question is that, seeing there is but one God, we must not worship or adore any one beside him. Neither must we look anywhere else than to this one God for all good things, and be thankful to him alone for what we have received." objection, but the scriptures declare that there are many gods. I have said, ye are gods. There are gods many, and lords many. Psalm 82, verse 6, 1 Corinthians 8, verse 5. Moses is also said to have been made a god to Pharaoh. Exodus 7, verse 1. Yea, the devil is called the god of this world. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4. 
Answer. The word God is used in a double sense. Sometimes it signifies him who is God by nature and has his being from none, but of and from himself. Such a being is the living and true God. Then again it designates one who bears some resemblance to the true God in dignity, office, etc. Such persons are one, magistrates and judges, who are called gods on account of their dignity and the office which they bear in the name of God, as it is said, by me kings reign, Proverbs 8, verse 15. As God therefore administers his government through magistrates and judges, as his vice-regents and servants upon the earth, he in like manner bestows upon them the honour of his own name by calling them gods, that those under them may know that they have to deal with God himself, whether they obey or resist the magistrate, according as it is said, whosoever resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, Romans 13, verse 2. 2. Angels are also called gods, in view of the dignity and excellency of their nature, power, and wisdom, in which they greatly excel other creatures, and on account of the office which they exercise by divine appointment in defending the godly and punishing the wicked. Thou hast made him a little lower than the gods, that is, the angels. Are they not all ministering spirits? Psalm 8, verse 5, Hebrews 1, verse 14. 3. The devil is called the god of this world on account of the great power which he has over men and other creatures according to the just judgment of God. 4. There are many things which are called gods in the opinion of men who regard and worship certain things and creatures for gods. So idols are called gods by imitation. The gods that have not made the heavens and the earth, even they shall perish from the earth and from under these heavens. Whose god is their belly? Jeremiah 10, verse 11, Philippians 3, verse 19. But here the question is in reference to the true God, to him who is God by nature, having his power from no one else, but from and by himself. Such a being is one only. Fourth. What do the terms essence, person, and trinity signify, and in what do they differ from each other? Essence, from the Greek ousia, signifies, as it is here used, a thing subsisting by itself, not sustained by another, although it may be communicated to more. That is said to be communicable or communicated, which is common, or which may be communicated to many. That is incommunicable, in which nothing else can participate. The essence of man is communicable, and common to many men generically, but not individually. But the essence of God is communicable individually, because the deity or nature of God is the same and entire in all the three persons of the Godhead. Person is that which subsists, is individual, living, intelligent, incommunicable, not sustained in another, nor part of another. Subsisting, by which we mean that it is not an accident, or thought, or a decree, or a vanishing sound, or a created quality or motion. Individual, that is, not man generically, but individually, as this man. Living, something different from that which is inanimate, as a stone, intelligent, not irrational, as the animal, which, although it may have life and feeling, is nevertheless devoid of personality. Incommunicable, it cannot be communicated as the divine essence, which may be in more than one, and be communicated to more than one. Personality, however, is incommunicable. Not sustained by another, because it subsists by itself, for the human nature of Christ is subsisting, individual, incommunicable, intelligent, and yet it is no person, because it is sustained by the word. So the soul of man subsists by itself, is intelligent, and not sustained by another, and yet it is no person, for the reason that it is a part of another subsisting individual. It is therefore added in the definition, nor part of another. We may now readily perceive the difference between the essence of God and the persons subsisting in the divine essence. For, by the term essence, we are to understand, in reference to this subject, that which the Eternal Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are considered and declared to be, singly and absolutely in themselves, and which is common to the three. By the term person, however, we are to understand that which the three persons of the Godhead are considered and declared to be, individually and relatively, or as compared with each other, and which they are, according to the mode of existence, peculiar to each. Or we may define essence as the very being of God, the very eternal and only deity, whilst the term person refers to the mode or manner in which the being of God, or the divine essence, subsists in each of these three. God the Father is that being who is of himself, and not from another. The Son is that self-same being or essence, not of himself, but of the Father. The Holy Ghost is in like manner the self-same being, not of himself, but from the Father and the Son. Thus the being or divine essence of the three persons of the Godhead is one and the same in number. 
but to be of himself or from another, from one or from two, that is, to have this one divine essence of himself, or to have it communicated from another, from one or from two, expresses the mode of existence which is threefold and distinct, to wit, to be of himself, to be begotten or generated, and to proceed, and hence the three persons which are expressed by the term trinity. The sum of this distinction between the terms essence and person, as applied to God, is this. Essence is absolute and communicable. Person is relative and incommunicable. This may be illustrated by the following example. It is one thing to be a man, and another thing to be a father, and yet one and the same is both a man and a father. He is a man absolutely, and according to his nature, and he is a father in respect to another, viz. to his son. So it is one thing to be God, and another to be the Father, or Son, or Holy Ghost, and yet one and the same is both God and the Father, or the Son, or the Holy Ghost, that in respect to himself, this in respect to another. Addenda the essence of a man who begets another is communicated to him who is begotten, but the person is not communicated, for he that begets does not bring forth himself, but another distinct from himself. The son, therefore, is not the father, nor the father the son, although both be real men. So, in like manner, the eternal father hath by eternal generation communicated to the son his essence, but not his person. That is, he begot not the father, but the son. Neither is the father the son, nor the son the father, although each is very God. Yet, although there is this resemblance, there is, at the same time, a great difference in the manner in which the divine essence, being infinite, and the human, being created and finite, are communicated to another, which difference is to be carefully observed. For first, in men, in the Father and the Son, the essence is as distinct as the persons themselves. The Father and the Son are not only two persons, but also two men, distinct in essence. But, in God, the persons are distinct, whilst the essence remains common and the same, and therefore there are not three gods, but the Son is the same God in number, which is the Father and the Son. Secondly, in persons created, he that begets doth not communicate his whole essence to him that is begotten, for then he should cease to be a man, but only a part is made over to him that is begotten, and made the essence of another individual distinct from him who begets. But in uncreated persons, he that begets or inspires communicates his whole essence to him that is begotten, or that proceeds, yet so that he who communicates retains the same and that whole. The reason of both differences is that the essence of man is finite and divisible, whilst that of the deity is infinite and indivisible. Wherefore the eternal Father, Son, and Holy Ghost constitute one true God, and yet the Father is not the Son or the Holy Ghost. Neither is the Holy Ghost the Son, that is, they are one God, not three gods, but three persons subsisting in one Godhead. This distinction of essence and person is therefore to be observed, that the unity of the true God may not be impaired, or the distinction of persons be taken away, or something else be understood by the term person, than the truth which God's word declares. Therefore these cautions are to be diligently observed. 1. That person, in relation to this subject, never signifies a mere relation or office, as the Latins are wont to say, principis personam tueri, to preserve the person of the prince as formerly Sibelius falsely taught, much less does it signify the countenance or visible shape representing the form or gesture of another, in which sense a stage actor may play off the person of another, as Servetus of late years sported and trifled with the word person, but it signifies a thing subsisting truly distinct from others, to whom it has a relation and respect, by an incommunicable property, that is, it signifies that which begets or is begotten, or proceeds, and not the office, dignity, or rank of him that begets or is begotten, or proceeds. 2. That the persons do not constitute something abstracted or separate from the essence which they have in common, nor that the essence is any fourth thing separate from the three persons, but each of them is the entire and self-same essence of the divinity. But the difference consists in this, that the persons are distinct from each other, whilst the essence is common to the three. 3. Concerning the word essence, it is also to be observed that God, or the deity, or the divine nature, has not the same respect to persons as matter has to form, for the reason that God is not compounded of matter and form. We cannot therefore correctly say that the three persons are, or consist of, one essence. Neither is it as the whole in respect to the parts, because God is indivisible. Therefore we cannot correctly say that the person is a part of the essence, or that the essence consists of three persons for every person is the whole divine essence. Neither is it as the general to the particular, because essence is not the genus of the three persons, nor is person a species of essence, 
but God is a more common name because the essence of the deity is common to the three persons, and therefore may be affirmed of each of them. But the names Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not applied in the same general way because the persons are truly distinct, so that we cannot predicate the one of the other. We may therefore correctly say God, or the divine essence, is the Father, is the Son, and is the Holy Spirit. Also, the three persons are one God, or in one God. Likewise, they are one and the same essence, nature, divinity, etc., and again, that they are of one and the same essence, nature, etc., yet it cannot properly be said that they are of one God, because there is no one of these persons that is not himself whole and perfect God. Wherefore, the divine essence is in respect to the persons, as that which is communicated in an extraordinary manner is in respect to those things with which it is common. There is, however, not a similar or exact example of communication in anything created. Trinity, from the Greek therias, signifies these three persons, distinct in three modes of being, or existing in one essence of the deity, but trinity and triplicity, trinal and triple, differ. That is called triple, which is composed of three essences. Trinal is that which is but one in essence, having three modes of being, or subsisting. God is therefore trinal, but not triple, because he is only one in essence, but three in persons, existing most simply. Fifth. Is it proper that the Church should retain the terms essence, person, and trinity? Heretics formerly already opposed the use of these terms because they are not found in the Scriptures. We, however, correctly retain the form of speech used by the Church in her early and purer days by holding fast to these terms, one, because, although they are not found in the Scriptures in the very same syllables, yet words and forms of speech of very close affinity and similarity yea, such as certainly signify the same thing, are found in the Scriptures, as when it is said, for instance, in Exodus 3, verse 14, I am that I am, he said, thus shalt thou say, I am hath sent me unto you. Again, it cannot be denied that the name Jehovah corresponds with the word essence, so the word hypostasis is used for person in the epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 1, verse 3, who being the express image of his person. Neither does the church call the persons the trinity, in any other sense than that in which john says there are three that bear witness in heaven the father the word and the holy ghost one john five verse seven two the object of interpretation requires that the words of scripture should be expounded to those less learned by other words signifying the same thing and taken from common use otherwise all interpretation would be taken away if no words but such as are found in the scriptures were used it is proper, therefore, that the Church should invent and use such forms of speech as express significantly the sense of Scripture and her own understanding of it. 3. Because the frauds and sophisms of heretics, which they generally attempt to cover with the words of Scripture, are the more easily discerned and detected if the same things are expressed in different words, and it is on account of the brevity and perspicuity of these words and phrases that heretics are not able to conceal their impositions and sophisms, if there were a full consent or agreement concerning the thing itself, there would be no difficulty about the use of the words. We abhor a logomachy or contention about words. Neither is the church at controversy with heretics and sectorists merely in regard to words, but it is concerning this doctrine that the Eternal Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are one God, and yet neither is the Father or the Son the Holy Ghost, nor is the Holy Ghost the Father or Son, etc. Were it not that heretics hold this doctrine in abhorrence, they would also easily admit the words, but they object to the use of the words because they do not receive the things expressed and signified thereby. From these things we may easily answer this objection. Words which are not in the Scriptures are not to be used in the Church. These terms, such as essence, etc., are not in the Scriptures, therefore they are not to be used. We reply to the Major thus, those things which are not in the Scriptures, neither as to the words nor as to the sense, are to be rejected but in relation to the terms essence, person, and trinity, as far as the things themselves are concerned, they are in the scriptures, as hath been shown. Again, terms that are not found in the scriptures must not be retained, if we are sure the omission of them will not endanger that which is expressed by them. But heretics seek nothing else than with the terms to reject the doctrine, or at least corrupt it. It is also objected to the use of these terms that they breed contentions, to this we reply that it does this only by accident and with contentious heretics. Sixth, how many persons are there in the Godhead? 
there are three persons that subsist in the one essence of god really distinct by their peculiar properties the father the son and the holy ghost these three are consubstantial and co-eternal all and each being the one true and eternal god this is proven one by many express declarations from the scriptures of the old and new testaments the spirit of god moved upon the face of the waters god said let there be light by the word of the lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth genesis one verses three and four psalm thirty three verse six the new testament scriptures furnish the clearest and most satisfactory testimony go teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the father son and holy ghost the comforter which is the holy ghost whom the father will send in my name that is through and on account of me he shall teach you all things when the comforter is come whom i will send unto you from the father even the spirit of truth which proceedeth from the father he shall testify of me there are three that bear record in heaven the father the word and the holy ghost and these three are one according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the holy ghost which he shed on us abundantly through jesus christ through him christ we both have access by one spirit to the father the grace of the lord jesus christ and the love of god and the communion of the holy ghost be with you all god hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts etc matthew twenty eight verse nineteen john fourteen verse twenty six chapter fifteen verse twenty six one john five verse seven titus three verses five and six ephesians two verse eighteen two corinthians thirteen verse fourteen galatians four verse six two those passages of scripture prove the same thing which attribute to these three the father son and holy ghost the name of jehovah and of the true god also those places in which certain things are spoken of jehovah in the old testament which in the new are expressly and without limitation referred to the son and holy ghost three those passages prove the same thing which attribute the same and whole divine essence to the three persons of the godhead and teach that the son is the proper and only begotten son of the father and that the holy spirit is in such a manner the proper spirit of the father and the son that he proceedeth from both for this doctrine is still further confirmed by those declarations of scripture which ascribe to these three persons of the godhead the same attributes and perfections such as eternity immensity omnipotence etc five the same is true in regard to those passages which attribute to the three persons of the godhead the same works which are peculiar to the deity viz creation preservation and government of the world also miracles and the deliverance and preservation of the church six the same may be said to be true of those passages which attribute to the three equal honour prayer and worship such as belongs to the true god alone from this agreement of the old and new testaments we know and prove that one god is three persons truly distinct and that these three persons are one god hence it is also correct to say that the father is other from the son and holy spirit and the holy spirit is other from the father and the son but it is not correct to say that the father is something else or another thing from the son and that the son is another thing and that the holy spirit is another for to be other signifies merely a distinction of persons whilst to be another thing signifies a diversity of essence we must now prove in reference to the three persons of the godhead that they are truly subsistence against samosatanus and servetus that they are distinct subsistence or persons against sabellius that they are equal against arius eunomius and macedonius and lastly that they are consubstantial or of the same essence against the same heretics concerning the person of the father there is no controversy and as to the objections which have been raised against the personality of the son and holy spirit we shall hereafter notice them in their proper place seventh how are the three persons of the godhead distinguished we must here consider first what the scriptures attribute as common to the three persons of the godhead the father the son and the holy ghost which three are one god and yet distinct in persons secondly what is ascribed to each singly as peculiar to him and how the persons are distinguished from each other the things that are common to the three persons of the godhead are one all the essential properties of god which we comprehend in the single name of deity as eternity immensity omnipotence wisdom goodness to have essence from himself or to be god of himself two all the external actions and works of the divinity which are commonly called ad extra that is such as god exercises towards his creatures and in them or through them as creation preservation the government of the world the gathering and preserving of the church etc these persons are distinguished in two ways 
one by their works ad intra, two by their works or mode of operating ad extra. The first are called the inward works or operations of the divinity because the persons have and exercise them one towards the other. By these internal works or properties, therefore, the persons are first distinguished from each other. For the Father is and exists of himself, not from another. The Son is begotten eternally from the Father, that is, he hath his divine essence communicated to him from the Father in a way not to be explained. The Holy Spirit proceeds eternally from the Father and the Son, that is, has the same divine essence communicated to him from the Father and the Son in an inexplicable manner. The proofs of this are the following. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. When the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, etc. John 1, verse 1, chapter 14, verse 18, chapter 15, verse 26. This is, therefore, the order according to which the persons of the Godhead exist. The Father is the first person, and as it were the fountain of the divinity of the Son and Holy Spirit, because the deity is communicated to him of no one, but he communicates the deity to the Son and Holy Spirit. The Son is the second person, because the deity is communicated to him of the Father by eternal generation. The Holy Ghost is the third person, because the deity is communicated to him from the Father and the Son, by an eternal inspiration or procession. This is the order in which the persons of the Godhead are spoken of in the following passages of Scripture. Go baptize all nations in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Matthew 28, verse 19, 1 John 5, verse 7. And yet the Father is not prior in time to the Son and Holy Ghost, nor is the Son before the Holy Ghost, but only in the order of existing. For no person of the Godhead is before or after the others in time, or dignity, or degree, but only according to the order in which they exist. The Father was never without the Son, nor the Son without the Holy Spirit, since the Deity is unchangeable. It is in this way that God has from everlasting existed in Himself, and hath so revealed Himself in His Word. Heretics are accustomed to ask in relation to this subject what the eternal generation of the Son is, and what is the procession of the Holy Spirit, and what the difference between them. And although we confess that the mode of eternal generation and procession, together with the formal and natural distinction between them, is inexplicable by man, which all the orthodox fathers of former times have confessed, yet the scriptures certainly teach the thing itself, viz., that generation is a communication of the divine essence, whereby only the second person of the deity derives and takes from the first person alone, as a son from a father, the same essence, whole and entire, which the father has and retains, and that procession is a communication of the divine essence by which the third person of the Godhead receives from the Father and the Son as the Spirit from him whose Spirit it is, the same entire essence which the Father and the Son have and retain. Both of these differ from creation, which implies the production of something out of nothing by the command and will of God, but to be conceived or begotten, and to proceed or emanate, is to produce from eternity some other or another person, from the substance of him who begets, or of him from whom the procession is, in a way that is altogether beyond our comprehension. Yet so that the Son has his subsistence by being begotten, and the Holy Spirit by proceeding. Thus, therefore, we perceive the thing itself, or that thus it is, as far as God has seen fit to reveal this great mystery unto us, although we cannot arrive at the knowledge why it is so. Concerning the question so warmly controverted by the Greek and Latin churches, whether the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father and the Son, or from the Father only, we shall speak hereafter, when we come to treat of the doctrine concerning the Holy Ghost. We must also here notice the phrases or forms of speech used in Scripture, and by the ancient church in reference to the distinction which exists between the persons of the Godhead themselves. Thus it is correct to say, God begat God, but it is not correct to say, God begat another God, or begat himself. It is correct to say the Father begat another, but not that he begat another thing or another God. It is orthodox to say the Son is what the Father is, but not that the Son is the same person as the Father is. It is true to say that the Son is begotten, and the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father. Also, the Son is of or from the Father, and the Holy Spirit is of or from the Father and the Son. Also, Whatsoever the Son has, he has from the Father, and received it by being begotten, and whatsoever the Holy Spirit has, he has from the Father and the Son, and received it by proceeding. 
Also, the Son and the Holy Spirit have a beginning in respect to their person, and have their essence communicated from another, but it is not true to say that they have a beginning in respect to their essence, or they are essenced, or have their essence produced from the Father or from some other person. It is orthodox to say the first person of the Godhead begat the second of his own essence, and the third person proceeded from the first and second, but not the divine essence begot a divine essence, or the person is begotten or proceeded from the essence. It is proper to say the divine essence is communicated, but not to say the divine essence is begotten or proceeds, because to be communicated and to be begotten are not the same thing, for not whatsoever is communicated to the begotten is begotten, but that is begotten to which the substance of him that begets is communicated. There is another distinction between the persons of the Godhead arising out of the former, which consists in the order in which the persons of the Godhead operate ad extra, which embraces those actions which they exercise out of themselves towards their creatures, and in them and by them. These works are indeed wrought by the common will and power of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. But yet the same order is preserved among the persons of the Godhead in working, which there is as it respects their existence. The Father is the fountain, as of the person, so also of the working, of the Son and Holy Ghost, and does all things not by another, that is, not by another working through him, not by the will of another preventing his, or communicating to him power or efficacy, but as existing of himself, so also knowing, working, etc., of himself. But the Son and Holy Ghost do not work of themselves, but by themselves, that is, the Son works the Father's will going before. The Holy Ghost works the will of the Father and of the Son going before. The Father works by the Son and Holy Ghost, and sends them, but he himself is not sent by them. The Son works through the Holy Spirit, sends him from the Father into the hearts of those that believe, but is not himself sent by the Holy Spirit, but of the Father. The Holy Spirit works and is sent from both the Father and the Son, not from himself. All things were made by him. The Son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. I proceeded forth and came from God, neither I came of myself. Whom the Father will send in my name, whom I will send unto you from the Father. John 1 verse 3, chapter 5 verse 19, chapter 8 verse 42, chapter 14 verse 26, chapter 15 verse 26. But when the Son and Holy Ghost are said to be sent, we must not understand it in the sense of a local motion, or as though it indicated a change in God himself, but it must be understood of his eternal will and decree to accomplish something by the Son and Holy Ghost, and of the execution and manifestation of his will through the working of the Son and Holy Ghost. So the Son says that he was sent into the world by the Father, that he came down from heaven, and yet that he was in heaven when he was upon the earth. So the Holy Spirit, although he existed before and dwelt in the apostles, yet it is said that he was sent upon them on the day of Pentecost, each of these persons was, therefore, sent into the world, not because they began to exist where they did not exist before, but because they accomplished in the world what was the will of the Father, and showed themselves present and efficacious according to the will of the Father. Thus it is said, God sent forth his Son made of a woman. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of his sons into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Galatians 4, verse 4 and 6. 8. Why it is necessary that the Church should hold fast to the doctrine of the Trinity. This doctrine of the Trinity should be taught and maintained in the Church, one, on account of the glory of God, that he may thus be distinguished from idols, with whom he will not be confounded, and that he may be known and worshipped as such an one as he has revealed himself to be. 2. On account of our comfort and salvation, for no one is saved without a knowledge of God the Father. But the Father is not known without the Son, no man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten Son which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. John 1 verse 18, 1 John 2 verse 23. Again, no man is saved without faith in the Son of God, our Mediator. This is the true God and eternal life. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed, and how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? 1 John 5, verse 20, Romans 10, verse 14. Likewise, no man is sanctified and saved without a knowledge of the Holy Spirit, for he who does not receive the Holy Spirit is not saved according to the declaration of Scripture, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. 
Romans 8 verse 9. But no one receives the Holy Ghost who is ignorant of him, according as it is said, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. John 14 verse 17. Wherefore, he who does not know the Holy Spirit cannot be saved. It is necessary, then, that all who will be saved should have a knowledge of the one God, the Eternal Father, the Co-Eternal Son, and the Co-Eternal Holy Ghost, for unless he is known as such an one as he has revealed himself, he does not communicate himself unto us, neither can we expect eternal life from him. Objections of Heretics Against the Doctrine of the Trinity 1. One essence is not three persons, because that one should be three implies a contradiction. Jehovah is one essence, therefore there are not three persons. Answer. The major is true of a created or finite essence, which cannot be the one, same, and whole substance of three persons. But it is not true in regard to the essence of the deity, which is infinite, individual, and most simple. Reply. A most simple essence cannot be the essence of three persons. God is a most simple essence, as is admitted in the above answer. Therefore it cannot be three persons. Answer. The major is true of an essence, a certain part of which constitutes another person, or which may be multiplied into a number of persons, but it is false when understood of such an essence as that which is the same and entire in each single person. The simplicity of such an essence is not in the least impaired by the number and distinction of the persons. 2. Where there are three and one, there are four distinct things. In God there are three persons and one essence, therefore there are four distinct things in God, which is absurd. Answer. Where there are three and one, really distinct, there are four. But in God the persons are not really distinct from the essence, for the three persons of the Godhead are one and the same divine essence. They differ from it and from each other only in the mode of subsisting. 3. To attach three names to one substance is Sabellianism. The doctrine of the Trinity attributes three names to one substance, therefore it is the heresy of Sibelius. Answer. There are four terms in this syllogism, for the term substance in the major either signifies a person, and in the minor an essence, or else one of the propositions is false. 4. He who is the whole deity, beside him there is no person in whom the whole deity is, in a like manner. The Father is the whole deity, therefore the whole deity is not in another person. Answer. We deny the major proposition because the same deity, which is entire in the Father, is also entire in the Son and Holy Spirit, on account of the immensity of the divine essence, of which there is neither more nor less in each person than in two or the three. 5. Those persons to whom distinct operations are ascribed must have distinct essences. There are distinct internal operations ascribed to the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, therefore their essences are distinct. Answer. The major is true of persons having a finite essence, but false when understood of divine persons. 6. The divine essence is incarnate. The three persons are the divine essence, therefore the three persons are incarnate, which is not true. Answer. The major speaks nothing of the divine nature generally, because the divine essence is incarnate in the person of the Son alone. We have therefore mere particulars from which nothing can be concluded. 7. Jehovah, or the true God, is the Trinity. The Father is Jehovah, therefore he is the Trinity, that is, all the three persons. Answer. Here again, the Major declares nothing generally, for not whatever is Jehovah is the Trinity, therefore nothing can be inferred from what is here said. 8. No abstract term signifies substance. Trinity is an abstract term, therefore it signifies no substance. Answer. The Major is false, for deity and humanity are also abstract terms, and yet they signify substance. Section 18 of God the Father, Ninth Lord's Day of God the Father. Question 26. What believest thou when thou sayest, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth? Answer. That the Eternal Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who of nothing made heaven and earth, with all that is in them, who likewise upholds and governs the same by his eternal counsel and providence, is, for the sake of Christ his Son, my God and my Father, on whom I rely so entirely that I have no doubt but that he will provide me with all things necessary for soul and body, and further that he will make whatever evils he sends upon me, in this valley of tears, turn out to my advantage, for he is able to do it, being Almighty God, and willing, being a faithful Father. EXPOSITION I believe in God. 
To believe God and to believe in God are two very different things. The first expresses historical faith, the latter true faith or confidence, for when I say I believe that God is, if I speak properly, I believe there is a God, and that he is such an one as he hath revealed himself in his word, viz. a spiritual essence, omnipotent, etc., the eternal Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. When I say I believe in God, I mean I believe that he is my God, that is, whatever he is and has is all for my salvation. Or to believe God, properly speaking, is to believe a certain person to be God according to all his attributes. To believe in God is to be persuaded that he will make all things attributed to him subservient to my salvation for the sake of his Son. In God. The name of God is here taken essentially for God the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, because the phrase I believe, with the particle in, is referred in the same manner to all the three persons of the Godhead, for the reason that we do not believe in the Son and Holy Ghost less than we do in the Father. Father When the name of Father is opposed to the Son, it is taken personally and signifies the first person of the Godhead, as here in the Creed. But when it is opposed to creatures, it must be understood essentially, and signifies the whole divine essence, as in the Lord's Prayer, Our Father who art in heaven. In this sense, the Son is expressly called by Isaiah, the everlasting Father, Isaiah 9, verse 6. The first person is called the Father, 1, in respect to Christ, his only begotten Son, 2, in respect to all creatures, as he is the creator and preserver of them all, 3, in respect to the elect, whom he hath adopted as his children, and whom he hath made accepted in his beloved Son. To believe in God the Father, therefore, is to believe in that God, who is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to believe that he is also my Father, and as such has a fatherly affection toward me, for and on account of Christ, in whom he has adopted me as his Son. In a word, it is to believe, one, that he is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, two, that he is a Father to me for Christ's sake, Objection 1. I believe in God the Father, therefore the Son and Holy Ghost are not God, but the Father alone. Answer. This is a fallacy of composition and division, for the word God is joined with the Father in such a manner as not to be separated from the Son and Holy Ghost. A comma should be placed after the words in God, in this manner, I believe in God, comma, the Father. This is proven, 1. Because the name God, as it is here used in the Creed, signifies essentially and embraces the three persons which are, as if by apposition, placed in order in the creed, I believe in God, comma, the Father, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, I believe in the Holy Ghost. For I believe in the one true God, who is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, yet so that the Father is not the Son, nor the Holy Ghost, the Son, or the Father. 2. We expressly profess that we believe in the Son and Holy Ghost, not less than in God the Father. And yet we do not believe in any one else except in the one only true God. 3. Many of the Greek copies read, I believe in one God, to it Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. As we are therefore to believe in the Father because he is God, so we are also to believe in the Son and Holy Ghost because they are God. The name of God is placed but once in the creed, because God is only one, but never as if the Father alone were called God. Almighty to believe in God Almighty is to believe in such a God, one who is able to accomplish what he wills, yea, even those things which he does not will, if they are not contrary to his nature, as he might have delivered Christ from death, but he would not. 2. Who can accomplish all things by his simple command and without any difficulty. 3. Who alone has power to do all things and is the dispenser of that power which is in all his creatures. 4 who is also almighty for my benefit, and can and will direct and make all things subservient to my salvation. Objection. God cannot lie, die, or undo that which is once done, therefore he cannot do all things. Answer. He can do all things which are indicative of power, but to lie, to die, etc., is no sign of power, but of infirmity or want of power. But defects are in creatures, not in God. Therefore they are contrary to the nature of God. Hence, by inverting the order of reasoning, we thus conclude, God is not able to do or will those things which are indicative of weakness and contrary to his nature. Therefore he is almighty. Maker of heaven and earth. 
to believe in the creator is to believe one that he is the creator of all things two that he sustains and governs by his providence all things which he has created three that he has also created me and made me a vessel of his mercy that i should obtain salvation in christ and that he by his special providence and grace will lead me to that salvation which he confers upon his people four that he has created all other things for us that they may contribute to the salvation of the church to the praise of his glory in short i believe in the creator is to believe that god created me that i might contribute to his glory and that he created all other things that they might be subservient to my salvation all things are yours and ye are christ's and christ is god's as if he should say all things are created for us and we for god one corinthians three verses twenty two and twenty three section nineteen of the creation of the world the doctrine which treats of the works of god is properly placed next in order after the doctrine concerning god which is also the arrangement in the creed there are five general works of god one the work of creation of which we have an account in the book of genesis where we are informed that it was accomplished in six days two the work of preservation by which god sustains heaven and earth and all things which he has created so that they do not fall into ruin three the work of government whereby through his great wisdom he directs and governs all things in the world four the work of restitution by which he repairs in christ all things which are subject to corruption by reason of the sin of man five the work of perfection or completing in which he brings all things to their appointed end but especially does he perfectly deliver and glorify his church we shall now speak of the work of creation or of the creation of the world in reference to which we must inquire first did god create the world second how did he create it third wherefore or for what end did he create it first did god create the world we must first define and understand what is meant by the terms here used to create is to produce something out of nothing the term world is used in the scriptures in four different significations it means one the structure or frame of the whole universe comprising heaven earth and all things which are in them the world was made by him john one verse ten two worldly concupiscence three the ungodly or unregenerate who are in the world john seventeen verse nine four those who are chosen out of the world that the world may believe that thou hast sent me god so loved the world john seventeen verse twenty one chapter three verse sixteen that god created the world we know first from the testimony of the holy scripture as for instance from the history of the creation as written by moses also from other passages of scripture and especially the following by the word of the lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth he spake and it was done he commanded and it stood fast psalm thirty three verses six and nine there are other places also in the psalms and elsewhere where the wonderful works of god are more largely spoken of and where the principal parts of the world which god created are dwelt upon in order that we may by a proper consideration of them be led to trust in god psalm one hundred and four one hundred and thirteen one hundred and twenty four one hundred and thirty six one hundred and forty six god himself showed unto job his marvellous and inconceivable works as they appear in the heavens and earth in connection with other things which he had created that he might declare his justice power and providence job thirty eight and thirty nine secondly beside the testimony of the scriptures there are many other arguments which prove in the most satisfactory manner that the world was created by god among which we may mention the following one the origin of nations as given by moses shows this which account could not have been invented by him when there were some remembrances of it still in the minds of many which however in the course of time became lost two the novelty of all other histories as compared with the antiquity of sacred history three the age of man decreasing shows that there was at first a greater strength in nature and that it has decreased hitherto not without some first cause four the certain course of time from the beginning of the world down to the coming of the messiah five the constitution and preservation of commonwealths six the order of things in nature which must of necessity have been produced by some intelligent mind superior to all things seven the excellency of the mind of man and of angels these intelligent beings have a beginning they must therefore have sprung from some intelligent cause eight the natural principles and notions which are engraven upon our hearts nine the chidings or reproofs of conscience in the ungodly ten the ends of all things wisely ordered 
11. Finally, all the other arguments which prove that there is a God prove also that the world was created by him. Thirdly, there are also philosophical arguments which go to prove that the world was created and that by God, although they cannot prove when it was created. 1. There is in nature no infinite progress of causes and effects. Otherwise, nature would never attain its end. Therefore, the world had a beginning. 2. The world is the first and most excellent of all effects. Therefore, it is from the first and most excellent cause, which is God. But there are other questions, as whether the world was created by God from all eternity or in time, that is, whether it be an effect of equal perpetuity with his own cause, or had it, at some time, a beginning, prior to which it had no existence. Also, if there was a time when the world did not exist, was it necessary that God should create it? Also, whether it shall endure for ever, and if so, will it remain the same, or will it be changed? These and similar questions cannot be decided by philosophy, and the reason is because all these things depend upon the will of the first mover, which is God, who does not act from necessity but most freely. But the will of God is not known to any creature unless God himself reveal it. Hence it is that we find it in the church alone, whilst heathen philosophers are ignorant of it, for they cannot arrive at any knowledge of these things by reasoning a posteriori, that is, from a continued effect to its cause. It is true, indeed, that there is a certain cause of these effects, but it does not follow that these effects were produced by this cause either at this or that time, or from all eternity, because a free agent may either act or suspend his action at pleasure. The sum of the proof of this, no effect, that is, depending upon such a cause as acts freely or contingently, can be demonstrated by that cause. The creation of the world is such an effect. Therefore it cannot be proven by the will of the first mover, which is God, that it was either created from all eternity, or that it had its beginnings in time. Whatever arguments philosophers may, therefore, bring against the creation of the world, it is easy to see that they are not drawn from true philosophy, but from the imaginations of men, if the order of the generation and change of things which God established in nature be distinguished from the creation. Objection 1. It is absurd philosophers tell us, to suppose that God is idle. Answer. It is indeed absurd to say that he who governs the world is idle, and if it be further objected to this, that he could not govern the world when as yet it did not exist, and that he must therefore have been idle before the creation of all things, we reply by denying the consequence. Because if God did not from everlasting govern the world, yet he was not idle, for he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, and constructed hell for wicked and curious men, who presumptuously endeavour to pry into the secret counsels of the Most High, as Augustine wittily answered a certain African, demanding of him what God did before he created the world. Quote, he made hell, said he, for curious and inquisitive men. End quote. Objection 2. Everything which has a beginning has an end. The world has no end, therefore it had no beginning. Answer, the major is to be distinguished. Everything that has a beginning through natural generation has an end, for corruption does not follow creation, but the generation of one thing out of another by the order of nature. But the power of God is certainly sufficient that he can either preserve in the same state, or change, or reduce to nothing, as well those things which he formed out of others, as those which he produced out of nothing. Second, how did God create the world? 1. God the Father created the world through the Son and Holy Ghost. Of the Son, it is said, all things were made by him. John 1 verse 3. Of the Holy Ghost, it is said, the Spirit of the Lord moved upon the face of the waters. The Spirit of God hath made me. Genesis 1 verse 2, Job 33 verse 4. 2. God created the world most freely without any constraint. There was no necessity in the case, but such as resulted from the decree of his own will, which, although it was eternal and immutable, was nevertheless most free. For he spake, and it was done. But our God is in the heavens, he hath done whatsoever he pleased. Psalm 33 verse 9, Psalm 115 verse 3. 3. God made the world by his simple command, word and will, without any labor, fatigue, or change of himself, which is the highest form of working. There are five kinds of operations or agents. 1. There are natural agents which operate according to the force of their own nature, without any intelligence or will such as the operation of fire, water, medicinal herbs, precious stones, etc., the action and operation of which is marked out by nature. 2. We have other operations or agencies which, although they are greatly controlled by nature, are nevertheless not without some desire or will of their own, 
even though the government of reason be wanting yet the action of these agents is of such a nature that it is oftentimes forced from them against their will which may be said to be true of animals three are the agencies of men who act according to their corrupt desires and inclinations four are the agencies of good spirits whom we call angels who act according to reason and willingly as men do but who are free from corruption five the highest and most complete kind of operation is that which results from an understanding and will most pure and holy which is subject to the wisdom and counsel of no one who is superior which is therefore of all others the most free wise and good and which is truly infinite such that all other things depend upon it alone such is the operation or agency of god alone he spake and it was done he commanded and it stood fast god who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were psalm thirty three verses six and nine romans four verse seventeen four god created all things out of nothing it was not therefore from any essence of deity nor from any pre-existing matter co-equal with himself from which god created the heavens and the earth for if all things were created by god nothing is accepted but the creator himself so that all other things were created not even excluding the matter out of which they were formed objection out of nothing is nothing answer according to the order of nature as it is now constituted it is true that one thing is generated or produced from another it is also true that nothing can be produced out of nothing by men but what is impossible to man is possible with god hence this proposition out of nothing is nothing is not true when applied to god nor is it true of the first creation or of the extraordinary working of god but only of the order of nature as it is now established that god created all things out of nothing should contribute to our comfort for if he has created all things out of nothing he is also able to preserve us and to restrain yea to bring to naught the counsels and devices of the wicked five god created all things most wisely and very good that is he made everything perfect according to its kind and degree all things were very good genesis one verse thirty one everything was created free from deformity and sin and from evil under every form objection but death is evil answer god did not create death but inflicted it as a just punishment upon the creature on account of sin reply but it is said god creates evil shall there be evil in a city and the lord hath not done it isaiah forty five verse seven amos three verse six answer these things are spoken of the evil of punishment and not of guilt god is the author of punishment because he is the judge of the world but he is not the author of sin he merely permits it six god created the world not suddenly nor in a moment of time but in six days on the seventh day god ended all his works genesis two verse two but why did not god create all things in a moment of time when he had the power to do so one because he designed that the creation of matter should be a thing distinct and manifest from the formation of the bodies of the world which were made out of it two because he would show his power and freedom in producing whatever he willed and that without any natural causes hence he gave light to the world made the earth fruitful and caused plants to grow out of it before the sun or moon were created three he wished to give an exhibition of his goodness and providence in providing for his creatures and having a regard for them before they were born to do this he brings animals upon the earth already clothed with plants and pasture and introduces man into the world which he had most richly furnished with everything necessary to meet his wants and to administer to his comfort for god created all things successively that we might not sit in idleness but might have an opportunity of considering his works and thus discerning his wisdom goodness and power seven lastly god created the world not eternally but at a certain and definite time and therefore in the beginning of time in the beginning god created the heavens and earth genesis one verse one according to the common reckoning it is now counting from this sixteen sixteen of christ five thousand five hundred and thirty four years since the creation of the world for from the creation of the world to the birth of christ according to melanchthon's calculation there are three thousand nine hundred and sixty three years according to luther's calculation there are three thousand nine hundred and sixty years according to the calculation of geneva there are three thousand nine hundred and forty three years according to the calculation of Beroaldus, there are three thousand nine hundred and twenty nine years the world has therefore existed according to melanchthon five thousand five hundred and seventy nine years according to luther five thousand five hundred and seventy six years 
according to those of Geneva, 5,559 years, according to Beroaldus, 5,545 years. These calculations harmonize sufficiently with each other in the larger numbers, although some years are either added or wanting in the smaller numbers. According to these four calculations made by the most learned men of our times, it will appear, by comparing them together, that the world was created by God, at least not much over 5,559 or 5,579 years. The world, therefore, was not created from everlasting, but had a beginning. Third, for what end did God create the world? The ends for which God created the world are some general and others special and subordinate. 1. The chief and ultimate end for which all things were created, especially angels and men, is the glory and praise of God. The Lord hath made all things for himself, bless the Lord all his works, for of him and through him and to him are all things. Proverbs 16 verse 4, Psalm 103 verse 22, Romans 11 verse 36. 2. The manifestation, knowledge, and contemplation of the divine wisdom, power, and goodness displayed in the creation of things. For if God would be praised, it was necessary that he should create rational intelligences capable of knowing him, and that, knowing him, they might praise and honor him. It was also necessary that he should create things destitute of reason, that they might furnish matter for praise. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiworks. Psalm 19, verse 1. 3. The government of the world. God created the world that he might by his providence always govern, rule, and preserve it, and so continually show forth his wonderful works, which he hath performed from the beginning of the world, and which he now performs or will hereafter perform, but especially that he might govern the church, composed of angels and men. This end is subservient to the second. Lift up your eyes on high, and behold who hath created these things. Isaiah 40, verse 26. 4 that he might gather to himself from the human race an everlasting church, which might know and praise him as the Creator. 5. That all things might contribute to the happiness, comfort, and salvation of men, and especially the elect, and that they may be to them, each in its own particular sphere, as ministers and instruments through which God may be praised by them, whilst bestowing his blessings upon them. Subdue the earth, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowls of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hand, thou hast put all things under his feet. Whether the world, or life, or death, or things present, or things to come, all are yours. Genesis 1 verse 28, Psalm 8 verse 6, 1 Corinthians 3 verse 22. God therefore created man for himself, and all other things for man, that they might serve him, and through him might serve God. Hence, when we make creatures occupy the place which belongs to God, we thrust ourselves out of the place which God has assigned unto us. The use of the doctrine of the creation of the world is, one, that all the glory thereof may be attributed to God, and that his wisdom, power, and goodness may be known and acknowledged from the works of creation. 2. That we may withdraw our confidence from all created things, and place our trust in God alone, the author and giver of salvation. Section 20. The Providence of God. Tenth Lord's Day. Question 27. What dost thou mean by the providence of God? Answer. The almighty and everywhere present power of God, whereby, as it were by his hand, he upholds and governs heaven, earth, and all creatures, so that herbs and grass, rain and drought, fruitful and barren years, meat and drink, health and sickness, riches and poverty, yea, all things, come not by chance, but by his fatherly hand. Exposition Intimately connected with the doctrine of the creation of the world is the subject of the providence of God, which is nothing else than a continuation of the creation, because the government of the world is the preservation of the things created by God, we are not to imagine, therefore, that the creation of the world is like the building of a ship, which the architect, as soon as it is completed, commits to the government of some pilot. But we must hold this as a most certain truth, that, as nothing could ever have existed except by the creating power of God, so it is impossible that anything should exist, even for a moment, without his government and preservation. It is for this reason that the scriptures often join the preservation and continual administration of all things with their creation. Hence, we cannot have a full and correct knowledge of the creation unless we at the same time embrace the doctrine of divine providence, concerning which we must inquire particularly. 
First, is there any providence of God? Second, what is it? Third, what does it profit us? The first and second of these propositions are considered under this question. The third will be considered when we come to treat the twenty-eighth question of the Catechism. First, is there any providence of God? There are three opinions entertained by philosophers respecting the providence of God. One, the Epicureans deny that there is any providence respecting the affairs of mortals, or those things which are and are done in the lower parts of the world. Two, the Stoics have devised and substituted for divine providence an absolute necessity of all things, and changes existing in the very nature of things, to which everything is subject, including even God himself. This necessity they call fate or destiny. Three, the peripatetics suppose that God does indeed behold and know all things, but does not direct and govern them, but only excites or keeps up the celestial motions, and through them sends down, by way of influence, some power or virtue into the lower parts of nature, whilst the operations and motions so excited are depending entirely upon matter and the will of man. In opposition to these errors the Church teaches, according to the word of God, that nothing exists or comes to pass in the whole world, unless by the certain and definite, but nevertheless most free and good counsel of God. There are two kinds of proofs by which we may establish the doctrine of the providence of God. These are testimonies from Scripture and the force of arguments. The testimony which the Scriptures furnish in support of this doctrine is contained in such passages as the following. He giveth to all life and breath and all things. In him we live and move and have our being are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall to the ground without your father. But the very hairs of your head are numbered. God worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Acts 17, verses 25 and 28, Matthew 10, verses 29 and 30, Ephesians 1, verse 11. There are also many similar testimonies of Scripture which prove the general and particular providence of God, for there is scarcely any doctrine more frequently and diligently inculcated than that of divine providence. As a single instance, God reasons in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 27, verses 5 and 6, from the general to the particular, that is, from the thing itself to the example. I have made the earth, the man and the beasts that are upon the ground, and have given it unto whom it seemeth meet unto me. And he immediately adds the particular, Now have I given all these lands into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. The arguments which establish a divine providence are of two kinds, some are a posteriori, which include such as are drawn from the effects or works of God. Others are a priori, that is, such as are drawn from the nature and attributes of God. Both may be clearly demonstrated and are common to philosophy and theology, unless that the attributes and works of God are better and more fully understood by the Church than by philosophy. The arguments, however, which are drawn from the divine works are more obvious, for it is through the arguments a posteriori that we arrive at and obtain a knowledge of those which are a priori. Arguments in proof of the providence of God drawn from his works. 1. Order cannot proceed from a brutish or irrational cause. For where there is order, there must also be someone that orders and directs. In the nature of things there is order, there is a most judicious arrangement of every part of nature, and a succession of changes and seasons contributing to the preservation and continuation of the whole. Therefore this order exists, and is preserved by some intelligent mind, and seeing that it is most wisely constituted, there is a necessity that he who has thus arranged all things, and who governs them by his providence, must be most wise. He telleth the number of the stars, he calleth them all by name. Psalm 147 verse 4 2. Man, who is, as it were, a little world, is ruled by a mind and understanding. Much more, therefore, is the world governed by divine providence. He who planted the ear, shall he not hear? Psalm 94, verse 9. 3. The natural law, the knowledge of general principles natural to men, the difference between things honest and base, engraven upon our hearts, teach that there is a providence, for he who has engraven upon the heart of man a rule or law for the regulation of the life has a regard to the actions of men. God now has engraven such a rule upon the heart of man and desires us to live in conformity thereunto. Therefore he must also govern the lives, actions, and events of his creatures. The Gentiles show the work of the law written in their hearts, etc. Romans 2 verse 15. Plautus says, There is verily a God who sees and hears what we do, and Homer says, God hath an upright eye. 4. 
the reproofs of conscience which follow the commission of sin on the part of the wicked prove that there must be a god who knows the secrets of men punishes their sins avenges himself upon their wickedness and who causes such inward fears and forebodings to arise in the mind their conscience at the same time bearing witness and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another for the wrath of god is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men Romans 2, verse 15, chapter 1, verse 18. 5. The rewards and punishments which follow the actions of men testify that there must be some executioner of the laws of nature. There are more pleasant and favorable events accompanying the lives of those who live in moderation, even though they be without the church, than is the case with those who live in profligacy and sensual indulgence, for atrocious crimes are generally followed with severe punishment. Therefore, there must be some judge who notices the actions of men, and rewards them accordingly. The righteous shall rejoice when he seeth the vengeance, he shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked, so that a man shall say, Verily, there is a reward for the righteous, verily, he is a God that judgeth in the earth. He that chasteneth the heathen shall he not correct. Psalm 58, verses 11 and 12, Psalm 94, verse 10. 6. A great part of the providence of God consists in the establishment, preservation, and transfer of kingdoms and empires. These things, however, could not take place if there were no God. By me kings reign, and princes decree justice. That the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdoms of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Proverbs 8, verse 15, Daniel 4, verse 25. Cicero says, quote, Commonwealths are governed far more by the aid and power of God than by the reason and counsel of men. End quote. There is always a greater number of the wicked than of the good, and more who wish the authority of the law subverted than maintained, yet civil order is preserved, and republics and kingdoms are perpetuated. Therefore, there must be someone greater than all devils, tyrants, and wicked men who always preserves this order against their rage. 7. The excellent virtues, exploits, and success of heroes surpassing the ordinary capacity of man, the singular gifts and excellency of artifices which God has conferred upon certain individuals, for the general good and for the preservation of human society, etc., testify that there is a God who has a care for the human race. For these are things which are far greater than any that can proceed from that which is merely sensual, and possess too great an excellence to be merely the acquirements of human industry. There is, therefore, a God who, when he wishes to accomplish great things for the safety of the human race, raises up men endowed with heroic virtues, inventors of arts and counsels, and princes that are brave, good, and prudent, and other instruments adapted to the accomplishment of his purposes. And when he wishes to punish men for their sins, he takes away the same instrument which he raised up for their safety. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus. The Lord doth take away the mighty man and the man of war, the judge and the prophet. He giveth wisdom to the wise, etc. Ezra 1 verse 1, Isaiah 3 verse 2, Daniel 2 verse 21. 8. A providence may be inferred from prophecy and the prediction of events. He is God who can declare to men things that are yet future, and who cannot be deceived in his predictions. Therefore, he does not only foresee future events, but also directs them, that they may come to pass, either by his effecting or permitting them, so that he has a regard for human affairs, and governs the world by his providence. Hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Numbers 23, verse 19. Cicero says, quote, They are no gods that do not declare things to come. End quote. 9. All things in the world are directed to certain ends, and constantly tend to these ends. Therefore there is some being most wise and powerful, who constantly directs all things by his providence, and brings each one to its appointed end. Man liveth not by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. Arguments drawn from the nature and attributes of God. 1. There is a God, therefore there is a providence. This is as truly said as to say, no God, no providence. For to suppose a God who does not rule the world is to deny God. Yea, to suppose God to exist and not to govern the world is in direct opposition to his nature, for the world can no more exist without God than it could be created without him. 2. God is so powerful that it is not possible that anything can be done which he does not simply wish, neither can it be done in a manner different from what he desires, but whatever is done must necessarily be done according to his will and direction, 
therefore those things which are daily done are accomplished according to the will of Almighty God, and so by His providence. 3. It belongs to a wise governor not to permit anything to be done in his kingdom without his will and certain counsel. God is most wise and can be present with all things, therefore nothing is done in the world without his providence. 4. God is most just, and at the same time the judge of the world, therefore he himself bestows reward upon the good, and inflicts punishment upon the wicked. 5. God is most good, but he who is most good is also most communicable. Therefore, as God creates the world from his infinite goodness, that he might communicate himself to it, so in like manner he preserves, administers, and governs the world which he creates by the same goodness. 6. The ends of all things are good and ordained of God, therefore the means also which are necessary for the attainment of these ends are appointed by God from everlasting, either absolutely or according to something else. 7. God is the first cause of all things, therefore all second causes are dependent upon Him. 8. An unchangeable foreknowledge depends on an immutable cause. God foreknows all things unchangeably from everlasting, Therefore he foreknows from an immutable cause, which is his eternal counsel and decree. The sum of all is this, God is almighty, most wise, just, and good. Therefore he ordained and created nothing without some special end and purpose. Neither does he cease to guide and direct his works to the ends for which he hath ordained them. Nor does he suffer those things to be accomplished by chance, which he made and ordained for the manifestation of his own glory. These things hast thou done, and I kept silence. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such a one as thyself, etc. Hath God forgotten to be gracious? My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Psalm 50, verse 21, Psalm 77, verse 9, Isaiah 46, verse 10. Second, what is the providence of God? Foreknowledge, providence, and predestination differ from each other. By foreknowledge we understand the knowledge of God by which he foreknew from all eternity not only what he himself would do, but also what others would do by his permission, viz. that they would sin. Providence and predestination, although they include only those things which God himself will do, yet they differ in this that providence extends to all the things and works of God, whilst predestination properly has respect only to rational creatures. Predestination is therefore the most wise, eternal, and immutable decree of God, by which he appointed and destined every man, before he was created, to his certain use and end, as will hereafter be more clearly shown. But providence is the eternal, most free, immutable, wise, just, and good counsel of God, according to which he effects all good things in his creatures, permits also evil things to be done, and directs all, both good and evil, to his own glory and the salvation of his people. Explanation and Confirmation of this Definition Counsel Divine Providence is called in the Scriptures the Counsel of God. The Counsel of the Lord standeth for ever. My Counsel shall stand. God willing to show the immutability of His Counsel. Psalm 32, verse 11, Isaiah 46, verse 10, Hebrews 6, verse 17. Also, Isaiah 14, verse 26, chapter 19, verse 17, chapter 28, verse 29, Jeremiah 32, verse 19, etc. From these declarations it is evident that by the term providence we are to understand not only the knowledge of things present and future, but also the decree or will and effectual working of God. For the term counsel comprehends an understanding or foreknowledge of things which are to be done, or which are yet future, with the causes on account of which they are or are not to be done, and also a will determining something from certain causes. Providence, therefore, is not the bare foresight or foreknowledge of God, but it also includes the will of God, just as pronua, which we translate providence, signifies with the Greeks both a knowledge and care of things. Eternal. Because, as there can be no ignorance, nor increase of knowledge, nor any change of will in God, there is a necessity that he must have known and decreed all things from everlasting. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his ways, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the things that are not yet done. He hath chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world. We speak the wisdom of God which he hath ordained before the world. Proverbs 8 verse 22, Isaiah 46 verse 10, Ephesians 1 verse 4, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 7. Most free. Because he has so decreed from everlasting, as was pleasing to himself, 
according to his immense wisdom and goodness when he had full power to have arranged his counsel otherwise or even to have omitted it or to have accomplished things differently from what he determined to do by his counsel he hath done whatsoever he pleased as the clay is in the potter's hands so are ye in my hands psalm one hundred and fifteen verse three jeremiah eighteen verse six unchangeable because neither error nor change can occur with god but what he has once decreed from everlasting that being most good and just he wills everlastingly and at length brings to pass i am the lord i change not the strength of israel will not lie nor repent malachi three verse six one samuel fifteen verse twenty nine also numbers twenty three verse nineteen job twenty three verse thirteen psalms thirty three and eleven proverbs nineteen verse twenty one most wise this is evident from the wonderful course of events and things in the world with him is strength and wisdom o oh, the depths of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of god job twelve verse sixteen romans eleven verse thirty three also one samuel sixteen verse seven one kings eight verse thirty nine job thirty six verse twenty three psalm thirty three verse fifteen psalm one hundred and nineteen verses two to six etc most just because the will of god is the fountain and pattern of justice there is no iniquity with the lord our god nor respect of persons two chronicles nineteen verse seven also nehemiah nine verse thirty three job nine verse two psalm thirty six verse seven psalm one hundred and nineteen verse one hundred and thirty seven daniel nine verses seven and fourteen according to which he effects all good things this is added that we may know that the counsel of god is not inactive but efficacious as christ declared my father worketh hitherto and i work john five verse seventeen the working of god is twofold general and special the general working of god is that by which he sustains and governs all things especially the human race the special is that by which he in this life commences the salvation of his people and perfects it in the life to come it is said in reference to both god is the saviour of all men especially of those that believe as many as are led by the spirit of god they are the sons of god the eyes of the lord are upon the righteous etc 1 Timothy 4, verse 10, Romans 8, verse 14, Psalm 34, verse 15. God works in both ways, either immediately or mediately. He works immediately when he does what he wills, independent of means, or in a manner different from the order which he has established in nature, as when he supports life in a miraculous manner. He works mediately when he produces through creatures or second causes those effects for which they are adapted according to the established order of nature and for which they were made, as when he sustains us by food and heals us of disease by medicine. Let them take a lump of figs and lay it for a plaster upon the bile, and he shall recover. Isaiah 38 verse 21 It is in this way that God reveals himself and his will unto us through the scriptures as read and preached. They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. Luke 16, verse 29. This mediate operation or working of God is effected sometimes through good instruments, including such as are natural as well as voluntary, and sometimes through such instruments as are evil and sinful, yet in such a way that what God effects in and through them is always most holy, just, and good, for the goodness of the works of God does not depend upon the instruments, but upon His bounty, wisdom, and righteousness that god works through good instruments is generally admitted by the godly there is however a diversity of sentiment as it respects instruments that are evil and wicked but if we would not deny that the trials and chastisements of the righteous as well as the punishments of the wicked which are accomplished through the wicked are just and proceed from the will and power of god and unless we also deny that the virtues and actions of the wicked which have contributed to the well-being of the human race are the gifts of god we must admit that God does also execute his just and holy judgments and works by instruments that are evil and sinful. It was thus that he sent Joseph into Egypt through his wicked brothers and the Midianites, blessed Israel through the false prophet Balaam, tempted the people through false prophets, vexed Saul through Satan, punished David through Absalom and the blasphemies of Shemi, chastised Solomon by the sedition of Jeroboam, tried job by satan carried judah and jerusalem into captivity by the hands of nebuchadnezzar etc he effects all good things this he does in such a manner that no creature great or small can either exist move or do or suffer anything without his will and counsel 
for by things that are good we are to understand the quantities qualities and motions of things as well as their substance because all things have been created by god and are therefore necessarily included in his providence permits evil things also to be done evil is twofold the evil of guilt which is all sin and the evil of punishment which includes every affliction destruction or vexation which god inflicts upon his rational creatures on account of sin we have an example of evil under both of its forms in jeremiah eighteen verse eight if that nation against whom i have pronounced turn from their evil i will repent of the evil i thought to do unto them the evil of punishment is from god the author and executioner thereof not only in as far as it is a certain action or motion but also in as far as it is the destruction or affliction of the wicked this is proven one because god is the chief and efficient cause of everything that is good every punishment now has the nature of moral good because it is the declaration and execution of divine justice therefore god is the author of punishment two god is the judge of the world and the vindicator of his own glory and desires to be acknowledged as such therefore he is the author of rewards and punishments three because the scriptures everywhere with one voice refer the punishments of the wicked as well as the chastisements trials and martyrdoms of the saints to the efficacious will of god i the lord make peace and create evil shall there be evil that of punishment in the city and the lord hath not done it rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell isaiah forty five verse seven amos three verse six matthew ten verse twenty eight the evils of guilt as far as they are such that is sins have not the nature of that which is good hence god does not will them neither does he tempt men to perform them nor does he affect them or contribute thereto but he permits devils and men to do them or does not prohibit them from committing them when he has the power to do so therefore those things do indeed also fall under the providence of god but not as if they were done by him but only permitted the word permit is therefore not to be rejected seeing that it is sometimes used in the scriptures therefore suffered i thee not to touch her but god suffered him not to touch me he suffered no man to do them wrong who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own way genesis twenty verse six chapter thirty one verse seven psalm one hundred and five verse fourteen acts fourteen verse sixteen but we must have a correct understanding of the word lest we detract from god a considerable portion of the government of the world and of human affairs for this permission is not an indifferent contemplation or suspension of the providence and working of god as it respects the actions of the wicked by which it comes to pass that these actions do not depend so much upon some first cause as upon the will of the creatures acting but it is a withdrawal of divine grace by which god whilst he accomplishes the decrees of his will through rational creatures either does not make known to the creature acting what he himself wishes to be done or he does not incline the will of the creature to render obedience and to perform what is agreeable to his will yet he nevertheless in the meanwhile controls and influences the creatures so deserted and sinning as to accomplish what he has purposed he directs all things both good and evil all things including those that are past from the creation of the world those that are present and those that are to come even to all eternity remember the former things of old for i am god and there is none else i am god and there is none like me isaiah forty six verses nine and ten to his own glory that is to the acknowledgment of his divine justice power wisdom mercy and goodness and to the salvation of his people that is to the life joy righteousness glory and eternal happiness of the church to these ends viz to the glory of god and the salvation of the church all the works and counsels of god ought without controversy to be referred because all of them give evidence of the glory of god and of his concern for the church the heavens declare the glory of god etc for my name's sake will i defer mine anger we know that all things work together for good to them that love god neither hath this man sinned nor his parents but that the glory of god should be manifest in him psalm nineteen verse one isaiah forty eight verse nine romans eight verse twenty eight john nine verse three we have now given a short explanation of the definition which we have given of the providence of god from which the following questions naturally arise is it a providence that includes all things or in other words does it extend to everything the answer to this question is evident which is that all things even the smallest fall within the providence of god so that whatever is done whether it be good or bad 
comes to pass not by chance, but by the eternal counsel of God, producing it, if it be good, and permitting it, if it be evil. But as there are some who are ignorant of this doctrine, whilst there are others who speak against it in various ways, and so cast reproach upon it, we must explain it more fully, and show that it is in perfect harmony with the teachings of God's word. The testimonies which prove that all things are embraced in the providence of God are partly general, such as teach that all things and events generally are subject to the providence of God, and partly special, such as prove that God directs and governs specially each particular thing. The former asserts and establishes a general, the latter a special providence. Those testimonies which are special have reference either to creatures or to the events which are daily occurring. As it respects creatures, they are either such as are irrational, whether animate or inanimate, or they are rational and voluntary agents doing that which is good or evil. As it respects events, they are contingent or casual or necessary, for those things which occur are either casual and fortuitous, but only as far as we are concerned who are ignorant of their true causes, or they are contingent in respect to their causes which work contingently, or necessary in respect to those causes which work necessarily in nature. In respect to God, however, there is nothing that is casual or contingent, but all things are necessary, although it be in a different manner as it respects good and evil actions. A TABLE OF THOSE THINGS WHICH FALL UNDER THE PROVIDENCE OF GOD The whole world is governed by the providence of God, and in the whole world, one, all things generally, which providence is called universal or general, two, each thing particularly, which providence is called particular or special, the things which are specially directed are, one, every single creature, divided into one irrational, of which kind some are one living, two without life, two rational, such as are one angels, divided into one good angels, working freely and willingly that which is good, two bad angels, working freely and willingly that which is evil, two men, divided into one good men, doing freely and willingly that which is good, two wicked men doing freely and willingly that which is evil. Two, every single event, divided into one casual, divided into one good, two evil, two contingent, divided into one good, two evil, three necessary, divided into one good, two evil. It is proper that we should here append to each separate part or division of the above table certain clear and satisfactory proofs, so as to leave no doubt upon the mind of any one respecting the truth of what is affirmed. 1. The general providence of God is established by the following testimonies taken from the word of God. He doeth all things according to the counsel of his own will. He giveth to all life and breath and all things. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Thou hast made heaven and earth and all things that are therein, the seas and all that are therein, and thou preserveth them all. I form the light and create darkness, I make peace and create evil, I the Lord do all these things. Ephesians 1 verse 11, Acts 17 verse 25, Numbers 23 verse 19, Nehemiah 9 verse 6, Isaiah 45 verse 7. 2. The history of Joseph furnishes a remarkable proof of a special providence in regard to rational creatures. It was not you that sent me hither, but God. Ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. Genesis 45, verse 8, chapter 50, verse 20. The history of Pharaoh, as recorded in the book of Exodus, establishes the same thing. Who hath made man's mouth, or who maketh the dumb, or deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? And the Lord said unto Joshua, Be not afraid because of them, for to-morrow about this time will I deliver them all up slain before Israel. The Lord hath said unto Shimei, Cursed David. And the Lord said, Who shall persuade Ahab, etc.? And he said, Thou shalt persuade him, and prevail also. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, as the rivers of water. He turneth it whithersoever he will. The Lord turned the heart of the king of Assyria unto them. Exodus 4, verse 11, Joshua 11, verse 6, 2 Samuel 16, verse 10, 1 Kings 22, verse 20, Proverbs 21, verse 1, Ezra 6, verse 22. The Lord also calls the king of the Assyrians the rod of his anger, and adds, When the Lord hath performed his whole work upon Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, I will punish the fruit of the stout heart of the king of Assyria, and the glory of his high looks. Who is he that saith, and it cometh to pass, when the Lord commandeth it not? 
he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth and none can stay his hand or say unto him what doest thou herod and pilate with the gentiles and the people of israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined to be done isaiah ten verses six and twelve lamentations three verse thirty seven daniel four verse thirty five acts four verses twenty seven and twenty eight three as it respects the providence of god over irrational creatures be they living or destitute of life the following proofs may be adduced he keepeth all the bones of the righteous not one of them is broken and god remembered noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark and god made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters assuaged he giveth to the beast his food and to the young ravens which cry your heavenly father feedeth the fowls of the air etc Psalm 44, verse 20, Genesis 8, verse 1, Psalm 147, verse 9, Matthew 6, verse 20. See also the 37th chapter of the book of Job, and the 104th Psalm. 4. Of things fortuitous and casual, it is said, And if a man lie not in wait, but God deliver into his hands, then I will appoint thee a place whither he shall flee. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father? but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away, blessed be the name of the Lord. The lot is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. Exodus 20, verse 13, Matthew 10, verses 29 and 30, Job 1, verse 21, Proverbs 16, verse 33. 5. Of necessary events, the necessity of which depends either upon the counsel of God revealed through His word, we may adduce the following testimony. These things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled, a bone of him shall not be broken. Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer, and to rise again from the dead on the third day. It must needs be, that offences will come. If it were possible, they would deceive the very elect. My sheep shall never perish, neither shall any pluck them out of my hands. John 19, verse 36, Luke 24, verse 36, Matthew 24, verse 24, John 10, verse 28 or, if the necessity of these events depend on the order, divinely established in nature, or on natural causes, operating by a natural necessity, we may in this case adduce the following testimonies. He causeth the bud to spring forth. He bringeth the dew, the frost, and the ice. He bringeth forth Mazaroth in his season, guides Arcturus and the motions of heaven, etc. God thundereth marvellously with his voice. He saith to the snow, Be thou on the earth likewise to the small rain and to the great rain of his strength. Out of the south cometh the whirlwind, and cold out of the north. He watereth the hills from his chambers. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of thy works. He causeth the grass to grow for the cattle, and herb for the service of man, etc. Job 28, verses 27 and 32, chapter 37, verses 5 to 10, Psalm 104, verses 13, 14 and 15. The scriptures furnish almost an infinite number of testimonies of a similar character, which prove that the providence of God embraces all things and every single event. These, however, are sufficient for our present purpose, for it is clearly evident, from what has now been said, that all things, the evil as well as the good, the small as well as the great, are directed and governed by the providence of God. Yet in such a way that those things which are good are done not only according to, but also by, divine providence as the cause that is, by God willing, commanding, and effecting them, whilst those that are evil, as far as they are evil, are not done by, but according to divine providence, that is, not by God willing, commanding, effecting, or furthering them, but by permitting them, and directing them to their appointed ends. The arguments by which we demonstrate that the providence of God embraces all and every single thing are very nearly the same as those by which we prove that there is a providence, one, nothing can be done without the will of him who is all-powerful, therefore it is impossible that anything can be done when God does not simply will it, seeing he is all-powerful. But whatever is done must be done either by God simply willing it, or it must be according to his will. Two, it belongs to a wise governor not to permit anything which he has in his power to be done without his will and counsel. And the wiser he is, the more extensive will his government be. But the wisdom of God is infinite, and all things are in his power, according to Isaiah 40, verse 27. Therefore nothing is done in the whole world which God does not will and decree. 3. All things have certain ends which are truly good, but all good things are from God who wills and directs them. 
therefore he wills and directs the ends of things but he who wills the ends wills also the means for the attainment of these ends hence god wills the means and these simply if they are good or in a certain manner or respect if they are evil seeing therefore that all things which are and are done are either ends or means for the attainment of these ends it follows that god must will and govern all things for there is some first cause which does not depend on anything else but which is the ground of all other things god is this first cause therefore all second causes depend upon the will of god five god foreknew all things unchangeably from everlasting because he can neither be deceived nor err in his foreknowledge therefore the foreknowledge of god is a certain and infallible knowledge of all things so that all things come to pass just as god foreknew they would and that because he foreknew them for his foreknowledge does not depend upon things created but upon himself hence all events depend upon and proceed immutably from the foreknowledge of god six all good things are from god as the first cause all things made and established in nature as substance desires actions etc as far as they are merely such are good therefore they are from god and are accomplished by his providence a refutation of certain objections against the providence of god the first objection respects the confusion or disorders in nature those things which are in a state of confusion are not governed by god because he is not the author of confusion there is much confusion in the world therefore either nothing or at least all things are not governed by divine providence answer one whilst there are many things in a state of confusion there are nevertheless many things that are wisely ordered and regulated as the motions of the heavenly bodies the preservation of the different races of men and of the different species of animals the preservation of commonwealths the punishment of the wicked etc hence it cannot be concluded universally that nothing is governed by god two as it respects those things which are deranged or confused it merely follows that this confusion which attaches itself to these things by the malice of devils and men is not from god there is therefore here also more in the conclusion than in the premises three we reply to the major proposition that those things which are deranged are not governed by god in as far as this derangement itself is concerned yet they are governed by him in as far as there is any order discerned in the midst of this derangement and there is nothing which is or which occurs in the world that is so deranged as to leave no marks of the order of divine wisdom power and justice for in the midst of the greatest confusion this order may always be clearly discerned there was for instance great confusion as far as the wills and actions of men were concerned in the death of the son of god who was crucified by the jews the same thing may be said of the selling of joseph in egypt of the sedition of absalom etc but yet there was at the same time the greatest order as far as the will and counsel of god was concerned who delivered his son to death for our sins sent joseph into egypt punished david and absalom etc in this way there can be in the same event confusion and order only in a different respect it follows therefore that things confused are not from god neither are they governed by him in as far as they are deranged and sinful but in as far as they agree with the order of divine wisdom and justice they both are and are governed by god to this it is objected that which opposes the will of god is not ruled by god the will of devils and men is opposed to the will of god therefore it is not ruled by god answer there are here four terms in this syllogism for the major is true of both the secret and revealed will of god whilst the minor is true of the will of god only as revealed and made known the second objection against the providence of god is in reference to the cause of sin all actions and desires or motions are from god many actions are sinful therefore sin is from god and as a matter of consequence the doctrine of universal providence makes god the author of sin answer there is a fallacy of the accident in the minor proposition for the actions of the wicked are sins not per se in themselves in as far as they are actions but by an accident on account of the want of righteousness and of the perversity of the will of the ungodly who do not observe this so as to follow in the action the will of god for this want of righteousness and perversity is an accident of the will and action of the creature which god designs to be affected by the corrupt will objection one but many actions are in their own nature sins therefore they are also sins in themselves 
answer we grant the whole argument as it respects actions prohibited by god and committed by creatures contrary to the will of god in so far they are sinful but not in as far as god wills them or commands them to be done for in respect to the divine will exciting or producing them they are always most just judgment of god nor are they without manifest contempt of god under the name of sin so that they may be comprehended under their class hence the antecedent is false objection to he who wills an action which is sinful in itself wills also the sin god wills actions which are sinful in themselves as the selling of joseph in egypt the sedition of absalom the lying of false prophets the cruelty of the assyrians the crucifixion of christ etc therefore he wills sin answer the major is true of him who wills an action which is sinful in respect to his will or who wills an action with the same end with which he does who sins but not of him who wills and performs a work which is sinful in respect to the will of another or who wills a certain thing with a different end and that good seeing that it is in harmony with the nature and law of god but the actions of the assyrians and those of other sinners which god efficaciously willed are sins not in respect to the will of god but in respect to the will of man sinning for god willed all those things with the best end while men on the other hand willed them with the worst that this answer may be the better understood and be made to rebut with greater force these cavils this general rule is to be observed the truth of which is manifest as well in theology as in moral and natural philosophy when there are many causes of one and the same effect some good and others evil that effect in respect to the good causes is good whilst in respect to the evil it is evil and sinful and good causes are in themselves the causes of good but by an accident they become the causes of effects which are evil and sinful or of the sin which is in the effect on account of a certain sinful cause and on the contrary sinful causes are in themselves the causes of evil but by an accident they become the cause of the good which is in the effect it is universally true that efficient and final causes make a difference in actions it is for this reason that the same action as for instance the selling of joseph into egypt was a most wicked affair in respect to his brothers and at the same time good in respect to god on account of different efficient and final causes and just as the good work of god cannot be referred to the brothers of joseph so their wicked deed cannot be ascribed to god objection three that which cannot be done god absolutely forbidding it may nevertheless be done when god wills it sin in as far as it is sin cannot be committed when god does not expressly will it for the reason that he is omnipotent therefore sin must be committed by god willing it answer we deny the consequence because the major proposition is defective it does not contain all that should be enumerated this is wanting or when he permits it for sin may be committed when god does not simply will it but willingly permits it or we may say that there is an ambiguity in the phrase not willing it which sometimes means to disapprove of and prevent at the same time in which sense it is impossible that anything should be done when god does not will it otherwise he would not be omnipotent and then again it signifies only to disapprove of and not to prevent but to permit in this sense sins may be committed when god does not will them that is when he does not approve of them but yet does not so restrain the wicked as to prevent their commission objection four the want of righteousness in man is from god this want of righteousness is sin therefore sin is from god answer there are four terms in this syllogism for in the major proposition the want of righteousness signifies the desertion and withdrawal of grace actively which is a most just punishment of the creature sinning and is thus from god whilst in the minor it is to be understood passively signifying a want of that righteousness which we ought to possess which when it is willingly contracted and received by men and exists in them contrary to the law of god is sin which is neither wrought nor desired by god briefly this want of righteousness is from god in as far as it is a punishment and it is not from him in as far as it is sin or opposition to the law in the creature objection five sinners are governed by god the actions of sinners are sins therefore sins are from god answer there is more in the conclusion than in the premises for this is all that follows legitimately therefore sins are ruled by god which is true in as far as they are merely desires and actions and are directed to the glory of god there is also a fallacy of accident in the minor for actions are sins in as far as they are done by bad men contrary to the law and not in as far as god influences men to perform them 
they are and become evil therefore not from themselves but from an accident which is the corruption of him who performs them just as pure water becomes muddy and filthy by flowing through an impure channel or as the best wine coming out of a good vessel becomes sour by being put into an impure vessel according to what horace says unless the vessel be clean that which thou puttest therein soureth or as the riding of a good horseman is halting if the horse be lame in all these and similar examples those things which are good in themselves are corrupted by an accident so that we have the commission of what is called a fallacy of the accident inasmuch as it proceeds from the thing itself to that which concurs with it by an accident in this manner the governing of a lame horse is plainly a halting the horseman wills and effects the governing of the lame horse therefore he wills and works the halting or the selling of joseph by his brothers was a sin god willed this selling therefore he willed the sin objection six god is the author of those things which are done by divine providence all evil results from divine providence therefore god is the author of them answer we grant the whole argument as it respects the evil of punishment but as touching the evil of guilt the major must be distinguished in the following manner those things which are done by the providence of god affecting them or in such a way that they result from it as an efficient cause god is the author of them but not of those which result from the providence of god only by permission or which god permits determines and directs to the best ends as is true of the evil of guilt or crime for the evils of guilt or sins in as far as they are such have not the nature or consideration of good as may be said to be true of the evil of punishment hence god does not will those things which are sins neither does he approve them nor produce them nor further or desire them but merely permits them to be done or does not prevent their commission partly that he may exercise his justice in those who deserve to be punished and partly that he may exhibit his mercy in forgiving others the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of jesus christ might be given to them that believe even for this purpose have i raised thee up that i might show forth my power in thee galatians three verse twenty two romans nine verse seventeen it is for this reason declared in the definition of the doctrine of divine providence that god permits evil to be done but this permission as we have already shown includes the withdrawal of divine grace by which god one does not make known to man his will that he might act according thereto two he does not incline the will of man to obey and honour him and to act in accordance with his will as revealed if a dreamer of dreams shall arise among you thou shalt not hearken unto him for the lord your god proveth you the lord moved david against israel to say go and number israel and judah deuteronomy thirteen verses one and three to samuel twenty four verse one why did he afterwards punish david that he might be led to repentance three he nevertheless influences and controls those who are thus deserted so as to accomplish through them his just judgments for god accomplishes good things through evil instruments no less than through those which are good for as the work of god is not made better by the excellency of the instrument so neither is it made worse by the evil character of the instrument god wills actions that are evil but only in as far as they are punishments of the wicked all good things are from god all punishments are just and good therefore they are from god according as it is said shall there be evil in the city and the lord hath not done it amos three verse six this is to be understood of the evil of punishment the apostle james says in reference to the evil of guilt let no man when he is tempted that is when he is enticed to evil say that he is tempted of god james one verse thirteen only the evil of punishment therefore is from god such as the chastisements and martyrdom of the saints which he himself wills and effects now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that ye sold me hither for god did send me before you to preserve your life genesis forty five verse five but god did not will death answer he did not will it in as far as it is a torment and destruction of the creature but he willed in as far as it is a punishment of sin and the execution of his judgment notwithstanding they hearkened not to the voice of their father because the lord would slay them one samuel two verse twenty five the third objection is in respect to contradictory wills he who in his secret counsel wills and prohibits by his law the same work in him there are contradictory wills but in god there are no contradictory wills therefore he does not by his secret determination will those things which he prohibits in his law as robbery murder lust theft etc answer one 
we grant the whole argument in as far as these things are done by creatures contrary to the law and our sins in this sense god neither wills nor approves of them but only in as far as they are certain motions and punishments of the wicked two we must make a distinction in reference to the major proposition for it is contradictory to say he wills and forbids the same work in the same respect and with the same end god wills and forbids the same things but in a different respect and with a different end he willed for instance the selling of joseph in as far as it was the occasion of his elevation the preservation of the family of jacob and the fulfilment of the prophecies concerning the bondage of the seed of abraham in egypt but in as far as he was sent away by the hatred of his brethren he did not will it but denounced and condemned it as horrible fratricide and so of the other examples we have adduced the fourth objection relates to liberty and contingency that which is done by the immutable decree of god cannot be done contingently and freely but necessarily but many things are done contingently and freely therefore many things are not done by the immutable decree and providence of god or else liberty and contingency are taken away answer one we reply to the major that which is done by the unchangeable decree of god cannot be done contingently viz in respect to the first cause or in respect to the same immutable divine decree yet it may be done contingently in respect to a second and last cause working contingently or freely for contingency is the order between a changeable cause and its effect just as necessity is the order between a necessary cause and its effect hence the cause must be of the same character as the effect but the same effect may proceed from a changeable and necessary cause in different respects as is the case with all things which god does through his creatures of which both god and his creatures are the cause thus in respect to god there is an unchangeable order between cause and effect but in respect to creatures there is a changeable order between the cause and the same effect hence in regard to god it is necessary but in regard to the creature it is contingent in the same effect therefore it is not absurd that the same effect should be said to be necessary and contingent in respect to different causes that is in respect to an unchangeable first cause acting necessarily and in respect to a changeable second cause acting contingently two we also deny what is said in the major that that is not done or may be done freely which is done by the immutable decree of god for it is not immutability but constraint or it is not the necessity of unchangeableness but that of constraint which take away liberty god is unchangeably and necessarily good and yet he is at the same time most freely good the devils are unchangeably and necessarily evil and yet they are evil and do that which is evil with the greatest freedom of the will the fifth objection relates to the uselessness of means it is in vain that means are employed for the purpose of hindering or advancing those things which are done by the unchangeable will and providence of god such are the counsels commands doctrines exhortations promises and threatenings of god the labours endeavours prayers etc of the saints but these means are not employed in vain because they are commanded by god therefore all things are not done by the unchangeable counsel and providence of god answer one we deny the major because the first and principal cause being considered it is not necessary that that which is secondary and instrumental should be taken away nor the contrary the reason is because god decreed also to employ means and second causes for the purpose of accomplishing the ends and effects determined upon by himself and he shows us in his word and in the order of nature that he wills to use them and commands us to do the same therefore it is not in vain that the sun daily rises and sets nor is it in vain that fields are sown or watered with showers or that our bodies are refreshed with food although god creates light and darkness causes the corn to spring up from the earth and is the life and length of our days so also it is not in vain that men are taught and that they should study to conform their lives to certain habits or doctrines although the actions and events that promote our well-being proceed from god only therefore means are to be employed one that we may render obedience to god who has ordained both the ends and the means for the attainment of these ends and has prescribed them unto us otherwise we tempt god at our peril two that we may obtain the good things promised unto us three that we may retain a good conscience even though we do not always obtain the things desired and expected in the use of these means two 
it is also a fallacy to declare that to be true generally which is true only in a certain respect for even where there is nothing accomplished by only means they are nevertheless profitable in this respect that they render the wicked inexcusable the sixth objection has respect to rewards and punishments those things which are necessary do not merit rewards or punishments all good works merit rewards whilst evil works merit punishment therefore good and evil works do not occur necessarily but changeably answer one we grant the whole in relation to second causes from which many things proceed changeably and which therefore produce changeable effects two we deny what is affirmed in the minor that good works merit reward with god although they may be rewarded among men as it is said of abraham if he were justified by works he hath whereof to glory but not before god romans four verse two three we deny the major proposition if it be understood of evil works generally for that evil works merit punishment the depravity and corrupt will of man is a sufficient testimony whether they be necessarily done or not aristotle himself when treating this subject in his ethics affirms that the inebriate ought not to be excused if he sin from intoxication and that men are deservedly punished and reprehended for vices whether of the body or of the mind of which they themselves are the cause although they may not be able to avoid or leave them off because they have brought these things upon themselves of their own accord question twenty eight what advantage is it to us to know that god has created and by his providence doth still uphold all things answer that we may be patient in adversity thankful in prosperity and that in all things which may hereafter befall us we place our firm trust in our faithful god and father that nothing shall separate us from his love since all creatures are so in his hand that without his will they cannot so much as move exposition it is necessary that the doctrine of the creation of all things and of the providence of god should be known and held one on account of the glory of god for those that deny the creation and providence of god deny also his attributes and in doing this they neither magnify nor praise god but deny him therefore the doctrine of providence should be known that we may attribute unto god the glory of the power wisdom goodness and justice which appears in creating preserving and governing all things two on account of our consolation and salvation that we may by this means be led in the first place to exercise patience in adversity for whatever comes to pass by the will and counsel of god and is profitable for us that we ought patiently to bear but all things even those that are evil happen by the counsel and will of god and are profitable unto us therefore we ought to bear these patiently and in all things consider and recognize the fatherly will of god towards us secondly that in prosperity we may be thankful to god for the benefits received for from whom we receive all good things temporal as well as spiritual great as well as small to him we ought to be grateful now it is from god the author of all good gifts that we have all that we enjoy therefore we ought to be thankful to him that is we ought to acknowledge and celebrate his benefits for gratitude bases itself upon the will and justice of god and so consists in acknowledging and celebrating his benefits towards us and in making suitable returns for the same thirdly that we may entertain a good hope in regard to all things which may hereafter befall us so as to rest fully assured that if god by his providence has so far delivered us out of past evils he will also in future make all things subservient to our salvation and never so desert us that we perish in short the ends of the doctrine of divine providence are the glory of god patience in adversity thankfulness in prosperity and hope in regard to future things from these things it appears that the whole truth of religion and the very foundation of piety would be overthrown if the providence of god as it has been defined and explained be not maintained because one we would not be patient in adversity if we did not know that these things are sent upon us from god our father two we would not be grateful for the benefits which we receive if we did not know that they are given to us from above three we would not have a good and certain hope in relation to future things if we were not fully persuaded that the will of god in regard to our salvation and that of all his people is unchangeable section twenty one of god the son and the names which are applied to him concerning the name jesus eleventh lord's day of god the son question twenty nine why is the son of god called jesus that is a saviour 
answer because he saveth us and delivereth us from our sins and likewise because we ought not to seek neither can find salvation in any other exposition the second part of the creed which now follows treats of the mediator the doctrine of the mediator consists of two parts the one has respect to the person of the mediator the other to his office these two articles are concerning his person and in jesus christ his only begotten son our lord who was conceived by the holy ghost born of the virgin mary the four following articles which bring us down to the article of the holy ghost treat of the office of the mediator the office of the mediator consists of two parts his humiliation or merit and his glorification or efficacy now as it respects his humiliation christ is meritorious as it respects his glorification he is efficacious the fourth article treats of his humiliation suffered under pontius pilate was crucified dead and buried he descended into hell the fifth and sixth treat of his glorification the third day he arose from the dead ascended into heaven sitteth at the right hand of god the father almighty the seventh which refers to his coming to judge the world respects the consummation of his glory when god will be all in all it appears from what has now been said with what great wisdom the articles of the creed were written and how well they are arranged in reference to the question of the mediator the humiliation which is the first part of his office has these grades he suffered was crucified dead buried and descended into hell we descend gradually from one degree to another until we reach the lowest point of his humiliation which is found in the article of his descent into hell the other part of his office which is his glorification ascends gradually from the glory which is less to that which is greater until it reaches its highest point in his exaltation at the right hand of god the same order and wisdom appear in the first part of the creed and also in the third where we have enumerated in the most beautiful order and succession the benefits which christ purchased and applies unto us by the holy spirit and which is as it were the fruit of the preceding articles the office of christ differs from his benefits as cause and effect or as antecedent and consequent the benefits are the things themselves which christ has purchased for us and which he bestows upon us such as remission of sins everlasting righteousness and salvation his office is the obtaining and bestowment of these things and in jesus that is i believe in jesus christ the words i believe are to be repeated because as we believe in god the father so we also believe in god the son according to what is written ye believe in god believe also in me believe me that i am in the father and the father in me i and my father are one this is the work of god that ye believe on him whom he hath sent he that believeth on the son hath everlasting life that all men should honour the son as they honour the father john fourteen verse one chapter fourteen verse eleven chapter ten verse thirty chapter six verse twenty nine chapter three verse thirty six chapter five verse twenty three this is a sure and well-grounded argument in support of the true divinity of the son for faith under this form is worship due to god alone touching the name jesus which we are here to consider we must not merely inquire into the etymology of it what it imports but we must consider more especially the office of the mediator which is signified therein the word Jesus, in Greek, Jesus, and in Hebrew, Yehoshua, or Yeshua, signifies a saviour, or the author of salvation which God himself ascribes to the mediator in the New Testament. The true etymology or import of the word was given by the angel when he said, His name shall be called Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Matthew 1 verse 21 the son of god is therefore called jesus the saviour in respect to his office because he is our mediator and saves and delivers us from the evil both of guilt and punishment and that truly because he is an only and perfect saviour the salvation which he offers is righteousness and eternal life this is inferred from the name itself because he has not the name without the thing but on account of the office objection but many others have also had the name of jesus as joshua the leader of the children of israel etc therefore nothing can be inferred and argued from the name itself answer others have had this name because they were typical saviors foreshadowing the true saviour and if it is objected that the parents of joshua when they gave this name to their infant son 
could not have expected that future deliverance would have been brought to Israel through him. We reply that God knew it, and directed their wills in so naming the child. The difference, however, between other saviours and this Jesus is great. 1. Others had this name given them fortuitously by the will of men, but this Jesus was so called by the angel. 2. Others were typical, this Jesus is the appointed and true saviour. 3. God merely conferred temporal blessings upon his people through other deliverers. This Jesus frees us not only from bodily and temporal evils, but also from the evils both of guilt and punishment. 4. Other deliverers were only instruments and ministers through whom God bestowed these temporal blessings. This Jesus is the author not only of all the good things which respect the body and this life, but also of those which respect the soul and the life to come. The Son of God is therefore called Jesus by way of pre-eminence to indicate thereby that he is the true Saviour. This is evident, one, because he saves us from the double evil of guilt and punishment. That he saves us from the evil of guilt is testified by the angel who said, He shall save his people from their sins. That he frees us from the evil of punishment may be inferred from the fact that if sin be taken away, punishment, which is the effect of sin, must also be taken away. For if the cause be removed, the effect must also be removed. The people whom Jesus saves are all those that believe, and those only. He is the Saviour only of such as believe, because it is only in them that his end is obtained. He established a church in the world to gather and save men, but upon this condition that they apprehend the benefits which he offers, and are thankful to him for them. 2. Because he is an only Saviour. For as our Mediator is only one, so Jesus must also be our only Saviour, according to what is declared in many places of Scripture. There is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. He that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. God hath given unto us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. For there is one God and one Mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. I... Even I am the Lord, and beside me there is no Saviour. Acts 4, verse 12, John 3, verse 18, 1 John 5, verse 11, 1 Timothy 2, verse 5, Isaiah 43, verse 11. Objection. The Father and the Holy Spirit also save us, therefore the Son is not an only Saviour. Answer. It is true that all the persons of the Godhead are engaged in the work of our salvation, but there is a distinction as to the manner in which they save us. The Father saves us through the Son as the fountain of salvation. The Holy Spirit saves us as being the immediate agent or accomplisher of our regeneration. The Son saves us by His merit, as being the only Saviour, paying a ransom for us, giving the Holy Spirit, regenerating and raising us up unto eternal life. The efficacy of our salvation is therefore common to the three persons of the Godhead, but the manner is peculiar to the Son. Again, the Son is called the only Saviour in opposition to all creatures, he therefore excludes all creatures, but not the Father, nor the Holy Spirit, as it is said, No man knoweth the things of God, but the Spirit of God, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 11, from which we are not to infer that the Father and Son do not know themselves, for the Spirit is here compared with creatures, and not with the Father and the Son. 3. He is a Saviour in two respects, by His merit and efficacy. He saves us by his merit or satisfaction, because by his obedience, suffering, death, and intercession, he has merited for us remission of sins, reconciliation with God, the Holy Spirit, salvation, and eternal life. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world, that is, for the sins of all sorts of men, of whatever age, rank, or place they may be. The blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. Through the obedience of one, many were made righteous. The Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. 1 John 2, verse 2, chapter 1, verse 7, Romans 3, verse 25, chapter 5, verse 19, Isaiah 53, verse 5. He also saves us by his efficacy, because he has not only by his merits obtained for us remission of sins, righteousness, and that life which we had lost, but he also grants and applies unto us the whole benefit of redemption by virtue of his Spirit through faith. For what he has merited by his death, he does not retain to himself alone, but confers upon us. He did not purchase salvation and eternal life, which he had for himself, but for us as our mediator. 
Therefore he reveals unto us the will of the Father, institutes and preserves the ministry. Through this he gives the Holy Spirit and converts men, collects a church, bestows all good things necessary for this life, defends his church against all her enemies, finally raises up in the last day to eternal life all those that believe in him, and delivers them from all evils, whilst he casts all his and their enemies into everlasting punishment. To accomplish all these things is the work of the true God, who alone is almighty. In short, his efficacy regenerates us by his word and spirit in this life, and preserves those that are renewed, lest they fall again, and at length raises them unto eternal life. These passages of Scripture speak of this revelation and regeneration. No man knoweth who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. The only begotten Son which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. There is another that shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. I will send the Holy Spirit unto you from the Father. When he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, and gave gifts unto men some pastors and teachers, etc. He ascended above all the heavens that he might fill all things. The Son of Man was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Matthew 11, verse 27, John 1, verse 18, Matthew 3, verse 11, John 15, verse 26, Ephesians 4, verses 8, 10, and 11, 1 John 3, verse 8. Concerning the preservation of them that believe, the following passages may be cited. Let not your heart be troubled, ye believe in God, believe also in me, etc. I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. I will not leave you comfortless. I and the Father will come unto him, and make our abode with him. John 14, verse 1, chapter 18, verse 23, Matthew 18, verse 20. Of his raising us up unto eternal life, these passages of Scripture speak. I will raise him up at the last day. No one shall pluck my sheep out of my hand and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. And when he shall have subjected all things unto himself, he shall present before God a glorious church, which he has gathered from the beginning to the end of the world. John 6, verse 54, chapter 10, verses 28 and 29, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 28, Ephesians 5, verse 27. From what has now been said, we may perceive that the gift of the Holy Spirit is also a part of our salvation, and that this ought to be accomplished through the Mediator, for the Holy Spirit renovates the heart by abolishing sin, which being abolished, death must also necessarily be abolished. It was for this destruction or abolishing of sin and death that Christ came into the world. 4. He saves us fully and perfectly by commencing salvation in us in this life, and at length consummating it in the life to come. This he does because his merit is most perfect, and that for two reasons, as has already been explained. First, because he is God. God purchased the church with his own blood, Acts 20, verse 28, from which it appears that his satisfaction surpasses the punishment and satisfaction of all the angels, and secondly, because of the greatness of the punishment which he endured for us. He also saves us in the manner just specified, because the salvation which he confers upon us is most full and complete. Ye are complete in him, Colossians 2, verse 10, that is, ye have all things which pertain unto everlasting blessedness, and are made the complete and happy sons of God, through and on account of Jesus Christ. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. The blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, cleanseth us from all sin. There is no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. But this man, because he continueth for ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood, Wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. Colossians 1 verse 19, 1 John 1 verse 7, Romans 8 verse 1, Hebrews 7 verse 24. The sum of all that has been said concerning the name of Jesus may be briefly reduced to these questions. 1. Who is he that saves us? The Son of God is our Jesus, or Saviour. 2. Whom does he save? His people, that is, all and only the elect given to him by the Father. 3. From what evils does he save us? From all sins and from the punishment of sin. 4. In what manner does he save us? In two ways, by his merit and efficacy, and in each way most perfectly. Now, therefore, what is the meaning of this article, I believe in Jesus? It means, 1. I believe that there is a certain saviour of the human race. 2. I believe that this person, Jesus, was born of the Virgin Mary, 
is this saviour of whom the father declared from heaven this is my beloved son in whom i am well pleased hear ye him matthew three verse seventeen god therefore will have him to be worshipped and honoured he that honoureth not the son honoureth not the father which hath sent him john five verse twenty three three i believe that this jesus by his merit and efficacy delivers us from all evils both of guilt and punishment by commencing this salvation in us in this life and consummating it in the life to come for i believe that he is not only the saviour of others whom he has called into his service but that he is also my only and perfect saviour working effectually in me here and carrying on until the day of full redemption what he has commenced question thirty do such then believe in jesus the only saviour who seek their salvation and happiness of saints of themselves or anywhere else answer they do not for though they boast of him in words yet in deeds they deny jesus the only deliverer and saviour for one of these two things must be true either that jesus is not a complete saviour or that they who by a true faith receive this saviour must find all things in him necessary to their salvation exposition this question is proposed on account of those who glory in the name of jesus and yet at the same time seek their salvation either wholly or in part in some other place without him in the merits of the saints in the indulgences of the pope in their own offerings works fastings prayers alms etc as to the papists the jesuits and other hypocrites of a similar caste we must therefore inquire whether these persons believe in jesus as the only saviour or not it is answered that they do not believe in him but that in very deed they deny him however much they may boast of him in words the substance of this answer is included in this syllogism drawn from the description of an only and perfect saviour whosoever is a perfect and only saviour he does not confer salvation with others nor in part only jesus is a complete and only saviour as we have shown in the exposition of the former question therefore he does not confer salvation in connection with others nor in part only but he alone confers it entire and in the most perfect manner hence we justly conclude that all those who seek their salvation wholly or in part somewhere else in reality deny him to be an only and perfect saviour or we may put it in this form those who seek salvation elsewhere than in christ whether in the saints or in themselves etc do not believe in jesus as an only saviour the papists and jesuits who look upon their works as meritorious do this therefore they do not believe in jesus as their only saviour the minor proposition is acknowledged by them and as to the major it is clearly evident from the description which we have given of a perfect saviour objection god desires and commands us to pray for each other therefore to attribute a part of our salvation to the intercession of the saints does not impeach the office and glory of an only saviour answer there is a great distinction to be made between the intercessions of christ and those of the saints christ intercedes for us with the father by the efficacy of his own peculiar dignity and merit and is heard on account of himself and obtains what he asks the saints pray and intercede mutually for each other in this life and the good things which they ask and obtain for themselves and others they seek and obtain not upon their own worthiness but upon the ground of the dignity and merit of the mediator wherefore inasmuch as the papists imagine that the saints obtain favour with god and certain good things for others on account of the worthiness of their own merits they manifestly derogate from the office and glory of jesus and deny him to be an only saviour section twenty two concerning the name christ twelfth lord's day question thirty one why is he called christ that is anointed answer because he is ordained of god the father and anointed with the holy ghost to be our chief prophet and teacher who has fully revealed to us the secret counsel and will of god concerning our redemption and to be our only high priest who by the one sacrifice of his body has redeemed us and makes continual intercession with the father for us and also to be our eternal king who governs us by his word and spirit and who defends and preserves us in the enjoyment of that salvation he has purchased for us exposition jesus is the proper name of the mediator christ is as it were an additional appellation for he is jesus in such a manner that he is also the christ the promised saviour and messiah both titles designate his office yet not with the same clearness 
for whilst the name Jesus denotes the office of the mediator in a general way, that of Christ expresses it more fully and distinctly, for the name Christ expresses the three parts of his office, viz. prophetical, sacerdotal, and regal. The name Christ signifies the anointed, Therefore he is Jesus the Saviour, in such a manner that he is Christ, or the Anointed, having the office of one that is anointed, which consists of three parts, as has just been remarked. The reason why these three things are comprehended in the name of Christ is because prophets, priests, and kings were anciently anointed, by which was signified both an ordination to the office, and also a conferring of those gifts which were necessary for the proper discharge of the duties thereby imposed. Therefore we thus conclude— he who is to be a prophet, priest, and king, and is called the anointed, he is so called on account of these three offices. Christ was to be a prophet, priest, and king, and is called the anointed, therefore he is called the anointed or Christ on account of these three, so that these parts of the office of the mediator are expressed in the one title of the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed. In discussing this question of the catechism, we must inquire, first, what is meant by the anointing of Christ, seeing the scriptures nowhere speak of his being anointed? Second, what is the prophetical office of Christ? Third, what is the priestly office of Christ? Fourth, what is the regal office of Christ? First, what is the unction or anointing of Christ? Anointing was a ceremony by which prophets, priests, and kings were confirmed in their office by being anointed either with common or with a particular kind of oil. This anointing signified, one, an ordination or calling to the office for which they were thus set apart. Two, it signified the promise and bestowment of the gifts necessary for the purpose of sustaining those upon whom the burden of either of these offices were imposed. There was also an analogy between the sign, or the external anointing, and the thing signified thereby, because as oil strengthens, invigorates, renovates, and makes firm the dry and feeble members of the body, and renders them active and fit for the discharge of their office, so the Holy Spirit enlivens and renews our nature, unfit of itself for the accomplishment of anything that is good, and furnishes it with strength and power to do that which is agreeable to God, and to discharge properly the duties imposed upon us in the relations in which we are called to serve Him. Moreover, those who were anointed under the Old Testament were types of Christ, so that it may be said that their anointing was only a shadow and so imperfect. But the anointing of Christ was perfect, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Colossians 2 verse 9. He alone received all the gifts of the Spirit in the highest degree and number. Another point of difference is seen in this, that none of those who were anointed under the Old Testament received all the gifts. Some received more, others less, but no one received all, neither did all receive them in the same degree. Christ, however, had all these gifts in the fullest and highest sense, Therefore, although this anointing was proper to those of the Old Testament as well as to Christ, yet it was real and perfect in no one excepting Christ. Objection, but we nowhere read of the anointing of Christ in the Holy Scriptures. Answer, it is true indeed that it is nowhere said that Christ was anointed ceremoniously, but he was anointed really and spiritually, that is, he received the thing signified thereby, which was the Holy Ghost. Therefore God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me. Psalm 45, verse 7, Hebrews 1, verse 9, Isaiah 61, verse 1. The anointing of Christ is, therefore, spoken of both in the Old and New Testament. It behooved Christ to be not a typical prophet, priest, and king, but that one which was signified and true, of whom all the others were but shadows. Hence it behooved him to be anointed, not typically, but really, for it was necessary that there should be an analogy between the office and the anointing, and, as a matter of consequence, it became necessary that his anointing should not be sacramental, but spiritual, not typical, but real. Christ was then anointed, one, because he was ordained to the office of mediator by the will of his heavenly Father. I am not come of myself, but the Father hath sent me. God hath spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, John 7, verse 28, Hebrews 1, verse 1. 2. Because his human nature was endowed with the gifts of the Holy Spirit without measure, so that he had all the gifts and graces necessary for restoring, ruling, and preserving his church, and for administering the government of the whole world, and directing it to the glory of God, and the salvation of his people. For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. John 3, verse 34. These two parts of the anointing of Christ differ from each other in this manner, 
that the conferring of gifts has respect to the human nature only, whilst his ordination to the office of mediator has respect to both natures. Hence an answer is readily furnished to another objection, which we sometimes hear, God cannot be anointed, Christ is God, therefore he could not be anointed. Answer, we grant the whole, if understood, of that nature, in which Christ is God, that he cannot be anointed. 1. Because it is impossible for us to add anything of justice, wisdom, and power to the Godhead. 2. Because the Holy Spirit, by whom the anointing was effected, is the proper Spirit of Christ, no less than of the Father. Therefore, just as no one can give thee thy Spirit which is in thee, because what thou hast cannot be given to thee, so no one can give the Holy Spirit to God, because he is in him, from him is his proper spirit, and is given to others by him. Objection. But if Christ could not be anointed as to his divinity, he is then prophet, priest, king, and mediator, according to his humanity only, for he is mediator according to that nature only which could be anointed. But it was possible for him to be anointed only as to his humanity, therefore he is mediator according to his humanity only. The minor proposition is proved by the definition of anointing, which is to receive gifts, but he received gifts only as to his human nature, therefore it was in respect to this alone that he was anointed. Answer. We deny what is here affirmed, because the definition which is given of anointing is not sufficiently distinct or full. For anointing does not merely include the reception of the gifts which pertain only to the humanity of Christ, but also an ordination to the office of mediator, which has respect to both natures. Therefore, Although the humanity of Christ alone could receive the Holy Spirit, yet it does not follow that his divinity was excluded from this anointing, in as far as it was a designation to the office of mediator. Or we may present the argument clearer by considering it negatively. Christ is not mediator according to the nature in which he is not anointed. He is not anointed as to his divinity, therefore he is not mediator in respect to his Godhead. Answer. There are here four terms. In the major, the anointing is taken for both parts thereof, or for the whole anointing, for the designation to the office and the bestowment of gifts. In the minor, it is considered only in relation to one part of the anointing. Therefore it follows that Christ was anointed according to each nature, although in a different manner, as has been shown. Hence Christ is prophet, priest, king, and mediator in respect to each nature, which is confirmed in the word of God by these two fundamental rules. 1. The properties of the one nature of the mediator are attributed to the whole person in the concrete according to the communication of properties, but in respect to that nature only, to which they are peculiar, as God is angry, suffered, died, viz. according to his humanity. The man Christ is omnipotent, eternal, everywhere, viz. according to his divinity. 2. The names also of the office of mediator are attributed to the whole person in respect to both natures, yet preserving the properties of each nature, and the differences in the works peculiar to each, because both the divine and human nature, together with the operations thereof, are necessary to the discharge of the office of mediator, so that each may perform that which is proper to it in connection with the other. Irenaeus says, in relation to this subject, that this anointing is to be understood as comprehending the three persons of the Godhead, the Father as the Anointer, the Son as the Anointed, and the Holy Spirit as the Unction or the Anointing. Second, what is the prophetical office of Christ? Having considered what we are to understand by the anointing of Christ, we must now speak briefly of the threefold office, or of the three parts of the office of the Mediator under which Christ was anointed. And in order that we may have a proper understanding of this subject, we must define what the terms prophet, priest, and king signify, which may be gathered from the parts of the office which these persons severally discharged. The word prophet comes from the Greek prophemi, which means to publish things that are to come. In general, a prophet is a person called of God to declare and explain his will to men concerning things present or future, which otherwise would have remained unknown, inasmuch as the truths which he reveals are of such a nature that men, of themselves, could never have attained a knowledge of them. A prophet is either a minister, or the head and chief of the prophets, which is Christ. Of those prophets which were ministerial, some were of the Old and some of the New Testament. Among the latter there were some that were generally, others specially so-called. The prophets of the Old Testament were persons immediately called and sent of God to his people, that they might reprove their errors and sins by threatening punishment upon offenders and inviting men to repentance, that they might declare and expound the true doctrine and worship of God, and preserve it from falsehood and corruption, that they might make known and illustrate the promise of the Messiah, 
the benefits of his kingdom and might foretell events that were to come having the gift of miracles and other sure and divine testimonies so that they could not err in the doctrine which they declared and at the same time sustaining certain relations to the state and performing duties of a civil character a prophet of the new testament specially so called was a person immediately called of god and furnished with the gift of prophecy for the purpose of foreseeing and foretelling things to come such were paul peter agabus etc whoever has the gift of understanding explaining and applying the holy scriptures to the edification of the church and individuals is a prophet generally so called it is in this sense the term is used in one corinthians fourteen verses three four five and twenty nine christ is the greatest and chief prophet and was immediately ordained of god and sent by him from the very commencement of the church in paradise for the purpose of revealing the will of god to the human race instituting the ministry of the word and the sacraments and at length manifesting himself in the flesh and proving by his divine teaching and works that he is the eternal and consubstantial son of the father the author of the doctrine of the gospel giving through it the holy spirit kindling faith in the hearts of men sending apostles and collecting to himself a church from the human family in which he may be obeyed invoked and worshipped the prophetical office of christ is therefore one to reveal god and his whole will to angels and men which could only be made known through the son and by a special revelation he who is in the bosom of the father he hath declared him i speak to the world those things which i have heard of my father john one verse eighteen chapter eight verse twenty six it was also the office of christ to proclaim the law and to keep it free from the errors and corruptions of men two to institute and preserve the ministry of the gospel to raise up and send forth prophets apostles teachers and other ministers of the church to confer on them the gift of prophecy and furnish them with the gifts necessary to their calling and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists etc therefore said the wisdom of god i will send them prophets and apostles etc for i will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist the spirit of christ spoke through the prophets ephesians four verse eleven luke eleven verse forty nine chapter twenty one verse fifteen one peter one verse eleven three it pertains to the prophetical office of christ that he should be efficacious through his ministry in the hearts of those that hear to teach them internally by his spirit to illuminate their minds and move their hearts to faith and obedience by the gospel he shall baptize you with the holy ghost and with fire then opened he their understandings that they might understand the scriptures christ gave himself for the church that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word and they went forth and preached everywhere the lord working with them confirming the word with signs following the lord opened the heart of lydia that she attended unto the things spoken by paul the lord gave testimony unto the word of his grace matthew three verse eleven luke twenty four verse forty five ephesians five verse twenty six mark sixteen verse twenty acts sixteen verse fourteen chapter fourteen verse three to sum up the whole in a few words the prophetical office of christ consists of three parts to reveal the will of the father to institute a ministry and to teach internally or effectually through the ministry these three things christ has performed from the very commencement of the church and will perform even to the end of the world and that by his authority power and efficacy hence christ is called the word not only in respect to the father by whom he was begotten when beholding himself in contemplation and considering the image of himself not vanishing away but subsisting consubstantial and co-eternal with the father himself but also in respect to us because he is the person that spake to the fathers and brought forth the living word or gospel from the bosom of the father hence it is apparent from what has now been said what is the difference between christ and other prophets and why he is called the greatest teacher and prophet and so the chief of all prophets one christ is the son of god and lord of all the other prophets were only men and servants of christ two christ brought forth and uttered the word immediately from the father to men other prophets and apostles are called and sent by christ three the prophetical wisdom of christ is infinite for even according to his humanity he excelled all others in every gift four christ is the fountain of all truth and the author of the ministry other prophets merely proclaim and reveal what they receive from christ hence christ is said to have spoken through the prophets neither does he reveal his doctrine to the prophets alone but to all the godly hence it is said of his fullness have we all received etc john one verse sixteen 
5. Christ preaches effectually through his own external ministry and that of those whom he calls into his service by virtue of the Holy Spirit operating upon the hearts of men. Other prophets are the instruments which Christ employs and are co-workers together with him. 6. The doctrine of Christ is clearer and more complete than that of Moses and all the other prophets. 7. Christ had authority of himself. Others have their authority from Christ. We believe Christ when he speaks on account of himself, but we believe others because Christ speaks in them. Third, what is the priestly or sacerdotal office of Christ? A priest in general is a person appointed of God for the purpose of offering oblations and sacrifices, for interceding and teaching others. We may distinguish between those who serve in the capacity of priests by speaking of them as typical and real. A typical priest is a person ordained of God to offer typical sacrifices, to make intercessions for himself and others, and to teach the people concerning the will of God and the Messiah to come. Such were all the priests of the Old Testament, among whom there was one that was the greatest, usually called the high priest, the others were inferior. It was peculiar to the high priest, one, that he alone entered once every year into the sanctuary or most holy place, and that, with blood which he offered for himself, and the people burning incense and making intercession. Two, he had a more splendid and gorgeous apparel than the others. Three, he was placed over the rest. Four, he offered sacrifice and made intercession for himself and the people. Five, he was to be consulted in matters or questions that were doubtful, weighty, and obscure, and returned to the people the answer which God directed him to give. All the rest were inferior, whose office it was to offer sacrifices, to teach the doctrine of the law and the promises pertaining to the Messiah, and to intercede for themselves and others. Wherefore, although all the priests of the Old Testament were types of Christ, yet the typical character of the high priest was the most notable of them all, because in him there were many things that represented Christ, the true and great high priest of the church. Objection. But if prophets and priests both teach, they do not differ from each other. Answer. They did indeed both teach the people, yet they were variously distinguished. Prophets were raised up immediately by God from any tribe, whilst the priests were immediately ordained from the single tribe of Levi. Prophets taught extraordinarily, whilst the priests had the ordinary ministry. The prophets received their doctrine immediately from God, whilst the priests learned it out of the law. The prophets had divine testimonies, so that they could not err. The priests could err in doctrine, and often did err in their instructions, and were reproved by the prophets. The signified and true priest is Christ, the Son of God, who was immediately ordained by the Father, anointed by the Holy Ghost to this office, that, having assumed human nature, he might reveal the secret will and counsel of God to us, and offer himself a propitiatory sacrifice for us, interceding in our behalf, and applying his sacrifice unto us, having the promise that he is always certainly heard in behalf of all those for whom he intercedes, and obtains for them the remission of sins, and finally, through the ministers of the Word and the Holy Spirit, collects, illuminates, and sanctifies his church. There are, therefore, four principal parts of the priestly office of Christ. One, to teach men, and that in a different manner from all others, who are called to act as priests, for he does not merely speak to the ear by his word, but effectually inclines the heart by his Holy Spirit. 2. To offer himself a sacrifice for the sins of the world. 3. To make continual intercession and prayer for us to the Father, that he may receive us into his favour on account of his intercession and will, and on account of the perpetual efficacy of his sacrifice, and to have the promise of being heard in reference to those things which he asks. 4. To apply his sacrifice unto those for whom he intercedes, which is to receive into favour those that believe, and to bring it to pass that the Father may receive them, and that faith may be wrought in their hearts, by which the merits of Christ may be made over to them, so that they are regenerated by the Holy Spirit unto everlasting life. From what has now been said we may easily perceive the difference between Christ and other priests. One, the latter teach only with the external voice. Christ teaches also by the inward and efficacious working of the Holy Spirit. Two, other priests do not make continual intercession, nor do they always obtain those things for which they pray. Three, they do not apply their own benefits to others. Four, they do not offer themselves a sacrifice for others, all of which things belong to Christ alone. Fourth, what is the kingdom or regal office of Christ? 
A king is a person ordained of God, that he may rule over a certain people according to just laws, that he may have the power to reward the good and punish the evil, and that he may defend his subjects, not having any one superior or above him. The king of kings is Christ, who was immediately ordained of God, that he might govern by his word and spirit the church which he purchased with his own blood, and defend her against all her enemies, whom he will cast into everlasting punishment, whilst he will reward his people with eternal life. The kingly office of Christ is therefore one to rule the church by his word and spirit, which he does in such a manner that he does not only show us what he would have accomplished in us, but also so inclines and affects the heart by his spirit, that we are led to do the same. Two, he preserves and defends us against our enemies, both external and internal, which he does by protecting us by his almighty power, arming us against our foes, that we may by his spirit be furnished with every weapon necessary for resisting and overcoming them. 3. To bestow upon his church gifts and glory, and finally to liberate her from all evils, to control and overcome all his enemies by his power, and at length, having fully subdued them, to cast them into inconceivable misery and wretchedness. Question 32. But why art thou called a Christian? Answer. Because I am a member of Christ by faith, and thus am partaker of his anointing, that so I may confess his name and present myself a living sacrifice of thankfulness to him, and also that with a free and good conscience I may fight against sin and Satan in this life and afterwards reign with him eternally over all creatures. Exposition. In this question we are to consider the dignity and communion of Christians with Christ their head, together with the offices which they sustain as members of Christ. The name Christian was first given to the disciples of Christ at Antioch in the time of the Apostles, Prior to this they were called brethren and disciples. The name Christian is derived from Christ, and denotes one who is a disciple of Christ, one who follows his doctrine and life, and who, being engrafted into Christ, has communion with him. There are two kinds of Christians, some that are only apparently such, and others that are really and truly such. Those who are Christians merely in appearance are those who have been baptized, and who are in the company of those who are called and profess the Christian faith, but are without conversion being nothing more than hypocrites and dissemblers, of whom it is said, Many are called, but few are chosen. Not every one that saith, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, etc. Matthew 20, verse 16, chapter 7, verse 22. Those are true Christians who are not only baptized and profess the doctrine of Christ, but who are also possessed of a true faith and declare this by the fruits of repentance, or they are those who are members of Christ by a true faith and are made partakers of his anointing. All true Christians are such also in appearance, because it is said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good work, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Show me thy faith by thy works. Matthew 5, verse 16, James 2, verse 18. But it is not true, on the other hand, that all who are apparently Christians are also such in reality, because it will be said of many, I never knew you. Matthew 7, verse 23. We are here to speak only of such as are true Christians, and we must inquire, why are we called Christians, that is, anointed? The reasons of this are two, because we are members of Christ by faith, and are made partakers of his anointing, that is, we are called Christians, because we have communicated unto us the person, office, and dignity of Christ. To be a member of Christ is to be engrafted into him, and to be united to him by the same Holy Spirit dwelling in him and in us and by this Spirit to be made a possessor of such righteousness and life as is in Christ, and to be made acceptable to God on account of the righteousness of Christ imputed unto us by faith, inasmuch as this righteousness is imperfect in this life. Of this our communion with Christ, the following passages of Scripture speak. We, being many, are one body in Christ. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? He that is joined to the Lord is one Spirit, we may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Romans 12, verse 5, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 15, chapter 12, verse 12, Ephesians 4, verse 15. The relation which holds between the head and the members of the same body is a most fit and striking illustration of the close and indissoluble union between Christ and us. For first, just as the members of the body have one and the same head, by means of which they are joined together by sinews and fleshy ligaments, and from which life and motion are communicated through the whole body, and just as all the outward and inward senses are seated in the head, from which the whole body and every single member draws its proper life, and as from the head alone life is communicated to every member, and not from one member to another, 
so long as they remained joined with the head and with each other, so Christ as the living head from whom the Holy Spirit is made to pass over into every member, and not from one member to another, from whom all the members are made to draw their life, and by whom they are ruled as long as they remain united to him by the Spirit dwelling in him and us, and that through faith by which we become the members of Christ, for it is through faith that we receive the Spirit through whom this union is effected, but the members are united with each other and among themselves by mutual love which cannot be wanting if we are joined to the head. For the connection of the head with the body is the cause of the union which exists among the members themselves. Secondly, just as in the human body there are various gifts, and as the members perform different offices, and yet but one life animates and moves them all, so in the church which is but one body there are various gifts and offices, and only one spirit, by whose benefit and help each individual member performs his appropriate office. Thirdly, just as the head is placed highest, and is therefore deserving of the greatest honour, and is the fountain of all life, so Christ has the highest place in the church, because in him the Spirit is without measure, and from his fullness we receive all the good gifts which we enjoy. But in Christians, who are the members of Christ, there is only a certain measure of gifts, which is made over to them, from Christ their only head, Wherefore it is plain that the Pope of Rome lies when he declares himself to be the head of the Church. Christ is our head in three respects. One, in respect to the perfection of his person, because he is God and man, excelling all creatures in gifts, even as far as his human nature is concerned. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him. Colossians 2 verse 9. He alone gives the Holy Ghost, as it is said, He it is that shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Matthew 3, verse 11. 2. In the dignity and order, glory and majesty, with which he declares himself to be king, lord, and heir of all things. For just as God created all things through him, so he has made him heir of all things and the ruler of his house. 3. In respect to his office, he is the redeemer and sanctifier of the church, is present with every member thereof, rules, governs, quickens, nourishes, and confirms them, so that they remain united to him and the rest of the members, just as the head governs and animates the whole body. We are also members of Christ in three respects. One, because by faith and the Holy Spirit we are joined to him, and also united among ourselves, just as the members are connected with the head and with each other. The joining together of the members of Christ with each other and among themselves is no less necessary for the safety of the church than the conjunction of the whole body with Christ the head. For if you separate the hand from the arm, you thereby separate it also from the body, so that it can no longer have any life. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Ephesians 3 verse 17. 2. Because we are quickened and governed by Christ and draw from him as the fountain all good things, so that unless we continue in him we have no life in us, as the members cut off from the body can retain no life in themselves. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. John 15 verse 6. 3. Because, as in the body there are different powers and functions belonging to the members, so there are different gifts and offices pertaining to the members of the Church of Christ, and as all the actions of the different parts of the body contribute to its preservation, so all the members of Christ ought to refer whatever they do to the preservation and benefit of the Church, which is the body of Christ. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Romans 12, verse 4, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7. Having now explained what it is to be a member of Christ, and in what manner we are his members, it will be more clearly seen what it is to be a partaker of the anointing of Christ. Anointing signifies a communion of the gifts and office of Christ, or it is a participation in all the gifts of Christ, and consists in the participation of his kingly, sacerdotal, and prophetical office. To be a partaker of the anointing of Christ is therefore one, to be a partaker of the Holy Ghost and of his gifts, for the Spirit of Christ is not idle or inactive in us, but works the same in us that he does in Christ, unless that Christ alone has more gifts than all of us, and these also in a greater or higher degree. 2. That Christ communicates his prophetical, sacerdotal, and kingly office unto us. The prophetical dignity, which is in Christians, is an understanding, acknowledgment, and confession of the true doctrine of God necessary for our salvation. 
or our prophetical office is one rightly to know god and his will two that every one in his place and degree profess the same being correctly understood faithfully boldly and constantly that god may thereby be celebrated and his truth revealed in its living force and power whosoever shall confess me before men him will i also confess before my father which is in heaven matthew ten verse thirty two the office of a priest is to teach to intercede and to offer sacrifice our priesthood therefore is one to teach others that is to show and communicate to them the knowledge of the true god when thou art converted strengthen thy brethren luke twenty two verse thirty two two to call upon god having a correct knowledge of him three to render proper gratitude worship and obedience to god or to offer sacrifices of thanksgiving pleasing and acceptable unto god being sanctified by the sacrifice of christ which includes one that we offer ourselves by mortifying our old man and giving our members as instruments of righteousness unto god two our prayers let us offer the sacrifice of praise to god continually that is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name hebrews thirteen verse fifteen three our alms thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before god acts ten verse four four confession of the gospel ministering the gospel of god that the offering up of the gentiles might be acceptable romans fifteen verse sixteen five cheerful and patient endurance of the cross and all the various calamities which god sends upon us yea and if i be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith i joy and rejoice with you all for i am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand philippians two verse seventeen two timothy four verse six furthermore christ communicates his priestly office unto us one by accomplishing and bringing it to pass that we offer the above-named sacrifices of thanksgiving two by causing them to be acceptable and pleasing to god the sacrifice of christ therefore differs from ours in the same way in which it differs from the sacrifices of the priests of old one christ offered up a sacrifice of thanksgiving and propitiation at the same time we offer only sacrifices of thanksgiving the priests of old also offered up sacrifices of thanksgiving because these belong to the whole church even from the beginning to the end of the world the sacrifices moreover which they offered were only typical which is no longer the case since all types and shadows have been done away with by christ who offered not a typical sacrifice but one that was real the one which was signified by all the sacrifices of the old testament and this he did because he was not a typical priest but the true and great high priest of the church to whom all the others looked two the sacrifice of christ was perfect ours is imperfect and defiled with many sins three the sacrifice of christ is meritorious in itself and avails before god on account of itself our sacrifices mean nothing and are pleasing to god only for the sake of the sacrifice of christ the kingly office of christians is one to oppose and overcome through faith the devil the world and all enemies two having subdued all our enemies to obtain at length through the same faith eternal life and glory come ye blessed of my father inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world matthew twenty five verse thirty four we are therefore kings one because we are lords over all creatures in christ for says the apostle all things are yours one corinthians three verse twenty one two because we conquer all our enemies through faith in christ who giveth us the victory this is the victory that overcometh the world even our faith one corinthians fifteen verse fifty seven one john five verse four the kingship of christ however differs from that of christians in this one the kingdom of christ is hereditary for he is the natural son of god whilst we are the sons of god by adoption but christ as a son over his own house god hath spoken unto us by christ whom he hath appointed heir of all things hebrews three verse six chapter one verse two two he alone is king over all creatures and especially over the church but we are kings and lords not of angels and the church but only of other creatures heaven earth and therefore all things shall serve us for we shall be crowned with glory majesty and the greatest excellency of gifts so that we shall condemn devils and wicked men by cheerfully submitting and yielding to the judgment of god in passing sentence of condemnation upon them hence we are kings not over the church but over all remaining creatures but christ rules with full right not only over the whole church but also over all creatures ye shall sit upon twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of israel do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world matthew nineteen verse twenty eight one corinthians six verse two 
three christ conquers his enemies by his own power but we overcome our foes in and through him by his grace and assistance be of good comfort i have overcome the world john sixteen verse thirty three four christ rules the world by the sceptre of his word and spirit swaying our hearts and restoring in us his image which was lost this is peculiar to christ alone for we are unable to give the holy spirit being nothing more than ministers and administrators of the outward word and rites as john the baptist said i indeed baptize you with water unto repentance but he that cometh after me is mightier than i and shall baptize you with the holy ghost and with fire who then is paul and who is apollos but ministers by whom ye believed even as the lord gave to every man matthew three verse eleven one corinthians three verse five the use and importance of this doctrine is great one for our consolation because we are through faith engrafted into christ as members to the head that we may be continually sustained governed and quickened by him and because he makes us prophets priests and kings unto god and his father by making us partakers of his anointing this is truly an unspeakable dignity conferred upon christians two for admonition and exhortation for since we are all prophets and teachers of god we ought continually to celebrate and praise him since we are priests we ought to offer ourselves wholly to god as living sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving and since we are kings it becomes us to fight manfully against sin the world and the devil that we may reign with christ section twenty three of the only begotten son of god thirteenth lord's day question thirty three why is christ called the only begotten son of god since we also are the children of god answer because christ alone is the eternal and natural son of god but we are children adopted of god by grace for his sake exposition the deity of the son of god is taught in this question and it is now proper for us to consider it more fully but here an objection arises out of the manner in which the above question is framed which it may be well to notice he who is the only begotten son has no brethren but christ has brethren for we also are the sons of god therefore he is not the only begotten son of god to this we reply by making a distinction as to the manner in which christ and we are the sons of god for there is a difference in this respect which it is well for us to keep in view whilst treating this subject christ is the only begotten the natural proper and eternal son of god but we are the sons of god adopted of the father by grace for the sake of christ that these things may be manifest we must explain in a few words who are called sons and in how many ways this title is used then consider who are and who are called the sons of god they are and are called sons who are either born sons or are adopted as such they are born sons who begin at one and the same time both to be and to be sons these are either sons born from parents or through grace sons born from parents are properly called natural sons to whom the essence and nature of their parents is communicated and that either wholly or in part now the essence and nature of our parents of whom we were born is communicated to us in part but the divine essence is communicated from the father to christ wholly according to his divinity as we are therefore the natural sons of our parents so christ is according to his divine nature the natural and only son of god of the same essence and nature with the father out of whose substance he was begotten from everlasting in a manner altogether beyond our comprehension as the father hath life in himself so also hath he given to the son to have life in himself john five verse twenty six the father has therefore communicated to him the life by which he himself lives by himself and by which he quickens all creatures which life is that one and eternal deity by whom all things are they are sons by grace who at one and the same time began to be and to be the sons of god that they are sons results either from the grace of creation or from the grace of conception by the holy ghost and union with the word the angels and adam before the fall are sons of god by the grace of creation because god created them that he might have them for sons and that they on the other hand might acknowledge and praise him as their gracious father these are indeed improperly called sons born by grace but yet they are such in as far as they began at one and the same time to exist and to be sons christ alone according to his human nature is the son of god by the grace of conception by the holy ghost and of union with the word because according to this he was the son of god by grace even from the very moment in which he began to be man and to be born and that because by virtue of the holy ghost he alone was from the substance of the virgin 
pure from all stain or corruption, and was personally united with the word. They are adopted sons, who do not begin at one and the same time to be and to be sons, but who were already before they were adopted, or who had an existence before their adoption as sons. They have been made sons by law and the will of him who has adopted them, and given them the right and title of sons, so that they occupy the same place as if they were natural sons. So Adam, after his fall, and all those who are regenerated, are the adopted sons of God, received into favour with him on account of his natural son, Jesus Christ. And all these were the children of wrath before they were adopted into the family and church of Christ. From what has now been said, it is plain, as well how we are the sons of God, which is by adoption, as how Christ, as the only begotten Son of God, viz. in two ways, first according to his divinity, because as touching this he was begotten from everlasting, from the substance of the Father, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, John 1 verse 14, and secondly according to his humanity in some sort, because even in relation to this he was born after such a manner as no one else ever was, from a pure and chaste virgin by the power of the Holy Ghost. Christ is also called the first begotten, one according to his divinity in respect both to time and dignity, two according to his humanity in respect to dignity alone, and that on account of the miraculous and peculiar manner of his conception, and on account of the gifts by which he excels all others, angels and men. It was the right of the first begotten to have a double portion of the inheritance, whilst each of the rest had only a single portion. The reason of this was on account of the office which he, as the first begotten, filled, for he was placed over the rest and ruled them. Christ is the firstborn of every creature, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Colossians 1, verses 15 and 18. Christ is also called God's own Son, because he was begotten and not adopted, who spared not his own Son. Romans 8, verse 32. There are also forms of speech, which it becomes us to observe carefully in speaking of the affiliation of Christ and us. Christ is called the natural Son of God according to his divinity, because he was begotten from everlasting from the Father. But according to his humanity he is not so called, but is called the Son of God by grace, and that not the grace of adoption, but of conception by the Holy Ghost, and of union with the Word. The reason why Christ is not according to his humanity the natural Son of God is because he is not begotten from the essence of the Father according to his humanity. And the reason why he is not the adopted Son of God in respect to his humanity is because he was not made a son of no son, but because in the very moment in which he began to be, he began also to be a son. Angels are called the natural sons of God, but it is by the grace of creation, as man also was before his fall. Those who are regenerated in this life are called the sons of God, not by the grace of creation, but of adoption. Grace, therefore, in respect to adoption, is as the general to the particular, for there are three or four degrees, or, as it were, species of grace, viz. that of creation, of conception by the Holy Ghost, of union with the Word, and of adoption, as appears from what we have said. A table of the sons of God. The sons of God are, one, born, one, of parents who are properly called natural sons, to whom is communicated the essence of their parents, one, holy, as the divine essence of the Father is wholly communicated to Christ according to his divinity, two, in part, as the essence of our parents is communicated to us only in part, two, born of God through the grace, one, of creation, as angels, Adam before the fall, two, of conception by the Holy Ghost and union with the Word, as Christ according to his human nature. The sons of God are two, adopted, one, of God, as Adam after the fall, as all the regenerate, two, of men, etc. Another table of those who are the sons of God. Of the sons of God, one, one is natural, viz. the word of the Eternal Father, two, all others are by the grace, one, of creation, as angels and Adam before the fall, two, of conception by the Holy Ghost, and of union with the word, as Christ according to his human nature, three, of adoption, as Adam after the fall, and all the regenerate. From these remarks and the distinction we have made between those who are the children of God, the answer to the above-named objection is apparent. He who has brethren is not the only begotten. Christ has brethren, therefore he is not the only begotten. 
In answering this objection, the major must be more clearly distinguished. He that has brethren, that is, of the same generation and nature, is not the only begotten, but those who sustain the relation of brethren to Christ are not of the same generation and nature, for they are not begotten of the substance of the Father, but are only adopted of him by grace. How then, it may be asked, are we the brethren of Christ? We reply that our brotherhood or fraternity with Christ consists in these four things— one, in the similitude and likeness of human nature, and because we are born from Adam, the common father of all. Two, in his fraternal love towards us. Three, in our conformity with Christ, which consists in perfect righteousness and blessedness. Four, in the consummation of his benefits. Objection two, he who has a generation unlike that of other sons is said in respect thereof to be the only begotten. Christ, according to his humanity, has a generation different from that of other sons, because he alone was conceived by the Holy Ghost and born of a virgin. Therefore Christ is called the only begotten according to his humanity, in respect to this generation from the virgin, and not on account of his eternal generation from the Father, according to his divinity. Answer. The major is true only of him who has a generation different from the whole race, that is, both in nature and in the mode of generation. But Christ, according to his humanity, has a generation different from us, not according to his nature, but only according to the mode of his generation. For according to his humanity he is consubstantial with us, having a human nature the same with ours in kind. The difference is only as to the miraculous manner in which he was conceived and born of the Virgin. Therefore, although he is the only begotten in respect to this generation, yet in Scripture and in the Creed he is called the only begotten Son of God, not according to his human, but according to his divine nature. Now, according to his human nature, Christ has brethren, but according to his divine nature he has no brethren, because he was begotten from everlasting, from the essence of the Father. Of no one else is it said that the Father hath given to him to have life in himself, and that in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Therefore he is expressly called the only begotten of the Father, and not of his mother. The phrase only begotten properly respects his nature and essence, and not his miraculous conception, and it signifies one that is begotten alone, and not one that is begotten in an extraordinary manner. Objection. Every son is either natural or adopted. Christ, according to his humanity, is not the natural Son of God, therefore he is adopted. Answer. The major of this syllogism is not sufficiently specific and clear, for there are sons of God by grace, as the angels, who are not sons by adoption, as we have already shown. Hence we are now, in view of what has been said, led to ask what is meant by this article, I believe in Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. It means, one, that I believe that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God, that is, the natural and proper Son, not having any brethren, begotten of the substance of the Father from everlasting, very God of very God. But this is not enough, for even the devils believe this and tremble. Therefore this is to be added. 2. I believe that he is the only begotten Son of God for me and my salvation in particular. Or I believe that he is the Son of God, that he may make me a son by adoption, and communicate to me and all the elect the right and dignity of the sons of God. As it is said, we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. John 1, verses 14 and 12, Matthew 3, verse 17, Ephesians 1, verse 6. Section 24 of the Divinity of Christ The doctrine concerning the only begotten Son of God is the foundation of our salvation, and has been variously corrupted and opposed by heretics in different periods of the Church, it is important, therefore, that we should here more fully explain and establish this doctrine. There are four things which are especially to be considered in relation to the divinity of Christ, the Son of God. First, whether Christ, beside his soul and body, is and has been a subsistent or person. Second, whether he is a person distinct from the Father and the Holy Ghost. Third, whether he be equal with the Father and the Holy Ghost. Fourth, whether he be consubstantial, that is, of one and the same substance with both. There are, therefore, just as many principal propositions to be demonstrated against different heretics. One, that Christ, born of the Virgin, besides his soul and body, is a person. Two, that he is a person distinct from the Father and the Holy Ghost. Three, that he is equal to both. 
for that he is of one and the same essence or consubstantial. There are two ways of collecting arguments out of the scriptures in favor of the divinity of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. The one is when the arguments are gathered according to the order of the books of the Bible. This is the most laborious and lengthy method. The other, which is the shortest and easiest mode to follow, because it assists the memory, and therefore the one which we shall follow, is, according to certain classes or sorts of arguments, under which those testimonies of Scripture that properly belong to them are arranged. First, the Son of God, the Word, is and has been a subsistent or person before and beside the flesh which he assumed. This proposition is to be proven against ancient and modern heretics as Ebion, Corinthus, Samosatinus, Photinus, Servetus, and others. The different classes of arguments by which we prove the hypostasis, or personal existence of the Word, before and besides the flesh which he assumed, may be reduced to eight or nine. 1. To the first class belong those passages of Scripture which expressly teach and distinguish two natures in Christ, and which affirm of the Word that he was made man, was manifested in the flesh, assumed our nature, etc., as the Word was made of flesh, he took of him the seed of Abraham. God was manifested in the flesh, every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. To this end was I born, and for this came I into the world. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. Before Abraham was, I am. John 1 verse 14, Hebrews 2 verse 16, 1 Timothy 3 verse 16, 1 John 4 verse 3, John 3 verse 13, chapter 18 verse 37, Hebrews 2 verse 14, John 8 verse 58. There is therefore one nature, which appeared in the flesh, assumed our nature, descended from heaven, and came into the world, was made a partaker of flesh and blood, and was before Abraham. And there is also another nature which was assumed, in which he came, and in which he appeared, for assuming and being assumed are not the same. Therefore, inasmuch as the word assumed human nature, he must of necessity be different from it, and must have had an existence before that which he took upon him, and into which he was not changed, but has a subsistence or hypostasis different and distinct from the flesh which he assumed. The argument is after this sort. He that assumes is before that which is assumed. The word or son is said to have taken upon him our nature, and to have been made flesh. Therefore he was before that which he assumed. All those testimonies of the word of God which distinguish the word who assumed our nature from that which he took upon himself are here in point. Concerning his Son, Jesus Christ, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, but declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness, of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed for evermore. Christ was put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Romans 1 verse 3 and 4, chapter 9 verse 5, 1 Peter 3 verse 18. Therefore there is something in Christ which is not of the seed of David and of the fathers, which was not put to death. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. John 2 verse 19. Therefore there is in Christ one nature which is destroyed, and another which raises up that which is destroyed, viz. the Word, who is called by John the only begotten Son. John 1 verse 18. Objection 1. The Word, by which is meant this preacher Jesus, was made flesh, that is, a mortal man. Answer, this is a bold and manifest corruption of the meaning of God's word. The word is said to have been God before he assumed our flesh. Through him all things were made. To have come to his own, to enlighten every man that cometh into the world, was made flesh, and has imparted of his fullness to us all. Therefore this word was before all men. He was even before Adam himself, whilst Abraham and Moses were illuminated by him, and received out of his fullness. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. Christ went by the Spirit in the days of Noah, and preached to the spirits that are in prison, which were disobedient in times past. John 6, verse 51, 1 Peter 3, verse 19. But the human nature of this preacher Jesus did not descend from heaven, and was not in the times of Noah. Objection 2. Christ, man, is called God in the New Testament. Therefore those who affirm that there is an invisible nature in this man corrupt the scripture, because when I affirm that thou art a scholar, I do not mean that a scholar is in thee. Answer. 
Christ is called by the Apostle the Son of God according to the Spirit. The Scriptures declare this man to be God, and that in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Christ says of himself, Destroy this body. And the author of the Epistle to the Hebrews makes mention of the tabernacle of the human nature, and calls his flesh a veil, viz. of his divinity. He suffered in the flesh. The Word was made flesh, and came unto his own. 1 Peter 4, verse 1, John 1, verses 14 and 11. Therefore, there must needs be another nature in the flesh. 2. The Scriptures expressly attribute opposite properties to Christ, which cannot be found in any one at the same time. They also attribute to him a finite and an infinite nature. Before Abraham was, I am. John 8, verse 58. Therefore, there is a necessity that this should be understood of different natures by the communication of properties, for Christ is never described as being such a God as is made, or as is efficacious in the hearts of men on account of his excellent gifts. 2. To the second division of arguments are to be referred those declarations of Scripture in which Christ is called the proper Son of God, because he is not adopted, but begotten from the substance of the Father, who spared not his own Son, Romans 8, verse 38. The Jews exclaimed against Christ in the presence of Pilate that he made himself the Son of God, viz. the proper and natural Son, otherwise they themselves would have been guilty of the blasphemy of which they accused Christ, since they acknowledged themselves the sons of God. And this is explained more clearly in another place, where the Jews are said to have desired to kill Christ, because he said that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. That is, his proper and peculiar Father, which is inferred from this, that he claimed for himself that power of working, which is peculiar to God. John 5, verse 18. Therefore we conclude from the words of the Jews that Christ called himself the proper and natural Son of God, having the right of a son by nature, which others obtain by grace through him, because if Christ had only called himself the Son of God either by adoption or by grace, the Jews could not have charged him with blasphemy, for so they would have passed sentence upon themselves as blasphemers, since they boasted that they were also the children of God. And further, if this had been a calumny on the part of the Jews, Christ would certainly have refuted it, or at least repelled it as far as he himself was concerned. But instead of this he admitted what they said, and showed by solid reasons that he was truly what he professed to be. Christ is therefore the proper Son of God, and there is necessarily another nature in him besides that which he assumed, according to which he is the proper Son of God. Objections of Servetus 1. Christ is called the proper Son of God because he was made by God, just as the Church is called the peculiar people of God. Answer. This is a corruption, for the Apostle, in the passage before cited, opposes the proper Son of God to us and to angels, who are not the proper sons of God. For the angels are the sons of God by the grace of creation, and we by that of adoption. But Christ alone is the proper and natural Son of God, because he was begotten from the substance of the Father. Objection 2. But it is nowhere said in the Scriptures that Christ is the natural Son of God. Therefore it is nothing more than an invention of men. Answer. It is true indeed that it is nowhere said in the Bible that Christ is the natural Son of God, but there are expressions used of a similar and equivalent signification, such as God's own Son, the only begotten Son, etc. And then the same conclusion is necessarily arrived at, as we have already shown, by the argument of the Apostle to the Romans, and that of the Jews in John. Objection 3. The Word was indeed always in God, but not the Son. Christ was called the Son in respect to his future filiation or sonship in the flesh which he assumed. Therefore he is not the natural Son of God. Answer 1. Nay, he was not thus called the Son of God, for his humanity did not proceed from the substance of the Father. 2. The Word is called such a Son as he to whom the Father gave to have life in himself, 3. There would not, according to the above objection, have been a personal distinction between the Father and the Son, because the Word, according to Servetus, was no hypostasis or person. Therefore the Father would have been without the Son, or would have been the same with the Son as Sibelius erroneously taught. 3. This class of arguments comprises those declarations of Scripture in which Christ is called the only begotten Son of God. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, etc. John 1, verse 14, chapter 3, verse 16. Now Christ is called the only begotten Son because he has no brethren, but according to his human nature he has brethren, as it is said, 
that it behooved him in all things to be made like unto his brethren, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Hebrews 2, verse 17 and 11. Therefore there is in Christ another nature, according to which he is the only begotten Son of the Father, and in relation to which he has no brethren. Objection. Christ is called the only begotten, because the man, Jesus, is the only one born of the Virgin by the Holy Ghost. Answer. This is a false interpretation of the language of Scripture. For one, he alone is the only begotten, who is from the substance of the Father. Two, because the generation of the Word from the Father, and that of Christ from the Virgin, are often distinguished in the Scriptures, as it is said of wisdom in Proverbs 8, verse 25, before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth, or, as it is otherwise rendered, begotten. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. And in Matthew we read that Jesus, who is called Christ, was born of the Virgin Mary. 3. The only begotten is opposed to angels and men, because Christ is the Son, not by the grace of adoption, as is true of men, nor by that of creation, as is true of angels, but by nature. Here, however, it is objected on the part of some that when it is said, We beheld his glory, it means the glory of the man Jesus, but this is an incorrect reference, because there is no antecedent to which we can properly refer the person spoken of, but the word. The words which precede are to be carefully noticed. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, that is, the glory of the word. If, therefore, the word is called and is the only begotten, then certainly only begotten in this passage does not signify generation from Mary, but from the Father, from everlasting. 4. To this division belong all those testimonies of Scripture in which the title Son of God is ascribed to Christ, as to his divine nature, even before he was made flesh, as who hath established all the ends of the earth, what is his name, and what is his Son's name? God hath spoken unto us by his Son, by whom also he made the world. God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world. Proverbs 30, verse 4, Hebrews 1, verse 2, John 3, verse 17. The Father sent his Son into the world, but human nature is born into the world, therefore the Son was before he was sent into the world. To this class of arguments we must also refer all those portions of Scripture which attribute divine works to the Son before his assumption of humanity, as by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth. My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. What things soever the Father doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. Colossians 1, verse 16, John 5, verses 17 and 19. But the humanity of Christ does not accomplish whatever the Father does, nor does it effect anything in the same manner in which the Father does, even now since it has been assumed, much less from the beginning. Therefore, according to this, the Son did all things from the beginning according to his divine nature, which is something different from the flesh which he assumed. No man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. If the Son now revealed God the Father to those who lived before he assumed our nature, he must have existed previously. Those testimonies, moreover, which expressly attribute to Christ the name of God according to his divine nature, are here in place. These are to be diligently collected, because the enemies of the divinity of Christ strongly insist that the name of God is only attributed to him in respect to his human nature. The word was God. God was manifested in the flesh. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Therefore there is in Christ a nature which was called the Son of God, even before he was made flesh. Hence heretics cannot say that Christ is only now called the Son of God, since his miraculous conception by the Holy Ghost. 5. Under this class of arguments we shall comprise those passages of Scripture which speak of the Word. The Word, concerning which John speaks, was a person apart from and before the assumption of humanity. The Son is the Word. Therefore the Son is a person apart from and before the flesh assumed. All the different parts of the description of the Word in the first chapter of the Gospel of John combine to establish the truth of the major of the above syllogism. Thus it is said that he was in the beginning of the world and was truly God, that through him all creatures were made, that he was the author of all life and light in men, that he was in the world from the beginning, even when he was not known and acknowledged, etc. Now all these things, which are proper only of some one that is subsistent, living, intelligent, and operating, being ascribed to the word, 
must clearly prove that he was a person, and that before the man Jesus was born of the virgin. The minor is proven from John 1 verse 14, we beheld his glory, viz. that of the incarnate word, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Likewise, he who is called the Word is in the same chapter called the only begotten Son, existing in the bosom of the Father. And again, John says that it was through the Word, and Paul says that it was through the Son that God created all things. Therefore, he who is called the Word and the Son of God is a person which has existed before Jesus was born, and now dwells personally in the human nature which he assumed. 6. Under this head we shall consider those declarations of holy writ which testify of Christ that he is the wisdom of God. The argument is this, the wisdom of God, through which all things were made, is eternal. The Son is that wisdom, therefore the Son is eternal, and by consequence existed before the assumption of humanity. The major is proven from what is said of wisdom in Proverbs 8 verse 22, The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his ways, before his works of old. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. The minor is thus proven. 1. Wisdom, in the passage just cited, is said to have been begotten. But to be begotten, when this is spoken of an intelligent nature, is nothing else than to be a son. 2. Christ calls himself the wisdom of God. Therefore also said, The wisdom of God, I will send them prophets, etc. Luke 11, verse 49. 3. Paul also calls Christ the wisdom of God. We preach Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 24. 4. The same things are ascribed by Solomon to wisdom, which the scriptures in other places attribute with peculiar efficacy to the Son, and which are more largely treated of in the book of wisdom. Therefore wisdom is the Son of God. 7. To this class belong those testimonies of Scripture concerning the office of the Mediator, which is to collect and to preserve the whole Church by his merit and efficacy. That the Church might be fully redeemed, it was necessary that there should be a Mediator, on account of whom, and through whom, it might be gathered and defended. This Mediator is neither the Father nor the Holy Ghost. Therefore Christ is the Mediator of the whole Church, existing already from the beginning of the world. The church of old was received into favour on account of Christ who was to come, but this could not have been had he not existed, for no merit or efficacy can be from one who is not. Wherefore it is clearly evident that Christ had an existence before his incarnation, for it is not possible that there could have been friendship between God and men without a mediator already existing. And hence, as there was a state of reconciliation between God and the faithful under the Old Testament, there must have been some mediator of the church. The scriptures now teach that there is only one mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Therefore Christ must have existed before his appearance in the flesh. The same thing may be inferred from the office of the mediator, which is not only to appease the Father by intercession and sacrifice, but also to confer upon the faithful all those good things which he has obtained by his power and efficacy, to make known the will of God to men, to institute a ministry, to collect and preserve the church, and that holy. No man knoweth the Father but the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Therefore neither Adam nor any of the faithful of old knew God except through the Son. Consequently the Son must then have existed. Those testimonies of Scripture which speak of the efficacy of Christ are to be referred to this division, as well as those which speak of his merit. Thus it is said, He hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone. Ephesians 1, verse 22, chapter 2, verse 20. Christ is therefore the foundation, the head, the upholder, and governor of the church, and hence existed before the church was. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. I give unto them eternal life. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. He was that true light which lighteneth every man that cometh into the world. For through him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. He gave some apostles, some prophets, and some pastors and teachers. John 14, verse 6, chapter 10, verse 28, chapter 1, verses 4 and 9, Ephesians 2, verse 18, chapter 4, verse 11. The apostle Peter says that the Spirit of Christ was in the prophets, foretelling the sufferings that should come unto Christ. Therefore Christ revealed the will of God, instituted the ministry, established and governs the church, and inasmuch as he has done all this from the very beginning of the church, it is not to be doubted, but that he has always existed. 
and this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing. John 6, verse 39. Therefore he preserves the church, and so has always been, because the church has always been preserved. There is a remarkable testimony in the prophecy of Malachi, chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord, whom ye seek, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. This is spoken by Christ himself through the prophet, and is confirmed by this argument. He for whom a way is prepared is Christ, and he who promises is the one for whom the way is prepared. Therefore, he who promises is Christ. The major is plain, for not the father but Christ was expected, and it was he that came after John the Baptist. The minor is proven from the text. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. Therefore Christ was, before he assumed our nature, because he sent his messenger, John, and was very God before he was manifested in the flesh, for he calls it his temple, to which he says he was about to come. No one but God has a temple built for his worship, therefore it is blasphemy to say that Christ did not exist before he assumed flesh. Nor is it to be objected, because he speaks in the third person, saying the Lord will come to his temple, for he clearly shows that it is the Son who is meant by that Lord, I, the Lord, who sent John before me, and who am also the messenger of the covenant. Hence it is possible that the prophet changes the person speaking, and represents the father speaking in regard to sending his son. 8. This class of arguments contains the testimonies in relation to the angel who appeared to the fathers under the Old Testament as the messenger of God. The angel which redeemed me from all evil, blessed the lads, etc. Genesis 48 verse 16. This angel of the Lord, of whose appearance we have many instances recorded in the Old Testament, the Church has always confessed to be the Son of God, and that for three reasons. One, because the whole Scriptures teach that the Son of God is the messenger of the Father to the Church, and that he performs the office of mediator. The Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is for ever and ever, etc., Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Malachi 3, verse 1, Hebrews 1, verse 8, chapter 13, verse 8. 2. Because what is said by Moses concerning this angel is said concerning Christ by Paul, that he was tempted in the desert by the Israelites. From these and similar things we may present the argument thus. The angel, or messenger of the Father, was before the Incarnation. That angel was neither the Father nor the Holy Ghost, but the Son, because the Son alone is the messenger of the Father, and the Mediator, therefore the Son was a person subsisting before he took upon him our nature. 9. In this last division are comprehended all those places in the Scripture in which Christ is expressly called the true God, by name and properties, of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all God, blessed for ever. This is the true God and eternal life. Romans 9, verse 5, 1 John 5, verse 20. Here the man Jesus Christ is expressly called the true God. If therefore he is the true God, he has always existed, for the one true God is from everlasting. God was manifested in the flesh. Here Christ is without doubt called God. To this class of arguments also properly belong all those testimonies which attribute to Christ the work of creation, miracles, redemption, regeneration, protection, glorification, and also the government of the whole world, for which infinite wisdom, power, knowledge, and omnipresence are necessary, of which we have already at different times furnished quite a number of proofs. From these it is evident that not only the name, but also the properties of the true God are attributed to the man Christ, the latter of which furnish the strongest proofs of his proper divinity. For, whilst the titles of the true God which are attributed to Christ may, after a certain manner, be expounded metaphorically, the divine properties cannot be so rested as to lose their proper weight. And if we fortify ourselves with arguments of this kind, our adversaries cannot stand, but will be compelled, willing or unwilling, to confess that Christ had an existence before his incarnation. This proposition being established, that the Son subsisted before his manifestation in the flesh, we must further inquire, what was he? The Creator, or a creature? Was he a spirit co-eternal with God, or created in time? An answer to these questions is returned in the description of the word and of wisdom which is found in the first chapter of the Gospel of John and in the eighth chapter of the Proverbs of Solomon. Second, that the Son is a person really distinct from the Father and the Holy Ghost. 
that the person of the son is distinct from that of the father must be maintained and taught on account of noetus sibelius and their adherents who affirm that the essence of the father son and holy ghost is of the same person or that the three are one person but that they have different names as father son and holy ghost on account of having different offices to prove that the son is distinct from the father not only in office but also in his personality the following arguments are sufficient one no one is a son of himself but every son is of a father who is distinct from him that is begotten or else the father and the son would be the same in the same respect which is absurd therefore the word is the son of the father and not the father himself two the scriptures teach that there are three distinct persons in the godhead there are three that bear record in heaven the father the word and the holy ghost and these three are one and god said let us make man in our own image he did not say i will make man i and my father are one but the comforter which is the holy ghost whom the father will send in my name he shall teach you all things but when the comforter is come whom i will send unto you from the father even the spirit of truth which proceedeth from the father he shall testify of me teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the father son and holy ghost 1 john 5 verse 7 genesis 1 verse 26 john 10 verse 30 chapter 14 verse 26 chapter 15 verse 26 matthew 28 verse 19 the holy ghost also descended in the shape of a dove the son was baptized in jordan and the voice of the father was heard from heaven saying this is my beloved son in whom i am well pleased matthew 3 verse 16 three there are express testimonies of scripture which affirm that the father is one the son is one and the holy ghost is another there is another that beareth witness of me viz the father speaking from heaven my doctrine is not mine but his that sent me the son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the father do and i will pray the father and he shall give you another comforter john five verses thirty two and thirty seven chapter seven verse sixteen chapter five verse nineteen chapter fourteen verse sixteen four there are distinct attributes ascribed to the different persons of the godhead the father begat the son and the son is begotten the father sent and the son is sent it is not said of the father that he was made flesh but of the son alone the son and not the father took upon him the seed of abraham the son was made a supplicating intercessor priest prophet king and mediator and not the father therefore the father and son are different the father is of himself through the son the son is not of himself nor through the father but through himself from the father finally christ was baptized and not the father nor the holy ghost therefore christ is distinct from the father and the holy ghost third that the son is equal with the father and the holy ghost that the son is true god equal with the father and the holy ghost that he was not made or created before all creature that he is not god on account of divine qualities or operations and that he is not inferior to the other persons of the godhead as arius eunomius samosartinus servetus and other heretics of a similar character imagine but that he is by nature god with the father and the holy ghost is proven one by explicit testimonies from the scriptures this is the will of the father that all men should honour the son as they honour the father but the father ought to be honoured as the true god and not as an imaginary deity so therefore the son is to be honoured whatsoever the father doeth the son does likewise as the father hath life in himself so hath he given to the son to have life in himself christ is over all god blessed for ever this is the true god and eternal life the second man is the lord from heaven all things that he hath are mine in him dwelleth all the fullness of the godhead bodily who being in the form of god thought it not robbery to be equal with god john five verse twenty three chapter five verse nineteen chapter five verse twenty six romans nine verse five one john five verse twenty one corinthians fifteen verse forty seven colossians two nine philippians two verse six two he is the true proper and natural son of god begotten from the essence of the father and if he is begotten from the essence of god the same is therefore communicated to him whole and entire since the divine essence is infinite indivisible and not communicated in part therefore inasmuch as the son has the whole essence communicated to him he is for this reason equal with the father and consequently true god 
3. The scriptures attribute all the essential properties of deity to the Son, not less than to the Father, as that he is eternal. Before the hills was I brought forth. In the beginning was the word. Proverbs 8, verse 25, John 1, verse 1. He is immense. No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. John 3, verse 13, Ephesians 3, verse 17. He is omnipotent. What things the Father doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise, according to the working whereby he is able to subdue all things unto himself, upholding all things by the word of his power. John 5, verse 19, Philippians 3, verse 21, Hebrews 1, verse 3. His wisdom is immense. His name shall be called Counselor. No man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father, save the Son, etc. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them, and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Now are we sure that thou knowest all things? Isaiah 9, verse 6, John 2, verse 54, chapter 16, verse 30. He is the sanctifier of the church. Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Ephesians 5, verses 25 and 26. He is unchangeable. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Matthew 24, verse 35. He is the truth itself, yea, the fountain of truth. Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true. I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 8, verse 14, chapter 14, verse 6. His mercy is unspeakable. As Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God. Ephesians 5, verse 2. He is angry with sin, and punishes even those sins that are committed in secret. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. And said to the rocks and mountains, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth upon the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. John 3, verse 36, Revelation 6, verse 16. Therefore the Son is by nature God, and equal with the Father. 4. The Scriptures, in like manner, attribute all divine works equally to the Father and the Son. He is the Creator of all things, for it is said in the Gospel of John, All things were made by Him. He is the Preserver and Governor of all things, upholding all things by the word of His power. Hebrews 1 verse 3. Then there is attributed to Christ those things which appertain specially to the salvation of the Church. He sends prophets, apostles, and other ministers of the Church. As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And he gave some prophets, and some apostles, and some evangelists, etc. John 20, verse 21, Ephesians 4, verse 11. He furnishes his ministers with necessary gifts and graces. I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. Luke 21, verse 15. He reveals unto us the doctrine of salvation. The only begotten which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. John 1, verse 18. He confirms this doctrine by miracles. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Mark 16, verse 20. He instituted the sacraments, for I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. Matthew 28, verse 19. He reveals the future. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. He shall receive of mine, and show it unto you. Revelation 22, verse 16, John 16, verse 14. He collects the church. I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. Other sheep also I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. John 10, verses 14 and 16. He illuminates the understandings of men. No man knoweth the Father, but the Son, and he to whom he will reveal him. Then opened he their understandings, that they might understand the Scriptures. Matthew 11, verse 27, Luke 24, verse 45. He regenerates and sanctifies. This is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. John 1, verse 33. Titus 2, verse 14. He governs the lives and actions of the godly. Without me ye can do nothing. I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. John 15, verse 5, Galatians 2, verse 20. He comforts the godly in temptations. 
Come unto me, all ye that labour, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Matthew 11, verse 28, John 14, verse 27. He confirms and defends those that are converted against the temptations of the devil, and preserves them by a true faith unto the end. Be of good comfort, I have overcome the world. My sheep shall never perish, neither shall any pluck them out of my hand. John 16, verse 33, chapter 10, verse 28. He hears those that call upon him. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. For this I besought the Lord thrice, and he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. John 14, verse 14, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 8. He forgives sins, justifies, and adopts us as the children of God. The knowledge of my righteous servant shall justify many, that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to be the sons of God. Isaiah 53, verse 11, Matthew 9, verse 6, John 1, verse 12. He gives eternal life and salvation. I give unto them eternal life. This is the true God and eternal life. John 10, verse 28, 1 John 5, verse 20. He will judge the world. He was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. Acts 10, verse 42, chapter 17, verse 32. These divine works attributed to the Son differ from the divine properties which are also ascribed to him, as effects differ from their causes. 5. In the Scriptures, equal and common honour and worship are also attributed to the Father and the Son, which equality follows from an equality of essence and operations, Christ is worshipped by the angels and the church. Let all the angels of God worship him. He himself said that all men should honour the Son even as they honour the Father. Hebrews 1 verse 6, John 5 verse 23. Faith and trust are to be reposed in him. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. John 14 verse 1. He is called God absolutely as the Father. This is the true God and eternal life. He himself instituted the sacraments in which he is worshipped. He is seated at the right hand of God upon the throne of his Father, and rules with equal power with the Father. He is adored with equal honour with the Father by the church triumphant. Blessing and honour and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb for ever and ever. Revelation 5 verse 13. Finally, he is the bridegroom, the husband, the head and king of the church, which is his house and temple, etc. Objection. He who has all things from another is inferior to him from whom he has them. The Son has all things from the Father, therefore he is inferior to the Father. Answer. The Major is true only of him who has anything by the grace of the giver, for he may not have it, and is therefore by nature inferior. But it is not true of him who has all things by generation or by nature. As the Son of God, the Word has all things from the Father. The Father hath given to the Son to have life in himself, as he hath life in himself. All mine are thine, and thine are mine. John 5, verse 26, chapter 17, verse 10. Objection 2. He who does whatever he does by the will of another, going before, is inferior to him by whose will he is controlled. The Son acts by the will of the Father going before and preventing. Therefore he is inferior to the Father. Answer. The order of operating on the part of the persons of the Godhead does not take away their equality, for it is thus that God reveals himself in his word, because the Father does all things through the Son and Holy Ghost, the Son by the Father, through the Spirit, etc. Neither is this an order of time or dignity or nature, but only of persons, so that the Son wills and does only such things as the Father wills and does, and that with the same power and authority, which instead of doing away with their equality, only establishes it the more fully. Fourth that the Son is consubstantial, or of the same essence, with the Father and the Holy Ghost. Having established the former propositions, we are now naturally led to prove that the Son is consubstantial, that is, of the same essence, with the Father. Heretics are willing to confess that the Son is of like substance, or essence, with the Father, which is indeed true, but does not express the whole truth in relation to this subject. Two men are also like substantial, who are nevertheless not consubstantial, but the Father and the Son are not only of similar, but of one and the same essence, and are one God. For there is only one divine essence which is the same, and is holy in every one of the persons of the Godhead. The Father is indeed one person, and the Son is another, 
but yet the Father is not one God, and the Son another God, etc. John says that there are three that bear record in heaven. They are three persons, but not three gods that bear witness, for these three are one. Therefore we declare against Arius that Christ is not only like substantial, but also consubstantial with the Father, having the same divine essence with the Father, which is confirmed by the following arguments. 1. Because the Son is called Jehovah, who is only one essence, and not only is the name, but the properties also which belong to Jehovah alone are attributed to Christ. And this is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Lo, this is our God, we have waited for him, and he will save us, this is the Lord. This expected God and Saviour is the Messiah, who in the same sense is called the desire of all nations, Jeremiah 23, verse 6, Isaiah 25, verse 9, Haggai 1, verse 7. Those passages of Scripture are here also in place, in which the angel of the Lord is called Jehovah himself, and also those which in the Old Testament are spoken concerning Jehovah, and in the New are cited and applied to Christ. When he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, and gave gifts unto men. Psalm 68, verse 18, Ephesians 4, verse 8. Jehovah was tempted in the desert, the same is said of Christ. And let all the angels of God worship him. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands. Psalm 97, verse 7, Hebrews 1, verse 6, Psalm 102, verse 26, Hebrews 1, verse 10. 2. Because he is called the true God, who is but one, as it is said, This is the true God and eternal life, who is over all God blessed for ever. 1 John 5, verse 20, Romans 9, verse 5. 3. Because there is one and the same Spirit of the Father and the Son, proceeding from and proper unto both, through whom the Father and the Son work. They are therefore not distinct in essence, but only in persons. Likewise, each one would have his own peculiar Spirit, and that different from the Spirit of the other. 4. Because Christ is the only begotten and proper Son of the Father, having his essence communicated to him the same and entire, inasmuch as the Godhead can neither be multiplied nor divided. From these considerations it is easy to return an answer to these sophisms of heretics, especially if we consider the source whence they proceed, for they either rest their conclusions upon false principles, or they transfer to the Creator those things which are peculiar to created things, or they attribute to the divinity of Christ those things which are spoken of his human nature, or they confound the office of the Mediator with his nature or person, or they exclude the Son and Holy Ghost from those things which they ascribe to the Father as the fountain of all the divine works of the Son and Holy Ghost, or they detract from the Son and Holy Ghost those things by which the divinity of the Father is distinguished from creatures and idols, or finally they corrupt the language of Scripture. General Rules by which an answer may be returned to the principal heresies and objections of heretics. 1. Heretics reason from false principles when they argue that if God begat one son, he could have begotten more, and the son might have begotten another son, etc. We reply to this objection by laying down this rule, that we are to judge of God according to the revelation which he has made in his word, and not according to the brain of heretics. Hence, as he has revealed himself in his word as such an one as could have begotten only one son, and has and willed to have only one and not more, we should rest satisfied with this, and not go beyond what he has been pleased to reveal. 2. They assume many things which are true in relation to things that are finite, but which are false when they are applied to God, who is infinite, as, for example, when they argue that three cannot be one. Three persons really distinct cannot be one essence. He that begets and he that is begotten are not the same essence. An infinite person cannot beget another that is infinite. One essence cannot be communicated to many. He who communicates his own essence, whole and entire, to another, does not remain what he was, etc. To these and similar objections, often brought forward by those who oppose the doctrine of the divinity of the Son and Holy Ghost, we reply, not by simply denying what they affirm, but by making a distinction according to this rule, principles which are true concerning a nature that is finite, are not to be transferred to the infinite essence of God, for when this is done they become false. 3. When they argue from things peculiar to the human nature, as that Christ suffered, died, etc., which things cannot be said of God, we reply to them by making a distinction between the natures in Christ, according to this rule, those things which are proper to the human nature of Christ, are not to be transferred to his divine nature. 4. 
when they conclude from those things which are peculiar to the office of the mediator that God cannot be sent by God, we must reply according to the rule of Cyril, sending and obedience do not take away or conflict with equality of power or of essence, or inequality of office does not set aside equality of nature or of persons. It is in accordance with this rule that we are also to explain that declaration of Christ, My Father is greater than I, viz. as it respects the office and human nature of the Mediator, but not as it respects his divine essence. John 14, verse 28. 5. When they conclude that the Son is not God, or that he is inferior to the Father, because he sometimes, in the Scriptures, attributes his own works to the Father, as the fountain of all divine operations, as in John 14, verse 10, the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. An answer is to be returned according to this rule. Those things which are attributed to the Father as the fountain are not to be considered as belonging to him exclusively, as though the Son did not participate in them, for they are communicated to him that he may have them as his own. For what things soever the Father doeth, these doeth the Son likewise. 6. So when they argue from those passages of Scripture in which the Father is opposed to false deities which make no mention of the Son, that this omission is a manifest proof that the Son is not that one God, an answer is easily given according to this rule. When anything is attributed to any one of the persons of the Godhead, that is opposed to creatures or false deities, that he may thereby be distinguished from them, the other persons are not excluded, but only those things in regard to which a comparison is made. Or, when one divine person, as the Father, is opposed to creatures or idols, and glory and honour are ascribed to him, it does not follow that the Son and Holy Ghost are not of the same divine essence with the one thus opposed, and that they do not possess equal honour and glory. Or, the divine properties, operations, and honour are attributed to any one of the persons in such a manner that they are not removed from the other persons of the Godhead, but only from creatures. Or, a superlative or exclusive manner of speaking in regard to one person, does not exclude the other persons of the Godhead, but creatures and false gods with whom the true God in one or more persons is opposed. As the Father is greater than all, that is, all creatures, and not the Son or Holy Ghost. John 10, verse 29. Of that day knoweth no one but the Father only, that is, no creature. Matthew 24, verse 36. Hence an answer is also furnished to the declaration that they might know thee, the only true God. John 17, verse 3. The Son is not by this excluded, as though he were not truly and properly God, but idols and false gods with whom the Father, the true God, is compared, are excluded. 7. Concerning the phrases and language of Scripture, which they corrupt, we are to judge of them according to the circumstances connected with the passages referred to, and by a comparison of them with other passages, as, He shall deliver up the kingdom to God, even the Father, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24, in such a manner, doubtless, that he himself might retain it, just as the Father delivered the kingdom to the Son in such a way that he, nevertheless, did not lose it. So the Son does nothing, John 5, verse 19, that is, he does nothing of himself or without the will of the Father going before, yet he acts by himself from the Father. Special rules against the sophisms of heretics and such as are necessary for the understanding of Scripture. 1. There is nothing objectionable in the declaration that those who are equal in nature may be unequal in office. 2. That which the Father has given to the Son that he may retain, he will never take from him again, but that which has been given and committed to him for a certain time, he must of necessity resign. 3. A consequence which is drawn from that which is relative to that which is absolute is not of force. 4. It does not follow that he who has his person from another has his essence likewise from another. 5. That which is proper to one nature only is attributed to the person in the concrete, but not otherwise than in respect to that nature to which it is proper. 6. Wisdom is twofold. There is one kind which is in creatures, which is the order of things in nature wisely constituted, and there is another wisdom which is in God, which, when it is opposed to creatures, is the divine mind itself, or the eternal decree of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost in relation to this order. But when this wisdom in God is distinguished from God, then it is properly taken for the Son of God. The former wisdom is created, the latter uncreated. Whenever one person of the Godhead is opposed in the Scripture to creatures or false gods, and thus distinguished from them, the other persons are not thereby excluded, but only creatures with whom there is a comparison of the true God. The same is to be observed in all exclusive and superlative declarations. 8. 
When God is named absolutely in the scriptures, it is always to be understood as referring to the true God. 9. Whereas the Son and Holy Ghost are from the Father, and whereas the Father works through the Son and Holy Ghost, and did not humble himself as the Son, the scriptures oftentimes, and especially in the discourses of Christ, understand by the name of the Father, also the Son and Holy Ghost. 10. When God is considered absolutely or by himself, or is opposed to creatures, the three persons are comprehended, but when he is opposed to the Son, the first person of the Godhead, which is the Father, is understood. 11. The scriptures distinguish the persons, when they oppose or compare them with each other, or when they express their personal properties, by which they restrict to one of the persons of the Godhead the name of God common to them all. But they embrace and mean all the persons of the Godhead, when they oppose the true God to creatures or false gods, or consider him absolutely according to his nature. 12. The Son is wont to refer to the Father, that which he has in common with him, not making any mention of himself inasmuch as he speaks in the person of the Mediator. 13. The Son is said to see, to learn, to hear, and to work, as from the Father, in respect to both natures, but yet with a just and proper distinction, for the will of God is made known to his human understanding by revelation. But his Godhead by itself, and in his own nature, knows and sees most perfectly from everlasting the will of the Father. 14. If the external operations of the three persons were distinct, they would make distinct essences, because, if when one would work another should rest, there would be different essences. 15. When God is called the Father of Christ and of the faithful, it does not follow that he is there and his Father in the same name. 16. The Father has never been without the Son, nor the Father and the Son without the Spirit, inasmuch as the Godhead can neither be increased, diminished, nor changed. Certain sophisms of heretics directed against the eternal deity of the Son briefly refuted. 1. Three persons are not in one essence. Jehovah is one essence, therefore there cannot be three persons in the Godhead. Answer. The major holds true only of things finite and created, and not of the uncreated, infinite, most simple and individual essence of the Godhead. 2. He that has a beginning is not eternal. The Son has a beginning, therefore he is not that eternal Jehovah who is the Father. Answer. That is not eternal which has a beginning of essence and time, but the Son is said to have had a beginning not of essence and time, but only of person, or of order, and of the mode of existing. For he has one and the same essence with the Father, not in time, but by eternal generation, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. As the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. Micah 5, verse 2, John 17, verse 5, chapter 5, verse 26. If it be further objected that he who has a beginning of person or of origin, as the Son has, is not Jehovah, we reply that, if this proposition is understood universally, it is false, for the Scriptures distinctly teach both that the Son is Jehovah, and that he was begotten, that is, had an origin of person from the Father. 3. Our union with God is a consent of will. The union of the Son with the Father is of the same character, as it is said, that they may be one as we are one. John 17, verse 11. Therefore, the union of the Son with the Father is not of essence, but only a consent and agreement of will. Answer. There is more in the conclusion than in the premises, for the conclusion is universal, whilst the minor is specific. For there is besides the consent of the faithful to the will of God also another union of the Son with the Father, viz. of essence, because they are one God. I and my Father are one. I am in the Father, and the Father in me. He that hath seen me hath seen the Father, who is the express image of his person. John 10, verse 30, chapter 14, verses 9 and 10, Hebrews 1, verse 3. 4. Besides him in whom the whole deity is, there is not another in whom it is likewise. The whole deity is in the Father, therefore the Godhead is not in the Son. Answer. We deny the major, because the same essence which is in the Father is also entire in the Son and Holy Ghost. 5. The divine essence is not begotten, but the Son is begotten. Therefore, he is not the same divine essence which the Father is. Answer. Nothing can be concluded from mere particulars. For the major, when expounded generally, is false, that whatever is the divine essence is not begotten. 6. Where there are distinct operations, at least such as are internal, 
There, there are also distinct essences. There are distinct internal operations of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Therefore, their essences are distinct. Answer. The major is true of persons having a finite nature, but may be inverted when understood of persons having an infinite essence. For where there are distinct operations ad intra, which consist in the communicating of essence, there it must needs be one and the same, and that the whole essence, because it is communicated entire to whomsoever it is made over. 7. Christ is the Son of God according to that nature in respect to which he is called the Son in the Scriptures, but he is called the Son according to his human nature only, therefore he is the Son of God according to this alone, and consequently is not very God. Answer. The minor is false because the Son is said to have descended from heaven, to be in heaven when his flesh was on earth. The Father is said to have created all things through the Son. These things are not said of the Son according to his human nature. 8. The Son has a head and is less than the Father. Therefore he is not one and the same essence with the Father. Answer. The Son has a head in respect to his human nature and his office as mediator. These things, however, do not detract anything from his divinity. 9. The divine essence is incarnate. The Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are the divine essence, therefore the three are incarnate. Answer. We deny the consequence, for nothing can be inferred with certainty from mere particulars. The major cannot be established universally, for not whatever is the divine essence is incarnate, that is, not every person subsisting in it is incarnate, or the divine essence is not incarnate in the three persons, but only in one, and that in the person of the Son. 10. The Father only is the true God, as it is said, John 17, verse 3, that they might know thee, the only true God. Therefore the Son is not the true God. Answer. 1. According to the sixth general rule, there is here not an opposition of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, but of the true God with idols and creatures. Therefore the particle only does not exclude the Son and Holy Ghost from deity, but only those to whom he is opposed. 2. There is a fallacy in dividing clauses of mutual coherence and necessary connection, for it follows in the passage above referred to, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Therefore eternal life also consists in this, that Jesus Christ sent of the Father might likewise be known to be the true God, as it is said, this is the true God and eternal life. 3. There is also a fallacy in referring the exclusive particle only to the subject the, to which it does not belong, but to the predicate the true God which the article in the Greek plainly shows, for the sense is that they might know thee, the Father, to be that God, who only is the true God. 11. Christ distinguishes himself from the Father by saying, My Father is greater than I, therefore he is not equal and consubstantial with the Father. Answer. He separates and distinguishes himself from the Father, one, in respect to his human nature, two, in respect to the office of mediator, the Father, therefore, is greater than the Son, not as to his essence, in which the Son is equal with the Father, but as to his office and human nature. It is resolved in accordance to the fourth general rule. 12. The mediator between God and man is not God himself. But the Son is the mediator between God and man, therefore he is not God. Answer. The major is false, because it might follow for the same reason that the mediator between God and man is not man. Reply 1. The major is thus proven. God is not inferior to himself. The mediator with God is inferior to him, therefore he is not God. Answer. The minor is true of the office of Christ, in which sense he is inferior to God, but it is not true when understood of his nature, according to the fourth general rule. Inequality of office does not take away the equality of nature or of persons. Reply 2. The Son is mediator with Jehovah. But the Son is not mediator with himself, therefore he is not Jehovah. Answer. We remark again that nothing can be inferred from mere particulars. The major is not general, for the Son is not mediator with whomsoever is Jehovah, but with the Father. Reply 3. Then the Son and Holy Ghost are not truly reconciled, or they are reconciled without a mediator. Answer. We deny the consequence, because the same will belongs to the three persons. When the Father is appeased, the Son and Holy Ghost are also reconciled. Reply 4. The Son is mediator with him whom he reconciles. But the Son does not only reconcile the Father, but also himself. Therefore he is mediator with himself, which is absurd. Answer. We reply to the Major that the Son is properly said to be mediator with him whom he so appeases by his satisfaction, 
that the decree and purpose of atonement may seem to have originally sprung from him. But this is the Father alone, therefore the Son is not, in this sense, mediator with himself, but with the Father alone. Again, it is not absurd to say that the Son is mediator towards or with himself, for it is not absurd that he should carry on the offices, both of God accepting and of the mediator making reconciliation, but in different respects, the former by reason of his divine nature, the latter by reason of the office of mediator. It is proper to compare these objections with those which are brought forward under the subject of the Trinity. For the same objections and sophisms which are brought against the divine essence and the Trinity itself are brought against each single person of the Godhead, and those with which one person is assailed are the same which are brought against the essence of God. Besides, some objections were there merely proposed which are here more fully refuted. More may be seen on this subject in the first volume of Osinus from page 115 to 125. Section 25. Concerning the name Lord. Question 34. Wherefore callest thou him our Lord? Answer. Because he has redeemed us, both soul and body, from all our sins, not with gold or silver, but with his precious blood, and hath delivered us from all the power of the devil, and thus hath made us his own property. Exposition. Two things are here to be considered. First, in what sense Christ is called Lord, Second, for what causes, and in how many ways, he is our Lord. First, in what sense Christ is called Lord. To be Lord is to have a right over some thing or person. Christ, therefore, is our Lord, and the Lord of all, one, because he has dominion over us, and over all things. He has a care for all things, keeps and preserves all, and especially those who have been purchased and redeemed by his blood. Two, because all things are subject to him, and we are bound to serve him in body and soul, that he may be glorified by us. The name Lord belongs to both natures of Christ, just as that of prophet, priest, and king, for the names of the office, benefits, dignity, and beneficence of Christ towards us are affirmed of his whole person, not by the communication of properties, as the names of the two natures and attributes of Christ, but properly in respect to each nature, for both natures of Christ will and secure our redemption, the human nature paid the price of our redemption by dying for us, and the divine gives and offers to the Father this price, and applies it unto us by the Spirit. Christ is, therefore, our Lord not only in respect to his divine nature, which has created us, but also in respect to his humanity, for even in as far as he is man, the person of Christ is Lord over all angels and men. Second, for what causes and in how many ways he is our Lord. Christ is our Lord, not only in one, but in many respects. One, by right of creation, sustenance, and government in its general character, as well as that which he has in common with the Father and Holy Ghost. Hence it is said, All mine are thine, and thine are mine. John 17, verse 10. The general dominion of Christ is that which extends itself not only to us, but to all men, even the wicked and the devils themselves, although not in the same respect. For one, he created us to eternal life, but them to destruction. Two, he has a right and power over the wicked and devils to make them do what he pleases, so that without his will they cannot so much as move, and if he wills, he has power to reduce them to nothing, as the history which we have in the gospel of the man possessed with devils sufficiently testifies. But besides this right which he likewise has over us, he is also called our Lord because he guards us as his own peculiar people, whom he has purchased with his blood, and sanctifies by his spirit, and furthermore, by this his spirit, he rules and governs us, and works in our hearts faith and obedience. 2. By the right of redemption peculiar to himself, because he alone is the mediator who has redeemed us by his blood from sin and death, delivered us from the power of the devil, and set us apart for himself, the way in which we have been redeemed is most precious, because it was far greater to redeem us with his blood than with money. Therefore the right of possession which he has over us is also of the strongest character. But seeing that he has redeemed us, it is evident that we were slaves. We were indeed the servants and slaves of the devil, from whose tyranny Christ has delivered us. Hence we are now the servants of Christ, because notwithstanding we were by nature his enemies, and deserving of destruction. He has preserved and redeemed us. Slaves were first called servi by the Romans from servando, which properly means preserved, 
because, being taken captives by their enemies, they were preserved when they might have been slain. This dominion of Christ over us is special inasmuch as it extends only to the church. Objection. If we have been redeemed from the power of the devil, the price of our redemption has been given to him. For from whose power we are redeemed, to him is the ransom due, but the price of our redemption was not given to Satan. Therefore we have not been redeemed from his power. Answer. The price of our deliverance is due him from whose power we have been redeemed, provided he is supreme Lord, and holds a dominion over us by right. But God alone, and not Satan, is our supreme Lord, and holds a dominion over us justly. Therefore the price of our redemption is due to God, and not to the devil. It is true indeed that Satan enslaved us by the just judgment of God, on account of sin, taking us by force, and thus making inroads upon the possessions of another. But Christ, that strong-armed and greater one, having made satisfaction for our sins, and broken the power of the devil, liberated us from his tyranny. Therefore Christ has redeemed us in respect to God, because he paid to him our ransom, and in respect to the devil he has liberated us, and asserted and secured our freedom. 3. By reason of our preservation Christ is our Lord, because he defends us even to the end, and keeps us unto eternal life, not only by preserving our bodies from injuries, but our souls also from sin. For our preservation must be understood not only concerning our first rescue from the power of the devil, but also concerning our continual preservation and the consummation of his benefits. Christ himself speaks of this preservation when he says, Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost. No man shall pluck them out of my hands. John 17, verse 12, chapter 10, verse 28. He preserves the wicked unto destruction, and that merely with a temporal defense. 4. In respect to ordination or appointment, because the Father ordained the Word, or this person Christ, to this, that he might through him accomplish all things in heaven and on earth. For Christ is our Lord, not only in that he preserves us, having rescued us from the power of the devil, and made us the sons of God, but also because the Father has given us to him, and has constituted him our prince, king, and head. He hath appointed him heir of all things. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be head over all things, to the church, etc. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a saviour, for to give repentance to Israel, etc. Hebrews 1 verse 2, John 17 verse 6, chapter 6 verse 37, Ephesians 1 verse 22, Acts 5 verse 31. Since Christ therefore is our Lord in a far more excellent manner than others, we are also much more strongly obligated to render obedience to him, for he is our Lord in such a manner that he may do with us what he wills, and has an absolute right over us, which he, however, uses only for our salvation, for we receive from him more and infinitely greater benefits than from any one else. Hence we ought ever to acknowledge the dominion which Christ has over us, which acknowledgment to be complete implies, one, a confession of this great benefit, that Christ should condescend to be our Lord, two, a confession of our obligation and duty to him, which may be comprehended in serving, worshipping, and loving him. What, therefore, is the meaning of this article? I believe in Christ our Lord. Three things are here to be observed. One, to believe that Christ is Lord. This, however, is not sufficient, for we believe also that the devil is Lord, but not of all, nor of us, as we believe Christ is Lord of us all. Two, to believe that Christ is Lord both of all and of us. Neither is this all that is necessary for us to believe, for the devils also believe that Christ is their Lord, as it is plain that he has a right and authority over them. 3. To believe in Christ as our Lord, that is, to believe that he is our Lord in such a manner that we may repose our confidence in him. And this is what we are especially required to believe. When we therefore say that we believe in our Lord, we believe, 1 that the Son of God is the Creator of all things, and therefore has a right over all creatures. All things that the Father hath are mine. 2. That he is in a peculiar manner constituted the Lord, the Defender and Preserver of the Church, because he has redeemed it with his blood. 3. That the Son of God is also my Lord, that I am one of his subjects, that I am redeemed by his blood, and continually preserved by him, so that I am bound to be grateful to him and further, that his dominion over me is such as is calculated to promote my good, and that I am saved by him as a most precious possession, a peculiar purchase, 
secured at the greatest expense. Section 26 of the Conception and Nativity of Christ Question 35. What is the meaning of these words? He was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary. Answer, that God's eternal Son, who is and continueth true and eternal God, took upon him the very nature of man, of the flesh and blood of the Virgin Mary, by the operation of the Holy Ghost, that he might also be the true seed of David, like unto his brethren in all things, sin excepted. Exposition The exposition of this question is necessary on account of ancient and modern heretics, who have denied and who now deny that the flesh of Christ was taken from the substance of the Virgin. The Eutychians argue Christ was conceived by the Holy Ghost, therefore the flesh of Christ was produced from the substance of the divinity, or from the essence of the Holy Ghost. By this means the divine nature was changed into the human. The fallacy of this argument arises from an incorrect use of a figurative mode of speaking, for the terms by, from, or of the Holy Ghost do not signify a material but an efficient cause, the power, efficacy, virtue, or operation of the Holy Ghost, for it was by the virtue or operation of the Holy Ghost that the Son of God was conceived in the womb of the Virgin, according to the words of the angel, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Luke 1, verse 35. Christ is also called the seed of Abraham, the son of David. Therefore he took his flesh from these fathers, and not from the Holy Ghost. As we are born of God because he made us, so Christ was conceived by the Holy Ghost, because it was by his virtue and operation that he was conceived, and not because he was formed from the substance of the Holy Ghost. Objection. But if the particle of or by does not signify a material cause when used of the Holy Ghost, then, in like manner, it cannot signify this when it is said of Christ that he was born of the Virgin Mary. Answer. The cases are not exactly parallel, for in relation to the latter article it behooved Christ to be born of the seed of David, but when it is said he was conceived of or by the Holy Ghost, the particle by cannot refer to or signify a material case for these reasons. 1. Because if this were true, then that which immediately follows, viz. that he was born of the Virgin Mary, would not be true. 2. Because God is not susceptible of any change, and therefore cannot be changed into flesh. 3. Because the word assumed flesh, but was not changed into it. What, therefore, does the conception of Christ by the Holy Ghost signify? Three things are comprehended in it. 1. That Christ was miraculously conceived in the womb of the Virgin, by the immediate action or operation of the Holy Ghost, without the seed or substance of man, so that his human nature was formed from his mother alone, contrary to the order of things which God has established in nature, as it is said, the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Luke 1, verse 35. If it be here objected that God has also formed us, we reply that we have been formed immediately and not immediately as Christ was, from which it is evident that the examples are not the same. 2. The Holy Ghost miraculously sanctified that which was conceived and produced in the womb of the Virgin, so that original sin did not attach itself to that which was thus formed, for it did not become the Word, the Son of God, to assume a nature polluted with sin, for the following reasons. 1. That he might be a pure sacrifice, for it behooved him to make satisfaction for sin. 2. That he might also, by his purity, sanctify others. 3. That we might know that whatever the Son says is truth, for that which is born of flesh, which is sinful and not sanctified, is flesh, falsehood and vanity. Objection. But Christ was born of a mother that was a sinner, therefore he himself had sin. Answer. The Holy Ghost knows best how to distinguish and separate sin from the nature of man, for sin is not from the nature of man, but was added to it from the devil. 3 that the hypostatical union of the two natures, the divine and the human, was formed by the same Holy Ghost in the womb of the Virgin, immediately and at the very moment of his conception. The meaning, therefore, of this article, he was conceived by the Holy Ghost, is that the Holy Ghost was the immediate author of the miraculous conception of the flesh of Christ, that he separated all impurity of original sin from that which was thus conceived, and united the flesh with the word in a personal union in the very moment of conception. He was born of the Virgin Mary. It behooved the Messiah to be born of the Virgin, according to the predictions of the prophets, that he might be a high priest without sin, 
and the type or figure of our spiritual regeneration, which is not of the will of flesh but of God. Hence it is added in the creed that Christ was born of the Virgin Mary. 1. That the truth of the human nature assumed by the Son of God might thus be signified, that is to say, that Christ was conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost, and was born a true man from the substance of Mary his mother, or the flesh of Christ, although miraculously conceived, was nevertheless taken and born of the Virgin. 2. That we may know that Christ has descended from the fathers, from whom Mary also was, that is to say, that he was the true seed of Abraham, being born from his seed, and that he was the son of David, being born from the daughter of David, according to the prophecies and promises. 3. That we may know that the scriptures are fulfilled, which declared, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. The seed of the woman shall bruise the serpent's head. Isaiah 7, verse 14, Genesis 3, verse 15. From this fulfillment of prophecy, by which it was foretold that Christ should be born of a virgin of the family of David, and that by a miraculous conception which the prophets did in a manner foretell, it is most clearly manifest that this man Jesus, born of the Virgin, is the promised Messiah, or the Christ, the Redeemer of the human race. 4. That we may know that Christ was sanctified in the womb of the Virgin by the power of the Holy Ghost, and he is therefore pure and without sin. 5. That we may know that there is an analogy between the nativity of Christ and the regeneration of the faithful, for the birth of Christ, of the Virgin, is a sign of our spiritual regeneration, which is not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Section 27 Of the Two Natures in Christ The article of the Incarnation, or of the Two Natures in Christ and their hypostatical union, is next to be considered. The questions which are here to be expounded somewhat largely are the following. First, are there two natures in the Mediator? Second, do these natures constitute one or two persons? Third, if but one person, what is the nature of this union? Fourth, why was it necessary that the hypostatical union should be constituted? First, are there two natures in the Mediator? That Christ has a divine nature has already been proven. That he has a human nature was formerly denied by Marcion, and is to this day denied by the Swankfieldians, who hold that Christ is a man only in name. It is therefore to be proven against heretics that Christ is a true and natural man, consisting of a body and soul, perfectly and truly, and subject to all infirmities, sin excepted. The proofs of this are, one, the testimonies of Scripture, which teach that God had all the parts of human nature, and that he was made like unto us in all things, sin only excepted. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Hebrews 2, verses 11 to 18, and chapter 4, verse 15. Those passages of Scripture are here likewise in point in which our Lord himself confirms the truth of his human nature after his resurrection, as when he said to the disciples, Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have, etc. Luke 24, verses 39 and 40. There have been those who have maintained that the divinity of Christ was constituted the soul of his body. Thus Apollinarius taught that Christ had indeed a true human nature, but that the word was united to him in the place of a soul. This heresy is easily refuted by the words of Christ himself, My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death, Matthew 27, verse 38. The body now cannot be said to be sorrowful, for it is not susceptible of grief. Neither can sadness be attributed to the divinity, for this is free from every passion. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit, and having thus said, he gave up the ghost. Luke 23, verse 46. The spirit here signifies the soul, and not the divinity, because the divinity never departed from the human nature. And again it is said by Paul, Hebrews 2, verse 17, it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. But without a soul he would not have been like unto his brethren in all things, 
for he would not have been a true man. Hence it must needs be that Christ had a human soul. 2. The same doctrine is also confirmed by the divine promises and prophecies, for the Messiah was promised to be such an one as would be the seed of the woman, the seed of Abraham, the son of David, the son of a virgin, etc. The seed of the woman shall bruise the serpent's head. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Concerning his son Jesus Christ, who is made of the seed of David according to the flesh, Genesis 3, verse 15, Isaiah 7, verse 14, Matthew 1, verse 1, Luke 1, verse 42, Romans 1, verse 3. The argument which is drawn from these declarations made in relation to the Messiah is most convincing, for if the humanity which he assumed was from the seed of Abraham and of David, then he had a real human nature. 3. The office of mediator demanded in Christ, our deliverer, a true human nature taken from ours which had sinned, and which was to be redeemed through him, as we have shown in the former part of this work, for it behooved the same nature which had sinned to suffer and make satisfaction for sin. Therefore, inasmuch as our nature sinned, Christ took this upon himself, and not a nature created out of nothing, or brought down from heaven, etc. Nor did it merely behoove our mediator to take upon him our nature, but it was further necessary that he should retain and keep it forever, because the Father receives us into his favour only upon the condition that we remain engrafted into his Son. This consolation, too, that Christ is our brother, that he bears our nature and is bone of our bone and flesh of our flesh, is necessary for us continually, even in eternity, for we should lose this consolation if Christ had not truly taken our nature and would not retain it forever. Without this he would not be our brother." Objection 1. The flesh of Adam, that is, that which is made over to his posterity by generation, is sinful, but the flesh of Christ is not sinful, therefore it is not of the flesh of Adam. Answer. There is here a fallacy of accident in affirming that to be true of the substance which is true only by an accident. Since the flesh of Adam is not sinful in itself but only by an accident, it also follows that the flesh of Christ is, only in respect to that accident, not the flesh of Adam, but is, according to the substance, the same flesh of Adam. Hence the argument ought rather to be changed thus. The flesh of Adam is true flesh, the flesh of Christ is the flesh of Adam, therefore the flesh of Christ is true flesh. Objection 2. Christ was conceived by the Holy Ghost, therefore his flesh was produced and propagated from the substance of the Holy Ghost, and is for this reason no creature. Answer. We reply to this, as we did to the objection brought forth under the thirty-fifth question of the Catechism, that there is a fallacy in misunderstanding the figure of speech that is employed, inasmuch as the particle by does not signify a material, but an efficient cause. Objection 3. In God there are not two natures. Christ is God, therefore there are not two natures in Christ. Answer. Nothing can be established by mere particulars, for the major does not express what is universally true, but what is true only of God, the Father, and Holy Ghost, and not of the incarnate Son which is God manifested in the flesh. Reply 1. But nothing can be added unto God by reason of his perfection. The Son is God, therefore it is not possible to add human nature to his divinity. Answer. We grant that nothing can be added to God by way of perfection, so as to change or perfect his essence, but there may be something added to him by copulation or union, because he took upon him the seed of Abraham. Reply 2. God dwells in light inaccessible, therefore it is not possible that human nature could ever approach him. Answer. It is conceded that human nature cannot approach God, much less become personally united to him, unless he draw, assume, and unite it with himself. Reply 3. It is reproachful to God to be a creature. Answer. It would indeed be reproachful to God if he were to be changed into a creature, but that he should be united with a created nature without a change of his own essence is honourable unto God, as he by this means demonstrates to the whole world his infinite wisdom, goodness, and power. Second, do these two natures of Christ constitute one or more persons? There are two natures in Christ, whole and distinct, but only one person— Marcion taught that there were two Christs, the one crucified, the other not, and that the one came to the assistance of the other upon the cross. But it behooved one to be Christ, because it was necessary that one should be mediator, both by merit and efficacy, therefore there must needs be only one person. Objection 1. 
in whom there are two things which constitute two entire persons, in him there are also two persons. In Christ there are two natures which constitute two entire persons, for the word is a complete person, whilst body and soul also constitute a person, therefore there are two persons in Christ. Answer, we deny that part of the minor proposition which affirms that body and soul, in connection with the word, constitute a person. This appears to be false according to the definition which we have given of person, which does not belong to the human nature assumed by the word, for it does not subsist by itself, but is sustained in and by another, viz. in and by the word. It was formed and assumed by the word at one and the same time, and would never have existed unless it had been assumed by the word, nor could it even now exist were it not sustained by the word. It is also a part of another, viz. of the mediator. But a person, according to the definition which we have given, is something individual, intelligent, subsisting by itself, not sustained by another, nor part of another. Hence it is evident that the human nature of Christ is not in and of itself a proper person, although it may be said to belong to the substance of Christ and to be part of him. The word, however, was and is a person, and yet has a relation to our nature, in as far as he has taken it upon himself. Hence it is correct to say the person took the nature, and the nature assumed a nature. But we cannot correctly say the person took a person, or the nature took a person, for the human nature which is in Christ was created in order that it might be made a part of another, so that we may properly say that it is a part of another, yet when we so speak, all imperfections must be carefully excluded. Many, however, refrain from the use of such language, in consequence of the dangers and abuses to which it may lead. Yet Damascenus and others often use this form of speaking. Objection 2. But, according to this, the word cannot be a person, because he is a part of the person, and that which is only a part cannot be a person. Answer. That which is only part of a person, and such a part that is not of itself a person, is no person, or that which is a part of a person is not that person of which it is a part. And so it may be said of the word, if it be properly understood, that he is not the whole person of the mediator, although he is in and of himself a whole and complete person in respect to the Godhead. Objection 3. God and man are two persons. Christ is God and man, therefore there are two persons in him. Answer. The major is true if we understand God and man as existing separately, without any union. But Christ is God and man in union. There is therefore here a fallacy of composition and division, for in the major proposition God and man are taken disjunctively, or as existing separately, and in the minor conjunctively, or as joined together. Reply 1. But the word united to himself a body and soul, and therefore a person. Answer. It is true, indeed, he united these to himself, but it was by a personal union, so that the body and soul which Christ took do not exist by themselves, but in the person of the word. Reply 2. But he united to himself the essential parts of a person, and therefore he must also have united a person. Answer. This holds true merely in relation to such parts as subsist by themselves, but the body and soul of Christ do not subsist, nor could they ever have subsisted unless in this union. Third. What is the union which exists between the two natures of Christ, and how was it made? The union which exists between the two natures in Christ was made by the operation of the Holy Ghost in the very conception, in such a manner that the two natures subsist in the single person of Christ, without confusion, without change, indivisible and inseparable, as it is expressed in the Chalcedonian Creed. It is called the hypostatical or personal union, because the two natures that are different are united in a mysterious manner in one person, whilst the essential properties of each nature are retained whole and entire. It is on account of this union that Christ is called, and is true God and man, in respect to the distinct natures of which he is possessed. He is very God according to the divine, and very man according to the human nature. That holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The word was made flesh. It took upon him the seed of Abraham. God was manifested in the flesh. Luke 1 verse 35, Colossians 2 verse 9, John 1 verse 14, Hebrews 2 verse 16, 1 Timothy 3 verse 16. Fourth, why was it necessary that this hypostatical union should be effected? The reasons which made it necessary that the mediator should be a true man and perfectly righteous, and at the same time true God, have been presented and explained under the sixteenth and seventeenth questions of the Catechism, so that, 
It is not necessary that we should here repeat them. For these reasons, it was necessary that a personal union should be effected between the natures of the mediator, that he might at the same time be very man and very God, who might be able to restore and merit for us that righteousness and life which we have lost. For had not these natures concurred and met together in the person of the word, as above described, he could not have accomplished the work of our redemption. Section 29. The Death and Burial of Christ. Sixteenth Lord's Day, Question 40. Why was it necessary for Christ to humble himself even unto death? Answer, because with respect to the justice and truth of God, satisfaction for our sins could be made no otherwise than by the death of the Son of God. Exposition. Under this question we are to consider, first, how Christ is said to have been dead, second, whether it was necessary that Christ should die, third, for whom he has died. First, how Christ is said to have been dead. The exposition of this question is necessary on account of heretics who have corrupted the sense of this article. Marcion denied that Christ did truly die, and affirmed also that the whole dispensation of the word in the flesh, and all those things which Christ endured for us, were imaginary, and that he had only the appearance of a man, but was not such in reality. Nestorius separated the natures in Christ, and would not admit that the Son of God was crucified and died, but said that this was true only of the man Christ. Do not exult and glory, O thou Jew, said he, thou hast not crucified God, but man. The ubiquitarians believe that the human nature of Christ, from the moment of the Incarnation, was so endowed with all the properties of deity, that the only difference between this and the Godhead of Christ is that the former has by accident what the latter has by and of itself. Hence it is that they imagine that Christ in his death, yea, when he was concealed in the womb of the Virgin, was not only as to his deity, but also as to his body, in heaven and everywhere. And this is what they call the form of God, concerning which Paul speaks in Philippians 2, verse 6. 1. But in opposition to all these, we believe what is affirmed in the Creed, that Christ was truly dead, and that there was a real separation between his soul and body, and that of a real local character, so that his soul and body were not only not together everywhere, but they were not at the same time in one place. The soul was not where the body was, and the body was not where the soul was. And Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And Jesus cried with a loud voice, and gave up the ghost. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. And he bowed his head, and gave up the ghost. Matthew 27, verse 50, Mark 15, verse 37, Luke 23, verse 46, John 19, verse 30 objection but he gave up the ghost just as virtue that is his divinity is said to have gone out of him answer there is a difference here which we must observe for the divinity whilst united with the humanity did nevertheless operate beyond and without it but the soul departed from the body the reason of this difference is that the divinity is something uncreated and therefore infinite whilst the soul is created and therefore finite two this is also to be added to what has been said, that although his soul was truly separated from his body, yet the word did not desert the soul and body, but remained, notwithstanding, personally united to each, so that, in this separation of soul and body, the two natures in Christ were not disjoined or severed. Objection. But if there was no such separation between the natures of Christ, why did he exclaim, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Answer, this cry was extorted from the suffering Son of God, not on account of any separation of the two natures, but on account of the delay of help and assistance, for the two natures in Christ ought not to be disjoined, because it is written, God hath purchased the church with his own blood, Acts 20, verse 28, and it was necessary that he who would die for our sins should be the Son of God, that there might thus be a sufficient ransom. So it is also clearly manifest that the union of the natures in Christ is no ubiquity, for his soul, being separated from his body, was not in the sepulchre with his body, and consequently not everywhere, because that which is everywhere can never be separated, and yet the union of the natures remained complete even in death and in the grave. Second, whether it was necessary that Christ should die for us, it was necessary for Christ, in order that he might make satisfaction, not only to suffer, but also to die, one, on account of the justice of God, 
sin is an evil of such magnitude that according to the order of justice it merits and demands the destruction of the sinner for the reason that that which is an offence against the highest good can only be expiated by the most severe punishment and extreme destruction of the sinner which is by his death according as it is written the wages of sin is death romans six verse twenty three christ now assumed our place and took upon himself the person of those who had sinned and deserved death not only eternal but also temporal for we had merited that destruction which consists in a dissolution between the soul and the body which being once effected the body itself is also dissolved as a house is said to be destroyed when the parts are separated from each other it was necessary therefore that the son of god should die in order that a sufficient ransom might thus be made which could not have been effected by a mere creature objection but we have merited eternal death therefore our souls ought not to be separated from our bodies that they might suffer eternal condemnation answer this is not a just conclusion because nothing more can be properly inferred than that it is necessary that our souls and bodies should be again united that they may suffer eternal death which will also at length come to pass therefore it was necessary that christ should die for us and that his soul should be separated from his body two on account of the truth of god for god had declared that he would punish sin with destruction and the death of the transgressor in the day thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die genesis two verse seventeen it was necessary that this threatening of god should be fulfilled after sin was once committed objection but adam did not immediately die answer he did not indeed instantly suffer temporal death yet he straightway became mortal and by degrees died whilst he already experienced the beginning of eternal death i heard said he thy voice and was afraid because i was naked genesis three verse ten there was a fear and a sense of the wrath of god a struggling with death and a loss of all the good gifts which god conferred upon man and yet the lenity and compassion of the gospel was not wanting for god had not expressly declared that he should suddenly die wholly and immediately if this had been wanting he would have perished for ever the son of god offered and brought in a mitigation and raised man to a new life that notwithstanding he remained subject to temporal death this was no longer injurious or fatal to him three on account of the promises made to the fathers by the prophets such as that contained in isaiah fifty three verse seven he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep is dumb before her shearers so he opened not his mouth and also on account of the types and sacrifices by which god signified that christ should die such a death as would be a sufficient ransom for the sins of the world this now was the work of no creature but of the son of god alone hence it became him to suffer such a painful death in our behalf for lastly christ himself foretold that his death was necessary for if i go not away the comforter will not come unto you if i wash thee not thou hast no part with me and i if i be lifted up will draw all men unto me john sixteen verse seven chapter thirteen verse eight chapter twelve verse thirty two three things therefore concur in this question that it was necessary to make satisfaction to the justice and truth of god that this satisfaction could only be made by death and that by the death of the son of god from what has now been said the following conclusions may be drawn one that sin should especially be avoided by us inasmuch as it could not be expiated except by the intervention of the death of the son of god two that we ought to be grateful to the son of god for this great benefit which he has out of his great goodness conferred upon us three that all our sins however great however many and grievous they may be are expiated by the death of christ alone third did christ die for all in answering this question we must make a distinction so as to harmonize those passages of scripture which seem to teach contradictory doctrines in some places christ is said to have died for all and for the whole world he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only but also for the sins of the whole world that he by the grace of god should taste death for every man we thus judge that if one died for all then were all dead and that he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves but unto him that died for them and rose again who gave himself a ransom for all etc john two verse two hebrews two verse nine two corinthians five verse fifteen one timothy two verse six the scriptures on the contrary affirm in many places that christ died prayed offered himself etc only for many for the elect for his own people for the church for his sheep etc i pray for them 
I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine, that is, the elect alone. The Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He shall save his people from their sins. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. John 17, verse 9, Matthew 20, verse 28, chapter 15, verse 24, chapter 1, verse 21, Hebrews 9, verse 28, Isaiah 53, verse 11, Ephesians 5, verse 25. What shall we say in view of these seemingly opposite passages of Scripture? Does the word of God contradict itself? By no means. But this will be the case unless these declarations, which in some places seem to teach that Christ died for all, and in others that he died for a part only, can be reconciled by a proper and satisfactory distinction, which distinction or reconciliation is twofold. There are some who interpret these general declarations of the whole number of the faithful, or of all that believe, because the promises of the gospel properly belong to all those that believe, and because the scriptures do often restrict them to such as believe. Whosoever believeth in him shall not perish. The righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all, and upon all them that believe. That through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. It is in this way that Ambrose interprets those passages which speak of the death of Christ as extending to all. Quote, the people of God, says he, have their fullness, and although a large portion of men either neglect or reject the grace of the Saviour, yet there is a certain special universality of the elect, and foreknown, separated, and discerned from the generality of all, that a whole world might seem to be saved out of a whole world, and all men might seem to be redeemed out of all men, etc. End quote. In this way there is no repugnancy or contradiction, for all those that believe are the many, the peculiar people, the church, the sheep, the elect, etc., for whom Christ died and gave himself. Others reconciled these seemingly contradictory passages of Scripture by making a distinction between the sufficiency and efficacy of the death of Christ. For there are certain contentious persons who deny that these declarations which speak in a general way are to be restricted to the faithful alone, that is, they deny that the letter itself or the simple language of Scripture does thus limit them and in proof thereof they bring forward those passages in which salvation seems to be attributed not only to those that believe, but also to hypocrites and apostates, as it is said, denying the Lord which bought them, and also where it is said that they have forgotten that they were purged from their old sins, 2 Peter 2 verse 1 and chapter 1 verse 9. But it is manifest that declarations of this kind are to be understood either concerning the mere external appearance and vain glorying of redemption, or of sanctification, or else of the sufficiency and greatness of the merit of Christ. That it may not therefore be necessary for us to contend much with these captious and fastidious persons concerning the restriction of those passages which speak so generally, although it is most manifest in itself, and that those places which speak of the redemption of hypocrites may the more easily be reconciled, some prefer, and not without reason according to my judgment, to interpret those declarations which in appearance seem to be contradictory, partly of the sufficiency and partly of the application and efficacy of the death of Christ. They affirm, therefore, that Christ died for all, and that he did not die for all, but in different respects. He died for all as touching the sufficiency of the ransom which he paid, and not for all, but only for the elect or for those that believe, as touching the application and efficacy thereof. The reason of the former lies in this, that the atonement of Christ is sufficient for expiating all the sins of all men, or of the whole world, if only all men will make application thereof unto themselves by faith. For it cannot be said to be insufficient, unless we give countenance to that horrible blasphemy which, God forbid, that some blame of the destruction of the ungodly results from a defect in the merit of the mediator. The reason of the latter is because all the elect, or such as believe, and they alone, do apply unto themselves by faith the merit of Christ's death, together with the efficacy thereof, by which they obtain righteousness and life, according, as it is said, He that believeth on the Son of God hath everlasting life. John 3, verse 36. The rest are excluded from this efficacy of Christ's death by their own unbelief. As it is again said, He that believeth not shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. John 3, verse 36. Those, therefore, whom the Scriptures exclude from the efficacy of Christ's death cannot be said to be included in the number of those for whom he died, 
as it respects the efficacy of his death, but only as to its sufficiency. Because the death of Christ is also sufficient for their salvation, if they will but believe, and the only reason of their exclusion arises from their unbelief. It is in the same way, that is, by making the same distinction, that we reply to those who ask concerning the purpose of Christ, did he will to die for all? For just as he died, so also he willed to die. Therefore, as he died for all, in respect to the sufficiency of his ransom, and for the faithful alone in respect to the efficacy of the same, so also he willed to die for all in general, as touching the sufficiency of his merit, that is, he willed to merit by his death, grace, righteousness, and life in the most abundant manner for all, because he would not that anything should be wanting, as far as he and his merits are concerned, so that all the wicked who perish may be without excuse. But he willed to die for the elect alone as touching the efficacy of his death, that is, he would not only sufficiently merit grace and life for them alone, but also effectually confers these upon them, grants faith and the Holy Spirit, and brings it to pass that they apply to themselves, by faith, the benefits of his death, and so obtain for themselves the efficacy of his merits. In this sense it is correctly said that Christ died in a different manner for believers and unbelievers. Neither is this declaration attended with any difficulty or inconvenience, inasmuch as it harmonizes not only with Scripture, but also with experience. For both testify that the remedy of sin and death is most sufficiently and abundantly offered in the gospel to all, but that it is effectually applied and profitable only to them that believe. The Scriptures also, everywhere, restrict the efficacy of redemption to certain persons only, as to Christ's sheep, to the elect, and such as believe, whilst on the other hand it clearly excludes from the grace of Christ the reprobate and unbelieving, as long as they remain in their unbelief. What concern hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? 2 Corinthians 6 verse 15, see also Matthew 20 verse 28, chapter 26 verse 28. Isaiah 53, verse 11, John 10, verse 15, Matthew 15, verse 24. Christ, moreover, prayed only for the elect, including those who were already his disciples, and also such as would afterwards believe on his name. Hence he says, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, John 17, verse 9. If therefore Christ would not pray for the world, by which we are to understand such as do not believe, much less would he die for them, as far as the efficacy of his death is concerned. For it is less to pray than to die for any one. There are also two inseparable parts of the sacrifice of Christ, intercession and death. And if he himself refuse to extend one part to the ungodly, who is he that will dare to give the other to them? Lastly, the orthodox fathers and schoolmen also distinguish and restrict the above passages of Scripture as we have done, especially Augustine, Cyril, and Prosper. Lombard writes as follows, quote, Christ offered himself to God, the Trinity for all men, as it respects the sufficiency of the price, but only for the elect as it regards the efficacy thereof, because he effected and purchased salvation only for those who were predestinated. End quote. Thomas writes, quote, The merit of Christ as to its sufficiency extends equally to all, but not as to its efficacy, which happens partly on account of free will and partly on account of the election of God, through which the effects of the merits of Christ are mercifully bestowed upon some and withheld from others according to the just judgment of God. End quote. Other schoolmen also speak in the same manner, from which it is evident that Christ died for all in such a way that the benefits of his death, nevertheless, pertain properly to such as believe, to whom alone they are also profitable and available. Objection 1. The promises of the gospel are universal, as appears from such declarations as invite all men to come to Christ, that they may have life. Hence it does not merely extend to such as believe, Answer, the promise is indeed universal in respect to such as repent and believe, but to extend it to the reprobate would be blasphemy. Quote, there is, saith Ambrose, as just quoted, a certain special universality of the elect, and foreknown, discerned and distinguished from the entire generality. End quote. This restriction of the promises to such as believe is proven from the plain and explicit form in which they are expressed, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life, the righteousness of God, which is by the faith of Jesus Christ unto all, and upon all them that believe. Come unto me, all ye that labour, and are heavy laden. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. He became the author of eternal salvation unto all that obey him. And from the words of Christ, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye pearls before swine, etc. 
John 3, verse 16, Romans 3, verse 22, Matthew 11, verse 28, Acts 2, verse 21, Hebrews 5, verse 9, Matthew 7, verse 6. Objection 2. Christ died for all, therefore his death does not merely extend to such as believe. Answer. Christ died for all as it regards the merit and efficacy of the ransom which he paid, but only for those that believe as it respects the application and efficacy of his death. For seeing that the death of Christ is applied to such alone, and is profitable to them, it is correctly said to belong properly to them alone, as has been already shown. Question 41. Why was he also buried? Answer. Thereby to prove that he was really dead. Exposition. There are many causes on account of which Christ was buried. 1. He would be buried in confirmation of his death, that it might be manifest that he was truly dead, for not the living but only the dead are buried. Therefore, just as he presented himself after his resurrection to be seen, handled, etc., that there might be clear evidence that his body was raised from the dead, so after his death he gave himself for the purpose of being felt and buried, that it might be known that he was a real corpse. There are some parts of the history of Christ's death that pertain to this, as that when he was dead he was pierced with a spear, was taken down from the cross, was anointed, was wrapped in linen, etc., for these also demonstrate the truth of his death. We are, therefore, by his burial, assured that he was really dead, and by this of our certain redemption, for our salvation consists in his death, the proof of which is his burial. 2. That the last part of his humiliation might be attained, for this, viz. burial, was a part of the punishment, curse, and ignominy, which we had merited, as it is said, unto dust shalt thou return, Genesis 3, verse 19. A dead body is, indeed, destitute of feeling and understanding, yet it was ignominious that his body should be laid in the earth as another corpse. Therefore, as the resurrection of Christ from the grave is a part of his glory, so his burial and interment among the dead, by which he was placed in the same condition with them, is a part of the humiliation and ignominy which he rendered on our account, for he was not unwilling to become a corpse for our sake. 3. He would be buried, that we might not be terrified in view of the grave, but know that he has sanctified our graves by his own burial, so that they are no longer graves to us, but chambers and resting places, in which we may quietly and peacefully repose, until we are again raised to life. 4. He was buried, that it might be apparent, in view of his resurrection, that he had truly overcome death in his own body, and that by his own power he had thrown it off from himself, so that his resurrection was no apparition or imaginary thing, but was a real resuscitation of a corpse reanimated. 5. That we may be confirmed in the hope of the resurrection, as we, after his example, shall also be buried, and shall be raised again by his power, knowing that Christ, our head, has opened up the way for us, from the grave to glory. 6. That we, being spiritually dead, may rest from sin. We are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Romans 6, verse 4. 7. That the truth might correspond with the type of Jonah, and that the prophecies might be fulfilled in relation to the burial of the Messiah. Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. He made his grave with the wicked. Psalm 16, verse 10, Isaiah 53, verse 9. Question 42. Since then Christ died for us, why must we also die? Answer. Our death is not a satisfaction for our sins, but only an abolishing of sin, and a passage into eternal life. Exposition. This answer is an explanation to the objection which we frequently hear made in the following form. He for whom another has died ought not himself to die, else God would seem to demand a double satisfaction for one offence. Christ now has died for us, therefore we ought not to die. Answer. It is conceded that we ought not to die for the sake of making satisfaction, but there are other causes why it becomes necessary for us to die. We do not die for the purpose of satisfying the justice of God, but that we may truly receive the benefits purchased by the death of another, that sin may be abolished, and a passage or transaction be made unto eternal life. Our temporal death is then not a satisfaction for sin, but it is, one, an admonition of the remains of sin in us, two, an admonition of the greatness of the evil of sin, three, an abolishing of the remains of sin, and lastly, a passage into eternal life, for the transition of the faithful to eternal life is affected by temporal death. Reply. Where the cause is removed, the effect can no longer remain in force. But the cause of death in us, which is sin, is taken away. Therefore, the effect, which is death, ought also to be taken away. 
Answer. The effect is indeed taken away when the cause is wholly removed, but in us the cause of death which has respect to the abolishing of sin is not entirely removed, although it be taken away as it respects the remission of sin. Or we may reply that sin, as far as it respects the guilt thereof, is taken away, but not as it respects the matter of sin, which is not yet entirely abolished, but remains in us, to be removed gradually, that we may be required to exercise repentance and be fervent in prayer, until, in the life to come, we be perfectly freed from all the remains of sin. Question 43. What further benefit do we receive from the sacrifice and death of Christ on the cross? Answer. That by virtue thereof our old man is crucified, dead, and buried with him, so that the corrupt inclinations of the flesh may no more reign in us, but that we may offer ourselves unto him a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Exposition. This question has respect to the fruits or benefits of Christ's death, and here also, as in the Passion of Christ, the end and fruits are to be regarded as the same, only in a different respect. For the things which Christ proposed to himself as ends are unto us the fruits, when we receive or apply them to ourselves. It is therefore manifest that the benefits of Christ's death comprehend the entire work of our redemption, of which fruits we may specify the following. 1. Justification, or the remission of sins. The justice of God demands that the sinner should not be punished twice, and as he has punished our sins in Christ, he will not therefore punish the same in us. The blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from all sin, original as well as actual, and sins of commission as well as omission. We are therefore justified, that is, freed from the evil both of punishment and of guilt on account of the death of Christ, which is the cause of this effect. 2. Regeneration or the renewing of our nature by the Holy Spirit. Christ, by his death, has merited for us not only the pardon of sin, but also its removal and the gift of the Holy Ghost. Or we may say that he has, by his own death, obtained for us not only the remission of sin, but the indwelling of God in us. If I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. And ye are complete in him, who is made unto us righteousness and sanctification. John 16, verse 7, Colossians 2, verse 10, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 30. But the death of Christ is, in two respects, the efficient cause, as well of our justification as of our regeneration. 1. In respect to God, because He, on account of the merit and death of Christ, remits unto us our sins, grants us the Holy Spirit, and renews in us His own image, being justified by His blood, being reconciled to God by the death of His Son. Because ye are sons, Christ hath sent the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Romans 5, verse 9 and 10, Galatians 4, verse 6. 2. In respect to us, the death of Christ is also an efficient cause, because we who believe that Christ obtained for us righteousness and the Holy Spirit cannot be otherwise than grateful to him, and earnestly desire so to live that we may honour him, which is done by commencing to walk in newness of life. The application of the death of Christ and a proper consideration of it will not suffer us to remain ungrateful, but will constrain us to love Christ in return, and to render thanks for such a great and inestimable benefit. Hence we are not to imagine that we can have remission of sins without regeneration, for no one that is not regenerated can obtain remission of sins. He, therefore, who boasts of having applied to himself by faith the death of Christ, and yet has no desire to live a holy and godly life, that he may so honour the Saviour, lies and gives conclusive evidence that the truth is not in him. For all those who are justified are willing and ready to do those things which are pleasing to God. The desire to obey God can never be separated from an application of the death of Christ, nor can the benefit of regeneration be experienced without that of justification. All those that are justified are also regenerated, and all those that are regenerated are justified. Objection. The Apostle Peter in his first epistle, chapter 1, verse 3, attributes our regeneration to the resurrection of Christ. In what manner, therefore, is it here attributed to his death? Answer. It is attributed to both, to his death, as it respects his merit, for by his death he has merited regeneration for us, and to his resurrection, as it respects the application of it, for by rising from the dead he applies regeneration unto us, giving us the Holy Spirit. 3. Eternal life is another fruit of the death of Christ. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, viz. to death, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. John 3, verse 16, 1 John 5, verse 11. What now is it to believe in Christ dead? It is to believe that he has not only suffered the most excruciating pains and torments, but also death itself, 
and that by his death he has obtained for me remission of sins, reconciliation with God, and by consequence the Holy Spirit also, who commences in me a new life, that I may again be made the temple of God, and at length attain unto eternal life, in which God shall forever be praised and magnified by me. Section 30